The Aeneid by Virgil, translated by Robert Fagels. Book 1. Safe Haven After Storm. Wars and a man I sing, an exile driven on by fate, he was the first to flee the coast of Troy, destined to reach Lavinian shores and Italian soil, yet many blows he took on land and sea from the gods above, thanks to cruel Juno's relentless rage, and many losses he bore in battle too, before he could found a city, bring his gods to Latium, source of the Latin race, the Alban lords and the high walls of Rome. Tell me, muse, how it all began. Why was Juno outraged? What could wound the queen of the gods with all her power? Why did she force a man, so famous for his devotion, to brave such rounds of hardship, bear such trials? Can such rage inflame the immortals' hearts? There was an ancient city held by Tyrian settlers, Carthage, facing Italy and the Tiber River's mouth but far away, a rich city trained and fierce in war. Juno loved it, they say, beyond all other lands in the world, even beloved Samos, second best. Here she kept her armor, here her chariot too, and Carthage would rule the nations of the earth if only the fates were willing. This was Juno's goal from the start, and so she nursed her city's strength. But she heard a race of men, sprung of Trojan blood, would one day topple down her Tyrian stronghold, breed an arrogant people ruling far and wide, proud in battle, destined to plunder Libya. So the fates were spinning out the future. This was Juno's fear and the goddess never forgot the old campaign that she had waged at Troy for her beloved Argos. No, not even now would the causes of her rage, her bitter sorrows drop from the goddess' mind. They festered deep within her, galled her still, the judgment of Paris, the unjust slight to her beauty, the Trojan stock she loathed, the honours showered on Ganymede ravished to the skies. Her fury inflamed by all this, the daughter of Saturn drove over endless oceans Trojans left by the Greeks and brute Achilles. Juno kept them far from Latium, forced by the fates to wander round the seas of the world, year in, year out. Such a long hard labour it was to found the Roman people. Now, with the ridge of Sicily barely out of sight, they spread sail for the open sea, their spirits buoyant, their bronze beaks churning the waves to foam as Juno, nursing deep in her heart the everlasting wound, said to herself, defeated, am I? Give up the fight? Powerless now to keep that Trojan king from Italy? Ah but of course, the fates bar my way. And yet Minerva could burn the fleet to ash and drown my Argive crews in the sea, and all for one, one mad crime of a single man, Arjax, son of Oileus. She hurled Jove's all-consuming bolt from the clouds, she shattered a fleet and whipped the swells with gales. And then as he gasped his last in flames from his riven chest she swept him up in a cyclone, impaled the man on a crag. But I who walk in majesty, I the queen of the gods, the sister and wife of Jove, I must wage a war, year after year, on just one race of men. Who will revere the power of Juno after this, lay gifts on my altar, lift his hands in prayer? With such anger seething inside her fiery heart the goddess reached Aeolia, breeding ground of storms, their home swarming with raging gusts from the south. Here in a vast cave King Airless rules the winds, brawling to break free, howling in full gale force as he chains them down in their dungeon, shackled fast. They bluster in protest, roaring round their prison bars with a mountain above them all, booming with their rage. But high in his stronghold Airless wields his scepter, soothing their passions, tempering their fury. Should he fail, surely they'd blow the world away, hurling the land and sea and deep sky through space. Fearing this, the Almighty Father banished the winds to that black cavern, piled above them a mountain mass and imposed on all a king empowered, by binding pact, to rein them back on command or let them gallop free. Now Juno made this plea to the Lord of Winds, Airless, the Father of Gods and King of Men gave you the power to calm the waves or rouse them with your gales. A race I loathe is crossing the Tuscan Sea, transporting Troy to Italy, bearing their conquered household gods, thrash your winds to fury, sink their warships, overwhelm them or break them apart, scatter their crews, drown them all. I happen to have some sea nymphs, fourteen beauties, Diapia the finest of all by far. I'll join you in lasting marriage, call her yours and for all her years to come she will live with you and make you the proud father of handsome children. Such service earns such gifts. Airless warmed to Juno's offer, yours is the task, my queen, to explore your heart's desires. Mine is the duty to follow your commands. Yes, thanks to you I rule this humble little kingdom of mine. You won me the scepter, Jupiter's favours too, and a couch to lounge on, set at the gods' feasts, you made me lord of the stormwind, king of cloudbursts. 
with such thanks, swinging his spear round he strikes home at the mountain's hollow flank and outcharge the winds through the breach he'd made, like armies on attack in a blasting whirlwind tearing through the earth. Down they crash on the sea, the east wind, south wind, all as one with the southwest squalls in hot pursuit, heaving up from the ocean depths huge killer-breakers rolling toward the beaches. The crews are shouting, cables screeching, suddenly cloud banks blotting out the sky, the light of day from the Trojan sight as pitch black night comes brooding down on the sea with thunder crashing pole to pole, bolt on bolt blazing across the heavens, death, everywhere men facing instant death. At once Aeneas, limbs limp in the chill of fear, groans and lifting both his palms toward the stars cries out, three, four times blessed, my comrades lucky to die beneath the soaring walls of Troy, before their parents' eyes. If only I'd gone down under your right hand, Diam's, strongest Greek afield, and poured out my life on the battlegrounds of Troy. Where raging Hector lies, pierced by Achilles' spear, where mighty Sarpedon lies, where the Simwa river swallows down and churns beneath its tides so many shields and helmets and corpses of the brave. Flinging cries as a screaming gust of the north wind pounds against his sail, raising waves sky high. The oars shatter, prow twists round, taking the breaker's broadside on and over Aeneas decks a mountain of water towers, massive, steep. Some men hang on billowing crests, some as the sea gapes, glimpse through the waves the bottom waiting, a surge a swirl with sand. Three ships the south wind grips and spins against those boulders lurking in mid-ocean, rocks the Italians call the altars, one great spine breaking the surface, three the east wind sweeps from open sea on the Surtees reefs, a grim sight, girding them round with walls of sand. One ship that carried the Lycian units led by staunch Orents, before Aeneas eyes a toppling summit of water strikes the stern and hurls the helmsman overboard, pitching him head first, twirling his ship three times, right on the spot till the ravenous whirlpool gulps her down. Here and there you can sight some sailors bobbing in heavy seas, strewn in the welter now the weapons, men, stray spars and treasures saved from Troy. Now Ilionia's sturdy ship, now brave Achates, now the galley that carried a bars, another, H. Elites, yes, the storm routes them all, down to the last craft the joints split, beams spring and the lethal flood pours in. All the while Neptune sends the furor above him, the roaring seas first and the storm breaking next, his standing waters boiling up from the seabed, churning back. And the mighty god, stirred to his depths, lifts his head from the crests and serene in power, gazing out over all his realm, he sees Aeneas' squadrons scattered across the ocean, Trojans overwhelmed by the surf and the wild crashing skies. Nor did he miss his sister Juno's cunning wrath at work. He summons the east and west wind, takes them to task, what insolence! Trusting so to your lofty birth? You winds, you dare make heaven and earth a chaos, raising such a riot of waves without my blessings. You, what I won't do! but first I had better set to rest the flood you ruffled so. Next time, trust me, you will pay for your crimes with more than just a scolding. Away with you, quick! And give your king this message, power over the sea and ruthless trident is mine, not his, it's mine by lot, by destiny. His place, east wind, is the rough rocks where you are all at home. Let him bluster there and play the king in his court, let Aeolus rule his bolted dungeon of the winds. Quicker than his command he calms the heaving seas, putting the clouds to rout and bringing back the sun. Struggling shoulder to shoulder, Triton and Simotho hoist and heave the ships from the jagged rocks as the god himself whisks them up with his trident, clearing a channel through the deadly reefs, his chariot skimming over the cresting waves on spinning wheels to set the seas to rest. Just as, all too often, some huge crowd is seized by a vast uprising, the rabble runs amok, all slaves to passion, rocks, firebrands flying. Rage finds them arms but then, if they chance to see a man among them, one whose devotion and public service lend him weight, they stand there, stock still with their ears alert as he rules their furor with his words and calms their passion. So the crash of the breakers all fell silent once their father, gazing over his realm under clear skies, flicks his horses, giving them free rein, and his eager chariot flies. Now bone-weary, Aeneas' shipmates make a run for the nearest landfall, wheeling prows around they turn for Libya's coast. There is a haven shaped by an island shielding the mouth of a long deep bay, its flanks breaking the force of comas pounding in from the sea while drawing them off into calm receding channels. Both sides of the harbour, rock cliffs tower, crowned by twin crags that menace the sky, overshadowing reaches of sheltered water, quiet and secure. Over them as a backdrop looms a quivering wood, above them rears a grove, bristling dark with shade, 
and fronting the cliff, a cave under hanging rocks with fresh water inside, seats cut in the native stone, the home of nymphs. Never a need of cables here to moor a weathered ship, no anchor with biting flukes to bind her fast. Aeneas puts in here with a bare seven warships saved from his whole fleet. How keen their longing for dry land underfoot as the Trojans disembark, taking hold of the earth, their last best hope, and fling their brine-racked bodies on the sand. Achates is first to strike a spark from flint, then works to keep it alive in dry leaves, cups it around with kindling, feeds it chips and briskly fans the tinder into flame. Then, spent as they were from all their toil, they set out food, the bounty of Ceres, drenched in sea salt, Ceres utensils too, her mills and troughs, and bent to parch with fire the grain they had salvaged, grind it fine on stones. While they see to their meal Aenea scales a crag, straining to scan the sea reach far and wide, is there any trace of Antheus now, tossed by the gales, or his warships banked with oars? Or Capis perhaps, or Caca stern adorned with shields? Not a ship in sight. But he does spot three stags roaming the shore, an entire herd behind them grazing down the glens in a long ranked line. He halts, grasps his bow and his flying arrows, the weapons his trusty aid Achates keeps at hand. First the leaders, antlers branching over their high heads, he brings them down, then turns on the herd, his shaft stampeding the rest like rabble into the leafy groves. Shaft on shaft, no stopping him till he stretches seven hefty carcasses on the ground, a triumph, one for each of his ships, and makes for the cove, divides the kill with his whole crew and then shares out the wine that good assests, princely man, had brimmed in their cask the day they left Sicilian shores. The commander's words relieve their stricken hearts, my comrades, hardly strangers to pain before now, we all have weathered worse. Some god will grant us an end to this as well. You've threaded the rocks resounding with Scylla's howling rabid dogs, and taken the brunt of the cyclops boulders, too. Call up your courage again. Dismiss your grief and fear. A joy it will be one day, perhaps, to remember even this. Through so many hard straits, so many twists and turns our course holds firm for Latium. Their fate holds out a homeland, calm, at peace. There the gods decree the kingdom of Troy will rise again. Bear up. Save your strength for better times to come. Brave words. Sick with mounting cares he assumes a look of hope and keeps his anguish buried in his heart. The men gird up for the game, the coming feast, they skin the hide from the ribs, lay bare the meat. Some cut it into quivering strips, impale it on skewers, some set cauldrons along the beach and fire them to the boil. Then they renew their strength with food, stretched out on the beach grass, fill themselves with seasoned wine and venison rich and crisp. Their hunger sated, the tables cleared away, they talk on for hours, asking after their missing shipmates, wavering now between hope and fear, what to believe about the rest. Were the men still alive or just in the last throes, forever lost to their comrades' far-flung calls? Aeneas most of all, devoted to his shipmates, deep within himself he moans for the losses, now for Orents, hardy soldier, now for Amicus, now for the brutal fate that Lycus may have met, then Gaius and brave Cloanthus, hearts of oak. Their morning was over now as Jove from high heaven, gazing down on the sea, the whitecaps winged with sails, the lands outspread, the coasts, the nations of the earth, paused at the zenith of the sky and set his sights on Libya, that proud kingdom. All at once, as he took to heart the struggles he beheld, Venus approached in rare sorrow, tears abrim in her sparkling eyes, and begged, O you who rule the lives of men and gods with your everlasting laws and your lightning bolt of terror, what crime could my Aeneas commit against you, what dire harm could the Trojans do that after bearing so many losses, this wide world is shut to them now? And all because of Italy. Surely from them the Romans would arise one day as the years roll on, and leaders would as well, descended from Teucer's blood brought back to life, to rule all lands and seas with boundless power, you promised. Father, what motive changed your mind? With that, at least, I consoled myself for Troy's demise, that heart-rending ruin, weighing fate against fate. But now after all my Trojans suffered, still the same disastrous fortune drives them on and on. What end, great king, do you set to their ordeals? Antinor could slip out from under the Greek siege, then make his passage through the Illyrian gulfs and, safe through the inlands where the Liburnians rule, he struggled past the Timavus river source. There, through its nine mouths as the mountain caves roar back, the river bursts out into full flood, a thundering surf that overpowers the fields. 
Reaching Italy, he erected a city for his people, a Trojan home called Padua, gave them a Trojan name, hung up their Trojan arms and there, after long wars, he lingers on in serene and settled peace. But we, your own children, the ones you swore would hold the battlements of heaven, now our ships are lost, appalling. We are abandoned, thanks to the rage of a single foe, cut off from Italy's shores. Is this our reward for reverence, this the way you give us back our throne? The father of men and gods, smiling down on her with the glance that clears the sky and calms the tempest, lightly kissing his daughter on the lips, replied, Relieve yourself of fear, my lady of Cythera, the fate of your children stands unchanged, I swear. You will see your promised city, see Lavinium's walls and bear your great-hearted Aeneas up to the stars on high. Nothing has changed my mind. No, your son, believe me, since anguish is gnawing at you, I will tell you more, unrolling the scroll of fate to reveal its darkest secrets. Aeneas will wage a long, costly war in Italy, crush defiant tribes and build high city walls for his people there and found the rule of law. Only three summers will see him govern Latium, three winters pass in barracks after the Latins have been broken. But his son Ascanius, now that he gains the name of Eulus, Eilus he was, while Ilium ruled on high, will fill out with his own reign thirty sovereign years, a giant cycle of months revolving round and round, transferring his rule from its old Lavinian home to raise up Alba Longa's mighty ramparts. There, in turn, for a full three hundred years the dynasty of Hector will hold sway till Ilia, a royal priestess great with the brood of Mars, will bear the god-twin sons. Then one, Romulus, reveling in the tawny pelt of a wolf that nursed him, will inherit the line and build the walls of Mars and after his own name, call his people Romans. On them I set no limits, space or time, I have granted them power, empire without end. Even furious Juno, now plaguing the land and sea and sky with terror, she will mend her ways and hold dear with me these Romans, lords of the earth, the race arrayed in togas. This is my pleasure, my decree. Indeed, an age will come, as the long years slip by, when a Saracus royal house will quell Achilles' homeland, brilliant Mycenae too, and enslave their people, rule defeated Argos. From that noble blood will arise a Trojan Caesar, his empire bound by the ocean, his glory by the stars, Julius, a name passed down from Eulus, his great forebear. And you, in years to come, will welcome him to the skies, you rest assured, laden with plunder of the east, and he with Aeneas will be invoked in prayer. Then will the violent centuries, battle set aside, grow gentle, kind. Vesta and silver-haired good faith and Romulus flanked by brother Remus will make the laws. The terrible gates of war with their welded iron bars will stand bolted shut, and locked inside, the frenzy of civil strife will crouch down on his savage weapons, hands pinioned behind his back with a hundred brazen shackles, monstrously roaring out from his bloody jaws. So he decrees and speeds the son of Maia down the sky to make the lands and the new stronghold, Carthage, open in welcome to the Trojans, not let Dido, unaware of fate, expel them from her borders. Down through the vast clear air flies Mercury, rowing his wings like oars and in a moment stands on Libya's shores, obeys commands and the will of God is done. The Carthaginians calm their fiery temper and Queen Dido, above all, takes to heart a spirit of peace and warm goodwill to meet the men of Troy. But Aeneas, duty-bound, his mind restless with worries all that night, reached a firm resolve as the fresh day broke. Out he goes to explore the strange terrain, what coast had the storm winds brought him to? Who lives here? All he sees is wild, untilled, what men, or what creatures? Then report the news to all his comrades. So, concealing his ships in the sheltered woody narrows overarched by rocks and screened around by trees and trembling shade, Aeneas moves out, with only Achates at his side, two steel-tipped javelins balanced in his grip. Suddenly, in the heart of the woods, his mother crossed his path. She looked like a young girl, a Spartan girl decked out in dress and gear or Thracian harpalice tiring out her mares, outracing the Hebrus River's rapid tides. Hung from a shoulder, a bow that fit her grip, a huntress for all the world, she'd let her curls go streaming free in the wind, her knees were bare, her flowing skirts hitched up with a tight knot. She speaks out first, you there, young soldiers, did you by any chance see one of my sisters? Which way did she go? Roaming the woods, a quiver slung from her belt, wearing a spotted lynx skin, or in full cry, hot on the track of some great frothing boar. So Venus asked and the son of Venus answered, Not one of your sisters have I seen or heard, but how should I greet a young girl like you? Your face, your features, hardly a mortal's looks and the tone of your voice is hardly human either. 
Oh, a goddess, without a doubt. What, are you Apollo's sister? Or one of the breed of nymphs? Be kind, whoever you are, relieve our troubled hearts. Under what skies and onto what coasts of the world have we been driven? Tell us, please. Castaways, we know nothing, not the people, not the place, lost, hurled here by the gales and heavy seas. Many a victim will fall before your altars, we'll slaughter them for you. But Venus replied, now there's an honor I really don't deserve. It's just the style for Tyrian girls to sport a quiver and high-laced hunting boots in crimson. What you see is a Punic kingdom, people of Tyre and Agenor's town, but the borders held by Libyans hard to break in war. Phoenician Dido is in command, she sailed from Tyre, in flight from her own brother. Oh it's a long tale of crime, long, twisting, dark, but I'll try to trace the high points in their order. Dido was married to Sicius, the richest man in Tyre, and she, poor girl, was consumed with love for him. Her father gave her away, wed for the first time, a virgin still, and these her first solemn rites. But her brother held power in Tyre, Pygmalion, a monster, the vilest man alive. A murderous feud broke out between both men. Pygmalion, catching Sicius off guard at the altar, slaughtered him in blood. That unholy man, so blind in his lust for gold he ran him through with a sword, then hid the crime for months, deaf to his sister's love, her heartbreak. Still he mocked her with wicked lies, with empty hopes. But she had a dream one night. The true ghost of her husband, not yet buried, came and lifting his face, ashen, awesome in death, showed her the cruel altar, the wounds that pierced his chest and exposed the secret horror that lurked within the house. He urged her on, take flight from our homeland, quick. And then he revealed an unknown ancient treasure, an untold weight of silver and gold, a comrade to speed her on her way. Driven by all this, Dido plans her escape, collects her followers fired by savage hate of the tyrant or bitter fear. They see some galleys set to sail, load them with gold, the wealth Pygmalion craved, and they bear it overseas and a woman leads them all. Reaching this haven here, where now you will see the steep ramparts rising, the new city of Carthage, the Tyrians purchased land as large as a bull's hide could enclose but cut in strips for size and called it Bursa, the hide, for the spread they bought. But you, who are you? What shores do you come from? Where are you headed now? He answered her questions, drawing a labored sigh from deep within his chest, Goddess, if I'd retrace our story to its start, if you had time to hear the saga of our ordeals, before I finished the evening star would close the gates of Olympus, put the day to sleep. From old Troy we come, Troy it's called, perhaps you've heard the name, sailing over the world seas until, by chance, some whim of the winds, some tempest drove us onto Libyan shores. I am Aeneas, duty-bound. I carry aboard my ships the gods of house and home we seized from enemy hands. My fame goes past the skies. I seek my homeland, Italy, born as I am from highest Jove. I launched out on the Phrygian sea with twenty ships, my goddess mother marking the way, and followed hard on the course the fates had charted. A mere seven, battered by wind and wave, survived the worst. I myself am a stranger, utterly at a loss, trekking over this wild Libyan wasteland, forced from Europe, Asia too, an exile, Venus could bear no more of his laments and broke in on his tale of endless hardship, whoever you are, I scarcely think the powers hate you, you enjoy the breath of life, you've reached a Tyrian city. So off you go now. Take this path to the Queen's gates. I have good news. Your friends are restored to you, your fleets reclaimed. The wind swerved from the north and drove them safe to port. True, unless my parents taught me to read the flight of birds for nothing. Look at those dozen swans triumphant in formation. The eagle of Jove had just swooped down on them all from heaven's heights and scattered them into open sky, but now you can see them flying trim in their long ranks, landing or looking down where their friends have landed, home, cavorting on ruffling wings and wheeling round the sky in convoy, trumpeting in their glory. So homeward bound, your ships and hardy shipmates anchor in port now or approach the harbour's mouth, full sail ahead. Now off you go, move on, wherever the path leads you, steer your steps. At that, as she turned away her neck shone with a rosy glow, her manerve hair gave off an ambrosial fragrance, her skirt flowed loose, rippling down to her feet and her stride alone revealed her as a goddess. He knew her at once, his mother, and called after her now as she sped away, why, you too, cruel as the rest. So often you ridicule your son with your disguises. 
Why can't we clasp hands, embrace each other, exchange some words, speak out, and tell the truth? Reproving her so, he makes his way toward town but Venus screens the travellers off with a dense mist, pouring round them a cloak of clouds with all her power, so no one could see them, no one reach and hold them, cause them to linger now or ask why they had come. But she herself, lifting into the air, wings her way toward Paphos, racing with joy to reach her home again where her temples stand and a hundred altars steam with Arabian incense, redolent with the scent of fresh-cut wreaths. Meanwhile the two men are hurrying on their way as the path leads, now climbing a steep hill arching over the city, looking down on the facing walls and high towers. Aeneas marvels at its mass, once a cluster of huts, he marvels at gates and bustling hum and cobbled streets. The Tyrians press on with the work, some are lining the walls, struggling to raise the citadel, trundling stones up slopes, some picking the building sites and plowing out their boundaries, others drafting laws, electing judges, a senate held in awe. Here they are dredging a harbour, there they lay foundations deep for a theatre, quarrying out of rock great columns to form a fitting scene for stages still to come. As hard at their tasks as bees in early summer, that work the blooming meadows under the sun, they escort a new brood out, young adults now, or press the oozing honey into the combs, the nectar brimming the bulging cells, or gather up the plunder workers haul back in, or close ranks like an army, driving the drones, that lazy crew, from home. The hive seeds with life, exhaling the scent of honey sweet with thyme. How lucky they are, Aeneas cries, gazing up at the city's heights, their walls are rising now. And on he goes, cloaked in cloud, remarkable, right in their midst he blends in with the crowds, and no one sees him. Now deep in the heart of Carthage stood a grove, lavish with shade, where the Tyrians, making landfall, still shaken by wind and breakers, first unearthed that sign, Queen Juno had led their way to the fiery stallion's head that signalled power in war and ease in life for ages. Here Dido of Tyre was building Juno a mighty temple, rich with gifts and the goddess aura of power. Bronze the threshold crowning a flight of stairs, the doorposts sheathed in bronze, and the bronze doors grown deep on their hinges. Here in this grove a strange sight met his eyes and calmed his fears for the first time. Here, for the first time, Aeneas dared to hope he had found some haven, for all his hard straits, to trust in better days. For awaiting the queen, beneath the great temple now, exploring its features one by one, amazed at it all, the city's splendor, the work of rival workers' hands and the vast scale of their labors, all at once he sees, spread out from first to last, the battles fought at Troy, the fame of the Trojan War now known throughout the world, Atreus' sons and Priam, Achilles, savage to both at once. Aeneas came to a halt and wept, and, oh, Achates, he cried, is there anywhere, any place on earth not filled with our ordeals? There's Priam, look. Even here, merit will have its true reward, even here, the world is a world of tears and the burdens of mortality touch the heart. Dismiss your fears. Trust me, this fame of ours will offer us some haven. So Aeneas says, feeding his spirit on empty, lifeless pictures, groaning low, the tears rivering down his face as he sees once more the fighters circling Troy. Here Greeks in flight, routed by Troy's young ranks, their Trojans routed by plumed Achilles in his chariot. Just in range are the snow-white canvas tents of Rhesus, he knows them at once, and sobs, Rhesus men betrayed in their first slumber, droves of them slaughtered by diams splattered with their blood, lashing back to the Greek camp their high-strung teams before they could ever savor the grass of Troy or drink at Xanthus banks. Next Aeneas sees Troilus in flight, his weapons flung aside, unlucky boy, no match for Achilles onslaught, horses haul him on, tangled behind an empty war car, flat on his back, clinging still to the reins, his neck and hair dragging along the ground, the butt of his javelin scrawling zigzags in the dust. And here the Trojan women are moving toward the temple of Pallas, their deadly foe, their hair unbound as they bear the robe, their offering, suppliants grieving, palms beating their breasts but Pallas turns away, staring at the ground. And Hector, three times Achilles has hauled him round the walls of Troy and now he's selling his lifeless body off for gold. Aeneas gives a groan, heaving up from his depths, he sees the plundered armor, the car, the corpse of his great friend, and Priam reaching out with helpless hands. He even sees himself swept up in the melee, clashing with Greek captains, sees the troops of the dawn and swarthy Memnon's arms. And Penthesilia leading her Amazons bearing half-moon shields, she blazes with battle fury out in front of her army, cinching a golden breastband under her bared breast, a girl, a warrior queen who dares to battle men. 
And now as Trojan Aeneas, gazing in awe at all the scenes of Troy, stood there, spellbound, eyes fixed on the war alone, the queen aglow with beauty approached the temple, Dido, with master escorts marching in her wake. Like Diana urging her dancing troops along the Eurotas banks or up Mount Synthus Ridge as a thousand mountain nymphs crowd in behind her, left and right, with quiver slung from her shoulder, taller than any other goddess as she goes striding on and silent Latona thrills with joy too deep for words. Like Dido now, striding triumphant among her people, spurring on the work of their kingdom still to come. And then by Juno's doors beneath the vaulted dome, flanked by an honor guard beside her lofty seat, the queen assumed her throne. Here as she handed down decrees and laws to her people, sharing labors fairly, some by lot, some with her sense of justice, Aeneas suddenly sees his men approaching through the crowds, Antheus, Segestus, gallant Cloanthus, other Trojans the black gales had battered over the seas and swept to far-flung coasts. Aeneas, Achates, both were amazed, both struck with joy and fear. They yearn to grasp their companions' hands in haste but both men are unnerved by the mystery of it all. So, cloaked in folds of mist, they hide their feelings, waiting, hoping to see what luck their friends have found. Where have they left their ships, what coast? Why have they come? These picked men, still marching in from the whole armada, pressing toward the temple amid the rising din to plead for some goodwill. Once they had entered, allowed to appeal before the queen, the eldest, Prince Ilioneus, calm, composed, spoke out, Your Majesty, empowered by Jove to found your new city here and curb rebellious tribes with your sense of justice, we poor Trojans, castaways, tossed by storms over all the seas, we beg you, keep the cursed fire off our ships. Pity us, God-fearing men. Look on us kindly, see the state we are in. We have not come to put your Libyan gods and homes to the sword, loot them and haul our plunder toward the beach. No, such pride, such violence has no place in the hearts of beaten men. There is a country, the Greeks called it Hesperia, land of the West, an ancient land, mighty in war and rich in soil. Enotrian settled it, now we hear their descendants call their kingdom Italy, after their leader, Italus. Italy bound we were when, surging with sudden breakers stormy Orion drove us against blind shoals and from the south came vicious gales to scatter us, whelmed by the sea, across the murderous surf and rocky barrier reefs. We few escaped and floated toward your coast. What kind of men are these? What land is this, that you can tolerate such barbaric ways? We are denied the sailors' right to shore, attacked, forbidden even a footing on your beach. If you have no use for humankind and mortal armor, at least respect the gods. They know right from wrong. They don't forget. We once had a king, Aeneas, none more just, none more devoted to duty, none more brave in arms. If fate has saved that man, if he still draws strength from the air we breathe, if he's not laid low, not yet with the heartless shades, fear not, nor will you once regret the first step you take to compete with him in kindness. We have cities too, in the land of Sicily, arms and a king, assests, born of Trojan blood. Permit us to haul our storm-racked ships ashore, trim new oars, hew timbers out of your woods, so that, if we are fated to sail for Italy, king and crews restored, to Italy, to Latium we will sail with buoyant hearts. But if we have lost our haven there, if Libyan waters hold you now, my captain, best of the men of Troy, and all our hopes for Eulus have been dashed, at least we can cross back over Sicilian seas, the straits we came from, homes ready and waiting, and seek out great assests for our king. So Ilioneus closed. And with one accord the Trojans murmured yes. Her eyes lowered, Dido replies with a few choice words of welcome, cast fear to the winds, Trojans, free your minds. Our kingdom is new. Our hard straits have forced me to set defenses, station guards along our far frontiers. Who has not heard of Aeneas' people, his city, Troy, her men, her heroes, the flames of that horrendous war? We are not so dull of mind, we Carthaginians here. When he yokes his team, the sun shines down on us as well. Whatever you choose, great Hesperia, Saturn's fields, or the shores of Eryx with assests as your king, I will provide safe passage, escorts and support to speed you on your way. Or would you rather settle here in my realm on equal terms with me? This city I build, it's yours. Haul ships to shore. Trojans, Tyrians, they will be all the same to me. If only the storm that drove you drove your king and Aeneas were here now. Indeed, I'll send out trusty men to scour the coast of Libya far and wide. Perhaps he's shipwrecked, lost in woods or towns. 
Spirits lifting at Dido's welcome, brave Achates and Captain Aeneas had long chafed to break free of the mist, and now Achates spurs Aeneas on, son of Venus, what feelings are rising in you now? You see the coast is clear, our ships and friends restored. Just one is lost. We saw him drown at sea ourselves. All else is just as your mother promised. He barely ended when all at once the mist around them parted, melting into the open air, and there Aeneas stood, clear in the light of day, his head, his shoulders, the man was like a god. His own mother had breathed her beauty on her son, a gloss on his flowing hair, and the ruddy glow of youth, and radiant joy shone in his eyes. His beauty fine as a craftsman's hand can add to ivory, or a glow a silver or pie in marble ringed in glinting gold. Suddenly, surprising all, he tells the queen, here I am before you, the man you are looking for. Aeneas the Trojan, plucked from Libya's heavy seas. You alone have pitted the long ordeals of Troy, unspeakable, and here you would share your city and your home with us, this remnant left by the Greeks. We who have drunk deep of each and every disaster land and sea can offer. Stripped of everything, now it's past our power to reward you gift for gift, Dido, there's as well, whoever may survive of the Dardan people still, strewn over the wide world now. But may the gods, if there are powers who still respect the good and true, if justice still exists on the face of the earth, may they and their own sense of right and wrong bring you your just rewards. What age has been so blessed to give you birth? What noble parents produced so fine a daughter? So long as rivers run to the sea, so long as shadows travel the mountain slopes and the stars range the skies, your honor, your name, your praise will live forever, whatever lands may call me to their shores. With that, he extends his right hand toward his friend Ilioneus, greeting Serestus with his left, and then the others, gallant Gaius, gallant Cloanthus. Tyrion Dido marveled, first at the sight of him, next at all he'd suffered, then she said aloud, born of a goddess, even so what destiny hunts you down through such ordeals? What violence lands you on this frightful coast? Are you that Aeneas whom loving Venus bore to Dardan Anchises on the Simois banks at Troy? Well I remember. Teusa came to Sidon once, banished from native ground, searching for new realms, and my father Belus helped him. Belus had sacked Cyprus, plundered that rich island, ruled with a victor's hand. From that day on I have known of Troy's disaster, known your name, and all the kings of Greece. Teusa, your enemy, often sang Troy's praises, claiming his own descent from Teusa's ancient stock. So come, young soldiers, welcome to our house. My destiny, harrying me with trials hard as yours, led me as well, at last, to anchor in this land. Schooled in suffering, now I learn to comfort those who suffer too. With that greeting she leads Aeneas into the royal halls, announcing offerings in the gods' high temples as she goes. Not forgetting to send his shipmates on the beaches twenty bulls and a hundred huge, bristling razorbacks and a hundred fatted lambs together with their mothers, gifts to make this day a day of joy. Within the palace all is decked with adornments, lavish, regal splendor. In the central hall they are setting out a banquet, draping the gorgeous purple, intricately worked, heaping the board with grand displays of silver and gold engraved with her father's valiant deeds, a long, unending series of captains and commands, traced through a line of heroes since her country's birth. Aeneas, a father's love would give the man no rest, quickly sends Achates down to the ships to take the news to Ascanius, bring him back to Carthage. All his paternal care is focused on his son. He tells Achates to fetch some gifts as well, plucked from the ruins of Troy, a gown stiff with figures stitched in gold, and a woven veil with yellow sprays of acanthus round the border. Helen's glory, gifts she carried out of Mycenae, fleeing Argos for Troy to seal her wicked marriage, the marvellous handiwork of Helen's mother, Leda. Aeneas adds the scepter Ilion used to bear, the eldest daughter of Priam, a necklace too, strung with pearls, and a crown of double bands, one studded with gems, the other, gold. Achates, following orders, hurries toward the ships. But now Venus is mulling over some new schemes, new intrigues. Altered in face and figure, Cupid would go in place of the captivating Ascanius, using his gifts to fire the queen to madness, weaving a lover's order through her bones. No doubt Venus fears that treacherous house and the Tyrians' forked tongues, and brutal Juno inflames her anguish too and her cares keep coming back as night draws on. So Venus makes an appeal to love, her winged son, you, my son, are my strength, my greatest power, you alone, my son, can scoff at the lightning bolts the high and mighty father hurled against Typhaeus. Help me, I beg you. I need all your immortal force. 
Your brother Aeneas is tossed round every coast on earth, thanks to Juno's ruthless hatred, as you well know, and time and again you've grieved to see my grief. But now Phoenician Dido has him in her clutches, holding him back with smooth, seductive words, and I fear the outcome of Juno's welcome here. She won't sit tight while fate is turning on its hinge. So I plan to forestall her with ruses of my own and besiege the queen with flames, and no goddess will change her mood, she's mine, my ally in arms in my great love for Aeneas. Now how can you go about this? Hear my plan. His dear father has just sent for the young prince, he means the world to me, and he's bound for Carthage now, bearing presents saved from the sea, the flames of Troy. I'll lull him into a deep sleep and hide him far away on Cythera's heights or High Idalium, my shrines, so he cannot learn of my trap or spring it open while it's being set. And you with your cunning, forge his appearance, just one night, no more, put on the familiar features of the boy, boy that you are, so when the wine flows free at the royal board and Dido, lost in joy, cradles you in her lap, caressing, kissing you gently, you can breathe your secret fire into her, poison the queen and she will never know. Cupid leaps at once to his loving mother's orders. Shedding his wings he masquerades as Eulus, prancing with his stride. But now Venus distills a deep, soothing sleep into Eulus' limbs, and warming him in her breast the goddess spirits him off to her high Idalian grove where beds of marjoram breathe and embrace him with aromatic flowers and rustling shade. Now Cupid is on the move, under her orders, bringing the Tyrians' royal gifts, his spirits high as Achates leads him on. Arriving, he finds the queen already poised on a golden throne beneath the sumptuous hangings, commanding the very center of her palace. Now Aeneas, the good captain, enters, then the Trojan soldiers, taking their seats on couches draped in purple. Servants pour them water to rinse their hands, quickly serving them bread from baskets, spreading their laps with linens, napkins clipped and smooth. In the kitchens are fifty serving maids assigned to lay out foods in a long line, course by course, and honor the household gods by building fires high. A hundred other maids and a hundred men, all matched in age, are spreading the feast on trestles, setting out the cups. And Tyrians join them, bustling through the doors, filling the hall with joy, to take invited seats on brocaded couches. They admire Aeneas' gifts, admire Eulus now, the glowing face of the god and the god's dissembling words, and Helen's gown and the veil adorned with a yellow acanthus border. But above all, tragic Dido, doomed to a plague about to strike, cannot feast her eyes enough, thrilled both by the boy and gifts he brings and the more she looks the more the fire grows. But once his embraced Aeneas, clung to his neck to sate the deep love of his father, deluded father, Cupid makes for the queen. Her gaze, her whole heart is riveted on him now, and at times she even warms him snugly in her breast, for how can she know, poor Dido, what a mighty god is sinking into her, to her grief? But he, recalling the wishes of his mother Venus, blots out the memory of Sicius bit by bit, trying to seize with a fresh, living lover heart at rest for long, long numb to passion. Then, with the first lull in the feast, the tables cleared away, they set out massive bowls and crown the wine with wreaths. A vast din swells in the palace, voices reverberating through the echoing halls. They light the lamps, hung from the corford ceiling sheathed in gilt, and blazing torches burn the night away. The queen calls for a heavy golden bowl, studded with jewels and brimmed with unmixed wine, the bowl that Bellus and all of Bella's sons had brimmed, and the hall falls hushed as Dido lifts a prayer, Jupiter, you, they say, are the god who grants the laws of host and guest. May this day be one of joy for Tyrians here and exiles come from Troy, a day our sons will long remember. Bacchus, giver of bliss, and Juno, generous Juno, bless us now. And come, my people, celebrate with all good will this feast that makes us one. With that prayer, she poured a libation to the gods, tipping wine on the board, and tipping it, she was first to take the bowl, brushing it lightly with her lips, then gave it to Bishas, laughing, goading him on and he took the plunge, draining the foaming bowl, drenching himself in its brimming, overflowing gold, and the other princes drank in turn. Then Iopas, long-haired bard, strikes up his golden lyre resounding through the halls. Giant Atlas had been his teacher once, and now he sings the wandering moon and the boring sun eclipsed, the roots of the human race and the wild beasts, the source of storms and the lightning bolts on high, Arcturus, the rainy Hyades and the great and little bears, and why the winter suns so rush to bathe themselves in the sea and what slows down the nights to a long lingering crawl. And time and again the Tyrians burst into applause and the Trojans took their lead. 
So Dido, doomed, was lengthening out the night by trading tales as she drank long draughts of love, asking Aeneas question on question, now about Priam, now Hector, what armor Memnon, son of the morning, wore at Troy, how swift were the horses of Diams? How strong was Achilles? Wait, come, my guest, she urges, tell us your own story, start to finish, the ambush laid by the Greeks, the pain your people suffered, the wanderings you have faced. For now is the seventh summer that has borne you wandering all the lands and seas on earth. Book 2. The Final Hours of Troy. Silence. All fell hushed, their eyes fixed on Aeneas now as the founder of his people, high on a seat of honor, set out on his story, sorrow, unspeakable sorrow, my queen, you ask me to bring to life once more, how the Greeks uprooted Troy in all her power, our kingdom mourned forever. What horrors I saw, a tragedy where I played a leading role myself. Who could tell such things, not even a Myrmidon, a Dilopian, or comrade of iron-hearted Ulysses, and still refrain from tears? And now, too, the dank night is sweeping down from the sky and the setting stars incline our heads to sleep. But if you long so deeply to know what we went through, to hear, in brief, the last great agony of Troy, much as I shudder at the memory of it all, I shrank back in grief, I'll try to tell it now. Ground down by the war and driven back by fate, the Greek captains had watched the year slip by until, helped by Minerva's superhuman skill, they built that mammoth horse, immense as a mountain, lining its ribs with ship timbers hewn from pine. An offering to secure safe passage home, or so they pretend, and the story spreads through Troy. But they pick by lot the best, most able bodied men and stealthily lock them into the horse's dark flanks till the vast hold of the monster's womb is packed with soldiers' bristling weapons. Just in sight of Troy, an island rises, Tenedos, famed in the old songs, powerful, rich, while Priam's realm stood fast. Now it's only a bay, a treacherous cove for ships. Well there they sail, hiding out on its lonely coast while we thought, gone. Sped home on the winds to Greece. So all Troy breathes free, relieved of her endless sorrow. We fling open the gates and stream out, elated to see the Greeks' abandoned camp, the deserted beachhead. Here the Dilopians formed ranks, here savage Achilles pitched his tents, over there the armada moored and here the familiar killing fields of battle. Some gaze wonderstruck at the gift for Pallas, the virgin never wed, transfixed by the horse, its looming mass, our doom. Thymoetes leads the way. Drag it inside the walls, he urges, plant it high on the city heights. Inspired by treachery now or the fate of Troy was moving toward this end. But Capis with other saner heads who take his side, suspecting a trap in any gift the Greeks might offer, tells us, fling it into the sea or torch the thing to ash or bore into the depths of its womb where men can hide. The common people are split into warring factions. But now, out in the lead with a troop of comrades, down Laocoon runs from the heights in full fury, calling out from a distance, poor doomed fools, have you gone mad, you Trojans? You really believe the enemy sailed away? or any gift of the Greeks is free of guile. Is that how well you know Ulysses? Trust me, either the Greeks are hiding, shut inside those beams, or the horses are battle engine geared to breach our walls, spy on our homes, come down on our city, overwhelm us, or some other deceptions lurking deep inside it. Trojans, never trust that horse. Whatever it is, I fear the Greeks, especially bearing gifts. In that spirit, with all his might he hurled a huge spear straight into the monster's flanks, the mortis timberwork of its swollen belly. Quivering, there it stuck, and the stricken wound came booming back from its depths with echoing groans. If fate and our own wits had not gone against us, surely Laocoon would have driven us on, now, to rip the Greek lair open with iron spears and Troy would still be standing, proud fortress of Priam, you would tower still. Suddenly, in the thick of it all, a young soldier, hands shackled behind his back, with much shouting Trojan shepherds were hailing him toward the king. They'd come on the man by chance, a total stranger. He'd given himself up, with one goal in mind, to open Troy to the Greeks and lay her waste. He trusted to courage, nerved for either end, to weave his lies or face his certain death. Young Trojan recruits, keen to have a look, came scurrying up from all sides, crowding round, outdoing each other to make a mockery of the captive. Now, hear the treachery of the Greeks and learn from a single crime the nature of the beast. Haggard, helpless, there in our midst he stood, all eyes riveted on him now, and turning a wary glance at the lines of Trojan troops he groaned and spoke, where can I find some refuge, where on land, on sea? What's left for me now? 
a man of so much misery. Nothing among the Greeks, no place at all. And worse, I see my Trojan enemies crying for my blood. His groans convince us, cutting all our show of violence short. We press him, tell us where you were born, your family. What news do you bring? Tell us what you trust to, such a willing captive. All of it, my king, I'll tell you, come what may, the whole true story. Greek I am, I don't deny it. No, that first. Fortune may have made me a man of misery but, wicked as she is, she can't make sign in a lying fraud as well. Now, perhaps you've caught some rumor of Palamedes, Bellison, and his shining fame that rings in song. The Greeks charge him with treason, a trumped-up charge, an innocent man, and just because he opposed the war they put him to death, but once he's robbed of the light, they mourn him sorely. Now I was his blood kin, a youngster when my father, a poor man, sent me off to the war at Troy as Palamedes' comrade. Long as he kept his royal status, holding forth in the councils of the kings, I had some standing too, some pride of place. But once he left the land of the living, thanks to the jealous, forked tongue of our Ulysses, you're no stranger to his story, I was shattered, I dragged out my life in the shadows, grieving, seething alone, in silence. Outraged by my innocent friend's demise until I burst out like a madman, swore if I ever returned in triumph to our native Argos, ever got the chance I'd take revenge, and my oath provoked a storm of hatred. That was my first step on the slippery road to ruin. From then on, Ulysses kept tormenting me, pressing charge on charge, from then on, he brooded about his two-edged rumors among the rank and file. Driven by guilt, he looked for ways to kill me, he never rested until, making cultures his henchmen, but why now? Why go over that unforgiving ground again? Why waste words? If you think all Greeks are one, if hearing the name Greek is enough for you, it's high time you made me pay the price. How that would please the man of Ithaca, how the sons of Atreus would repay you. Now, of course, we burn to question him, urge him to explain, blind to how false the cunning Greeks could be. All a tremble, he carries on with his tale, lying from the cockles of his heart, time and again the Greeks had yearned to abandon Troy, bone-tired from a long hard war, to put it far behind and beat a clean retreat. Would to God they had. But time and again, as they were setting sail, the heavy seas would keep them confined to port and the south wind filled their hearts with dread and worst of all, once this horse, this mass of timber with locking planks, stood stationed here at last, the thunderheads rumbled up and down the sky. So, at our wit's end, we send Eurypolis off to question Apollo's oracle now, and back he comes from the god's shrine with these bleak words, with blood you appeased the winds, with a virgin sacrifice when you, you Greeks, first sought the shores of Troy. With blood you must seek fair winds to sail you home, must sacrifice one more Greek life in return. As the word spread, the ranks were struck dumb and icy fear sent shivers down their spines. Whom did the god demand? Who'd meet his doom? Just that moment the Ithacan hailed the prophet, Calchas, into our midst, he twisted out of him, what was the god's will? The army rose in uproar. Even then our soldiers sensed that I was the one, the target of that Ulysses' vicious schemes, they saw it coming, still they held their tongues. For ten days the seer, silent, closed off in his tent, refused to say a word or betray a man to death. But at last, goaded on by Ulysses' mounting threats but in fact conniving in their plot, he breaks his silence and dooms me to the altar. And the army gave consent. The death that each man dreaded turned to the fate of one poor soul, a burden they could bear. The day of infamy soon came, the sacred rites were all performed for the victim, the salted meal strewn, the bands tied round my head. But I broke free of death, I tell you, burst my shackles, yes, and hid all night in the reeds of a marshy lake, waiting for them to sail, if only they would sail. Well, no hope now of seeing the land where I was born or my sweet children, the father I longed for all these years. Maybe they'll wring from them the price for my escape, avenge my guilt with my loved one's blood, poor things. I beg you, king, by the powers who know the truth, by any trust still uncorrupt in the world of men, pity a man whose torment knows no bounds. Pity me in my pain. I know in my soul I don't deserve to suffer. He wept and won his life, our pity, too. Priam takes command, has him freed from the ropes and chains that bind him fast, and hails him warmly, whoever you are, from now on, now you've lost the Greeks, put them out of your mind and you'll be one of us. But answer my questions. Tell me the whole truth. Why did they raise up this giant, monstrous horse? Who conceived it? 
What's it for? Its purpose? A gift to the gods? A great engine of battle? He broke off. Sinon, adept at deceit, with all his Greek cunning lifted his hands, just freed from their fetters, up to the stars and prayed, Bear witness, you eternal fires of the sky and you inviolate will of the gods. Bear witness, altar and those infernal knives that I escaped and the sacred bands I wore myself, the victim. It's right to break my sworn oath to the Greeks, it's right to detest those men and bring to light all they are hiding now. No laws of my native land can bind me here. Just keep your promise, Troy, and if I can save you, you must save me too, if I reveal the truth and pay you back in full. All the hopes of the Greeks, their firm faith in a war they'd launched themselves had always hinged on Pallas Athena's help. But from the moment that godless Diams, flanked by Ulysses, the mastermind of crime, attacked and tore the fateful image of Pallas out of her own hallowed shrine, and cut down the sentries ringing your city heights and seized that holy image and even dared touch the sacred bands on the virgin goddess head with hands reeking blood, from that hour on, the high hopes of the Greeks had trickled away like a slow, ebbing tide. They were broken, beaten men, the will of the goddess dead set against them. Omens of this she gave in no uncertain terms. They'd hardly stood her image up in the Greek camp when flickering fire shot from its glaring eyes and salt sweat ran glistening down its limbs and three times the goddess herself, a marvel, blazed forth from the ground, shield clashing, spear brandished. The prophet spurs them at once to risk escape by sea, you cannot root out Troy with your Greek spears unless you seek new omens in Greece and bring the god back here, the image they'd borne across the sea in their curved ships. So now they've sailed away on the wind for home shores, just to rearm, recruit their gods as allies yet again, then measure back their course on the high seas and back they'll come to attack you all off guard. So Calchas read the omens. At his command they raised this horse, this effigy, all to atone for the violated image of Pallas, her wounded pride, her power, and expiate the outrage they had done. But he made them do the work on a grand scale, a tremendous mass of interlocking timbers towering toward the sky, so the horse could not be trundled through your gates or hauled inside your walls or guard your people if they revered it well in the old, ancient way. For if your hands should violate this great offering to Minerva, a total disaster, if only God would turn it against the seer himself, will wheel down on Priam's empire, Troy, and all your futures. But if your hands will rear it up, into your city, then all Asia in arms can invade Greece, can launch an all-out war right up to the walls of Pelops. That's the doom that awaits our son's sons. Trapped by his craft, that cunning liar Sinon, we believed his story. His tears, his treachery seized the men whom neither Tydia's son nor Achilles could defeat, nor ten long years of war, nor all the thousand ships. But a new portent strikes our doomed people now, a greater omen, far more terrible, fatal, shakes our senses, blind to what was coming. Laocoon, the priest of Neptune picked by Lot, was sacrificing a massive bull at the holy altar when, I cringe to recall it now, look there. Over the calm deep straits off Tenedo swim twin, giant serpents, rearing in coils, breasting the sea swell side by side, plunging toward the shore, their heads, their blood-red crests surging over the waves, their bodies thrashing, backs rolling in coil on mammoth coil and the wake behind them churns in a roar of foaming spray, and now, their eyes glittering, shot with blood and fire, flickering tongues licking their hissing moors, yes, now they are about to land. We blanch at the sight, we scatter. Like troops on attack they are heading straight for Laocoon, first each serpent seizes one of his small young sons, constricting, twisting around him, sinks its fangs in the tortured limbs, and gorges. Next Laocoon rushing quick to the rescue, clutching his sword, they trap him, bind him in huge muscular whirls, their scaly backs lashing around his midriff twice and twice around his throat, their heads, their flaring necks mounting over their victim writhing still, his hands frantic to wrench apart their knotted trunks, his priestly band splattered in filth, black venom and all the while his horrible screaming fills the skies, bellowing like some wounded bull struggling to shrug loose from his neck an axe that struck awry, to lumber clear of the altar. Only the twin snakes escape, sliding off and away to the heights of Troy where the ruthless goddess holds her shrine, and there at her feet they hide, vanishing under Minerva's great round shield. At once, I tell you, a stranger fear runs through the harrowed crowd. Laocoon deserved to pay for his outrage, so they say, he desecrated the sacred timbers of the horse, he hurled his wicked lance at the beast's back. Haul Minerva's effigy up to her house, we shout, offer up our prayers to the power of the goddess. We breach our own ramparts, fling our defenses open, all pitch into the work. 
smooth running rollers we will beneath its hoofs, and heavy hempen ropes we bind around its neck, and teeming with men-at-arms the huge deadly engine climbs our city walls. And round it boys and unwed girls sing hymns, thrilled to lay a hand on the dangling ropes as on and on it comes, gliding into the city, looming high over the city's heart. O oh my country! Troy, home of the gods! You great walls of the Dardans long renowned in war! Four times it lurched to a halt at the very brink of the gates, four times the armor clashed out from its womb. But we, we forge ahead, oblivious, blind, insane, we stationed the monster fraught with doom on the hallowed heights of Troy. Even now Cassandra revealed the future, opening lips the gods had ruled no Trojan would believe. And we, poor fools, on this, our last day, we deck the shrines of the gods with green holiday garlands all throughout the city. But all the while the skies keep wheeling on and night comes sweeping in from the ocean stream, in its mammoth shadow swallowing up the earth, and the pole star, and the treachery of the Greeks. Dead quiet. The Trojans slept on, strewn throughout their fortress, weary bodies embraced by slumber. But the Greek armada was underway now, crossing over from Tenedos, ships in battle formation under the moon's quiet light, their silent ally, homing in on the berths they know by heart, when the king's flagship sends up a signal flare, the cue for Sinon, saved by the fate's unjust decree, and stealthily loosing the pine bolts of the horse, he unleashes the Greeks shut up inside its womb. The horse stands open wide, fighters in high spirits pouring out of its timbered cavern into the fresh air, the chiefs, Thysandrus, Sthenelus, ruthless Ulysses rappelling down a rope they dropped from its side, and Achamas, Thoas, Neoptolemus, son of Achilles, Captain Machaon, Menelaus, Epius himself, the man who built that masterpiece of fraud. They steal on a city buried deep in sleep and wine, they butcher the guards, fling wide the gates and hug their cohorts poised to combine forces. Plot complete. This was the hour when rest, that gift of the gods most heaven sent, first comes to beleaguered mortals, creeping over us now, when there, look, I dreamed I saw Prince Hector before my eyes, my comrade haggard with sorrow, streaming tears, just as he once was, when dragged behind the chariot, black with blood and grime, thongs piercing his swollen feet, what a harrowing sight. What a far cry from the old Hector home from battle, decked in Achilles' arms, his trophies, or fresh from pitching Trojan fire at the Greek ships. His beard matted now, his hair clotted with blood, bearing the wounds, so many wounds he suffered fighting round his native city's walls. I dreamed I addressed him first, in tears myself I forced my voice from the depths of all my grief, O light of the Trojans, last, best hope of Troy. What's held you back so long? How long we've waited, Hector, for you to come, and now from what far shores? How glad we are to see you, we battle-weary men, after so many deaths, your people dead and gone, after your citizens, your city felt such pain. But what outrage has mutilated your face so clear and cloudless once? Why these wounds? Wasting no words, no time on empty questions, heaving a deep groan from his heart he calls out, Escape, son of the goddess, tear yourself from the flames. The enemy holds our walls. Troy is toppling from her heights. You have paid your debt to our king and native land. If one strong arm could have saved Troy, my arm would have saved the city. Now, into your hands she entrusts her holy things, her household gods. Take them with you as comrades in your fortunes. Seek a city for them, once you have roved the seas, erect great walls at last to house the gods of Troy. Urging so, with his own hands he carries Vesta forth from her inner shrine, her image clad in ribbons, filled with her power, her everlasting fire. But now, chaos, the city begins to reel with cries of grief, louder, stronger, even though father's palace stood well back, screened off by trees, but still the clash of arms rings clearer, horror on the attack. I shake off sleep and scrambling up to the pitched roof I stand there, ears alert, and I hear a roar like fire assaulting a wheat field, whipped by a south wind's fury, or mountain torrent in full spate, flattening crops, leveling all the happy, thriving labor of oxen, dragging whole trees headlong down in its wake, and a shepherd perched on a sheer rock outcrop hears the roar, lost in amazement, struck dumb. No doubting the good faith of the Greeks now, their treachery plain as day. Already, there, the grand house of Daphobus stormed by fire, crashing in ruins, already his neighbor Eucalagon up in flames, the Sigeon straight shimmering back the blaze, the shouting of fighters soars, the clashing blare of trumpets. Out of my wits, I seize my arms, what reason for arms? 
Just my spirit burning to muster troops for battle, rush with comrades up to the city's heights, fury and rage driving me breakneck on as it races through my mind what a noble thing it is to die in arms. But now, look, just slipped out from under the Greek barrage of spears, Panthus, Arthri's son, a priest of Apollo's shrine on the citadel, hands full of the holy things, the images of our conquered gods, his dragging along his little grandson, making a wild dash for our doors. Panthus, where's our stronghold? Our last stand? Words still on my lips as he groans in answer, the last day has come for the Trojan people, no escaping this moment. Troy's no more. Ilium, gone, our awesome Trojan glory. Brutal Jupiter hands it all over to Greece, Greeks are lording over our city up in flames. The horse stands towering high in the heart of Troy, disgorging its armed men, with Sinon in his glory, gloating over us, Sinon fans the fires. The immense double gates are flung wide open, Greeks in their thousands mass there, all who ever sailed from proud Mycenae. Others have choked the cramped streets, weapons brandished now in a battle line of naked, glinting steel tents for the kill. Only the first guards at the gates put up some show of resistance, fighting blindly on. Spurred by Panther's words and the gods' will, into the blaze I dive, into the fray, wherever the din of combat breaks and war cries fill the sky, wherever the battle fury drives me on and now I'm joined by Ripius, Epitus mighty in armor, rearing up in the moonlight, Hypanes comes to my side, and Dimas too, flanked by the young Coroebus, Migdon's son. Late in the day he chanced to come to Troy incensed with a mad, burning love for Cassandra, son-in-law to our king, he would rescue Troy. Poor man, if only he'd marked his bride's inspired ravings. Seeing their close-packed ranks, hot for battle, I spur them on their way, men, brave hearts, though bravery cannot save us, if you're bent on following me and risking all to face the worst, look around you, see how our chances stand. The gods who shored our empire up have left us, all have deserted their altars and their shrines. You race to defend a city already lost in flames. But let us die, go plunging into the thick of battle. One hope saves the defeated, they know they can't be saved. That fired their hearts with the fury of despair. Now like a wolf pack out for blood on a foggy night, driven blindly on by relentless, rabid hunger, leaving cubs behind, waiting, jaws parched, so through spears, through enemy ranks we plow to certain death, striking into the city's heart, the shielding wings of the darkness beating round us. Who has words to capture that night's disaster, tell that slaughter? What tears could match our torments now? An ancient city is falling, a power that ruled for ages, now in ruins. Everywhere lie the motionless bodies of the dead, strewn in her streets, her homes and the god's shrines we held in awe. And not only Trojans pay the price in blood, at times the courage races back in their conquered hearts and they cut their enemies down in all their triumph. Everywhere, wrenching grief, everywhere, terror and a thousand shapes of death. And the first Greek to cross our path? Androgios leading a horde of troops and taking us for allies on the march, the fool, he even gives us a warm salute and calls out, hurry up, men. Why holding back, why now, why drag your heels? Troy's up in flames, the rest are looting, sacking the city heights. But you, have you just come from the tall ships? Suddenly, getting no password he can trust, he sensed he'd stumbled into enemy ranks. Stunned, he recoiled, swallowing back his words like a man who threads his way through prickly brambles, pressing his full weight on the ground, and blindly treads on a lurking snake and back he shrinks in instant fear as it rears in anger, puffs its blue-black neck. Just so Androgios, seeing us, cringes with fear, recoiling, struggling to flee but we attack, flinging a ring of steel around his cohorts, panic takes the Greeks unsure of their ground and we cut them all to pieces. Fortune fills our sails in that first clash and Coroebus, flushed, fired with such success, exults, comrades, wherever fortune points the way, wherever the first road to safety leads, let soldier on. Exchange shields with the Greeks and wear their emblems. Call it cunning or courage, who would ask in war? Our enemies will arm us to the hilt. With that he dons Androgio's crested helmet, his handsome blazoned shield and straps a Greek sword to his hip, and comrades, spirits rising, take his lead. Ripius, Dimas too and our corps of young recruits, each fighter arms himself in the loot that he just seized and on we forge, blending in with the enemy, battling time and again under strange gods, fighting hand to hand in the blind dark and many Greeks we send to the king of death. Some scatter back to their ships, making a run for shore and safety. 
Others disgrace themselves, so panicked they clamber back inside the monstrous horse, burying into the womb they know so well. But, oh how wrong to rely on God's dead set against you. Watch, the virgin daughter of Priam, Cassandra, torn from the sacred depths of Minerva's shrine, dragged by the hair, raising her burning eyes to the heavens, just her eyes, so helpless, shackles kept her from raising her gentle hands. Coroebus could not bear the sight of it, mad with rage he flung himself at the Greek lines and met his death. Closing ranks we charge after him, into the thick of battle and face our first disaster. Down from the temple roof come showers of lances hurled by our own comrades there, duped by the look of our Greek arms, our Greek crests that launch this grisly slaughter. And worse still, the Greeks roaring with anger, we had saved Cassandra, attack us from all sides. Ajax, fiercest of all and Atreus' two sons and the whole Dolopian army, wild as a rampaging whirlwind, gusts clashing, the west, and the south, an east wind riding high on the rushing horses of the dawn, and the woods howl and Nereus, thrashing his savage trident, churns up the sea exploding in foam from its rocky depths. And those Greeks we had put to rout, our ruse in the murky night stampeding them headlong on throughout the city, back they come, the first to see that our shields and spears are naked lies, to mark the words on our lips that jar with theirs. In a flash, superior numbers overwhelm us. Coroebus is first to go, cut down by Penelius' right hand he sprawls at Minerva's shrine, the goddess, power of armies. Ripius falls too, the most righteous man in Troy, the most devoted to justice, true, but the gods had other plans. Hypanes, Dimas die as well, run through by their own men, and you, Pandas, not all your piety, all the sacred bands you wore as Apollo's priest could save you as you fell. Ashes of Ilium, last flames that engulfed my world, I swear by you that in your last hour I never shrank from the Greek spears, from any startling hazard of war, if fate had struck me down, my sword arm earned it all. Now we are swept away, Iphitus, Peleus with me, one way down with age and the other slowed by a wound Ulysses gave him, heading straight for Priam's palace, driven there by the outcries. And there, I tell you, a pitched battle flares. You'd think no other battles could match its fury, nowhere else in the city were people dying so. Invincible Mars rears up to meet us face to face with waves of Greeks assaulting the roofs, we see them choking the gateway, under a tortoiseshell of shields, and the scaling ladders cling to the steep ramparts, just at the gates the raiders scramble up the rungs, shields on their left arms thrust out for defense, their right hands clutching the gables. Over against them, Trojans ripping the tiles and turrets from all their roofs, the end is near, they can see it now, at the brink of death, desperate for weapons, some defense, and these, these missiles they send reeling down on the Greeks' heads, the gilded beams, the inlaid glory of all our ancient fathers. Comrades below, posted in close-packed ranks, block the entries, sword points drawn and poised. My courage renewed, I rush to relieve the palace, brace the defenders, bring the defeated strength. There was a secret door, a hidden passage linking the wings of Priam's house, remote, far to the rear. Long as our realm still stood, Andromache, poor woman, would often go this way, unattended, to Hector's parents, taking the boy Astyanax by the hand to see grandfather Priam. I slipped through the door, up to the jutting roof where the doomed Trojans were hurling futile spears. There was a tower soaring high at the peak toward the sky, our favorite vantage point for surveying all of Troy and the Greek fleet and camp. We attacked that tower with iron crowbars, just where the upper story planks showed loosening joints, we rocked it, wrenched it free of its deep moorings and all at once we heaved it toppling down with a crash, trailing its wake of ruin to grind the massed Greeks assaulting left and right. But on came Greek reserves, no let up, the hail of rocks, the missiles of every kind would never cease. There at the very edge of the front gate springs Pyrrhus, son of Achilles, prancing in arms, a flash in his shimmering brazen sheath like a snake buried the whole winter long under frozen turf, swollen to bursting, fed full on poisonous weeds and now it springs into light, sloughing its old skin to glisten sleek in its newfound youth, its back slithering, coiling, its proud chest rearing high to the sun, its triple tongue flickering through its fangs. Backing him now comes Periphas, giant fighter, Automedon too, Achilles' henchman, charioteer who bore the great man's armor, backing Pyrrhus, the young fighters from Cyros raid the palace, hurling firebrands at the roofs. Out in the lead, Pyrrhus seizes a double axe and batters the rocky sill and ripping the bronze posts out of their sockets, hacking the rugged oaken planks of the doors, makes a breach, a gaping moor, and there, exposed, the heart of the house, the sweep of the colonnades, the palace depths of the old kings and Priam lie exposed and they see the armed sentries bracing at the portals. 
but all in the house is turmoil, misery, groans, the echoing chambers ring with cries of women, wails of mourning hit the golden stars. Mothers scatter in panic down the palace halls and embrace the pillars, cling to them, kiss them hard. But on he comes, Pyrrhus with all his father's force, no bolts, not even the guards can hold him back, under the ram's repeated blows the doors cave in, the doorposts, prized from their sockets, crash flat. Force makes a breach and the Greeks come storming through, butcher the sentries, flood the entire place with men at arms. No river so wild, so frothing in spate, bursting its banks to overpower the dikes, anything in its way, its cresting tide stampeding in fury down on the fields to sweep the flocks and stalls across the open plain. I saw him myself, Pyrrhus crazed with carnage and Atreus' two sons just at the threshold, I saw Hecuba with her hundred daughters and daughters-in-law, saw Priam fouling with blood the altar fires he himself had blessed. Those fifty bridal chambers filled with the hope of children's children still to come, the pillars proud with trophies, gilded with eastern gold, they all come tumbling down, and the Greeks hold what the raging fire spares. Perhaps you wonder how Priam met his end. When he saw his city stormed and seized, his gates wrenched apart, the enemy camped in his palace depths, the old man dons his armor long unused, he clamps it round his shoulders shaking with age and, all for nothing, straps his useless sword to his hip, then makes for the thick of battle, out to meet his death. At the heart of the house an ample altar stood, naked under the skies, an ancient laurel bending over the shrine, embracing our household gods within its shade. Here, flocking the altar, Hecuba and her daughters huddled, blown headlong down like doves by a black storm, clutching, all for nothing, the figures of their gods. Seeing Priam decked in the arms he'd worn as a young man, are you insane, she cries, poor husband, what impels you to strap that sword on now? Where are you rushing? Too late for such defense, such help. Not even my own Hector, if he came to the rescue now. Come to me, Priam. This altar will shield us all or else you'll die with us. With those words, drawing him toward her there, she made a place for the old man beside the holy shrine. Suddenly, look, a son of Priam, Polites, just escaped from slaughter at Pyrrhus' hands, comes racing in through spears, through enemy fighters, fleeing down the long arcades and deserted hallways, badly wounded, Pyrrhus hot on his heels, a weapon poised for the kill, about to seize him, about to run him through and pressing home as Polites reaches his parents and collapses, vomiting out his lifeblood before their eyes. At that, Priam, trapped in the grip of death, not holding back, not checking his words, his rage, you, he cries, you and your vicious crimes. If any power on high recoils at such an outrage, let the gods repay you for all your reckless work, grant you the thanks, the rich reward you've earned. You've made me see my son's death with my own eyes, defiled a father's sight with a son's lifeblood. You say you're Achilles' son? You lie. Achilles never treated his enemy Priam so. No, he honored a suppliant's rights, he blushed to betray my trust, he restored my Hector's bloodless corpse for burial, sent me safely home to the land I rule. With that and with all his might the old man flings his spear, but too impotent now to pierce, it merely grazes Pyrrhus' brazen shield that blocks its way and clings there, dangling limp from the boss, all for nothing. Pyrrhus shouts back, well then, down you go, a messenger to my father, Peleus' son. Tell him about my vicious work, how Neoptolemus degrades his father's name, don't you forget. Now, die. That said, he drags the old man straight to the altar, quaking, slithering on through slicks of his son's blood, and twisting Priam's hair in his left hand, his right hand sweeping forth his sword, a flash of steel, he buries it hilt deep in the king's flank. Such was the fate of Priam, his death, his lot on earth, with Troy blazing before his eyes, her ramparts down, the monarch who once had ruled in all his glory the many lands of Asia, Asia's many tribes. A powerful trunk is lying on the shore. The head wrenched from the shoulders. A corpse without a name. Then, for the first time the full horror came home to me at last. I froze. The thought of my own dear father filled my mind when I saw the old king gasping out his life with that raw wound, both men were the same age, and the thought of my cruiser, alone, abandoned, our house plundered, our little Euless fate. I look back, what forces still stood by me? None. Totally spent in war, they'd all deserted, down from the roofs they'd flung themselves to earth or hurled their broken bodies in the flames. So, three at just that moment I was the one man left and then I saw her, clinging to Vesta's threshold, hiding in silence, tucked away, Helen of Argos. 
Glare of the fires lit my view as I looked down, scanning the city left and right, and there she was, terrified of the Trojans' hate. Now Troy was overpowered, terrified of the Greeks' revenge, her deserted husband's rage, that universal fury, a curse to Troy and her native land and here she lurked, skulking, a thing of loathing cowering at the altar, Helen. Out it flared, the fire inside my soul, my rage ablaze to avenge our fallen country, pay Helen back, crime for crime. So, this woman, it struck me now, safe and sound she'll look once more on Sparta, her native Greece. She'll ride like a queen in triumph with her trophies. Feast her eyes on her husband, parents, children too. Her retinue fawning round her, Phrygian ladies, slaves. That, with Priam put to the sword. And Troy up in flames? And time and again our Dardan shores have sweated blood? Not for all the world. No fame, no memory to be won for punishing a woman, such victory reaps no praise but to stamp this abomination out as she deserves, to punish her now, they'll sing my praise for that. What joy, to glut my heart with the fires of vengeance, bring some peace to the ashes of my people. Whirling words, I was swept away by fury now, when all of a sudden there my loving mother stood before my eyes, but I had never seen her so clearly, her pure radiance shining down upon me through the night, the goddess in all her glory just as the gods behold her build, her awesome beauty. Grasping my hand she held me back, adding this from her rose-red lips, my son, what grief could incite such blazing anger? Why such fury? And the love you bore me once, where has it all gone? Why don't you look first where you left your father, Anchises, spent with age? Do your wife, cruiser, and son Ascania still survive? The Greek battalions are swarming round them all, and if my love had never rushed to the rescue, flames would have swept them off by now or enemy sword blades would have drained their blood. Think, it's not that beauty, Helen, you should hate, not even Paris, the man that you should blame, no, it's the gods, the ruthless gods who are tearing down the wealth of Troy, a toppling crown of towers. Look around. I'll sweep it all away, the mist so murky, dark, and swirling around you now, it clouds your vision, dulls your mortal sight. You are my son. Never fear my orders. Never refuse to bow to my commands. There, yes, where you see the massive ramparts shattered, blocks wrenched from blocks, the billowing smoke and ash, it's Neptune himself, prizing loose with his giant trident the foundation stones of Troy, his making the walls quake, ripping up the entire city by her roots. There's Juno, cruelest in fury, first to commandeer the Scaean gates, sword at her hip and mustering comrades, shock troops streaming out of the ships. Already up on the heights, turn around and look, there's Pallas holding the fortress, flaming out of the clouds, a savage gorgon glaring. Even father himself, is filling the Greek hearts with courage, stamina, Jove in person spurring the gods to fight the Trojan armies. Run for your life, my son. Put an end to your labors. I will never leave you, I will set you safe at your father's door. Parting words. She vanished into the dense night. And now they all come looming up before me, terrible shapes, the deadly foes of Troy, the gods gigantic in power. Then at last I saw it all, all Ilium settling into her embers, Neptune's Troy, toppling over now from her roots like a proud, veteran ash on its mountain summit, chopped by stroke after stroke of the iron axe as woodsmen fight to bring it down, and over and over it threatens to fall, its boughs shudder, its leafy crown quakes and back and forth it sways till overwhelmed by its wounds, with a long last groan it goes. Torn up from its heights it crashes down in ruins from its ridge. Venus leading, down from the roof I climb and win my way through fires and massing foes. The spears recede, the flames roll back before me. At last, gaining the door of father's ancient house, my first concern was to find the man, my first wish to spirit him off, into the high mountain range, but father, seeing Ilium raised from the earth, refused to drag his life out now and suffer exile. You, he argued, you in your prime, untouched by age, your blood still coursing strong, you hearts of oak, you are the ones to hurry your escape. Myself, if the gods on high had wished me to live on, they would have saved my palace for me here. Enough, more than enough, that I have seen one sack of my city, once survived its capture. Here I lie, here laid out for death. Come say your parting salutes and leave my body so. I will find my own death, sword in hand, my enemies keen for spoils will be so kind. Death without burial? A small price to pay.
Four years now, I've lingered out my life, despised by the gods, a dead weight to men, ever since the father of gods and king of mortals stormed at me with his bolt and scorched me with its fire. So he said, planted there. Nothing could shake him now. But we dissolved in tears, my wife, Cruiser, Ascanius, the whole household, begging my father not to pull our lives down with him, adding his own weight to the fate that dragged us down. He still refuses, holds to his resolve, clings to the spot. And again I rushed to arms, desperate to die myself. Where could I turn? What were our chances now, at this point? What? I cried. Did you, my own father, dream that I could run away and desert you here? How could such an outrage slip from a father's lips? If it please the gods that nothing of our great city shall survive, if you are bent on adding your own death to the deaths of Troy and of all your loved ones too, the doors of the deaths you crave are spread wide open. Pyrrhus will soon be here, bathed in Priam's blood, Pyrrhus who butchers sons in their father's faces, slaughters fathers at the altar. Was it for this, my loving mother, you swept me clear of the weapons, free of the flames? Just to see the enemy camped in the very heart of our house, to see my son, Ascanius, see my father, my wife, Cruiser, with them, sacrificed, massacred in each other's blood? Arms, my comrades, bring me arms. The last light calls the defeated. Send me back to the Greeks, let me go back to fight new battles. Not all of us here will die today without revenge. Now buckling on my sword again and working my left arm through the shield's trap, grasping it tightly, just as I was rushing out, right at the doors my wife, Cruiser, look, flung herself at my feet and hugged my knees and raised our little Ulysses up to his father. If you are going off to die, she begged, then take us with you too, to face the worst together. But if your battles teach you to hope in arms, the arms you buckle on, your first duty should be to guard our house. Desert us, leave us now, to whom? Whom? Little Ulysses, your father and your wife, so I once was called. So Cruiser cries, her wails of anguish echoing through the house when out of the blue an omen strikes, a marvel. Now as we held our son between our hands and both our grieving faces, a tongue of fire, watch, flares up from the crown of Ulysses' head, a subtle flame licking his downy hair, feeding around the boy's brow, and though it never harmed him, panicked, we rushed to shake the flame from his curls and smother the holy fire, damp it down with water. But Father Anchises lifts his eyes to the stars in joy and stretching his hands toward the sky, sings out, Almighty Jove. If any prayer can persuade you now, look down on us, that's all I ask, if our devotion has earned it, grant us another omen, Father, seal this first clear sign. No sooner said than an instant peal of thunder crashes on the left and down from the sky a shooting star comes gliding, trailing a flaming torch to irradiate the night as it comes sweeping down. We watch it sailing over the topmost palace roofs to bury itself, still burning bright, in the forests of Mount Ida, blazing its path with light, leaving a broad furrow, a fiery wake, and miles around the smoking sulphur fumes. One over at last, my father rises to his full height and prays to the gods and reveres that holy star, no more delay, not now. You gods of my fathers, now I follow wherever you lead me, I am with you. Safeguard our house, safeguard my grandson Ulysses. This sign is yours, Troy rests in your power. I give way, my son. No more refusals. I will go with you, your comrade. So he yielded but now the roar of flames grows louder all through Troy and the seething floods of fire are rolling closer. So come, dear father, climb up onto my shoulders. I will carry you on my back. This labor of love will never wear me down. Whatever falls to us now, we both will share one peril, one path to safety. Little Ulysses, walk beside me, and you, my wife, follow me at a distance, in my footsteps. Servants, listen closely. Just past the city walls a grave mound lies where an old shrine of forsaken Ciri stands with an ancient cypress growing close beside it, our father's reverence kept it green for years. Coming by many routes, it's there we meet, our rendezvous. And you, my father, carry our half-gods now, our father's sacred vessels. I, just back from the war and fresh from slaughter, I must not handle the holy things, it's wrong, not till I cleanse myself in running springs. With that, over my broad shoulders and round my neck I spread a tawny lion's skin for a cloak, and bowing down, I lift my burden up. Little Ulysses, clutching my right hand, keeps pace with tripping steps. My wife trails on behind. 
and so we make our way along the pitch-dark paths, and I who had never flinched at the hurtling spears or swarming Greek assaults, now every stir of wind, every whisper of sound alarms me, anxious both for the child beside me and burden on my back. And then, nearing the gates, thinking we've all got safely through, I suddenly seem to catch the steady tramp of marching feet and father, peering out through the darkness, cries, run for it now, my boy, you must. They are closing in, I can see their glinting shields, their flashing bronze. Then in my panic something strange, some enemy power robbed me of my senses. Lost, I was leaving behind familiar paths, at a run-down blind dead end when, oh dear God, my wife, cruiser, torn from me by a brutal fate. What then, did she stop in her tracks or lose her way? Or exhausted, sink down to rest? Who knows? I never set my eyes on her again. I never looked back, she never crossed my mind, cruiser, lost, not till we reached that barrow sacred to ancient Ceres where, with all our people rallied at last, she alone was missing. Lost to her friends, her son, her husband, gone forever. Raving, I blamed them all, the gods, the human race, what crueler blow did I feel the night that Troy went down. Ascanius, father Anchises, and all the gods of Troy, entrusting them to my friends, I hide them well away in a valley shelter, don my burnished gear and back I go to Troy, my mind steeled to relive the whole disaster, retrace my route through the whole city now and put my life in danger one more time. First then, back to the looming walls, the shadowy rear gates by which I'd left the city, back I go in my tracks, retracing, straining to find my footsteps in the dark, with terror at every turn, the very silence makes me cringe. Then back to my house I go, if only, only she's gone there, but the Greeks have flooded in, seized the entire place. All over now. Devouring fire whipped by the winds goes churning into the rooftops, flames surging over them, scorching blasts raging up the sky. On I go and again I see the palace of Priam set on the heights, but there in colonnades deserted now, in the sanctuary of Juno, there stand the elite watchmen, Phoenix, ruthless Ulysses guarding all their loot. All the treasures of Troy hauled from the burning shrines, the sacramental tables, bowls of solid gold and the holy robes they'd seized from every quarter, Greeks, piling high the plunder. Children and trembling mothers rounded up in a long, endless line. Why, I even dared fling my voice through the dark, my shouts filled the streets as time and again, overcome with grief I called out, cruiser. Nothing, no reply, and again cruiser. But then as I madly rushed from house to house, no end in sight, abruptly, right before my eyes I saw her stricken ghost, my own cruiser's shade. But larger than life, the life I'd known so well. I froze. My hackles bristled, voice choked in my throat, and my wife spoke out to ease me of my anguish, my dear husband, why so eager to give yourself to such mad flights of grief? It's not without the will of the gods these things have come to pass. But the gods forbid you to take cruiser with you, bound from Troy together. The king of lofty Olympus won't allow it. A long exile is your fate, the vast plains of the sea are yours to plow until you reach Hesperian land, where Lydian Tiber flows with its smooth march through rich and loamy fields, a land of hardy people. Their great joy and a kingdom are yours to claim, and a queen to make your wife. Dispel your tears for cruiser whom you loved. I will never behold the high and mighty pride of their palaces, the Myrmidons, the Dilopians, or go as a slave to some Greek matron, no, not I, daughter of Dardanus that I am, the wife of Venus' son. The great mother of gods detains me on these shores. And now farewell. Hold dear the son we share, we love together. These were her parting words and for all my tears, I longed to say so much, dissolving into the empty air she left me now. Three times I tried to fling my arms around her neck, three times I embraced, nothing, her phantom sifting through my fingers, light as wind, quick as a dream in flight. Gone, and at last the night was over. Back I went to my people and I was amazed to see what throngs of new companions had poured in to swell our numbers, mothers, men, our forces gathered for exile, grieving masses. They had come together from every quarter, belongings, spirits ready for me to lead them over the sea to whatever lands I'd choose. And now the morning star was mounting above the high crests of Ida, leading on the day. The Greeks had taken the city, blocked off every gate. No hope of rescue now. So I gave way at last and lifting my father, headed toward the mountains. Book 3. Landfalls, Ports of Call. 
now that it pleased the gods to crush the power of Asia and Priam's innocent people, now proud Troy had fallen, Neptune's city a total ruin smoking on the ground, signs from the high gods drive us on, exiles now, searching earth for a home in some neglected land. We labor to build a fleet, hard by Antandros, under the heights of Phrygian Ida, knowing nothing. Where would destiny take us? Where are we to settle? We must amend for crews. Summer has just begun when Father commands us, hoist our sails to fate. And I launch out in tears and desert our native land, the old safe haven, the plains where Troy once stood. So I take to the open sea, an exile outward bound with sun and comrades, gods of hearth and home and the great gods themselves. Just in the offing lies the land of Mars, the boundless farmlands tilled by the Thracian field hands, ruled in the old days by merciless Lycurgus. His realm was a friend of Troy for years, our household gods in league so long as our fortunes lasted. Well, here I sail and begin to build our first walls on the curving shore, though fate will block our way, and I give the town the name of Enos modelled on my own. Now, making offerings to my mother, Dion's daughter, and to the gods who bless new ventures, I was poised, there on the beach, to slaughter a pure white bull to Jove above all who rules the powers on high. Nearby I chanced on a rise of ground topped off by thickets bristling dogwood and myrtle spears. I tried to tear some green shoots from the brush to make a canopy for the altar with leafy boughs, when a dreadful, ghastly sight, too strange for words, strikes my eyes. Soon as I tear the first stalk from its roots and rip it up from the earth dark blood oozes out and fouls the soil with filth. Icy shudders rack my limbs, my blood chills with fear. But again I try, I tear at another stubborn stalk, I'll probe this mystery to its hidden roots, and again the dark blood runs from the torn bark. Deeply shaken, I pray to the country nymphs and Father Mars who strides the fields of Thrace, make this sight a blessing, lift the omen's weight. But now as I pitch at a third stalk, doubling my effort, knees bracing against the sand, struggling to pry it loose, shall I tell you or hold my tongue, I hear it, clearly, a wrenching groan rising up from the deep mound, a cry heaving into the air, why, Aeneas, why mangle this wretched flesh? Spare the body buried here, spare your own pure hands, don't stain them. I am no stranger to you. I was born in Troy, and the blood you see is oozing from no tree. O oh, escape from this savage land, I beg you, flee these grasping shores. I am Polydorus. Here they impaled me, an iron planting of lances covered my body, now they sprout in stabbing spears. Then I was awestruck, stunned by doubt and dread. My hackles bristled, voice choked in my throat. This Polydorus, the doomed Priam had once dispatched him in secret, bearing a great weight of gold, to be maintained by the king of Thrace when Priam lost his faith in Trojan arms and saw his city gripped by siege. That Thracian, once the power of Troy was shattered, our Trojan fortunes gone, he joins forces with Agamemnon, siding with his victorious arms, and breaks all human laws. He hacks Polydorus down and commandeers the gold. To what extremes won't you compel our hearts, you accursed lust for gold? When dread has left my bones, I bring this omen sent by the gods before our chosen Trojan captains, my father first of all, I had to have their judgment. With one mind they insist we leave this wicked land where the bonds of hospitality are so stained, sail out on the south wind now. And so we give Polydorus a fresh new burial, piling masses of earth on his first mound, raising to all the shades below an altar dark with the reeds of grief and dead black cypress ringed by Trojan women, hair unbound in mourning. We offer up full bowls, foaming with warm milk, and our cups of hallowed blood. And so we lay his soul in the grave as our voices raise his name, the resounding last farewell. Then in the first light when we can trust the waves, a breeze has calmed the surf and a gentle rustling south wind makes the rigging sing, inviting us to see, my crewmen crowd the beaches, launch the ships, and out from port we sail, leaving the land and cities sinking in our wake. Mid-sea there lies the sacred island of Delos, loved by the Nereid's mother, Aegean Neptune too. Apollo the archer, finding his birthplace drifting shore to shore, like a proper son had chained it fast to Mykonos' steep coast and Gyros, made it stable, a home for men that scorns the wind's assaults. Here I sail, and here a haven, still, serene, receives our weary body safe and sound. Landing, we just begin to admire Apollo's city when King Aeneas, king of men and priest of the god, his brow wreathed with the bands and holy laurel leaves, comes to meet us, spotting a long-lost friend, Anchises. Clasping our host's hands, we file toward his palace. There, awed by the shrine of God, 
built strong of ancient stone, I begged Apollo, grant us our own home, god of Thimbra. Grant us weary men some walls of our own, some sons, a city that will last. Safeguard this second Troy, this remnant left by the Greeks and cruel Achilles. Whom do we follow? Where do we go? Command us, where do we settle now? Grant us a sign, Father, flow into our hearts. I had barely spoken when all at once, everything seemed to tremble, the gates of the god, Apollo's laurel tree, the entire mountain around us seemed to quake, the tripod moaned, the sacred shrine swung open. We flung ourselves on the ground, and a voice sounded out, sons of Dardanus, hardy souls, your father's land that gave you birth will take you back again, restored to her fertile breast. Search for your ancient mother. There your house, the line of Aeneas, will rule all parts of the world, your son's sons and all their descendants down the years. And Phoebus' words were met by a ringing burst of joy mixed with confusion, all our voices rising, asking, where is this city? Where is the land that Apollo calls us wanderers to, the land of our return? Then my father, mulling over our old traditions, answers, lords of Troy, learn where your best hopes rest. An island rises in mid-sea, Crete, great Jove's own land where the first Mount Ida rears, the cradle of our people. The Cretans live in a hundred spacious cities, rich domains. From there, if I recall what I heard, our first father, Teusa sailed to Troy, Cape Rotium, picked the point and founded his kingdom on those shores. But Troy and her soaring ramparts were not standing yet, the people lived in valleys, deep in lowlands. From Crete came our great mother of Mount Sibylus, her corribant's clashing symbols, her grove on Ida, the sacred binding silence kept for her mystic rites and the team of lions yoked to our lady's chariot. So come, follow the gods' commands that lead us on. Placate the winds, set sail for Nossa's country. It's no long journey. If only Jove is with us now, the third dawn will find us beached on the shores of Crete. With that, he slaughtered fitting beasts on the altars, a bull to Neptune, a bull to you, our noble Apollo, a black ram to the winter storms, and a white ram to the zephyrs fair and warm. Rumor flies that Idomeneus, famous Cretan prince, has fled his father's kingdom, an exile, and the shores of Crete are now deserted, clear of enemies, homes derelict, standing ready for us to settle. Out of Ortigia's port we sail, winging the sea to race on past the Naxos ridge where the Menads revel, past the lush green islands of Denusa and Oliaros, Poros, gleaming white as its marble, through the cyclades strewn across the sea and through the straits we speed, their waters churned to foam by the crowded shorelines, shipmates racing each other, spurring each other on, on to Crete, they are shouting, back to our fatherland. And a rising stern wind surges, drives our vessels on and at last we're gliding into the old Curet's harbour. Inspired, I start to build the city walls we crave. I call it Pergamum, yes, and my people all rejoice at the old Trojan name. I urge them to cherish their hearths and homes, erect a citadel strong to shield them well. Our ships were no sooner hauled onto dry land, our young crewmen busy with weddings, plowing the fresh soil while I was drafting laws and assigning homes, when suddenly, no warning, out of some foul polluted quarter of the skies a plague struck now, a heartrending scourge attacking our bodies, rotting trees and crops, one whole year of death. Men surrendered their own sweet lives or dragged their decrepit bodies on and on. And the dog star scorched the green fields barren, the grasses shriveled, blighted crops refused us food. Double back on the sea lanes, back to Delos now, Apollo's oracle. So my father Anchises urges, pray for the gods' goodwill and ask him there, where will they end, our backbreaking labors? Where can we turn for help from all our toil? What new course do we set? Night had fallen and sleep embraced all living things on earth. But the sacred images of our Trojan household gods, those I'd saved from the fires that swept through Troy. Now as I lay asleep they seemed to stand before me, clear before my eyes, so vivid, washed in the light of the full moon flooding in through deep-set windows. Then the power spoke out to ease me of my anguish, all that Apollo will predict if you return to Delos, he tells you here, of his own free will he sends us here before your doors. You and your force at arms, we followed you all when Troy was burnt to rubble. We are the gods, with you at the helm, who crossed the billowing sea in ships. And one day we shall lift your children to the stars and exalt your city's power. For a destiny so great, great walls you must erect and never shrink from the long labor of exile, no, you must leave this home. These are not the shores Apollo of Delos urged. He never commanded you to settle here on Crete. 
there is a country, the Greeks called it Hesperia, land of the west, an ancient land, mighty in war and rich in soil. Enotrian settled it, now we hear their descendants call their kingdom Italy, after their leader, Italus. There lies our true home. There Dardanus was born, there Iasius. Fathers, founders of our people. Rise up now. Rejoice, relay our message, certain beyond all doubt, to your father full of years. Seek out the town of Corythus, sail for Italy. Jove denies you the fields of Dict, Crete. Thunderstruck by the vision, the god's voice, this was no empty dream, I saw them clear before me, their features, face to face, their hair crowned with wreaths. At the sight an icy sweat goes rippling down my body, I tear myself from bed, I raise my hands and voice in prayer to the skies and tip a pure, unmixed libation on the hearth. Gladly, the rite performed, I unfold the whole event to Anchises, point by point. He recalls at once the two lines of our race, two parents, his own error, his late mistake about ancient places. My son, he says, so pressed by the fate of Troy, Cassandra alone made such a prophecy to me. Now I recall how she'd reveal our destination, Hesperia, time and again repeating it by name, repeating the name of Italy. But who believed a Trojan expedition could reach Italian shores? Who was moved by Cassandra's visions then? Yield to Apollo now and take the better course, the god shows the way. So Anchises urges and all are overjoyed to follow his command. Leaving a few behind, we launch out from Crete, deserting another home, and set our sails again, scudding on buoyant hulls through wastes of ocean. As soon as our ships had reached the high seas, no land in sight, no longer, water at all points, at all points the sky, looming over our heads a pitch-dark thunderhead brings on night and storm, ruffling the swells black. At once the winds whip up the sea, huge waves heaving, strewing, flinging us down the sheer abyss, the cloud bank swallowing up the daylight, rain-soaked night wipes out the sky and flash on flash of lightning bursts from the torn clouds, we're whirled off course, yuring blind in the big waves. Even Palinurus, he swears he can't tell night from day, scanning the heavens he finds nothing but walls of sea, the pilot's bearings lost. For three whole days we rush, the waves driving us wildly on, the sun blotted out, for as many nights we're robbed of stars to steer by. Then at last, at the fourth dawn, landfall, rearing up into view, some mountains clear in the offing, a rising curl of smoke. Down come the sails, the crewmen leap to the oars, no time to lose, they bend to it, churn the spray and sweep the clear blue sea. So I was saved from the deep, the shores of the Strophades first to take me in. Strophades, Greek name for the turning islands, lie in the great Ionian Sea. Here Grim Salino and Sister Harpy settled after Phineas' doors were locked against them all and they fled in fear from the tables where they'd gorged. The Harpies, no monsters on earth more cruel, no scourge more savage, no wrath of the gods has ever raised its head from the stakes as waters. The faces of girls, but birds. A loathsome ooze discharges from their bellies, talons for hands, their jaws deathly white with a hunger never sated. Gaining that landfall, making port, what do we see but sleek lusty herds of cattle grazing the plains, flocks of goats unguarded, cropping grassland? We charge them with drawn swords, calling out to the gods, to Jove himself, to share our kill. Then on the half-moon bay we build up mounds of turf and fall to the rich feast. But all of a sudden, watch, with a ghastly swoop from the hills the harpies swarm us, ruffling, clattering wingbeats, ripping our food to bits, polluting it all with their foul, corrupting claws, their obscene shrieks bursting from the stench. Again, in a deep recess under rocky cliffs, screened around by trees and trembling shade, we deck our tables out, relight the altar fire but again, from some new height, some hidden nest the rout comes screaming at their quarry, flapping round us, slashing with claw feet, hook beaks fouling our meal. To arms. I command the men, wage all out war against this brutal crew. All hands snap to orders, hiding swords away in the tall grasses, covering shields as well. So when they make their roaring swoop along the bay, Messenus, poised on a lookout, sounds the alarm, a brazen trumpet blast, and the men attack, geared for a strange new form of combat, fighting to hack these vile seabirds down with bloody swords. But their feathers take no stab wounds, backs no scars and swift on their wings they soar toward the heavens, leaving behind half-eaten prey and trails of filth. All but one. Perched on a beetling crag, Selino, prophet of doom, her shrieks erupted from her breast, so, war as well now? Gearing for battle, are you? 
you, the sons of Laomedon, as if to atone for the butchery of our cattle, our young bulls? You'd force the innocent harpies from their father's kingdom? Take what I say to heart and stamp it in your minds, this prophecy the Almighty Father made to Phoebus and Phoebus made to me, the greatest of the furies, and I reveal to you. Italy is the land you seek. You call on the winds to sweep you there by sea. To Italy you will go. Permitted to enter port but never granted a city girded round by ramparts, not before some terrible hunger and your attack on us, outrageous slaughter, drive you to gnaw your platters with your teeth. So Salino shrieked and taking flight, dashed back to the forest. The blood of my comrades froze with instant dread. Their morale sank, they lost all heart for war, pressing me now to pray, to beg for peace, whether our foes are goddesses, yes, or filthy, lethal birds. Then Father Anchises, stretching his hands toward the sea, cries out to the great powers, pledging them their due rights, gods, ward off these threats. Gods, beat back disaster. Be gracious, guard your faithful. We cast off cables and let the sheets run free, unfurling sail as a south wind bellies out the canvas. We launch out on the foaming waves as wind and helmsmen call our course. Now over the high seas we raise up Woody's Asynthos, Dulichium, Same, Nerito's Crags, past Ithaca's rocky coast we race, Laird's Realm, cursing the land that spawned the vicious Ulysses. And soon Yukata's cloudy summit comes into view and Apollo's shrine on its rugged headland, dread of sailors. Exhausted, we land at Aksham, trek to the little town. Anchors run from prows, the sterns line the shore. So, exceeding our hopes, we win our way to solid ground at last. We cleanse ourselves with the rites we owe to Jove and make the altars blaze with votive gifts, then crowd the action shore with Trojan games. My shipmates strip and glistening sleek with oil, wrestle the old Trojan way, our spirits high, we'd skimmed past such a flurry of Argive cities, holding true to our flight through waters held by foes. Then as the sun rolls round the giant arc of the year, icy winter arrives and a north wind roughens up the seas. Fronting the temple doors, I bolt the brazen shield great Abar's bore, and I engrave the offering with a verse, Aeneas devotes these arms seized from Grecian victors. Then I command the crews to embark from harbour, man the thwarts. And shipmates race each other, thrashing the waves, plunging along Phaeacia's mist-enshrouded heights to lose them far astern, skirting Epirus coasts, sailing into Caonia's port and we finally reach the hilltop town, Buthrotum. Here an incredible story meets our ears, that Helenus, Priam's son, holds sway over these Greek towns, that he had won the throne and wife of Pyrrhus, son of Achilles, and Dramash was wed once more to a man of Trojan stock. Astonishing. My heart burned with longing, irresistible longing to see my old friend and learn about this remarkable twist of fate. Setting out from the harbour, leaving ships and shore I chanced to see Andromache pouring out libations to the dead, the ritual foods, the gifts of grief, in a grove before the city, banked by a stream the exiles made believe was Simwa River. Just now tipping wine to her husband's ashes, she implored Hector's shade to visit his tomb, an empty mound of grassy earth, crowned with the double altars she had blessed, a place to shed her tears. As she saw me coming, flanked by Trojan troops, she lost control, afraid of a wonder so extreme. Watching, rigid, suddenly warmth leaves her bones, she faints, and after a long pause barely finds the breath to whisper, that face, it's really you? You're real, a messenger come my way? Son of the goddess, still alive? Or if the light of life has left you, where's my Hector now? Breaking off, Andromache wept, her wailing filled the grove, inconsolable. I could scarcely interject a word, dismayed, I stuttered a few breathless phrases, alive, yes. Still dragging out my life. Through the worst the world can offer. Have no doubt, what you see is real. Oh what fate has overpowered you, robbed of such a husband? Or does fortune shine again on you, Hector's Andromache, just as you deserve? Are you still married to Pyrrhus? Eyes lowered, her voice subdued, she murmured, she was the one, the happiest one of all, Priam's virgin daughter doomed to die at our enemy's tomb, Achilles, under the looming walls of Troy. No captive slave allotted to serve the lust of a conquering hero's bed. But I, our home in flames, was shipped over strange seas, I bowed to the high and mighty pride of Achilles' son, produced him a child, in slavery. Then, keen to marry a Spartan bride, Hermione, granddaughter of Leda, he turned me over to Helenus, slave to slave.
but Orestes burned with love for his stolen bride, spurred by the furies for his crimes, he seized Pyrrhus, quite off guard, and butchered him at his father's altar. At Pyrrhus' death, part of his kingdom passed to Helenus, who named the plains Caonian, all this realm, Chaonia, after the Trojan Chaon, and built a Trojan fortress, the Ilian stronghold rising on this ridge. But you, what following winds, what fates have sailed you here? What god urged you, all unknowing, to our shores? And what of your son, Ascanius? Still alive, still breathing the breath of life? Your son, whom in the old days at Troy, does he still love his mother lost and gone? Do his father Aeneas and uncle Hector fire his heart with the old courage, his heroic forebear spirit? A torrent of questions, weeping futile tears, she sobs her long lament as Priam's warrior son, Helenus, comes from the walls with full courtage. Recognizing his kin, he gladly leads us home, each word of welcome breaking through his tears. And I as I walk, I recognize a little Troy, a miniature, mimicking our great Trojan towers, and a dried-up brook they call the River Xanthus, and I put my arms around a cut-down Scaean gate. And all my Trojans join me, drinking deep of a Trojan city's welcome. The king ushered us into generous colonnades, in the heart of the court we offered Bacchus wine and feasted from golden plates, all cups held high. Now time wears on, day in, day out, and the breezes lure our sails, a south wind rippling in our canvas. So I approach the prophet king with questions, son of Troy and seer of the gods, you know the will of Phoebus Apollo, know his clarion tripods and his laurel, know the stars, the cries of birds, the omens quick on the wing. Please, tell me, all the signs foretold me a happy voyage, yes, and the will of all the gods impels me now to sail for Italy, seek that far-off land. The harpy Salino alone foretold a monstrous sign, chanting out the unspeakable, withering wrath to come and the ghastly pangs of famine. What dangers, tell me, to steer away from first? What course to set to master these ordeals? At that, Helenus first performs a sacrifice, slaughters many bulls. He prays the gods for peace, he looses the sacred ribbons round his hallowed head and taking me by the hand he leads me to your shrine, Apollo, stirred with or by your vibrant power, and at once this prophecy comes singing from the priest's inspired lips, son of the goddess, surely proof is clear, the highest sanctions shine upon your voyage. So the king of the gods has sorted out your fate, so rolls your life, as the world rolls through its changes. Now, few out of many truths I will reveal to you, so you can cross the welcoming seas more safely, more secure in a Latian harbor. The fates have forbidden Helenus to know the rest. Saturnian Juno says I may not speak a word. First, that Italian land you think so near, all unknowing, planning to ease into its harbors, lies far off. A long wandering path will part you miles from that shore by a lengthy stretch of coast. So, first you must bend your oar in Sicilian seas and cross in your ships the salt Italian waves, the lakes of the underworld and Aeaea, Circe's Isle, before you can build your city safe on solid ground. I will give you a sign. Guard it in your heart. When at an anxious time by a secret river's run, under the oaks along the bank you find a great sow stretched on her side with thirty pigs just farrowed, a snow-white mother with snow-white young at her dugs, that will be the place to found your city, there your repose from labor lies. No reason to fear that prophecy, the horror of eating your own platters. The fates will find the way. Apollo comes to your call. But set sail from our land, steer clear of Italy's coast, the closest coast to our own, washed by our own seas, every seaboard town is manned by hostile Greeks. Here the Nauritian Locri built their walls and troops of Cretan Idomeneus from Lictos commandeered the Salentine level fields. Here little Petelia built by Philoctetes, the Melibian chief, lies safe behind its walls. Once you have passed them all, moored your ships on the far shore and set up altars on the beach to perform your vows, then cloak yourselves in purple, veil your heads, so while the hallowed fires are burning in honor of the gods, no enemy presence can break in and disrupt the omens. Your comrades, you yourself must hold fast to this sacred rite, this custom. Your son's sons must keep it pure forever. Now then, launching out as the wind bears you toward Sicilian shores and Polaris crowded headlands open up a passage, steer for the lands to port, the seas to port, in a long southern sweep around the coast, but stay clear of the heavy surf to starboard. 
These lands, they say, were once an immense unbroken mass but long ago, such is the power of time to work great change as the ages pass, some vast convulsion sprang them apart, a surge of the sea burst in between them, cleaving Sicily clear of Hesperia's flanks, dividing lands and towns into two coasts, rushing between them down a narrow tide drip. But now Scylla to starboard blocks your way, with never sated Charybdis off to port, three times a day, into the plunging whirlpool of her abyss she gulps down floods of sea, then heaves them back in the air, pelting the stars with spray. Scylla lurks in her blind cave, thrusting out her mouths and hauling ships on her rocks. She's human at first glance, down to the waist a girl with lovely breasts, but a monster of the deep below, her body a writhing horror, her belly spawns wolves flailing with dolphins' tails. Better to waste time, skirting Sicily then in a long arc round in Cape Pachinus, than once set eyes on gruesome Scylla deep in her cave, her rocks booming with all her sea-green hounds. What's more, if a prophet has second sight, if Hellenus earns your trust and Apollo fills his soul with truth, one prophecy, one above all, son of the goddess, I will make to you, over and over repeat this warning word. Revere great Juno's power first in all your prayers, to Juno chant your vows with a full heart and win the mighty goddess over with gifts to match your vows. Only then can you leave Sicilian shores at last, dispatched to Italy's coast, a conquering hero. Once ashore, when you reach the city of Cumi and Avernus haunted lakes and murmuring forests, there you will see the prophetess in her frenzy, chanting deep in her rocky cavern, charting the fates, committing her vision to words, to signs on leaves. Whatever verses the seer writes down on leaves she puts in order, sealed in her cave, left behind. There they stay, motionless, never slip from sequence. But the leaves are light, if the door turns on its hinge, the slightest breath of air will scatter them all about and she never cares to retrieve them, flitting through her cave, or restore them to order, join them as verses with a vision. So visitors may depart, deprived of her advice, and hate the sibyl's haunts. But never fear delay, though crewmen press you hard and the course you set calls out to your sails to take the waves, and you could fill those sails with good fair winds. Still you must approach her oracle, beg the seer with prayers to chant her prophesies, all of her own accord, unlock her lips and sing with her own voice. She will reveal to you the Italian tribes, the wars that you must fight, and the many ways to shun or shoulder each ordeal that you must meet. Revere her power and she will grant safe passage. That far I may go with my words of warning. Now sail on. By your own brave work exalt our Trojan greatness to the skies. Friendly words, and when he had closed, the prophet ordered presents, hordes of gold and ivory inlays, brought to our ships, crowding our holds with a massive weight of silver, Dodona cauldrons, a breastplate linked with mail and triple meshed in gold, a magnificent helmet peaked with a plumed crest, Neoptolemus arms, and then the gifts of honor for my father. He adds horses too, pilots to guide our way, fills out our crews, rearms our fighting comrades. Meanwhile Anchises gave the command to spread sail, no time to waste, would lose the good fair winds, and Apollo seer addressed him with deep respect, Anchises, worthy to wed the proudest, Venus herself, how the gods do love you. Twice they plucked you safe from the ruins of Troy. Italy waits you now, look, sail on and make it yours. But first you must hurry past the coastline here, the part of Italy that the god unfolds for you lies far at sea. Set sail now, the god commands, blessed in the dedication of your son. Enough. Why waste time with talk when the wind is rising? Andromache grieves no less at our final parting. She brings out robes shot through with gilded thread and a Phrygian cloak for Ascanius. Not to be outdone in kindness, weighing him down with woven gifts she says, please take these as well, the work of my hands, reminders of me to you, dear boy, and tokens of my love, the love of Hector's Andromache that never dies. Take them. The last gifts from your own people. You are the only image of my Astyanax that's left. His eyes, his hands, his features, so like yours, he would be growing up now, just your age. Turning to leave, my tears brimmed and I said a last farewell, live on in your blessings, your destiny's been won. But ours calls us on from one ordeal to the next. You've earned your rest at last. No seas to plow, no questing after Italian fields forever receding on the horizon. Now you see before you Xanthus and Troy in replica, built with your own hands, under better stars, I trust, and less exposed to the Greeks. 
If I ever reach the Tiber, the fields on Tiber's banks, and see my people secure behind their promised walls, then of our neighboring kin and kindred cities, both in Epirus and Hesperia, both have the same founder, Dardanus, the same fate too, someday we will make our peoples one, one Troy in heart and soul. Let this mission challenge all our children. North we sail and skirt Saronia's cliffs to the narrow straits, the shortest route to Italy, while the sun sinks and darkness shrouds the hills. Landing, drawing lots for tomorrow's stint at the oars, we stretch out in the lap of welcome land at water's edge and scattered along the dry beach refresh ourselves as sleep comes streaming through our weary bodies. Night, drawn by the hours, approaches mid-career when Palinurus, on the alert, leaps up from bed to test the winds, his ears keen for the first stir, scanning the constellations wheeling down the quiet sky, Arcturus, the rainy Hyades and the great and little bears, his eyes roving to find Orion geared in gold. And then, when he sees the entire sky serene, all clear, he gives the trumpet signal from his stern and we strike camp at once, set out on our way and spread our canvas wings. The dawn was a red glow now, putting stars to flight as we glimpse the low-lying hills, dim in the distance. Italy. Italy. Achates was first to shout the name, Italy, comrades cried out too with buoyant hearts. Father Anchises crowned a great bowl with wreaths, brimmed it with unmixed wine, and standing tall in the stern, he prayed the gods, you powers that rule the land and sea and storms, grant us wind for an easy passage, blow us safe to port. As the wind we pray for quickens, a harbour opens wide and closer till we can see Minerva's temple on the heights. Shipmates furl the sails and swing the prows toward land. The harbour curves like a bow, bent by eastern comas, rocky breakwaters foam with the salt surf spray, the havens just behind them. Towering cliffs fling out their arms like steep twin walls and the temple rests securely back from shore. Here I saw it, our first omen, four horses, snow white, cropping the grasslands far and wide. War. Father Anchises calls out, land of welcome, that's what you bring us, true, horses are armed for war, these pairs of horses threaten war. But then again, the same beasts are trained to harness as teams and bow to the yoke, at one with bit and bridle. There's hope for peace as well. At once we pray to the force of Pallas, goddess of clashing armies, the first to receive our band of happy men. We stand at the altar, heads under Trojan veils, and following Helena's orders first and foremost, duly burn our offerings, just as bidden, to Juno, Queen of Argos. No time for delay. Our rites complete, at once we swing our sails to the wind on Yardam spars and put astern this home of Greeks, the fields we dare not trust. First we sight the Gulf of Tarentum, Hercules' town, if the tale is true, then looming over the waves ahead, Licinian Juno's temple, Corland's fort on the rugged coast of Silatium, wrecker of ships, then far across the seas, rising up from the swells, we can see Mount Etna, Sicily, hear the tremendous groaning of waters, pounding rocks, the resounding roar of breakers crashing on the shore, reefs spring up, swirling sand in the sea surge. Father Anchises cries out, surely that's Charybdis, those the cliffs that Helenus warned of, craggy death traps. Row for your lives, my shipmates, backs in the oars, now stroke. They snapped to commands, pulled hard, Palinurus first to swerve his shuddering prow to port for open sea and the whole fleet swung to port with oars and sails. Up to the sky an immense billow hoists us, then at once, as the wave sank down, down we plunged to the pit of hell. Three times the cliffs roared out from between the hollow caves, three times we saw the spume exploding to spray the stars. At last the sun and the wind went down, abandoned us, broken men, our bearings lost, floating adrift toward the cyclops' coast. There is a harbour clear of the wind, and spacious, calm, a haven, but Etna rumbles, hard by, showering deadly scree and now it heaves into the sky a thundering dark cloud, a whirlwind pitch black with smoke and red hot coals and it hurls up huge balls of fire that lap the stars, and now it vomits rocks ripped from the mountain's bowels erupting lava into the air, enormous molten boulders, groaning magma roiling up from its bedrock depths. They say Enceladus' body, half devoured by lightning, lies crushed under Etna's mass, the mighty volcano piled over him, breathing flames from its furnaces blasting open, and every time the giant rolls on his bone-weary side all Sicily moans, quakes, shrouds the sky with smoke. Covered by woods that night we brave out horrors, unable to see what made such a monstrous uproar. The stars were extinguished, the high skies black, the luminous heavens blotted out by a thick cloud cover, the dead of night had wrapped the moon in mist. 
At last the day was breaking, the morning star on the rise, Aurora had just burned off the night's dank fog, when suddenly out of the woods the weird shape of a man, a stranger, all but starved to death, in wretched condition, emerges, staggers toward us, hands outstretched to us on the beaches, begging mercy. We turned, looked back at him, his filth appalling, his beard all tangled, his rags hooked up with thorns. Still, head to foot a Greek, a man once sent to Troy equipped with his country's arms. Soon as he saw our Dardan dress from afar, our Trojan swords, he froze in his tracks a moment, gripped by fear, then breakneck made for the shore with tears and prayers, I beg you, Trojans, beg by the stars, the gods above, the clear bright air we breathe, sail me off and away. Anywhere, any land you please, that's all I want. I am, I confess, a man from the Greek fleets, I admit I fought to seize your household gods. For that, if my crime against you is so wicked, rip me to bits and fling the bits in the sea, plunge me into the depths. If die I must, death at the hands of men will be a joy. With that, he clutched my knees and kneeling, groveling, clung fast. We press him hard, who is he? Who are his parents? What rough fortune has driven him to despair? Father Anchises, barely pausing, gives the man his hand and the friendly gesture lifts the stranger's spirits. Setting his fears aside, he starts out on his story, I come from Ithaca, my country unlucky Ulysses' comrade. Call me Achaemenids. My father Adamastus was poor, and so I sailed to Troy, oh if only our poverty lasted longer. But here my comrades left me, forgot me, this monstrous cave of the Cyclops, fleeing in terror from its brutal mouth. This gruesome house. Gory with its hideous feasts. Pitch dark inside. Immense. The giant himself, his head scrapes the stars. God save our earth from such a scourge. No looking him in the face, no trying to reach him with a word. He gorges himself on the innards and black blood of all his wretched victims. With my own eyes I've seen him snatch a pair of our men in one massive hand and, sprawling amidst his lair, crush their bodies on the rocks till the caves more swam with splashing blood. I've seen him gnawing limbs, oozing dark filth, and the warm flesh twitching still between his grinding jaws. But what a price he paid! Ulysses would not tolerate such an outrage, always true to himself when it's life or death. Soon as the monster gorged himself to bursting, buried deep in wine, his neck slumping to one side, spreading his huge hulk across his cave, dead asleep but retching chunks of flesh and wine awash with filth, we prayed to the great gods, drew lots, rushed in a ring around him there and drilled out with a stabbing spike his one enormous eye, lodged deep in his grisly brow, big as a Greek shield or Apollo's torch, the sun. So at last we avenged our comrades' shades, elated. But you, poor men, run now, run for your lives, cut your hawsers, sail away. Just as horrible, huge as Polyphemus here in his rocky cavern, penning his woolly sheep, milking their udders dry, there are a hundred more accursed cyclops, everywhere, crowding the deep inlets, lumbering over the ridged hills. Three times now the horns of the moon have filled with light since I've dragged out my lonely days through the woods, where only the wild things have their dens and lairs, and watched from a lookout crag for the giant cyclops, quaking to hear their rumbling tread, their shouts. I live on the meagre fare the branches offer, berries and cornel nuts as hard as rocks, and feed on roots I tear from the earth. As I scanned the horizon, yours were the first ships that I'd seen come ashore. I throw myself on your mercy, whoever you may be. Enough for me to escape that barbarous crew. Better for you to take this wretched life, by any death you please. He'd barely finished when there, up on a ridge we saw him, Polyphemus. The shepherd among his flock, hauling his massive hulk, groping toward the shore he knew by heart. The monster, immense, gargantuan, hideous, blind, his lone eye gone, clutching a pine tree trunk to keep his footing firm. His woolly sheep at his side, his sole pleasure, his only solace in pain. Soon as the giant gained deep water and offshore swells, he washed the blood still trickling down from his dugout socket, gnashing his teeth, groaning, and wades out in the surf but the breaker still can't douse his soaring thighs. In panic we rushed to escape, get clear of his reach, take aboard the fugitive, he had earned his way, and we cut our lines, dead quiet, put our backs in a racing stroke that makes the waters churn. He hears us, wheels to follow our splashing oars but he has no chance to seize us in his clutches, he's no match for Ionian tides in his pursuit, so he gives a tremendous howl that shakes the sea and all its waves, all Italy inland shudders in fear and Etna's echoing caverns bellow from their depths. 
Down from the woods and high hills they lumber in alarm, the tribe of Cyclops, down to the harbor, crowding the shore, the Brotherhood of Etna. We see them standing there, powerless, each with his one glaring eye, their heads towering up, and horrendous muster looming into the vaulting sky like mountain oaks or cypress heavy with cones in Jupiter's soaring woods or Diana's sacred grove. Breakneck on, impelled by the sharp edge of fear, we shake our sheets out, spread our sails to the wind, wherever it may blow. But we run counter to Helena's warnings not to steer between Scylla and Charybdis, only a razor edge between the devil and deep blue sea, so it's come about, we must swing back, when look, a north wind speeds to our rescue, sweeping south from the narrow cape of Polaris, driving us past the Pantagia's mouth, that haven of native rock, past the bay of Megara, Thapsus lying low, sea marks pointed out by Achaemenids now, retracing the shores he once had coasted past as luckless Ulysses' shipmate. There is an island fronting the Bay of Syracuse, over against Plumerium's headland rocked by breakers, called Ortigia once by men in the old days. They tell how Alpheus, the Aline River, forcing his passage undersea by secret channels, now, Arethusa, mixes streams at your fountain's mouth with your Sicilian waters. We act on command, we worship the powers of the place, then sail on past the Hellerus rich, marshy fields, then brush by the jutting reefs of craggy Cape Pachinus, then distant Camarina heaves into view, a town the fates will never allow to move, then Gila's fields and Gila named for its rushing torrent. Next in the offing Acragas rears, Steep City, once a famous breeder of fiery steeds, and shows its mighty ramparts. Next we run with the winds and leave Salinas, city of palms, astern, then pick our way by the shoals and hidden spurs of Lilibium. Then, at last, the port of Drepanum takes me in, a shore that brought no joy. Here, after all the blows of sea and storm I lost my father, my mainstay in every danger and defeat. Spent as I was, you left me here, Anchises, best of fathers, plucked from so many perils, all for nothing. Not even Helenus, filled with dreadful warnings, foresaw such grief for me, not even foul Salino. This was my last ordeal, my long journey's end. From here I sailed. God drove me to your shores. So Aeneas, with all eyes fixed on him alone, the founder of his people recalled his wanderings now, the fates the gods had sent. He fell hushed at last, his tale complete, at rest. Book 4. The Tragic Queen of Carthage. But the queen, too long she has suffered the pain of love, hour by hour nursing the wound with her lifeblood, consumed by the fire buried in her heart. The man's courage, the sheer pride of his line, they all come pressing home to her, over and over. His looks, his words, they pierce her heart and cling, no peace, no rest for her body, love will give her none. A new day's dawn was moving over the earth, Aurora's torch cleansing the sky, burning away the dank shade of night as the restless queen, beside herself, confides now to the sister of her soul, dear Anna, the dreams that haunt my quaking heart. Who is this stranger just arrived to lodge in our house, our guest? How noble his face, his courage, and what a soldier! I'm sure, I know it's true, the man is born of the gods. Fear exposes the low-born man at once. But, oh, how tossed he's been by the blows of fate! What a tale he's told, what a bitter bowl of war he's drunk to the dregs! If my heart had not been fixed, dead set against embracing another man in the bonds of marriage, ever since my first love deceived me, cheated me by his death, if I were not as sick as I am of the bridal bed and torch, this, perhaps, is my one lapse that might have brought me down. I confess it, Anna, yes. Ever since my Zacchaeus, my poor husband met his fate, and my own brother shed his blood and stained our household gods, this is the only man who's roused me deeply, swayed my wavering heart. The signs of the old flame, I know them well. I pray that the earth gape deep enough to take me down or the Almighty Father blast me with one bolt to the shades, the pale, glimmering shades in hell, the pit of night, before I dish you, my conscience, break your laws. He's carried my love away, the man who wed me first, may he hold it tight, safeguard it in his grave. She broke off, her voice choking with tears that brimmed and wet her breast. But Anna answered, Dear one, dearer than light to me, your sister, would you waste away, grieving your youth away, alone, never to know the joy of children, all the gifts of love? Do you really believe that's what the dust desires, the ghosts in their ashen tombs? Have it your way. But granted that no one tempted you in the past, not in your great grief, no Libyan suitor, and none before in Tyre, you scorned Iabas and other lords of Africa, sons bred by this fertile earth in all their triumph, why resist it now, this love that stirs your heart? 
Don't you recall whose lands you settled here, the men who press around you? On one side the Getulian cities, fighters matchless in battle, unbridled Numidians, Surtees, the treacherous sandbanks. On the other side an endless desert, parched earth where the wild bark and marauders range at will. Why mention the war that's boiling up in Tyre, your brother's deadly threats? I think, in fact, the favor of all the gods and Juno's backing drove these Trojan ships on the winds that sailed them here. Think what a city you will see, my sister, what a kingdom rising high if you marry such a man. With a Trojan army marching at our side, think how the glory of Carthage will tower to the clouds. Just ask the gods for pardon, win them with offerings. Treat your guests like kings. Weave together some pretext for delay, while winter spends its rage and drenching Orion whips the sea, the ship still battered, weather still too wild. These were the words that fanned her sister's fire, turned her doubts to hopes and dissolved her sense of shame. And first they visit the altars, make the rounds, praying the gods for blessings, shrine by shrine. They slaughter the pick of yelling sheep, the old way, to Ceres, giver of laws, to Apollo, Bacchus who sets us free and Juno above all, who guards the bonds of marriage. Dido aglow with beauty holds the bowl in her right hand, pouring wine between the horns of a pure white cow or gravely paces before the gods' fragrant altars, under their statues eyes refreshing her first gifts, dawn to dusk. And when the victim's chests are splayed, Dido, her lips parted, pours over their entrails, throbbing still, four signs. But, oh, how little they know, the omniscient seers. What good are prayers and shrines to a person mad with love? The flame keeps gnawing into her tender marrow hour by hour and deep in her heart the silent wound lives on. Dido burns with love, the tragic queen. She wanders in frenzy through her city streets like a wounded doe caught all off guard by a hunter stalking the woods of Crete, who strikes her from afar and leaves his winging steel in her flesh, and his unaware but she veers in flight through Dick's woody glades, fixed in her side the shaft that takes her life. And now Dido leads her guest through the heart of Carthage, displaying Phoenician power, the city readied for him. She'd speak her heart but her voice chokes, mid-word. Now at dusk she calls for the feast to start again, madly begging to hear again the agony of Troy, to hang on his lips again, savoring his story. Then, with the guests gone, and the dimming moon quenching its light in turn, and the setting stars inclining heads to sleep, alone in the echoing hall, distraught, she flings herself on the couch that he left empty. Lost as he is, she's lost as well, she hears him, sees him or she holds Ascanius back and dandles him on her lap, bewitched by the boy's resemblance to his father, trying to cheat the love she dare not tell. The towers of Carthage, half-built, rise no more, and the young men quit their combat drills in arms. The harbours, the battlements plan to block attack, all work suspended now, the huge, threatening walls with the soaring cranes that sway across the sky. Now, no sooner had Jove's dear wife perceived that Dido was in the grip of such a scourge, no thought of pride could stem her passion now, than Juno approaches Venus and sets a cunning trap, what a glittering prize, a triumph you carry home. You and your boy there, you grand and glorious powers. Just look, one woman crushed by the craft of two gods. I am not blind, you know. For years you've looked askance at the homes of rising Carthage, feared our ramparts. But where will it end? What good is all our strife? Come, why don't we labor now to live in peace? Eternal peace, sealed with the bonds of marriage. You have it all, whatever your heart desires, Dido's ablaze with love, drawing the frenzy deep into her bones. So, let us rule this people in common, joint command. And let her marry her Phrygian lover, be his slave and give her Tyrians over to your control, her dowry in your hands. Perceiving at once that this was all pretense, a ruse to shift the kingdom of Italy onto Libyan shores, Venus countered Juno, now who'd be so insane as to shun your offer and strive with you in war? If only fortune crowns your proposal with success. But swayed by the fates, I have my doubts. Would Jove want one city to hold the Tyrians and the Trojan exiles? Would he sanction the mingling of their peoples, bless their binding pacts? You are his wife, with every right to probe him with your prayers. You lead the way. I'll follow. The work is mine, imperious Juno carried on, but how to begin this pressing matter now and see it through? I'll explain in a word or so. Listen closely. Tomorrow Aeneas and lovesick Dido plan to hunt the woods together, soon as the day's first light climbs high and the titan's rays lay bare the earth. 
But while the beaters scramble to ring the glens with nets, I'll shower down a cloudburst, hail, black driving rain, I'll shatter the vaulting sky with claps of thunder. The huntsmen will scatter, swallowed up in the dark, and Dido and Troy's commander will make their way to the same cave for shelter. And I'll be there, if I can count on your own goodwill in this, I'll bind them in lasting marriage, make them one. Their wedding it will be. So Juno appealed and Venus did not oppose her, nodding in assent and smiling at all the guile she saw through. Meanwhile dawn rose up and left her ocean bed and soon as her rays have lit the sky, an elite band of young huntsmen streams out through the gates, bearing the nets, wide-meshed or tight for traps and their hunting spears with broad iron heads, troops of Massilian horsemen galloping hard, packs of powerful hounds, keen on the scent. Yet the queen delays, lingering in her chamber with Carthaginian chiefs expectant at her doors. And there her proud, mettlesome charger prances in gold and royal purple, pouring with thunder hoofs, champing a foam fleck bit. At last she comes, with a great retinue crowding round the queen who wears a Tyrian cloak with rich embroidered fringe. Her quiver is gold, her hair drawn up in a golden torque and a golden buckle clasps her purple robe in folds. Nor do her Trojan comrades tarry. Out they march, young Ulysses flushed with joy. Aeneas in command, the handsomest of them all, advancing as her companion joins his troop with hers. So vivid. Think of Apollo leaving his Lycian haunts and Xanthus in winter spate, his out to visit Delos, his mother's isle, and strike up the dance again while round the altars swirls a growing throng of Cretans, Dryopians, Agathertians with tattoos, and a drumming roar goes up as the god himself strides the Cynthian ridge, his streaming hair braided with pliant laurel leaves entwined in twists of gold, and arrows clash on his shoulders. So no less swiftly Aeneas strides forward now and his face shines with a glory like the gods. Once the huntsmen have reached the trackless lairs aloft in the foothills, suddenly, look, some wild goats flushed from a ridge come scampering down the slopes and lower down a herd of stags goes bounding across the open country, ranks massed in a cloud of dust, fleeing the high ground. But young Ascanius, deep in the valley, rides his eager mount and relishing every stride, outstrips them all, now goats, now stags, but his heart is racing, praying, if only they'd send among this feeble, easy game some frothing wild boar or a lion stalking down from the heights and tawny in the sun. Too late. The skies have begun to rumble, peals of thunder first and the storm breaking next, a cloud burst pelting hail and the troops of hunters scatter up and down the plain, Tyrian comrades, bands of Dardans, Venus' grandson Eulus panicking, running for cover, quick, and down the mountain gullies erupt in torrents. Dido and Troy's commander make their way to the same cave for shelter now. Primordial Earth and Juno, queen of marriage, give the signal and lightning torches flare and the high sky bears witness to the wedding, nymphs on the mountaintops wail out the wedding hymn. This was the first day of her death, the first of grief, the cause of it all. From now on, Dido cares no more for appearances, nor for her reputation, either. She no longer thinks to keep the affair a secret, no, she calls it a marriage, using the word to cloak her sense of guilt. Straightway rumor flies through Libya's great cities, rumor, swiftest of all the evils in the world. She thrives on speed, stronger for every stride, slight with fear at first, soon soaring into the air she treads the ground and hides her head in the clouds. She is the last, they say, our mother earth produced. Bursting in rage against the gods, she bore a sister for Coeus and Enceladus, rumor, quicksilver afoot and swift on the wing, a monster, horrific, huge and under every feather on her body, what a marvel, an eye that never sleeps and as many tongues as eyes and as many raucous mouths and ears pricked up for news. By night she flies aloft, between the earth and sky, whirring across the dark, never closing her lids in soothing sleep. By day she keeps her watch, crouched on a peaked roof or palace turret, terrorizing the great cities, clinging as fast to her twisted lies as she clings to words of truth. Now rumor is in her glory, filling Africa's ears with tale on tale of intrigue, bruiting her song of facts and fossils mingled. Here this Aeneas, born of Trojan blood, has arrived in Carthage, and lovely Dido deigns to join the man in wedlock. Even now they warm the winter, long as it lasts, with obscene desire, oblivious to their kingdoms, abject thralls of lust. Such talk the sordid goddess spreads on the lips of men, then swerves in her course and heading straight for King Iabas, stokes his heart with hearsay, piling fuel on his fire. Iabas, son of an African nymph whom Jove had raped, raised the god a hundred splendid temples across the king's wide realm, a hundred altars too, consecrating the sacred fires that never died, eternal sentinels of the gods. 
the earth was rich with blood of slaughtered herds and the temple doorways wreathed with riots of flowers. This Iabas, driven wild, set ablaze by the bitter rumor, approached an altar, they say, as the gods hovered round, and lifting a suppliant's hands, he poured out prayers to Jove, almighty Jove. Now as the moors adore you, feasting away on their gaudy couches, tipping wine in your honor, do you see this? Or are we all fools, father, to dread the bolts you hurl? All aimless then, your fires high in the clouds that terrify us so? All empty noise, your peals of grumbling thunder? That woman, that vagrant. Here in my own land she founded her paltry city for a pittance. We tossed her some beach to plow, on my terms, and then she spurns our offer of marriage, she embraces Aeneas as lord and master in her realm. And now this second Paris, leading his troop of eunuchs, his hair oozing oil, a Phrygian bonnet tucked up under his chin, he revels in all that he has filched, while we keep bearing gifts to your temples, yes, yours, coddling your reputation, all your hollow show. So King Iabas appealed, his hand clutching the altar, and Jove Almighty heard and turned his gaze on the royal walls of Carthage and the lovers oblivious now to their good name. He summons Mercury, gives him marching orders, quick, my son, away. Call up the Zephyrs, glide on wings of the wind. Find the Dardan captain who now malingers long in Tyrian Carthage, look, and pays no heed to the city's fate decrees are his. Take my commands through the racing winds and tell him this is not the man his mother, the lovely goddess, promised, not for this did she save him twice from Greek attacks. Never. He would be the one to master an Italy rife with leaders, shrill with the cries of war, to sire a people sprung from Teusa's noble blood and bring the entire world beneath the rule of law. If such a glorious destiny cannot fire his spirit, if he will not shoulder the task for his own fame, does the father of Ascanius grudge his son the walls of Rome? What is he plotting now? What hope can make him loiter among his foes, lose sight of Italian offspring still to come and all the Lavinian fields? Let him set sail. This is the sum of it. This must be our message. Jove had spoken. Mercury made ready at once to obey the great commands of his almighty father. First he fastens under his feet the golden sandals, winged to sweep him over the waves and earth alike with the rush of gusting winds. Then he seizes the wand that calls the pallid spirits up from the underworld and ushers others down to the grim dark depths, the wand that lends us sleep or sends it away, that unseals our eyes in death. Equipped with this, he spurs the winds and swims through billowing clouds till in mid-flight he spies the summit and rugged flanks of Atlas, whose long-enduring peak supports the skies. Atlas, his pine-covered crown is forever girded round with black clouds, battered by wind and rain, driving blizzards cloak his shoulders with snow, torrents course down from the old titan's chin and shaggy beard that bristles stiff with ice. Here the god of Selene landed first, banking down to a stop on balanced wings. From there, headlong down with his full weight he plunged to the sea as a seahawk skims the waves, rounding the beaches, rounding cliffs to hunt for fish inshore. So Mercury of Selene flew between the earth and sky to gain the sandy coast of Libya, cutting the winds that sweep down from his mother's father, Atlas. Soon as his winged feet touch down on the first huts in sight, he spots Aeneas founding the city fortifications, building homes in Carthage. And his sword hilt is studded with tawny jasper stars, a cloak of glowing Tyrian purple drapes his shoulders, a gift that the wealthy queen had made herself, weaving into the weft a glinting mesh of gold. Mercury lashes out at once, you, so now you lay foundation stones for the soaring walls of Carthage. Building her gorgeous city, doting on your wife. Blind to your own realm, oblivious to your fate. The king of the gods, whose power sways earth and sky, he is the one who sends me down from brilliant Olympus, bearing commands for you through the racing winds. What are you plotting now? Wasting time in Libya, what hope misleads you so? If such a glorious destiny cannot fire your spirit, if you will not shoulder the task for your own fame, at least remember Ascanius rising into his prime, the hopes you lodge in Eulus, your only heir, you owe him Italy's realm, the land of Rome. This order still on his lips, the god vanished from sight into empty air. Then Aeneas was truly overwhelmed by the vision, stunned, his hackles bristle with fear, his voice chokes in his throat. He yearns to be gone, to desert this land he loves, thunderstruck by the warnings, Jupiter's command. But what can he do? What can he dare say now to the queen in all her fury and win her over? Where to begin, what opening? 
Thoughts racing, here, there, probing his options, turning to this plan, that plan, torn in two until, at his wit's end, this answer seems the best. He summons Mnestheus, Segestus, staunch Serestus, gives them orders, fit out the fleet, but not a word. Muster the crews on shore, all tackle set to sail, but the cause for our new course, you keep it secret. Yet he himself, since Dido who means the world to him knows nothing, never dreaming such a powerful love could be uprooted, he will try to approach her, find the moment to break the news gently, a way to soften the blow that he must leave. All shipmates snap to commands, glad to do his orders. True, but the queen, who can delude a lover, soon caught wind of a plot afoot, the first to sense the Trojans are on the move. She fears everything now, even with all secure. Rumor, vicious as ever, brings her word, already distraught, that Trojans are rigging out their galleys, gearing to set sail. She rages in helpless frenzy, blazing through the entire city, raving like some mina driven wild when the women shake the sacred emblems, when the cyclic orgy, shouts of Bacchus, fire her on and Citheran echoes round with maddened midnight cries. At last she assails Aeneas, before he said a word, so, you traitor, you really believed you'd keep this a secret, this great outrage. Steal away in silence from my shores? Can nothing hold you back? Not our love? Not the pledge once sealed with our right hands? Not even the thought of Dido doomed to a cruel death? Why labor to rig your fleet when the winters roar, to risk the deep when the north wind's closing in? You cruel, heartless, even if you were not pursuing alien fields and unknown homes, even if ancient Troy were standing, still, who'd sail for Troy across such heaving seas? You're running away, from me? Oh, I pray you by these tears, by the faith in your right hand, what else have I left myself in all my pain, by our wedding vows, the marriage we began, if I deserve some decency from you now, if anything mine has ever won your heart, pity a great house about to fall, I pray you, if prayers have any place, reject this scheme of yours. Thanks to you, the African tribes, Numidian warlords hate me, even my own Tyrians rise against me. Thanks to you, my sense of honor is gone, my one and only pathway to the stars, the renown I once held dear. In whose hands, my guest, do you leave me here to meet my death? Guest, that's all that remains of a husband and now. But why do I linger on? Until my brother Pygmalion batters down my walls? Or Iabas drags me off, his slave? If only you'd left a baby in my arms, our child, before you deserted me. Some little Aeneas playing about our halls, whose features at least would bring you back to me in spite of all, I would not feel so totally devastated, so destroyed. The queen stopped but he, warned by Jupiter now, his gaze held steady, fought to master the torment in his heart. At last he ventured a few words, I, you have done me so many kindnesses, and you could count them all. I shall never deny what you deserve, my queen, never regret my memories of Dido, not while I can recall myself and draw the breath of life. I'll state my case in a few words. I never dreamed I'd keep my flight a secret. Don't imagine that. Nor did I once extend a bridegroom's torch or enter into a marriage pact with you. If the fates had left me free to live my life, to arrange my own affairs of my own free will, Troy is the city, first of all, that I'd safeguard, Troy and all that's left of my people whom I cherish. The Grand Palace of Priam would stand once more, with my own hands I would fortify a second Troy to house my Trojans in defeat. But not now. Grinian Apollo's oracle says that I must seize on Italy's noble land, his Lycian lot say, Italy. There lies my love, there lies my homeland now. If you, a Phoenician, fix your eyes on Carthage, a Libyan stronghold, tell me, why do you grudge the Trojans their new homes on Italian soil? What is the crime if we seek far-off kingdoms too? My father, Anchises, whenever the darkness shrouds the earth in its dank shadows, whenever the stars go flaming up the sky, my father's anxious ghost warns me in dreams and fills my heart with fear. My son Ascanius. I feel the wrong I do to one so dear, robbing him of his kingdom, lands in the west, his fields decreed by fate. And now the messenger of the gods, I swear it, by your life and mine, dispatched by Jove himself has brought me firm commands through the racing winds. With my own eyes I saw him, clear, in broad daylight, moving through your gates. With my own ears I drank his message in. Come, stop inflaming us both with your appeals. I set sail for Italy, all against my will. 
even from the start of his declaration, she has glared at him askance, her eyes roving over him, head to foot, with a look of stony silence, till abruptly she cries out in a blaze of fury, no goddess was your mother. No Dardana sighed your line, you traitor, liar, no, Mount Caucasus fathered you on its flinty, rugged flanks and the tigers of Hyrcania gave you their dugs to suck. Why hide it? Why hold back? To suffer greater blows? Did he groan when I wept? Even look at me? Never. Surrender a tear? Pity the one who loves him? What can I say first? So much to say. Now, neither mighty Juno nor Saturn's son, the father, gazes down on this with just, impartial eyes. There's no faith left on earth. He was washed up on my shores, helpless, and I, I took him in, like a maniac let him share my kingdom, salvaged his lost fleet, plucked his crews from death. Oh I am swept by the furies, gales of fire. Now it's Apollo the prophet, Apollo's Lycian oracles, they are his masters now, and now, to top it off, the messenger of the gods, dispatched by Jove himself, comes rushing down the winds with his grimset commands. Really? What work for the gods who live on high, what a concern to ruffle their repose. I won't hold you, I won't even refute you, go, strike out for Italy on the winds, your realm across the sea. I hope, I pray, if the just gods still have any power, wrecked on the rocks mid-sea you'll drink your bowl of pain to the dregs, crying out the name of Dido over and over, and worlds away I'll hound you then with pitch-black flames, and when icy death has severed my body from its breath, then my ghost will stalk you through the world. You'll pay, you shameless, ruthless, and I will hear of it, yes, the report will reach me even among the deepest shades of death. She breaks off in the midst of outbursts, desperate, flinging herself from the light of day, sweeping out of his sight, leaving him numb with doubt, with much to fear and much he means to say. Catching her as she faints away, her women bear her back to her marble bridal chamber and lay her body down upon her bed. But Aeneas is driven by duty now. Strongly as he longs to ease and allay her sorrow, speak to her, turn away her anguish with reassurance, still, moaning deeply, heart shattered by his great love, in spite of all he obeys the gods' commands and back he goes to his ships. Then the Trojans throw themselves in the labor, launching their tall vessels down along the beach and the hull rubbed sleek with pitch floats high again. So keen to be gone, the men drag down from the forest untrimmed timbers and bow still green for oars. You can see them streaming out of the whole city, men like ants that, wary of winter's onset, pillage some huge pile of wheat to store away in their grange and their army's long black line goes marching through the field, trundling their spoils down some cramped, grassy track. Some put shoulders to giant grains and thrust them on, some dress the ranks, strictly martial stragglers, and the whole trail seeds with labor. What did you feel then, Dido, seeing this? How deep were the groans you uttered, gazing now from the city heights to watch the broad beaches seething with action, the bay a chaos of outcries right before your eyes. Love, you tyrant. To what extremes won't you compel our hearts? Again she resorts to tears, driven to move the man, or try, with prayers, a suppliant kneeling, humbling her pride to passion. So if die she must, she'll leave no way untried. Anna, you see the hurly-burly all across the beach, the crew swarming from every quarter? The wind cries for canvas, the buoyant oarsmen crown their sterns with wreaths. This terrible sorrow, since I saw it coming, Anna, I can endure it now. But even so, my sister, carry out for me one great favor in my pain. To you alone he used to listen, the traitor, to you confide his secret feelings. You alone know how and when to approach him, soothe his moods. Go, my sister. Plead with my imperious enemy. Remind him I was never at Aulis, never swore a pact with the Greeks to rout the Trojan people from the earth. I sent no fleet to Troy, I never uprooted the ashes of his father, Anchises, never stirred his shade. Why does he shut his pitiless ears to my appeals? Where's he rushing now? If only he would offer one last gift to the wretched queen who loves him, to wait for fair winds, smooth sailing for his flight. I no longer beg for the long-lost marriage he betrayed, nor would I ask him now to desert his kingdom, no, his lovely passion, Latium. All I ask is time, blank time, some rest from frenzy, breathing room till my fate can teach my beaten spirit how to grieve. I beg him, pity your sister, Anna, one last favor, and if he grants it now, I'll pay him back, with interest, when I die. So Dido pleads and so her desolate sister takes him the tale of tears again and again. 
but no tears move Aeneas now. He is deaf to all appeals. He won't relent. The fates bar the way and heaven blocks his gentle, human ears. As firm as a sturdy oak grown tough with age when the north winds blasting off the Alps compete, fighting left and right, to wrench it from the earth, and the winds scream, the trunk shudders, its leafy crest showers across the ground but it clings firm to its rock, its roots stretching as deep into the dark world below as its crown goes towering toward the gales of heaven, so firm the hero stands, buffeted left and right by storms of appeals, he takes the full force of love and suffering deep. In his great heart, his will stands unmoved. The falling tears are futile. Then, terrified by her fate, tragic Dido prays for death, sickened to see the vaulting sky above her. And to steal her new resolve to leave the light, she sees, laying gifts on the altar's steaming incense, shudder to hear it now, the holy water going black and the wine she pours congeals in bloody filth. She told no one what she saw, not even her sister. Worse, there was a marble temple in her palace, a shrine built for her long-lost love, Sikias. Holding it dear she tended it, marvellous devotion, draping the snow-white fleece and festal boughs. Now from its depths she seemed to catch his voice, the words of her dead husband calling out her name while night enclosed the earth in its dark shroud, and over and over a lonely owl perched on the rooftops drew out its low, throaty call to a long wailing dirge. And worse yet, the grim predictions of ancient seers keep terrifying her now with frightful warnings. Aeneas the hunter, savage in all her nightmares, drives her mad with panic. She always feels alone, abandoned, always wandering down some endless road, not a friend in sight, seeking her own Phoenicians in some godforsaken land. As frantic as Pentheus seeing battalions of Furies, twin suns ablaze and double cities of Thebes before his eyes. Or Agamemnon's Orests hounded off the stage, fleeing his mother armed with torches, black snakes, while blocking the doorway coil her Furies of revenge. So, driven by madness, beaten down by anguish, Dido was fixed on dying, working out in her mind the means, the moment. She approaches her grieving sister, Anna, masking her plan with a brave face aglow with hope, and says, I've found a way, dear heart, rejoice with your sister, either to bring him back in love for me or free me of love for him. Close to the bounds of ocean, west with the setting sun, lies Ethiopian land, the end of the earth, where colossal Atlas turns on his shoulder the heavens studded with flaming stars. From there, I have heard, a Massilian priestess comes who tended the temple held by Hesperian daughters. She'd safeguard the boughs in the sacred grove and ply the dragon with morsels dripping loops of oozing honey and poppies drowsy with slumber. With her spells she vows to release the hearts of those she likes, to inflict raw pain on others, to stop the rivers in midstream, reverse the stars in their courses, raise the souls of the dead at night and make earth shudder and rumble underfoot, you'll see, and send the ash trees marching down the mountains. I swear by the gods, dear Anna, by your sweet life, I arm myself with magic arts against my will. Now go, build me a pyre in secret, deep inside our courtyard under the open sky. Pile it high with his arms, he left them hanging within our bridal chamber, the traitor, so devoted then. And all his clothes and crowning it all, the bridal bed that brought my doom. I must obliterate every trace of the man, the curse, and the priestess shows the way. She says no more and now as the queen falls silent, pallor sweeps her face. Still, Anna cannot imagine these outlandish rites would mask her sister's death. She can't conceive of such a fiery passion. She fears nothing graver than Dido's grief at the death of her Sikias. So she does as she is told. But now the queen, as soon as the pyre was built beneath the open sky, towering up with pitch pine and cut logs of oak, deep in the heart of her house, she drapes the court with flowers, crowning the place with wreaths of death, and to top it off she lays his arms and the sword he left and an effigy of Aeneas, all on the bed they'd shared, for well she knows the future. Altars ring the pyre. Hair loose in the wind, the priestess thunders out the names of her three hundred gods, Erebus, Chaos and Triple Hecate, Diana the Three-Faced Virgin. She'd sprinkled water, simulating the springs of hell, and gathered potent herbs, reaped with bronze sickles under the moonlight, dripping their milky black poison, and fetched a love charm ripped from a foal's brow, just born, before the mother could gnaw it off. And Dido herself, standing before the altar, holding the sacred grain in reverent hands, with one foot free of its sandal, robes unbound, sworn now to die, she calls on the gods to witness, calls on the stars who know her approaching fate. And then to any power above, mindful, even-handed, who watches over lovers bound by unequal passion, Dido says her prayers. 
the dead of night, and weary living creatures throughout the world are enjoying peaceful sleep. The woods and savage seas are calm, at rest, and the circling stars are gliding on in their midnight courses, all the fields lie hushed and the flocks and gay and gorgeous birds that haunt the deep clear pools and the thorny country thickets all lie quiet now, under the silent night, asleep. But not the tragic queen, torn in spirit, Dido will not dissolve into sleep, her eyes, her mind won't yield to night. Her torments multiply, over and over her passion surges back into heaving waves of rage, she keeps on brooding, obsessions roil her heart, and now, what shall I do? Make a mockery of myself, go back to my old suitors, tempt them to try again? Beg the new Midians, grovel, plead for a husband, though time and again I scorn to wed their like. What then? Trail the Trojan ships, bend to the Trojans every last demand? So pleased, are they, with all the help, the relief I lent them once. And memory of my service past stands firm in grateful minds. And even if I were willing, would the Trojans allow me to board their proud ships, a woman they hate? Poor lost fool, can't you sense it, grasp it yet, the treachery of Laomedon's breed. What now? Do I take flight alone, consorting with crews of Trojan oarsmen in their triumph? Or follow them out with all my troops of Tyrians thronging the decks? Yes, hard as it was to uproot them once from Tyre. How can I force them back to sea once more, command them to spread their sails to the winds? No, no, die. You deserve it, end your pain with the sword. You, my sister, you were the first, won over by my tears, to pile these sorrows on my shoulders, mad as I was, to throw me into my enemy's arms. If only I'd been free to live my life, untested in marriage, free of guilt as some wild beast untouched by pangs like these. I broke the faith I swore to the ashes of Sychaeus. Such terrible grief kept breaking from her heart as Aeneas slept in peace on his ship's high stern, bent on departing now, all tackle set to sail. And now in his dreams it came again, the god, his phantom, the same features shining clear. Like Mercury head to foot, the voice, the glow, the golden hair, the bloom of youth on his limbs and his voice rang out with warnings once again, son of the goddess, how can you sleep so soundly in such a crisis? Can't you see the dangers closing around you now? Madman. Can't you hear the west wind ruffling to speed you on? That woman spawns her plots, mulling over some desperate outrage in her heart, lashing her surging rage, she's bent on death. Why not flee headlong? Flee headlong while you can. You'll soon see the waves a chaos of ships, lethal torches flaring, the whole coast ablaze, if now a new dawn breaks and finds you still malingering on these shores. Up with you now. Enough delay. Woman's a thing that's always changing, shifting like the wind. With that he vanished into the black night. Then, terrified by the sudden phantom, Aeneas, wrenching himself from sleep, leaps up and rouses his crews and spurs them headlong on, quick. Up and at it, shipmates, man the thwarts. Spread canvas fast. A god's come down from the sky once more, I've just seen him, urging us on to sever our mooring cables, sail at once. We follow you, bless God, whoever you are, glad at heart we obey your commands once more. Now help us, stand beside us with all your kindness, bring us favoring stars in the sky to blaze our way. Tearing sword from sheath like a lightning flash, he hacks the mooring lines with a naked blade. Gripped by the same desire, all hands pitch in, they hoist and haul. The shores deserted now, the waters hidden under the fleet, they bend to it, churn the spray and sweep the clear blue sea. By now early dawn had risen up from the saffron bed of Tithonus, scattering fresh light on the world. But the queen from her high tower, catching sight of the morning's white glare, the armada heading out to sea with sails trimmed to the wind, and certain the shore and port were empty, stripped of oarsmen, three, four times over she beat her lovely breast, she ripped at her golden hair and, oh, by God, she cries, will the stranger just sail off and make a mockery of our realm? Will no one rush to arms, come streaming out of the whole city, hunt him down, race to the docks and launch the ships? Go, quick, bring fire. Hand out weapons. Bend to the oars. What am I saying? Where am I? What insanity's this that shifts my fixed resolve? Dido, oh poor fool, is it only now your wicked work strikes home? It should have then, when you offered him your scepter. Look at his hand clasp, look at his good faith now, that man who, they say, carries his father's gods, who stooped to shoulder his father bent with age. 
Couldn't I have seized him then, ripped him to pieces, scattered them in the sea? Or slashed his men with steel, butchered Ascanius, served him up as his father's feast? True, the luck of battle might have been at risk, well, risk away. Whom did I have to fear? I was about to die. I should have torched their camp and flooded their decks with fire. The son, the father, the whole Trojan line, I should have wiped them out, then hurled myself on the pyre to crown it all. You, son, whose fires scan all works of the earth, and you, Juno, the witness, midwife to my agonies, Hecate greeted by nightly shrieks at city crossroads, and you, you avenging furies and gods of dying Dido. Hear me, turn your power my way, attend my sorrows, I deserve your mercy, hear my prayers. If that curse of the earth must reach his haven, labor on to landfall, if Jove and the fates command and the boundary stone is fixed, still, let him be plagued in war by a nation proud in arms, torn from his borders, wrenched from Euless embrace, let him grovel for help and watch his people die a shameful death. And then, once he has bowed down to an unjust peace, may he never enjoy his realm and the light he yearns for, never, let him die before his day, unburied on some desolate beach. That is my prayer, my final cry, I pour it out with my own lifeblood. And you, my Tyrians, harry with hatred all his line, his race to come, make that offering to my ashes, send it down below. No love between our peoples, ever, no pacts of peace. Come rising up from my bones, you avenger still unknown, to stalk those Trojan settlers, hunt with fire and iron, now or in time to come, whenever the power is yours. Shore clash with shore, sea against sea and sword against sword, this is my curse, war between all our peoples, all their children, endless war. With that, her mind went veering back and forth, what was the quickest way to break off from the light, the life she loathed. And so with a few words she turned to Bas, Sikia's old nurse, her own was now black ashes deep in her homeland lost forever, dear old nurse, send Anna my sister to me here. Tell her to hurry, sprinkle herself with river water, bring the victims marked for the sacrifice I must make. So let her come. And wrap your brow with the holy bands. These rites to Jove of the stakes that I have set in motion, I yearn to consummate them, and the pain of love, give that cursed Trojan's pyre to the flames. The nurse bustled off with an old crone's zeal. But Dido, trembling, desperate now with the monstrous thing afoot, her bloodshot eyes rolling, quivering cheeks blotched and pale with imminent death, goes bursting through the doors to the inner courtyard, clambers in frenzy up the soaring pyre and unsheathes a sword, a Trojan sword she once sought as a gift, but not for such an end. And next, catching sight of the Trojans' clothes and the bed they knew by heart, delaying a moment for tears, for memory's sake, the queen lay down and spoke her final words, Oh, dear relics, dear as long as fate and the gods allowed, receive my spirit and set me free of pain. I have lived a life. I've journeyed through the course that fortune charted for me. And now I pass to the world below, my ghost in all its glory. I have founded a noble city, seen my ramparts rise. I have avenged my husband, punished my blood brother, our mortal foe. Happy, all too happy I would have been if only the Trojan keels had never grazed our coast. She presses her face in the bed and cries out, I shall die unavenged, but die I will. So, so, I rejoice to make my way among the shades. And may that heartless Dardan, far at sea, drink down deep the sight of our fires here and bear with him this omen of our death. All at once, in the midst of her last words, her women see her doubled over the sword, the blood foaming over the blade, her hand splattered red. A scream goes stabbing up to the high roofs, rumor raves like a menad through the shocked city, sobs, and grief, and the wails of women ringing out through homes, and the heavens echo back the keening din, for all the world as if enemies stormed the walls and all of Carthage or old Tyre were toppling down and flames in their fury, wave on mounting wave were billowing over the roofs of men and gods. Anna heard and, stunned, breathless with terror, raced through the crowd, her nails clawing her face, fists beating her breast, crying out to her sister now at the edge of death, was it all for this, my sister? You deceived me all along? Is this what your pyre meant for me, this, your fires, this, your altars? You deserted me, what shall I grieve for first? Your friend, your sister, you scorn me now in death. You should have called me on to the same fate. The same agony, same sword, the one same hour had borne us off together. Just to think I built your pyre with my own hands, implored our father's gods with my own voice, only to be cut off from you, how very cruel, when you lay down to die. 
You have destroyed your life, my sister, mine too, your people, the lords of Sidon and your new city here. Please, help me to bathe her wounds in water now, and if any last, lingering breath still hovers, let me catch it on my lips. With those words she had climbed the pyre's topmost steps and now, clasping her dying sister to her breast, fondling her she sobbed, stanching the dark blood with her own gown. Dido, trying to raise her heavy eyes once more, failed, deep in her heart the wound kept rasping, hissing on. Three times she tried to struggle up on an elbow, three times she fell back, writhing on her bed. Her gaze wavering into the high skies, she looked for a ray of light and when she glimpsed it, moaned. Then Juno in all her power, filled with pity for Dido's agonizing death, her labor long and hard, sped Iris down from Olympus to release her spirit wrestling now in a deathlock with her limbs. Since she was dying a death not fated or deserved, no, tormented, before her day, in a blaze of passion, Proserpina had yet to pluck a golden lock from her head and commit her life to the stakes and the dark world below. So Iris, glistening dew, comes skimming down from the sky on gilded wings, trailing showers of iridescent shimmering into the sun, and hovering over Dido's head, declares, so commanded, I take this lock as a sacred gift to the god of death, and I release you from your body. With that, she cut the lock with her hand and all at once the warmth slipped away, the life dissolved in the winds. Book 5. Funeral Games for Anchises. All the while Aeneas, steeled for a mid-sea passage, held the fleet on course, well on their way now, blowing the waves blown dark by a north wind as he glanced back at the walls of Carthage set aglow by the fires of tragic Dido's pyre. What could light such a conflagration? A mystery, but the Trojans know the pains of a great love defiled, and the lengths a woman driven mad can go, and it leads their hearts down ways of grim foreboding. Once they had reached the high seas, no land in sight, no longer, water at all points, at all points the sky, looming over their heads a pitch-dark thunderhead brought on night and storm, ruffling the swells black. Even the pilot Palinurus, high astern at his station, cries out, why such cloud banks wrapped around the sky? Father Neptune, what are you whipping up for us now? And with that he issues orders, trim your sails. Bend to your sturdy oars and setting canvas aslant to work the wind, he calls out to his captain, great-hearted Aeneas, no, not even if Jove himself would pledge me with all his power, could I dream of reaching Italy under skies like these. The wind shifted, surging athwart our beam, roaring out of the black west, building into clouds. There's no fighting it, no making way against it, we're too weak. Since fortune's got the upper hand, let's follow her where she calls and change course. No long way off, I think, there are friendly shores, the coast of your brother Eric's, Sicily's havens, if I remember rightly and take our bearings back by the stars I marked when we set out. That's what the wind demands, says good Aeneas. For long I've watched you trying to fight against it, all for nothing. Shorten sail, change course. What land could please me more, and where would I rather beach our battered ships than Sicily? Home that harbors my Dardan friend Assests, earth that holds my father Anchise's bones. At that, they head for port and a following west wind bellies out their sails. The fleet goes skimming over the whitecaps now, the men rejoicing to wheel their prows around to a coast they know, at last. But far away, high on a mountain lookout, quite amazed to see the fleet of his old friends coming in, Assests rushes down to meet them there, a wild figure bristling spears and a Libyan she bears hide. Born of a Trojan mother to the river god Crinesus, Assests, never forgetting his age old lineage, gladly welcomes his Trojan friend's return. He warms them in with treasures of the field, he cheers the exhausted men with generous care. And next, once day broke in the east and put the stars to flight, Aeneas summons his crews from down along the beach and greets them all from a mounded rise of ground, gallant sons of Dardanus, born of the god's high blood, the wheeling year has passed, rounding out its months, since we committed to earth my godlike father's bones, his relics, and sanctified the altars with our tears. The day has returned, if I am not mistaken, the day always harsh to my heart, I'll always hold in honor. So you gods have willed. Were I passing the hours, an exile lost in the swirling sands of Carthage or caught in Greek seas, imprisoned in Mycenae, I would still perform my anniversary vows, carry out our processions grand and grave and heat the altars high with fitting gifts. But now, beyond our dreams, here we stand by the very bones and ashes of my father, not, I know, without the plan and power of the gods, borne by the seas we've reached this friendly haven. So come, all of us celebrate our happy, buoyant rites. Pray for fair winds. 
and may it please my father, once my city is built with temples in his name, that I offer him these rites year in, year out. A cests born in Troy will give you cattle, two head for every ship. Invite to the feast our household gods, the gods of our own home and those our host assests worships, too. Then, if the ninth dawn brings a brilliant day to the race of men and her rays lay bare the earth, I shall hold games for all our Trojans. First a race for our swift ships, then for our fastest man afoot, and then our best and boldest can step up to win the javelin hurl or wing the wind swift arrow or dare to fight with bloody rawhide gauntlets. Come all. See who takes the victory prize, the palm. A reverent silence, all, and crown your brows with wreaths. With that, he binds his own brows with his mother's myrtle. So does Helimus, so does Acestes ripe in years, the boy Ascanius too, and the other young men take his lead. Leaving the council now with thousands in his wake, amid his immense cortege, Aeneas gains the tomb and here he pours libations, each in proper order. Two bowls of unmixed wine he tips on the ground and two of fresh milk, two more of hallowed blood, then scatters crimson flowers with this prayer, Hail, my blessed father, hail again. I salute your ashes, your spirit and your shade, my father I rescued once, but all for nothing. Not with you would it be my fate to search for Italy's shores and destined fields and, whatever it may be, the Italian river Tiber. At his last words a serpent slithered up from the shrine's depths, drawing its seven huge coils, seven rolling coils calmly enfolding the tomb, gliding through the altars, his back blazed with a maze of sea-blue flecks, his scales with a sheen of gold, shimmering as a rainbow showers iridescent sunlight arcing down the clouds. Aeneas stopped, struck by the sight. The snake slowly sweeping along his length among the bowls and polished goblets tasted the feast, then back he slid below the tomb, harmless, slipping away from altars where he'd fed. With fresh zeal Aeneas resumes his father's rites, wondering, is the serpent the genius of the place? Or his father's familiar spirit? Bound by custom he slaughters a pair of yearling sheep, as many swine and a brace of young steers with their sleek black backs, then tipping wine from the bowls, he calls his father's ghost, set free from Acheron now, the great Anchise's shade. The comrades, too, bring on what gifts they can, their spirits high, loading the altars, killing steers, while others, setting the bronze cauldrons out in order, stretch along the grass, holding spits over embers, broiling cuts of meat. The long four-day arrived as the horses of feet had brought the ninth dawn on through skies serene and bright. News of the day and Assest's famous name had roused the people round about, and a happy crowd had thronged the shore, some to behold Aeneas' men, some set to compete as well. And first the trophies are placed on view amid the field, sacred tripods, leafy crowns and palms, the victor's prizes, armor, robes dyed purple, and gold and silver bars. A trumpet blast rings out from a mound midfield, let the games begin. For the first event, enter, four great ships, well matched with their heavy oars, picked from the whole armada. Nestheus commands the dragon swift with her eager crew, Nestheus soon of Italy, soon from him the Memian clan would take its name. Gaius commands the huge Chimera, a hulk as huge as a city, Trojans in three tiers drive her on, churning as one man at three ranked sweeps of oars. Segestus, who gives his name to the surgeon house, rides the tremendous vessel Centaur. Cloanthus who bred your line, you Roman Cluentius, sails the bright blue Scylla. Far out in the offing, fronting the foaming coastline, looms a rock. At times, when the winter's northwest winds blot out the stars, it's all submerged, the breakers thunder it under. In calm weather, up from the gentle swells it lifts a quiet, level face, a favorite haunt of cormorants basking in the sun. Here the good commander Aeneas staked an ilex, leaves and all, as a turning post where crews would know to wheel their ships around and begin the long pull home. They next draw lots for starting places, captains stand on the sterns, their purple and gold regalia gleaming far afield and the oarsmen don their reeds of poplar leaves, all poured on their naked shoulders makes them glisten. They crowd the thwarts, their arms tense at the oars, ears tense for the signal, hearts pounding, racing with nerves high-strung and a grasping lust for glory. At last a piercing blare of the trumpet, suddenly all the ships burst forth from the line, no stopping them now, the shouts of the sailors hit the skies, the oarsmen's arms pull back to their chests as they whip the swells to foam. Still dead even, they plow their furrows, ripping the sea wide open with thrashing oars and cleaving triple beaks. Never so swift the teams in a two-horse chariot race breaking headlong out of the gates to take the field, not even when charioteers lay on the rippling reins, leaning into the whipstroke, giving the teams full head. 
resounding applause, cries of partisans fill the woods and the curving bayshore rolls the sound around and the pelted hillsides volley back the roar. Amid this din and confusion Gaius darts ahead, leading the field at the start to race across the surf, next Cloanthus, better awed but his pine hulk slows him down, next, at an equal gap, the dragon and centaur fight it out for third, and now the dragon has it and now the huge centaur edges her out, now they are even, prow to prow, cleaving the salt sea with long keels. Soon they are nearing the rock, swerving into the turn when Gaius, holding the lead, still victor at mid-course, shouts out to his helmsman Menoetes, where are you heading? Why so hard to starboard? Hold course. Hug the coast. Your oars should barely shave that rock to port. Leave the deep sea to the rest. Clear commands but Menno eats, fearing some hidden reefs, veers his prow to starboard, to open water, and Gaia shouts again, where now? Still off course. Head for the rocks, Menno eats. And glancing back, watch, Cloanthus right in his wake, grazing past to port on an inside track between Gaia's ship and the booming reefs, races round into safe water, leaving the mark astern. Young Gaius blazed in indignation deep to his bones, tears streamed down his cheeks, he flings to the winds all care for self-respect and the safety of his crew and pitches the sluggish Menoites off the stern, headlong into the sea and takes the helm himself. His own pilot now, he spurs his oarsman, turning the rudder hard to port and heads for home. Old Menno eats, dead weight in his sodden clothes, struggling up at last from the depths to break the surface, clambered onto the rock and perched there high and dry. The Trojan crews had laughed when he took the plunge, then when he floundered round and now they laugh as he wretches spews of brine from his heaving chest. A happy hope flared up in the last two captains now, Segestus and Nestheus, to pass the flagging Gaius. Segestus gains the lead as they near the rock but not by a whole keel's length, his prows ahead but the dragon's pressing prow overlaps his stern, so Mnestheus, striding the gangplank, spurs his crew, now put your backs in the oars, you comrades of Hector. You are the ones I chose, my troops at Troy's last stand. Now show the nerve, the heart you showed on Libya's reefs, the Ionian Sea, the waves at Malia that attacked us. It's not for first place now Mnestheus strives, not for victory, oh, if only, no, let Neptune pick the winner he wants but we must not come last, what shame. Just win that victory, oh, my Trojans, spare us that disgrace. They bend hard to the oars and pull for all they are worth, and the bronze hull shivers under their massive strokes and the deep sweeps by beneath them, gasping for breath, their chests racked, mouths parched, sweat rivering down their backs, but blind chance brings that crew the prize they yearn for. Wild with striving, Segestus, wheeling his prow toward the rock, risking an inside track, the dangerous straits, crashes into the jutting reefs, unlucky man. The struck crag shudders, or slamming against its rip-tooth edges split, and the prow driven onto the rock, hangs there, hoisted into the air. The crew springs up, shouting, trying to backwater, and shipping their iron pikes and sharp-tipped punting poles, they scramble to rescue splintered oars from the surf. Nestheus riding high, the higher for his success, oars at a racing stroke, wind at his beck and call, shoots into open water, homing down the coast. Swift as a dove, flushed in fear from a cave where it nests its darling chicks in crannies, a sudden burst of wings and out its home it flies, terrified, off into open fields and next it skims through the bright, quiet air and never beats a wing. So Mnestheus, so his dragon speeds ahead, cleaving the swells on the home stretch, so she flies along on her own forward drive. First he leaves a stern suggester struggling still at his beetling rock, splashing in shallows, crying for help, no use, as he studies how to race with shattered oars. Next Nestheus goes for Gaius, the huge chimera stripped of her helmsman, giving up the lead. Now nearing the finish, that left one, Cloanthus, Nestheus goes for him all out, urging his crews to give it all they've got. Roars of the crowd re-echo, cheering on his challenge, the air resounds with cries. One crew, stung by the shame of losing victory now with glory won, would trade their lives for fame. But Nestheus and his crew, fired by their success, can just about win the day because they think they can. They were drawing abreast, perhaps they'd seize the prize if Cloanthus had not flung his arms to the sea and poured his prayers to the gods and begged them to hear his vows, you gods, you lords of the waves I'm racing over here, I'll gladly steady a pure white bull at your altars, there on shore, and pay my vows, scatter its innards over the salt swell and tip out streams of wine. 
So he prayed, and far in the depths they heard him, all the Nereids, Phorcus Chorus, Virgin Panopea and Father Portunus himself, with his own mighty hand, drove the racing Scylla swifter than southern winds or a winging arrow, speeding toward the shore to find her birth in the good deep water harbour. Then the son of Anchise is summoned all together, true to custom. A herald's ringing voice declares Cloanthus the victor and Aeneas crowns his brows with fresh green laurel. He presents the prizes to each ship's crew, some wine, three bulls of their choice and a heavy silver bar and for each ship's captain lays on gifts of honour. To the winner a cloak of braided gold that's fringed with twin ripples of Melibian crimson running round it, and woven into its weft, Ganymede, prince of woody Ida spins his javelins, wearing out the racing stags, his breathless, hot on the hunt, so true to life as the eagle that bears Jove's lightning sweeps him up from Ida into the heavens, pinned in its talons while old guardsmen reach for the stars in vain and the watchdog's savage howling fills the air. Then to the man whose prowess won him second place he gives a coat of mail, glinting with burnished links and triple meshed in gold, a victor's trophy he himself had dragged from Demolios, killed near Simwa Rapids under Troy's high wall. This armor he gives Mnestheus, a fighter's badge of honor to shield him well in war. Two aides de Kang, Phegeus and Sagaris, hefting it on their shoulders now, could hardly bear it off with all its heavy plies, yet Demolios wore it once, fully armed as he ran down Trojan stragglers. Aeneas presents a pair of brazen cauldrons for third prize and two cups of hammered silver, ridged in sharp relief. Now with the gifts presented, all were moving off, proud of their prizes, scarlet ribbons binding their brows when here comes Segestus, bringing in his ship. He barely worked her free of the ruthless rock with craft and effort, one bank of her oars gone, one in splinters. A laughing stark, shorn of glory, she came crawling in. Like a snake caught, as they often are, on a causeway, crushed by a bronze will or heavy rock flung by a traveller, trampled, left half dead, trying to slip away, writhing in gnarled coils, no hope. Part fighting mad, its eyes blazing, its hissing head puffed high, part crippled, wounds cutting its pace, struggling in knots, twitching, twisting round itself. So the ship limped in, oars laboring, slowly, and still she spreads her sails and enters the harbour, canvas taut. Aeneas, glad that the ship is salvaged, crew restored, gives Segestus the prize that he had promised, a slave girl, Folo, born of Cretan stock and hardly inept at Minerva's works of hand, nursing twins at her breast. The ship race over, good Aeneas strides to the grassy level field ringed by hills with woodland sloping down to a vale that formed an enormous round arena. There he went, the hero leading many thousands, and took his own seat on a built-up platform mid the growing crowd. And here, for those who chance to long for a breathless foot race now, Aeneas stirs their spirits, setting out the prizes. Trojans mixed with Sicilians come from all directions, with Nisus and Euryalus out in front. Euryalus radiant, famed for the bloom of youth, Nisus, for the pure love he devoted to the boy. Following them, Dior's, sprung from the stock of Priam's royal house. Then patron flanked by Salius, an Acarnanian, one, and one an Arcadian born of Tegean blood. Then two Sicilian youngsters, Helimus, Panopes, hunters used to the woods, and friends of old Assests, and many others too, their names now lost in the dark depths of time. Among the crowds, Aeneas addressed them all with, Hear me now, mark my words and fill your hearts with joy. Not one of you leaves and lacks a gift from me. I'll give two Cretan arrows with polished iron points and a double axe embossed with knobs of silver. The same honours await you, one and all. But prize trophies go to the three frontrunners, brows crowned with the wreaths of braided golden olive. First, the winner, shall have a horse with dazzling trappings. The second, an Amazon's quiver bristling Thracian arrows, slung from a sweeping sword belt starred with gold and clasped with a brilliant jewel. The third can leave content with this Greek helmet. Soon as said they take their mark, ready, set, a sudden signal, go, and they break from the start, pouring over the course like a storm cloud streaking on, all eyes fixed on the goal, with nice as far in the lead, shooting out of the tight pack and faster than wind or the winged lightning, second, second at quite a gap, comes Salius, next, and a good long way behind, Euryalus coming third, and after Euryalus, Helimus, then Dior's flying hot on his heels and closer, closing, watch, breathing over his shoulder and if there had been more track to cover he would have caught and passed him or run him a dead heat. 
Now down the stretch they come, the exhausted runners closing on the goal when all at once unlucky nicer skids on a slick of blood they chance to spill, killing bullocks, soaking the turf and green grass surface, here the racer, elated, victory won, pressing the pace he stumbles, pitching face first in the filthy dung and blood of victims. But he won't forget Euryalus, his great love, never, up from the slime he struggles, flings himself in Salius' path to send him spinning, reeling backward, splayed out on the beaten track as Euryalus flashes past, thanks to his friend he takes the lead, the victor flying along, sped by the roaring crowd, with Helimus next and Dior's wins third prize. But at this, Salius bursts out with howls that ring through the huge arena, round from the front row elders to the crowd, a foul had robbed him clean of the prize he wanted back. True, but Euryalus has the people on his side, plus modest tears and his own gallant ways, favoured all the more for his handsome build. And Dior's backs him up with loud appeals, he finished third, but no third prize for him if the victor's prize returned to Salius' hands. Your prizes are yours, said Captain Aeneas firmly, they all stand fast, young comrades. No one alters our ranked list of winners now. Just let me offer a consolation prize to a luckless man, a friend without a fault. And with that, he handed Salius a giant African lion's hide, a great weight with its shaggy manner and gilded claws. If losers win such prizes, Nisus erupted now, and the ones who trip, such pity, what gift will you give to Nisus worth his salt? Why, I clearly had earned the crown for first prize if the same bad luck that leveled Salius had not knocked me down. And with each word he points to the sopping muck that fouled his face and limbs. The fatherly captain smiled down at his friend and had them fetch a shield, Didymaeon's work the Greeks had torn from Neptune's sacred gate. This gleaming trophy he gives the fine young runner. Then with the racing over, the prize is handed out, now, Aeneas announces, let any man with heart, with the fire in his chest, come forward, put up your fists, strap on the rawhide gloves. And he sets afield a pair of trophies for the boxing, for the winner a bull with gilded horns and wreaths, a sword and a burnished helm to console the loser. No delay. Instantly there he stands, that immense man, dares, jaw thrust out, tremendous in all his power. The crowds are buzz as he hauls himself to his feet, the one man who could trade blows with Paris, dares who, by the mound where great Hector lies, crushed the champion buttes, that gigantic hulk, a braggart who fought as a Micus Babrician kin, he laid him out on the yellow sand to gasp his last. So strong, this dares, first to cock his head for combat, flaunting his broad shoulders, sparring, lefts and rights, beating the air with blows. Who will take him on? Not one in the whole crowd would dare go up against him, strap the gloves on. So, certain that all contenders had withdrawn, the trophy his alone, he strode up to Aeneas now and never pausing, full of swagger, grasps the bull's horn with his left hand and boasts, son of Venus, since no one dares to face me in the ring, how long do I have to stand here? How long's right? Just say the word, I'll lead my prize away. With one accord the Trojans roared assent, give the man the prize that he'd been promised. But now Assest's rebukes Intellus sharply, sitting side by side on a grassy rise of ground, Intellus, once our bravest hero, where's it gone? Look at this prize. How can you just sit back, feckless, and let them cart it off without a fight? Where's that god of ours, that Eryx, tell me, our teacher once, renowned for nothing now? Where's your fame that thrilled all Sicily once? What of the trophies hanging from your rafters? Intellus returns, my love of glory, my pride still holds strong, not beaten down by fear. It's slow old age, that's what dogs me now. My blood runs cold, my body's chill, played out. But if I were now the man I was, full of the youth that spurs that bantam there, cocksure and strutting so, I'd need no bribe of a prize bull to bring me out. I have no use for trophies. Fighting words. Down in the ring he threw his pair of gauntlets, massive weights that violent Eryx used to sport, binding his fists to fight with rawhide taut and tough. The crowd was dazed, seven welted plies of enormous oxide stitched in ridges of lead and iron to make them stiff. Dares, dazed the most, shrinks back from the bout. But the hearty son of Anchises tests their heft, turning over and over the heavy coiling straps. Now old Intellus voice comes rising from his chest, what if you'd seen the gloves of Hercules himself and the grim fight he fought on these very sands? 
This is the gear your brother Eric's used to wield, look, still crusted with blood and spattered brains, with these he stood up against great Hercules, and I used to wear them too, when the blood ran warmer in me, made me strong before old age, my rival, flecked my brows with grey. But if this Trojan, dares, cringes before my weapons, if good Aeneas decides and assesses my promoter nods, we'll fight as equals here. These gloves of Eric's, I'll give them up for your sake, dares. Come, nothing to fear, pull off your Trojan gauntlets. With that challenge Intella stripped his pleated cloak from his shoulders, bearing his great sinewy limbs, his great bones and joints, and stood gigantic in the center of the ring. Officiating, Aeneas produced two pairs of gauntlets matched in weight and bound both fighters' hands with equal weapons. At once each struck his stance, up on his toes, fists raised high, not a twinge of fear now, heads rearing back, out of range of the fists, they mix punches, left, right, probe for openings, dares trusting to young blood and fancy footwork, intellus to brawn, to brute force, but his knees quake, his huge, lumbering frame is racked with labored breathing. Wasting blow after blow at each other, thrown but missed then blow, blow upon hollow ribs, landing fast and furious, pounding chest bones, flurry of blows to head and ears, jaws cracking under the crush of hammering jabs, massive intellus, stock still in his tracks, merely rolls to avoid the salvos, eyes fixed on his rival. Dares like some captain assaulting a steep city wall or laying siege to a mountain stronghold under arms, now this approach, now that, exploring the whole fort with skill, with every kind of assault, and all no use. Intellus towers up for a stunning roundhouse right and dare seeing it coming, ducks, quick, he's gone, but the giant's full force poured in the crashing blow lands on empty air and his own weight brings him down, a colossal man, a colossal fall, he slammed the earth, toppled, as often a hollow pine, ripped up by the roots on steep Mount Ida or Erymanthus, topples down to ground. The crowd springs up, Sicilians, Trojans, rival outcries hit the sky. Assests, first to rush to his aged friend, pities Intellus, hoists him off the ground. The champion, never slowed by a fall, unshaken, goes back to fight and all the fiercer, anger fueling his power now, shame fires him up, and a sense of his own strength. So in a blaze of fury he pummels dares headlong over the whole wide ring, lefts and rights, doubling blows, no lull, no let up, thick and fast as the hailstones pelting down from a storm cloud, rattling roofs, so dense the champion's blows, both fists pounding over and over, battering dares reeling round, enough. Aeneas, the good captain, could not permit the fury, the blind rage of Intellus to rampage any longer. He stopped the fight, pulled the battle-weary dares out of the bout and consoled him with these words, poor man, what insanity's got you in its grip? You're up against superhuman power, can't you see? The will of gods against you. Bow to God. With that command he parted both contenders. Trusty friends conducted dares back to the ships, dragging his wobbly knees, his head lolling side to side, spitting clots from his mouth, blood mixed with teeth. His mates, called back, receive his sword and helmet, leaving the bull and the victor's palm to Intellus. Overflowing with pride, glorying over his bull the old champion shouts, Son of the goddess, see, you Trojans too, what power I had when I was in my prime, and from what a death you rescue dares now. With that, standing over against the bull's head steadied there, the battle's prize, he drew the iron gauntlet back and rearing up for the blow, swings it square between both horns, crushing the skull and dashing out the brains, and dying, quivering, down on the ground the great beast sprawls. And rising over it now the champion's voice comes pouring from his heart, here, Eric's, I pay your spirit a better life than dares. Here, in victory, I lay down my gloves, my skill. At once Aeneas invites all those who wish to contend with winging shafts and names the prizes. With powerful hands he steps the mast from Serestus' ship and tethers atop it, looped by a cord, a fluttering dove, a mark for steel-shod arrows. The archers gather now, cast lots in a bronze helmet, and first to leap out, to partisan shouts, is Hippocoon, son of Herticus. Next, Mnestheus, flushed with victory in the ships, his brow still crowned with an olive wreath of green. Third, Eurytion, your brother, famous Pandarus, archer who once under orders broke that truce, the first to whip an arrow into the Argive ranks. The last lot, deep in the helm, was Assest's own, who dared to try his hand at young men's work. Now as they flex their bows to a curve with all their force, all each man can muster, drawing shafts from quivers, young Hippocoon shot first, his bowstring twanged, his whizzing arrow ripped through the swift air and struck home, fixed deep in the timber mast. The mast shuddered, the dove fluttered in fright and the whole arena round rang out with cheers. 
And next, Keen Nestheus took his stand, bow drawn, aiming higher, his eye and shaft both trained on the mark but he had no luck, he missed the bird itself, his shaft just slit a knot in the hempen cord that tied her foot as the dove dangled high from the soaring mast and off she flew to the south and the dark clouds. Quick as a wink Eurition, Bo Long bent an arrow set for release, prayed to his archer brother, aimed at the dove that reveled in open sky, winging under a black cloud, and struck, and down she dropped, dead weight, leaving her life in the stars and bringing home the shaft that shot her through. Now Assest's alone remained, and his prize lost. Still he whipped an arrow high in the lofting air to display his seasoned art and make his bow ring out. Suddenly, right before their eyes, look, a potent marvel destined to shape the future. So the outcome proved when the awestruck prophet sang the signs to later ages. Flying up to the swirling clouds the arrow shot into flames, blazing its way in fire, burning out into thin air, lost like the shooting stars that often break loose, trailing a manner of flames to sweep across the sky. Transfixed, the men of Troy and Sicily froze and prayed the gods on high. Nor did Prince Aeneas hold back from the omen. He embraced Assests in all his glory, heaping splendid gifts on the old king and urging, take them, father. By this sign the great lord of Olympus has decreed that you should bear off honours far from all the rest. Here, you'll have a gift from old Anchises himself. A mixing bowl, richly engraved, the proud trophy that Thracian Sisius one day gave my father. A memento of his host, a pledge of his affection. With that, he crowns his brows with laurel leaves and declares Assests first, the winner over all. Good Eurition never grudged him this distinction, though he alone shot down the dove from the high sky. Next in the prizes comes the one who slit the cord and last the man whose shaft had drilled the mast. Even before the contest ended, great Aeneas calls Epitides over, friend and bodyguard of the young Eulus, and whispers in his trusted ear, go, and if Ascanius has his troop of boys prepared, their horses mustered to ride through their manoeuvres, have him parade his squadrons now, to honour Anchises here and display himself in arms. Aeneas commands the flooding crowds to clear the whole broad arena, leave the field wide open. Then in ride the boys, trim in their ranks before their parents' eyes, mounted on bridled steeds and glittering in the light and as they pass, the men of Troy and Sicily murmur a hum of admiration. All the riders, following custom, wear their hair bound tight with close-cut wreaths, each bearing a pair of lances, cornel, tipped with steel. Some sling burnished quivers over their shoulders, high on their necks the torques of flexible, braided gold encircle each boy's neck. Three squadrons with three captains weave their ways, each leading a column of twelve, six boys in double file, a trainer beside each troop, all shining in the sun. The first young squadron parades along in triumph led by little Priam, who bore his forebear's name, your noble son, Polites, destined to sire Italians, riding a Thracian stallion dappled white, his pastons white and prancing, highbrow flashing a blaze of white. Next comes Atis, soon the source of the Latinations, little Atis, a boy the boy Prince Ulus loved. Last, handsomest captain of them all, comes Ulus riding a mount from Sidon, radiant Dido's gift, a memento of the queen, a pledge of her affection. The rest of the youngsters ride Sicilian horses, old Assest's gifts, the riders awed by applause the Dardans give their fine dressage, delighted to see in their looks their own lost parents' faces. Now, once they paraded past the assembled crowd, triumphant on horseback, bright in the eyes of kinsmen, all riders took their places and epitides from afar called out, get set, a crack of his whip, and watch, the long column, split into three equal squads, splits into rows of six, in bands dancing away, then recalled at the next command they wheeled and charged each other, lances tense for attack, wheeling charge into countercharge, return and turn through the whole arena, enemy circling. Swerving back in their armor, acting out a mock display of war, now bearing their backs in flight, now turning spears for attack, now making peace and riding file by file. So complex the labyrinth once in hilly Crete, they say, where the passage wove between blind walls and wavered on in numberless cunning paths that broke down every clue, with nothing to trace and no way back, a baffling maze. Complex as the course the sons of Troy now follow, weaving their way through mock escapes and clashes all in sport as swiftly as frisky dolphins skim the rolling surf, cleaving the Libyan or Carpathian seas in play. This tradition of drill and these mock battles, Ascanius was the first to revive the ride when he girded Alba longer round with ramparts, teaching the early Latins to keep these rites, just as he and his fellow Trojan boys had done, and the Albans taught their sons, and in her turn Great Rome received the rites and preserved our father's fame. The boys are now called Troy, their troop the Trojan Corps. 
here came to an end the games in honor of Aenea's hallowed father. But here for the first time fortune veered in its course and turned against the Trojans. While they consecrated the tomb with various games, Saturnian Juno hurries Iris down from the sky to the Trojan fleet, breathing gusts at her back to wing her on her way. Juno brooding, scheming, her old inveterate rants are never sated. Iris flies, arcing down on her rainbow showering iridescence, and no one sees the virgin glide along the shore, past the huge assembly, catching sight of the harbour all deserted now, and the fleet they left unguarded. But there, far off on a lonely stretch of beach the Trojan women wept for the lost anchises. Gazing out on the deep dark swells they wept and wailed, how many reefs, how many sea miles more that we must cross. Heart-weary as we are. They cried with one voice. A city is what they pray for. All were sick of struggling with the sea. So down in their mid speeds Iris, no stranger to mischief, putting aside the looks and gown of a goddess, turning into Bero, aged wife of Doriclus the Temerian, a woman of fine, noble birth who once had fame and sons. Like Bero now, Iris mingles in among all the Trojan mothers. How wretched we are, she cries, that no Greek soldier dragged us off to die in the war beneath our country's walls. Oh, my poor doomed people. What is fortune saving you for, what death blow? Seven summers gone since Troy went down and still we're swept along, measuring out each land, each sea, how many hostile rocks and stars, scanning an endless ocean, chasing an Italy fading still as the waves roll us on. Here is our brother Eric's land. Assests is our host. What prevents us from building walls right here, presenting our citizens with a city? Oh, my country, gods of the hearth we tore from enemies, all for nothing, will no walls ever again be called the walls of Troy? We're never again to see the rivers Hector loved, the Simwar and the Xanthus? No, come, action. Help me burn these accursed ships to ashes. The ghost of Cassandra came to me in dreams, the prophetess gave me flaming brands and said, look for Troy right here, your own home here. Act now. No delay in the face of signs like these. You see? For altars to Neptune. The god himself is giving us torches, building our courage, too. Spurring them on and first to seize a deadly brand, she held it high in her right hand, shook it to flame and with all her power hurled the fire home. Astounded, the hearts of the Trojan women froze, stunned till one in the crowd, the eldest, Pergo, once the royal nurse to Priam's several sons, called out, that's not Barrow, you women of Troy, no Trojan wife of Doriclus. Look at her beauty, her fiery eyes, immortal marks, what pride, what features, and what a voice, what stride. Why, I just left Barrow now, sick and bitter to be the only one deprived of our lavish rights, denied her part in the honours paid anchises. Urging so, but at first the women wavered, looking back at the ships with hateful glances, torn between their hapless love for the land they stood on now and the fated kingdom, calling still, when all at once the goddess towered into the sky on balanced wings, cleaving a giant rainbow, flying beneath the clouds. Now they are dumbstruck, driven mad by the sign they scream, some seize fire from the inner hearths, some plunder the altars, branches, brushwood, torches, they hurl them all at once and the god of fire unleashed goes raging over the benches, orlocks, piney blaze and sterns. The ships are ablaze. The herald Eumelus runs the news to crowds wedged in the theatre round Anchise's tomb, even they can see the black cloud churn with sparks. Out in the lead, Ascanius, still heading his horsemen, still in triumph, swerves for the ships at full tilt, his breathless handlers helpless to rein him back, and finding the camp in chaos, shouts out, madness, beyond belief. What now? What drives you on? Wretched women of Troy, it's not the enemy camp, the Greeks, you're burning your own best hopes. Look, it's your own Ascanius. Down at his feet he flung his useless helmet, the one he donned when he played at war, acting out mock battles. Just then Aeneas hurries in with his Trojan troops but the women, terrified, scatter down the beaches, fleeing, stealing away into woods and rocky caverns, anywhere they can hide. They cringe from the daylight, shrink from what they've done. They come to their senses, know their people, and Juno is driven from their hearts. Despite all that, the flames, the implacable fire never quits its fury. Under the sodden beams the toe still smoulders, reeking a slow, heavy smoke that creeps along the keels, the ruin eating into the hulls, and all their heroic efforts, showering water, get them nowhere. 
At once devoted Aeneas ripped the robe on his shoulders, called the gods for help and flung his hands in prayer, Almighty Jove, if you still don't hate all Trojans, if you still look down with your old sense of devotion, still respect men's labours, save our fleet from fire. Now, father, snatch the slim hopes of the Trojans out of the jaws of death. Or if I deserve it, come, hurl what's left of us down to death with all your angry bolts, overwhelm us here with your iron fist. No sooner said than a wild black flood of rain comes whipping down in fury, claps of thunder, highlands, lowlands quake and a raging tempest bursts from the whole sky dense and dark with the lashing south wind's blast. The decks are awash, the charred timbers drench till all the fires are slaked and all the ships, except for the four hulls lost, are saved from ruin. But Captain Aeneas, dazed by this swift sharp blow, kept wrestling the overriding anguish in his heart, now this way, that way. Should he forget his fate and settle in Sicily now, or head for Italian shores? Then old Nauts, the one-man Tritanian palace taught, making him famous for his knowledge of her arts, giving him answers for what the gods' great rage might mean or what the march of fate cried out for, Nauts speaks, consoling Aeneas with his counsel, son of Venus, whether the fates will draw us on or draw us back, let's follow where they lead. Whatever fortune sends, we master it all by bearing it all, we must. You have a Cests, a Trojan born of the gods, a ready advisor. Invite him into your councils. Make your plans together. Hand them over to him, the people left from the burnt ships and those worn out by the vast endeavor you've begun, your destiny, your fate. The old men bent with age, the women sick of the sea, ones who are feeble, ones who shrink from danger, set them apart, and exhausted as they are, let them have their walls within this land. If he lends his name, they'll call the town a sester. Inspired now by the plans of his old friend, Aeneas is torn by anguish all the more as dark night, looming up in her chariot, took command of the heavens, and all at once, down from the sky his father Anchise's phantom seemed to glide and the words came rushing from him toward Aeneas, my son, dearer to me than life while I was still alive. O oh my son, so pressed by the fate of Troy, I've come by the will of Jove, who swept the fire from your ships and now from the heights of heaven pities you at last. So come, follow old Nort's good sound advice, choose your elite troops, your bravest hearts, and sail them on to Italy. There in Latium you must battle down a people of wild, rugged ways. But first go down to the house of death, the underworld, go through Avernus depths, my son, to seek me, meet me there. I am not condemned to wicked Tartarus, those bleak shades, I live in Elysium, the luminous fields where the true and faithful gather. A chaste sibyl will guide you there, once you have offered the blood of many pure black sheep. And then you will learn your entire race to come and the city walls that will be made your own. Now farewell. Dank night wheels around in mid-career, cruel dawn breaks in the east, and I feel her panting stallions breathing near. With that, he fled into thin air like a wisp of smoke. Racing away, but where? Aeneas cries, so rushed. Whom do you flee? Who keeps you from our embrace? Calling so, he rakes the slumbering coals to worship the household god of Troy and the sacred shrine of white-haired Vesta, offering up a suppliant's hallowed meal, and mist from an overflowing censer. At once he summons his friends, assessed first, to report the will of Jove, his dear father's commands and the firm resolve now settled in his mind. No time for debate, and no dissent from assessed's. Consigning the women to the town, they disembark all those who elect to stay, who feel no need for glory. The rest repair the thwarts, replace the charred beams with new ship timbers, refit the oars and cables, no large troop, but their spirits burn for war. Meanwhile Aeneas is plowing out the city limits, assigning homes by L.O.T. One sector, as he decrees, called Troy, another, Ilium. Trojan-born Assests relishes his new kingdom, holding court, giving laws to the elders called in session. Then on the peak of Eryx reaching for the stars, he founds a temple to Venus of Mount Ida, round it a spreading sacred grove, and appoints a priest to tend Anchise's tomb. Now the assembled people have feasted nine days, the altars have their gifts, a placid breeze has lulled the swells, and a pulsing breath of the south wind calls them back to sea. A great wail rises up from the deep curved bay as they linger out the night and day in each other's arms. And the same women, the same men who once believed the face of the sea, its mighty god, too cruel to bear, now long to embark and brave the pains of exile to the end. But good Aeneas, consoling them all with heartfelt words, weeps as he commends them to assests, their blood kin. 
Three calves to Eryx, then a ewe to the god of storms, he orders killed, and the crewmen slip the cables, one after another. Apart at the prow, Aeneas takes his stand, crowned with a trim olive wreath, and raises a wine bowl high and scatters innards over the salt swell and tips out streams of wine. Shipmates race each other, thrashing the waves and a rising stern wind surges, drives the vessels on. But now Venus, her anguish mounting, goes to Neptune, pouring out her heart in a flood of lamentation, Juno, her lethal rage, her insatiable spirit, Neptune, makes me stoop to every kind of prayer. No lapse of time, no reverence, nothing tames her, no decree of Jove or the fates can break her will, she never rests. Not even devouring a city, the heart of the Phrygian race, in all her hatred, dragging the remnant down through pains of every sort, it's not enough for her. Now she stalks the bones, the ashes of murdered Troy. Such furies beyond me, no doubt she has her reasons. Neptune, you yourself, you're my witness to what great instant chaos she unleashed, just now, in Libya's heaving seas, mixing the sea and wind and backed by airless blasts, all for nothing, but all dared in your own realm. What outrage! Why, she drove the Trojan women down the path of crime, goading them on to gut the ships with fire, so hateful, the fleet lost and their friends abandoned here on alien soil. The survivors? I beg you, give them all safe passage across your waters, let them reach the Tiber, if only my prayers are granted, if fate will grant the Trojan city walls. Saturn's son, the king of the deep, complied, by all rights, Cytheria, you should trust my realm, it gave you birth. I've earned your trust, what's more? Time and again I tamed the wild rage of sky and sea, the same on land, Xanthus and Simwa be my witness, I cared for your Aeneas. Once when Achilles harried the breathless Trojans, pounding their ranks against their walls, slaughtering thousands, rivers crammed with corpses groaned and the Xanthus could find no channel rolling down to sea, and then as Aeneas went up against the mighty Achilles, hardly a match for the man's gods, the man's power, then I saved him, wrapped him into a fold of clouds, though I longed to crush their ramparts roots and all, the walls I built with my own hands, those lying Trojans. And now as then, my concern for him stands firm. So cast your fear to the winds. Just as you wish, he will arrive at Avernus Haven safe and sound. Only one will be lost, one you'll seek at sea. One life, for the lives of many men. Welcome words, and soon as Father Neptune had soothed the goddess heart, he harnesses up his team with their yoke of gold, slips the frothing bits in their chafing jaws, slacks the reins and the team goes running free, the sea blue chariot skimming lightly over the crests and the waves fall calm, and under the axles thunder the sea swell levels off and the storm clouds flee from the wild skies. And now his retinue rises in all their forms, enormous beasts of the deep, the veteran troop of Glaucus, Ino son Polemon, windswift Tritons, Phorcus army in full force with the Tees, Malite, virgin Panopea out on the left, Fair Isle, Sea Cave, Spray, and the waves embrace. No more wavering now, now buoyant spirits seize Aenea's heart. The good commander orders all masts stepped at once and the yardarms hung with sail. All as one they make sheets fast and let out canvas bellying now to port and now to starboard, all as one they swing the lofty spars around and swing them back as a favoring stern wind sweeps the fleet straight on. Far in front, Palinurus leads the tight formation, a line commanded to set their course by him. By now dank night had nearly reached her turning point in the sky, and stretched on the hard thwarts beneath their oars the crews gave way to a deep, quiet rest, when down from the stars the god of sleep came gliding gently, cleaving the dark mists and scattering shadows, hunting you, Palinurus, bringing you fatal sleep in all your innocence. Like Phorbus to the life, the god sat high astern, pouring his persuasions into your ears, son of Iasius, Palinurus, the sea, all on its own, is sweeping the squadrons on, the wind is blowing steady. Time to sleep. Come, put your head down, steal some rest for your eyes worn out from labor. For a moment I'll take on your work myself. Barely raising his eyes, Palinurus answers, you tell me to forget my sense of the sea, the placid face of the swells, the sleeping breakers? You tell me to put my trust in that, that monster? How could I leave Aeneas prey to the lying winds? I, betrayed so often by calm, deceptive skies. So the pilot countered, iron grip on the tiller, never loosing his grasp, his eyes fixed on the stars. But watch, the god with a bow drenched in Lethe's dew and drowsy with all the river Styx's numbing power shakes it over the pilot's temples left and right and fight as he does, his swimming eyes fall shut. 
Just as an instant sleep stole in and left him limp, the god, rearing over him, hurled him into the churning surf and down he went, head first, wrenching a piece of rudder off and the tiller too, and crying out to his shipmates time and again, no use, as the god himself goes winging off into thin air. And the squadrons forge ahead undaunted, swift as ever, sailing safely along as Father Neptune promised, true, but carried closer into the sirens' rocks, hard straits once, white with the bones of many men, now roaring out with the sounding boom of surf on reef when Captain Aeneas felt his ship adrift, her pilot lost, and took command himself, at sea in the black night, moaning deeply, stunned by his comrade's fate, you trusted, oh, Palinurus, far too much to a calm sky and sea. Your naked corpse will lie on an unknown shore. Book 6. The Kingdom of the Dead. So as he speaks in tears Aeneas gives the ships free rein and at last they glide onto UB and Cumi's beaches. Swinging their prows around to face the sea, they moor the fleet with the anchor's biting grip and the curved sterns edge the bay. Bands of sailors, primed for action, leap out onto land, Hesperian land. Some strike seeds of fire buried in veins of flint, some strip the dense thickets, lairs of wild beasts, and lighting on streams, are quick to point them out. But devout Aeneas makes his way to the stronghold that Apollo rules, throned on high, and set apart is a vast cave, the awesome Sibyl's secret haunt where the seer of Delos breathes his mighty will, his soul inspiring her to lay the future bare. And now they approach Diana's sacred grove and walk beneath the golden roofs of God. Daedalus, so the story's told, fleeing the realm of Minos, daring to trust himself to the sky on beating wings, floated up to the icy north, the first man to fly, and hovered lightly on Cumi's heights at last. Here, on first returning to earth, he hallowed to you, Apollo, the oars of his rowing wings and here he built your grand, imposing temple. High on a gate he carved Androgeo's death and then the people of Athens, doomed, so cruel, to pay with the lives of seven sons. Year in, year out, the urn stands ready, the fateful lots are drawn. Balancing these on a facing gate, the land of Crete comes rising from the sea. Here the cursed lust for the bull and Pasiphae spread beneath him, duping both her mates, and here the mixed breed, part man, part beast, the Minotaur, a warning against such monstrous passion. Here its lair, that house of labor, the endless blinding maze, but Daedalus, pitying royal Ariadne's love so deep, unraveled his own baffling labyrinth's winding paths, guiding Theseus' groping steps with a trail of thread. And you too, Icarus, what part you might have played in a work that great, had Daedalus' grief allowed it. Twice he tried to engrave your fall in gold and twice his hands, a father's hands, fell useless. Yes, and they would have kept on scanning scene by scene if Achates, sent ahead, had not returned, bringing Daphobe, Glaucus' daughter, priestess of Phoebus and Diana too, and the Sibyl tells the king, this is no time for gazing at the sights. Better to slaughter seven bulls from a herd unbroken by the yoke, as the old rite requires, and as many head of teething yearling sheep. Directing Aeneas so, and his men are quick with the sacrifice she demands, the Sibyl calls them into her lofty shrine. Now carved out of the rocky flanks of Cumi lies an enormous cavern pierced by a hundred tunnels, a hundred mouths with as many voices rushing out, the Sibyl's rapt replies. They had just gained the sacred seal when the virgin cries aloud, now is the time to ask your fate to speak. The god, look, the god. So she cries before the entrance, suddenly all her features, all her color changes, her braided hair flies loose and her breast heaves, her heart bursts with frenzy, she seems to rise in height, the ring of her voice no longer human, the breath, the power of God comes closer, closer. Why so slow, Trojan Aeneas, she shouts, so slow to pray, to swear your vows. Not until you do will the great jaws of our spellbound house gape wide. And with that command the prophetess fell silent. An icy shiver runs through the Trojan's sturdy spines and the king's prayers come pouring from his heart, Apollo, you always pitted the Trojan's heavy labors. You guided the arrow of Paris, pierced Achilles' body. You led me through many seas, bordering endless coasts, far off Massilian tribes, and fields washed by the Syrtes, and now, at long last, Italy's shores, forever fading, lie within our grasp. Let the doom of Troy pursue us just this far, no more. You too, you gods and goddesses, all who could never suffer Troy and Troy's high glory, spare the people of Pergamum now, it's only right. And you, you blessed Sibyl who knows the future, grant my prayer. I ask no more than the realm my fate decrees, let the Trojans rest in Latium, they and their roaming gods, their rootless powers. 
Then I will build you a solid marble temple, Apollo and Diana, establish hallowed days, Apollo, in your name. And Sybil, for you too, a magnificent sacred shrine awaits you in our kingdom. There I will house your oracles, mystic revelations made to our race, and ordain your chosen priests, my gracious lady. Just don't commit your words to the rustling, scattering leaves, sport of the winds that whirl them all away. Sing them yourself, I beg you. There Enea stopped. But the Sibyl, still not broken in by Apollo, storms with a wild fury through her cave. And the more she tries to pitch the great god off her breast, the more his bridle exhausts her raving lips, overwhelming her untamed heart, bending her to his will. Now the hundred immense mouths of the house swing open, all on their own, and bear the Sibyl's answers through the air, you who have braved the terrors of the sea, though worse remain on land, you Trojans will reach Lavinium's realm, lift that care from your hearts, but you will rue your arrival. Wars, horrendous wars, and the Tiber foaming with tides of blood, I see it all. Simwa, Xanthus, a Greek camp, you'll never lack them here. Already a new Achilles springs to life in Latium, son of a goddess too. Nor will Juno ever fail to harry the Trojan race, and all the while, pleading, pressed by need, what tribes, what towns of Italy won't you beg for help? And the cause of this, this new Trojan grief? Again a stranger bride, a marriage with a stranger once again. But never bow to suffering, go and face it, all the bolder, wherever fortune clears the way. Your path to safety will open first from where you least expect it, a city built by Greeks. Those words re-echoing from her shrine, the Cumian Sibyl chants her riddling visions filled with dread, her cave resounds as she shrouds the truth in darkness, Phoebus whips her on in all her frenzy, twisting his spurs below her breast. As soon as her fury dies and raving lips fall still, the hero Aeneas launches in, no trials, my lady, can loom before me in any new, surprising form. No, deep in my spirit I have known them all, I faced them all before. But grant one prayer. Since here, they say, are the gates of Death's King and the dark marsh where the Acheron comes flooding up, please, allow me to go and see my beloved father, meet him face to face. Teach me the way, throw wide the sacred doors. Through fires, a thousand menacing spears I swept him off on these shoulders, saved him from our enemies' onslaught. He shared all roads and he braved all seas with me, all threats of the waves and skies, frail as he was but graced with a strength beyond his years, his L.O.T. He was the one, in fact, who ordered, pressed me on to reach your doors and seek you, beg you now. Pity the son and father, I pray you, kindly lady. All power is yours. Hecate held back nothing, put you in charge of Avernus Groves. If Orpheus could summon up the ghost of his wife, trusting so to his Thracian lyre and echoing strings, if Paul Lux could ransom his brother and share his death by turns, time and again traversing the same road up and down, if Theseus, mighty Hercules, must I mention them? I too can trace my birth from Jove on high. So he prayed, grasping the altar while the Sibyl gave her answer, born of the blood of gods, Anchise's son, man of Troy, the descent to the underworld is easy. Night and day the gates of shadowy death stand open wide, but to retrace your steps, to climb back to the upper air, there the struggle, there the labor lies. Only a few, loved by impartial Jove or borne aloft to the sky by their own fiery virtue, some sons of the gods have made their way. The entire heartland here is thick with woods, Cocytus glides around it, coiling dense and dark. But if such a wild desire seizes on you, twice to sail the Stygian marsh, to see black Tartarus twice, if you're so eager to give yourself to this, this mad ordeal, then hear what you must accomplish first. Hidden deep in a shady tree there grows a golden bough, its leaves and its hardy, sinewy stem all gold, held sacred to Juno of the dead, Proserpina. The whole grove covers it over, dusky valleys enfold it too, closing in around it. No one may pass below the secret places of earth before he plucks the fruit, the golden foliage of that tree. As her beauty's due, Proserpina decreed this bough shall be offered up to her as her own hallowed gift. When the first spray's torn away, another takes its place, gold too, the metal breaks into leaf again, all gold. Lift up your eyes and search, and once you find it, duly pluck it off with your hand. Freely, easily, all by itself it comes away, if fate calls you on. If not, no strength within you can overpower it, no iron blade, however hard, can tear it off. One thing more I must tell you. A friend lies dead, oh, you could not know, his body pollutes your entire fleet with death while you search on for oracles, linger at our doors. 
Bear him first to his place of rest, bury him in his tomb. Lead black cattle there, first offerings of atonement. Only then can you set eyes on the Stygian groves and the realms no living man has ever trod. Abruptly she fell silent, lips sealed tight. His eyes fixed on the ground, his face in tears, Aeneas moves on, leaving the cavern, turning over within his mind these strange, dark events. His trusty comrade Achates keeps his pace and the same cares weigh down his plodding steps. They traded many questions, wondering, back and forth, what dead friend did the Sibyl mean, whose body must be buried. Suddenly, Mycenas, out on the dry beach they see him, reach him now, cut off by a death all undeserved. Mycenas, heirless son, a herald unsurpassed at rallying troops with his trumpet's cry, igniting the god of war with its shrill blare. He had been mighty Hector's friend, by Hector's side in the rush of battle, shining with spear and trumpet both. But when triumphant Achilles stripped Hector's life, the gallant hero joined forces with Dardan Aeneas, followed a captain every bit as strong. But then, chancing to make the ocean ring with his hollow shell, the madman challenged the gods to match him blast for blast and jealous Triton, if we can believe the story, snatched him up and drowned the man in the surf that seethed between the rocks. So all his shipmates gathered round his body and raised a loud lament, devoted Aeneas in the lead. Then still in tears, they rushed to perform the Sibyl's orders, no delay, they strive to pile up trees, to build an altar pyre rising to the skies. Then into an ancient wood and the hidden dens of beasts they make their way, and down crash the pines, the ilex rings to the axe, the trunks of ash and oak are split by the driving wedge, and they roll huge rounds down the hilly slopes. Aeneas spurs his men in the forefront of their labors, geared with the same woodsman's tools around his waist. But the same anxiety keeps on churning in his heart as he scans the endless woods and prays by chance, if only that golden bough would gleam before us now on a tree in this dark grove. Since all the Sibyl foretold of you was true, Mycenas, all too true. No sooner said than before his eyes, twin doves chanced to come flying down the sky and lit on the green grass at his feet. His mother's birds, the great captain knew them and raised a prayer of joy, be my guides. If there's a path, fly through the air, set me a course to the grove where that rich branch shades the good green earth. And you, goddess, mother, don't fail me in this, my hour of doubt. With that he stopped in his tracks, watching keenly, what sign would they offer? Where would they lead? And on they flew, pausing to feed, then flying on as far as a follower's eye could track their flight and once they reached the foul-smelling gorge of Avernus, up they veered, quickly, then slipped down through the clear air to settle atop the long four goal, the twofold tree, its greener foil for the breath of gold that glows along its branch. As mistletoe in the dead of winter's icy forests leaves with life on a tree that never gave it birth, embracing the smooth trunk with its pale yellow bloom, so glowed the golden foliage against the ilex evergreen, so rustled the sheer gold leaf in the light breeze. Aeneas grips it at once, the bough holds back, he tears it off in his zeal and bears it into the Vatic Sibyl's shrine. All the while the Trojans along the shore keep weeping for Mycenas, paying his thankless ashes final rites. And first they build an immense pyre of resinous pitch pine and oaken logs, weaving into its flanks dark leaves and setting before it rose a funereal cypress, crowning it all with the herald's gleaming arms. Some heat water in cauldrons fired to boiling, bathe and anoint the body chill with death. The dirge rises up. Then, their weeping over, they lay his corpse on a litter, swathe him round in purple robes that form the well-known shroud. Some hoisted up the enormous beer, sad service, their eyes averted, after their father's ways of old, and thrust the torch below. The piled offerings blazed, frankincense, hallowed foods and brimming bowls of oil. And after the coal sank in and the fires died down, they washed his embers, thirsty remains, with wine. Corinea sealed the bones he culled in a bronze urn, then circling his comrades three times with pure water, sprinkling like drops from a blooming olive spray, he cleansed the men and voiced the last farewell. But devout Aeneas mounds the tomb, an immense barrow crowned with a man's own gear, his oar and trumpet, under a steep headland, called after the herald now and for all time to come it bears Mycenae's name. The rite performed, Aeneas hurries to carry out the Sibyl's orders. There was a vast cave deep in the gaping, jagged rock, shielded well by a dusky lake and shadowed grove. Over it no bird on earth could make its way unscathed, such poisonous vapors steamed up from its dark throat to cloud the arching sky. 
Here, as her first step, the priestess steadies four black-backed calves, she tips wine on their brows, then plucks some tufts from the crown between their horns and casts them over the altar fire, first offerings, crying out to Hecate, mighty queen of heaven and hell. Attendants run knives under throats and catch warm blood in bowls. Aeneas himself, sword drawn, slaughters a black-fleeced lamb to the Fury's mother, Night, and to her great sister, Earth, and to you, Proserpina, kills a barren heifer. Then to the king of the river Styx, he raises altars into the dark night and over their fires lays whole carcasses of bulls and pours fat oil over their entrails flaming up. Then suddenly, look, at the break of day, first light, the earth groans underfoot and the wooded heights quake and across the gloom the hounds seem to howl at the goddess coming closer. Away, away, the sibyl shrieks, all you unhallowed ones, away from this whole grove. But you launch out on your journey, tear your sword from its sheath, Aeneas. Now for courage, now the steady heart. And the sibyl says no more but into the yawning cave she flings herself, possessed, he follows her boldly, matching stride for stride. You gods who govern the realm of ghosts, you voiceless shades and chaos, you, the river of fire, you far-flung regions hushed in night, lend me the right to tell what I have heard, lend your power to reveal the world immersed in the misty depths of earth. On they went, those dim travellers under the lonely night, through gloom and the empty halls of death's ghostly realm, like those who walk through woods by a grudging moon's deceptive light when Jove has plunged the sky in dark and the black night drains all colour from the world. There in the entryway, the gorge of hell itself, grief and the pangs of conscience make their beds, and fatal pale disease lives there, and bleak old age, dread and hunger, seductress to crime, and grinding poverty, all, terrible shapes to see, and death and deadly struggle and sleep, twin brother of death, and twisted, wicked joys and facing them at the threshold, war, rife with death, and the fury's iron chambers, and mad, raging strife whose blood-stained headbands not her snaky locks. There in the midst, a giant shadowy elm tree spreads her ancient branching arms, home, they say, to swarms of false dreams, one clinging tight under each leaf. And a throng of monsters too, what brutal forms are stabled at the gates, centaurs, mongrel sillas, part women, part beasts, an hundred-handed Briarius and the savage Hydra of Lerna, that hissing horror, the chimera armed with torches, gorgons, harpies and triple-bodied Gerion, his great ghost. And here, instantly struck with terror, Aeneas grips his sword and offers its naked edge against them as they come, and if his experienced comrade had not warned him they are mere disembodied creatures, flimsy will-o'-the-wisps that flit like living forms, he would have rushed them all, slashed through empty phantoms with his blade. From there the road leads down to the Atron's Tartarian waves. Here the enormous whirlpool gapes a swirl with filth, seeds and spews out all its silt in the wailing river. And here the dreaded ferryman guards the flood, grisly in his squalor, Charon, his scraggly beard a tangled mat of white, his eyes fixed in a fiery stare, and his grimy rags hang down from his shoulders by a knot. But all on his own he punts his craft with a pole and hoist sail as he ferries the dead souls in his rust-red skiff. He's on in years, but a god's old age is hale and green. A huge throng of the dead came streaming toward the banks, mothers and grown men and ghosts of great souled heroes, their bodies stripped of life, and boys and unwed girls and sons laid on the pyre before their parents' eyes. As thick as leaves in autumn woods at the first frost that slip and float to earth, or dense as flocks of birds that wing from the heaving sea to shore when winter's chill drives them over the waves to landfalls drenched in sunlight. There they stood, pleading to be the first ones ferried over, reaching out their hands in longing toward the farther shore. But the grim ferryman ushers aboard now these, now those, others he thrusts away, back from the water's edge. Aeneas, astonished, stirred by the tumult, calls out, Tell me, Sybil, what does it mean, this thronging toward the river? What do the dead souls want? What divides them all? Some are turned away from the banks and others scull the murky waters with their oars. The aged priestess answered Aeneas briefly, son of Anchises, born of the gods, no doubt, what you see are Cochitus pools and Styx's marsh, powers by which the gods swear oaths they dare not break. And the great rout you see is helpless, still not buried. That ferryman there is Charon. Those born by the stream have found their graves. And no spirits may be conveyed across the horrendous banks and horse, roaring flood until their bones are buried, and they rest in peace. A hundred years they wander, hovering round these shores till at last they may return and see once more the pools they long to cross. Anchise's son came to a halt and stood there, pondering long, while pity filled his heart, their lot so hard, unjust. 
And then he spots two men, grief-stricken and robbed of death's last tribute, Leucaspis and Orance, the Lycian fleet's commander. Together they sailed from Troy over windswept seas and a southern gale sprang up and toppling breakers crushed their ships and crews. Look, the pilot Palinurus was drifting toward him now, fresh from the Libyan run where, watching the stars, he plunged from his stern, pitched out in heavy seas. Aeneas, barely sighting him grieving in the shadows, hailed him first, What god, Palinurus, snatched you from our midst and drowned you in open waters? Tell me, please. Apollo has never lied before. This is his one reply that's played me false, he swore you would cross the ocean safe and sound and reach Italian shores. Is this the end he promised? But the pilot answered, Captain, Anchise's son, Apollo's prophetic cauldron has not failed you, no god drowned me in open waters. No, the rudder I clung to, holding us all on course, my charge, some powerful force ripped it away by chance and I dragged it down as I dropped headlong too. By the cruel seas I swear I felt no fear for myself to match my fear that your ship, stripped of her tiller, steersman wrenched away, might founder in that great surge. Three blustery winter nights the south wind bore me wildly over the endless waters, then at the fourth dawn, swept up on a breaker's crest, I could almost sight it now, Italy. Stroke by stroke I swam for land, safety was in my grasp, weighed down by my sodden clothes, my fingers clawing the jutting spurs of a cliff, when a band of brutes came at me, ran me through with knives, the fools, they took me for plunder worth the taking. The tides hold me now and the storm winds roll my body down the shore. By the sky's lovely light and the buoyant breeze I beg you, by your father, your hopes for Ulysses rising to his prime, pluck me up from my pain, my undefeated captain. Or throw some earth on my body, you know you can, sail back to Valia's port. Or if there's a way and your goddess mother makes it clear, for not without the will of the gods, I'm certain, do you strive to cross these awesome streams and Stygian marsh, give me your pledge, your hand, in all my torment. Take me with you over the waves. At least in death I'll find a peaceful haven. So the pilot begged and so the sibyl cut him short, how, Palinurus, how can you harbour this mad desire of yours? You think that you, unburied, can lay your eyes on the Styx's flood, the Fury's ruthless stream, and approach the banks unsummoned? Hope no more the gods' decrees can be brushed aside by prayer. Hold fast to my words and keep them well in mind to comfort your hard lot. For neighboring people living in cities near and far, compelled by signs from the great gods on high, will appease your bones, will build you a tomb and pay your tomb due rites and the site will bear the name of Palinurus now and always. That promise lifts his anguish, drives, for a while, the grief from his sad heart. He takes delight in the cape that bears his name. So now they press on with their journey underway and at last approach the river. But once the ferryman, still out in the Styx's currents, spied them moving across the silent grove and turning toward the bank, he greets them first with a rough abrupt rebuke, stop, whoever you are at our river's edge, in full armor too. Why have you come? Speak up, from right where you are, not one step more. This is the realm of shadows, sleep and drowsy night. The law forbids me to carry living bodies across in my Stygian boat. I'd little joy, believe me, when Hercules came and I sailed the hero over, or Theseus, Pirithus, sons of gods as they were with their high and mighty power. Hercules stole our watchdog, chained him, the poor trembling creature, dragged him away from our king's very throne. The others tried to snatch our queen from the bridal bed of death. But Apollo's seer broke in and countered Charon, there's no such treachery here, just calm down, no threat of force in our weapons. The huge guard at the gates can howl for eternity from his cave, terrifying the bloodless shades, Persephone keep her chastity safe at home behind her uncle's doors. Aeneas of Troy, famous for his devotion, feats of arms, goes down to the deepest shades of hell to see his father. But if this image of devotion cannot move you, here, this bow, showing the bow enfolded in her robes, you know it well. At this, the heaving rage subsides in his chest. The Sibyl says no more. The ferryman, marveling at the awesome gift, the fateful branch unseen so many years, swerves his dusky craft and approaches shore. The souls already crouched at the long thwarts, he brusquely thrusts them out, clearing the gangways, quickly taking massive Aeneas aboard the little skiff. Under his weight the boat groans and her stitched seams gape as she ships great pools of water pouring in. At last, the river crossed, the ferryman lands the seer and hero all unharmed in the marsh, the repellent oozing slime and livid sedge. 
These are the realms that monstrous Cerberus rocks with howls braying out of his three throats, his enormous bulk squatting low in the cave that faced them there. The Sibyl, seeing the serpents writhe around his neck, tossed him a sop, slumbrous with honey and drugged seed, and he, frothing with hunger, three jaws spread wide, snapped it up where the Sibyl tossed it, gone. His tremendous back relaxed, he sags to earth and sprawls over all his cave, his giant hulk limp. The watchdog buried now in sleep, Aenea seizes the way in, quickly clear of the river's edge, the point of no return. At that moment, cries, they could hear them now, a crescendo of wailing, ghosts of infants weeping, robbed of their share of this sweet life, at its very threshold too, all, snatched from the breast on that black day that swept them off and drowned them in bitter death. Beside them were those condemned to die on a false charge. But not without jury picked by lot, not without judge are their places handed down. Not at all. Minos the Grand Inquisitor stirs the urn, he summons the silent jury of the dead, he scans the lives of those accused, their charges. The region next to them is held by those sad ghosts, innocents all, who brought on death by their own hands, despising the light, they threw their lives away. How they would yearn, now, in the world above to endure grim want and long hard labor. But fate bars the way. The grisly swamp and its loveless, lethal waters bind them fast, STYX with its nine huge coils holds them captive. Close to the spot, extending toward the horizon, the Sibyl points them out, are the fields of mourning, that is the name they bear. Here wait those souls consumed by the harsh, wasting sickness, cruel love, concealed on lonely paths, shrouded by myrtle bowers. Not even in death do their torments leave them, ever. Here he glimpses Phaedra, Procris, an Eryphile grieving, bearing the wounds her heartless son had dealt her. Evaden, Pasiphae, and Laodamia walking side by side, and another, a young man once, a woman now, Seneus, turned back by fate to the form she bore at first. And wandering there among them, wound still fresh, Phoenician Dido drifted along the endless woods. As the Trojan hero paused beside her, recognized her through the shadows, a dim, misty figure, as one when the month is young may see or seem to see the new moon rising up through banks of clouds, that moment Aeneas wept and approached the ghost with tender words of love, tragic Dido, so, was the story true that came my way? I heard that you were dead, you took the final measure with a sword. Oh, dear God, was it I who caused your death? I swear by the stars, by the powers on high, whatever faith one swears by here in the depths of earth, I left your shores, my queen, against my will. Yes, the will of the gods, that drives me through the shadows now, these mouldering places so forlorn, this deep unfathomed night, their decrees have forced me on. Nor did I ever dream my leaving could have brought you so much grief. Stay a moment. Don't withdraw from my sight. Running away, from whom? This is the last word that fate allows me to say to you. The last. Aeneas, with such appeals, with welling tears, tried to soothe her rage, her wild fiery glance. But she, her eyes fixed on the ground, turned away, her features no more moved by his pleas as he talked on than if she were set in stony flint or pie in marble rock. And at last she tears herself away, his enemy forever, fleeing back to the shadowed forests where Sicius, her husband long ago, answers all her anguish, meets her love with love. But Aeneas, no less struck by her unjust fate, escorts her from afar with streaming tears and pities her as she passes. From there they labor along the charted path and at last they gain the utmost outer fields where throngs of the great war heroes live apart. Here Tydeus comes to meet him, Parthenope is shining in arms, and Adrastus pallid phantom. Here, mourned in the world above and fallen dead in battle, sons of Dardanus, chiefs arrayed in a long-ranked line. Seeing them all, he groaned, Glaucus, Medon, Thersilochus, Antinor's three sons and the priest of Ceres, Polybotes, Ideas too, still with chariot, still with gear in hand. Their spirits crowding around Aeneas, left and right, beg him to linger longer, a glimpse is not enough, to walk beside him and learn the reasons why he's come. But the Greek commanders and Agamemnon's troops in phalanx, spotting the hero and his armor glinting through the shadows, blinding panic grips them, some turn tail and run as they once ran back to the ships, some strain to raise a battle cry, a thin wisp of a cry that mocks their gaping jaws. And here he sees Daphobus too, Priam's son mutilated, his whole body, his face hacked to pieces, ah, so cruel, his face and both his hands, and his ears ripped from his ravaged head, his nostrils slashed, disgraceful wound. He can hardly recognize him, a cowering shadow hiding his punishment so raw. 
Aeneas, never pausing, hails the ghost at once in an old familiar voice, mighty captain, Daphobus, sprung of the noble blood of Teucer, who was bent on making you pay a price so harsh. Who could maim you so? I heard on that last night that you, exhausted from killing hordes of Greeks, had fallen dead on a mangled pile of carnage. So I was the one who raised your empty tomb on Rotium Cape and called out to your shade three times with a ringing voice. Your name and armor mark the site, my friend, but I could not find you, could not bury your bones in native soil when I set out to sea. Nothing, my friend, Priam's son replies, you have left nothing undone. All that's owed Daphobus and his shadow you have paid in full. My own fate and the deadly crimes of that Spartan whore have plunged me in this hell. Look at the souvenirs she left me. And how we spent that last night, lost in deluded joys, you know. Remember it we must, and all too well. When the fatal horse mounted over our steep walls, its weighted belly teeming with infantry in arms, she led the Phrygian women round the city, feigning the orgiastic rites of Bacchus, dancing, shrieking, but in their midst she shook her monstrous torch, a flare from the city heights, a signal to the Greeks. While I in our cursed bridal chamber, there I lay, bone weary with anguish, buried deep in sleep, peaceful, sweet, like the peace of death itself. And all the while that matchless wife of mine is removing all my weapons from the house, even slipping my trusty sword from under my pillow. She calls Menelaus in and flings the doors wide open, hoping no doubt by this grand gift to him, her lover, to wipe the slate clean of her former wicked ways. Why drag things out? They burst into the bedroom, Ulysses, that rouser of outrage right beside them, airless crafty air. You gods, if my lips are pure, I pray for vengeance now, deal such blows to the Greeks as they dealt me. But come, tell me in turn what twist of fate has brought you here alive? Forced by wanderings, storm-tossed at sea, or prompted by the gods? What destiny hounds you on to visit these, these sunless homes of sorrow, harrowed lands? Trading words, as dawn in her rose-red chariot crossed in mid-career, high noon in the arching sky, and they might have spent what time they had with tales if the sibyl next to Aeneas had not warned him tersely, night comes on, Aeneas. We waste our time with tears. This is the place where the road divides in two. To the right it runs below the mighty walls of death, our path to Elysium, but the left-hand road torments the wicked, leading down to Tartarus, path to doom. No anger, please, great priestess, begged Daphobus. Back I go to the shades to fill the tally out. Now go, our glory of Troy, go forth and enjoy a better fate than mine. With his last words he turned in his tracks and went his way. Aeneas suddenly glances back and beneath a cliff to the left he sees an enormous fortress ringed with triple walls and raging around it all, a blazing flood of lava, Tartarus river of fire, whirling thunderous boulders. Before it rears a giant gate, its columns solid adamant, so no power of man, not even the gods themselves can root it out in war. An iron tower looms on high where Tisiphone, crouching with bloody shroud girt up, never sleeping, keeps her watch at the entrance night and day. Groans resound from the depths, the savage crack of the lash, the grating creak of iron, the clank of dragging chains. And Aeneas froze there, terrified, taking in the din, what are the crimes, what kinds? Tell me, Sybil, what are the punishments, why this scourging? Why such wailing echoing in the air? The seer rose to the moment, famous captain of Troy, no pure soul may set foot on that wicked threshold. But when Hecate put me in charge of Avernus Groves she taught me all the punishments of the gods, she led me through them all. Here Cretan Radamanthus rules with an iron hand, censuring men, exposing fraud, forcing confessions when anyone up above, reveling in his hidden crimes, puts off his day of atonement till he dies, the fool, too late. That very moment, vengeful Tisiphone, armed with lashes, springs on the guilty, whips them till they quail, with her left hand shaking all her twisting serpents, summoning up her savage sisters, bands of furies. Then at last, screeching out on their grinding hinge the infernal gates swing wide. Can you see that sentry crouched at the entrance? What a spectre guards the threshold. Fiercer still, the monstrous hydra, fifty black moors gaping, holds its lair inside. Then the abyss, Tartarus itself plunges headlong down through the darkness twice as far as our gaze goes up to Olympus rising toward the skies. Here the ancient line of the earth, the titan spawn, flung down by lightning, writhe in the deep pit. There I saw the twin sons of Aluas too, giant bodies that clawed the soaring sky with their hands to tear it down and thrust great Jove from his kingdom high above. 
I saw Salmoneus too, who paid a brutal price for aping the flames of Jove and Olympus thunder. Sped by his four-horse chariot, flaunting torches, right through the Greek tribes and Elicity's heart he rode in triumph, claiming as his the honors of the gods. The madman, trying to match the storm and matchless lightning just by stamping on bronze with prancing horn-hoofed steeds. The Almighty Father hurled his bolt through the thunderheads, no torches for him, no smoky flicker of pitch pines, no, he spun him headlong down in a raging whirlwind. Titius too, you could see that son of earth, the mother of us all, his giant body splayed out over nine whole acres, a hideous vulture with hooked beak gorging down his immortal liver and innards ever ripe for torture. Deep in his chest it nestles, ripping into its feast and the fibers, grown afresh, get no relief from pain. What need to tell of the Lapiths, Ixion, or Pirithus? Above them a black rock, now, now slipping, teetering, watch, forever about to fall. While the golden posts of high festal couches gleam, and a banquet spreads before their eyes with luxury fit for kings, but reclining just beside them, the oldest fury holds back their hands from even touching the food, surging up with her brandished torch and deafening screams. Here those who hated their brothers, while alive, or struck their fathers down or embroiled clients in fraud, or brooded alone over troves of gold they gained and never put aside some share for their own kin, a great multitude, these, then those killed for adultery, those who marched to the flag of civil war and never shrank from breaking their pledge to their lords and masters, all of them, walled up here, wait to meet their doom. Don't hunger to know their doom, what form of torture or twist of fortune drags them down. Some trundle enormous boulders, others dangle, racked to the breaking point on the spokes of rolling wheels. Doom Thysia sits on his seat and there he will sit forever. Phlegias, most in agony, sounds out his warning to all, his piercing cries bear witness through the darkness, learn to bow to justice. Never scorn the gods. You all stand forewarned. Here's one who bartered his native land for gold, he saddled her with a tyrant, set up laws for a bribe, for a bribe he struck them down. This one forced himself on his daughter's bed and sealed a forbidden marriage. All dared an outrageous crime and what they dared, they did. No, not if I had a hundred tongues and a hundred mouths and a voice of iron too, I could never capture all the crimes or run through all the torments, doom by doom. So Apollo's aged priestess ended her answer, then she added, come, press on with your journey. See it through, this duty you've undertaken. We must hurry now. I can just make out the ramparts forged by the cyclops. There are the gates, facing us with their arch. There our orders say to place our gifts. At that, both of them march in step along the shadowed paths, consuming the space between, and approach the doors. Aeneas springs to the entryway and rinsing his limbs with fresh pure water, there at the threshold, just before them, stakes the golden bough. The rite complete at last, their duty to the goddess performed in full, they gained the land of joy, the fresh green fields, the fortunate groves where the blessed make their homes. Here a freer air, a dazzling radiance clothes the fields and the spirits possess their own sun, their own stars. Some flex their limbs in the grassy wrestling rings, contending in sport, they grapple on the golden sands. Some beat out a dance with their feet and chant their songs. And Orpheus himself, the Thracian priest with his long robes, keeps their rhythm strong with his lyre's seven ringing strings, plucking now with his fingers, now with his ivory plectrum. Here is the ancient line of Teusa, noblest stock of all, those great-hearted heroic sons born in better years, Ilus, and Asaracus, and Dardanus, founder of Troy. Far off, Aeneas gazes in awe, their arms, their chariots, phantoms all, their lances fixed in the ground, their horses, freed from harness, grazing the grasslands near and far. The same joy they took in arms and chariots when alive, in currying horses sleek and putting them to pasture, follows them now they rest beneath the earth. Others, look, he glimpses left and right in the meadows, feasting, singing in joy a chorus raised to healing Apollo, deep in a redolent laurel grove where Eridanus river rushes up, in full spate, and rolls through woods in the high world above. And here are troops of men who had suffered wounds, fighting to save their country, and those who had been pure priests while still alive, and the faithful poets whose songs were fit for Phoebus, those who enriched our lives with the newfound arts they forged and those we remember well for the good they did mankind. And all, with snow-white headbands crowning their brows, flow around the Sibyl as she addresses them there, Musaeus first, who holds the center of that huge throng, his shoulders rearing high as they gaze up toward him, tell us, happy spirits, and you, the best of poets, what part of your world, what region holds and chises. 
All for him we have come, we've sailed across the mighty streams of hell. And at once the great soul made a brief reply, no one's home is fixed. We live in shady groves, we settle on pillowed banks and meadows washed with brooks. But you, if your heart compels you, climb this ridge and I soon will set your steps on an easy path. So he said and walking on ahead, from high above points out to them open country swept with light. Down they come and leave the heights behind. Now Father Anchises, deep in a valley's green recess, was passing among the souls secluded there, reviewing them, eagerly, on their way to the world of light above. By chance he was counting over his own people, all his cherished heirs, their fame and their fates, their values, acts of valor. When he saw Aeneas striding toward him over the fields, he reached out both his hands as his spirit lifted, tears ran down his cheeks, a cry broke from his lips, you've come at last. Has the love your father hoped for mastered the hardship of the journey? Let me look at your face, my son, exchange some words, and hear your familiar voice. So I dreamed, I knew you'd come, I counted the moments, my longing has not betrayed me. Over what lands, what seas have you been driven, buffeted by what perils into my open arms, my son? How I feared the realm of Libya might well do you harm. Your ghost, my father, he replied, your grieving ghost, so often it came and urged me to your threshold. My ships are lying moored in the Tuscan Sea. Let me clasp your hand, my father, let me, I beg you, don't withdraw from my embrace. So Aeneas pleaded, his face streaming tears. Three times he tried to fling his arms around his neck, three times he embraced, nothing, the phantom sifting through his fingers, light as wind, quick as a dream in flight. And now Aeneas sees in the valley's depths a sheltered grove and rustling wooded brakes and the lethe flowing past the homes of peace. Around it hovered numberless races, nations of souls like bees in meadowlands on a cloudless summer day that settle on flowers, riots of color, swarming round the lily's lustrous sheen, and the whole field comes alive with a humming murmur. Struck by the sudden sight, Aeneas, all unknowing, wonders aloud, and asks, what is the river over there? And who are they who crowd the banks in such a growing throng? His father Anchises answers, they are the spirits owed a second body by the fates. They drink deep of the river Lethe's currents there, long draughts that will set them free of cares, oblivious forever. How long I have yearned to tell you, show them to you, face to face, yes, as I count the tally out of all my children's children. So all the more you can rejoice with me in Italy, found at last. What, father, can we suppose that any spirits rise from here to the world above, return once more to the shackles of the body? Why this mad desire, poor souls, for the light of life? I will tell you, my son, not keep you in suspense, Anchises says, and unfolds all things in order, one by one. First, the sky and the earth and the flowing fields of the sea, the shining orb of the moon and the titan sun, the stars, an inner spirit feeds them, coursing through all their limbs, mind stirs the mass and their fusion brings the world to birth. From their union springs the human race and the wild beasts, the winged lives of birds and the wondrous monsters bred below the glistening surface of the sea. The seeds of life, fiery is their force, divine their birth, but they are weighed down by the body's ills or dulled by earthly limbs and flesh that's born for death. That is the source of all men's fears and longings, joys and sorrows, nor can they see the heaven's light, shut up in the body's tomb, a prison dark and deep. True, but even on that last day, when the light of life departs, the wretches are not completely purged of all the taints, nor are they wholly freed of all the body's plagues. Down deep they harden fast, they must, so long ingrained in the flesh, in strange, uncanny ways. And so the souls are drilled in punishments, they must pay for their old offenses. Some are hung splayed out, exposed to the empty winds, some are plunged in the rushing floods, their stains, their crimes scoured off or scorched away by fire. Each of us must suffer his own demanding ghost. Then we are sent to Elysium's broad expanse, a few of us even hold these fields of joy till the long days, a cycle of time seen through, cleanse our hard, inveterate stains and leave us clear ethereal sense, the eternal breath of fire purge and pure. But all the rest, once they have turned the wheel of time for a thousand years, God calls them forth to the Lethe, great armies of souls, their memories blank so that they may revisit the overarching world once more and begin to long to return to bodies yet again. Anchises, silent a moment, drawing his son and Sybil with him into the midst of the vast murmuring throng, took his stand on a rise of ground where he could scan the long column marching toward him, soul by soul, and recognize their features as they neared. 
So come, the glory that will follow the sons of Troy through time, your children born of Italian stock who wait for life, bright souls, future heirs of our name and our renown, I will reveal them all and tell you of your fate. There, you see that youth who leans on a tipless spear of honor? Assigned the nearest place to the world of light, the first to rise to the air above, his blood mixed with Italian blood, he bears an Alban name. Silvius, your son, your last born, when late in your old age your wife Lavinia brings him up, deep in the woods, a king who fathers kings in turn, he founds our race that rules in Alba Longa. Nearby, there's Procas, pride of the Trojan people, then come Capis, Numita, and the one who revives your name, Silvius Aeneas, your equal in arms and duty, famed, if he ever comes to rule the Alban throne. What brave young men! Look at the power they display and the oak leaf civic crowns that shade their foreheads. They will erect for you Nomentum, Gabii, Fadina town and build Calatia's ramparts on the mountains, Pamisha too, an Inuus fortress, Bola and Cora. Famous names in the future, nameless places now. Here, a son of Mars, his grandsire Numitor's comrade, Romulus, bred from Asaracus blood by his mother, Ilia. See how the twin plumes stand joined on his helmet? And the father of gods himself already marks him out with his own bolts of honor. Under his auspices, watch, my son, our brilliant Rome will extend her empire far and wide as the earth, her spirit high as Olympus. Within her single wall she will gird her seven hills, blessed in her breed of men, like the Berecynthian mother crowned with her turrets, riding her victor's chariot through the Phrygian cities, glad in her brood of gods, embracing a hundred grandsons. All dwell in the heavens, all command the heights. Now turn your eyes this way and behold these people, your own Roman people. Here is Caesar and all the line of Eula soon to venture under the sky's great arch. Here is the man, his here. Time and again you've heard his coming promised, Caesar Augustus. Son of a god, he will bring back the age of gold to the Latian fields where Saturn once held sway, expand his empire past the Garamants and the Indians to a land beyond the stars, beyond the wheel of the year, the course of the sun itself, where Atlas bears the skies and turns on his shoulder the heavens studded with flaming stars. Even now the Caspian and Meotic kingdoms quake at his coming, oracles sound the alarm and the seven mouths of the Nile churn with fear. Not even Hercules himself could cross such a vast expanse of earth, though it's true he shot the stag with its brazen hoofs, and brought peace to the ravaged woods of Erymanthus, terrorized the Hydra of Lerna with his bow. Not even Bacchus in all his glory, driving his team with vines for reins and lashing his tigers down from Nysa's soaring ridge. Do we still flinch from turning our valor into deeds? Or fear to make our home on western soil? But look, who is that over there, crowned with an olive wreath and bearing sacred emblems? I know his snowy hair, his beard, the first king to found our Rome on laws, Numa, sent from the poor town of Cures, poultry land, to wield imperial power. And after him comes Toulouse disrupting his country's peace to rouse a stagnant people, armies stale to the taste of triumph, back to war again. And just behind him, Ancus, full of the old bravado, even now too swayed by the breeze of public favor. Wait, would you like to see the Tarquin kings, the overweening spirit of Brutus the Avenger, the fasces he reclaims? The first to hold a consul's power and ruthless axes, then, when his sons ferment rebellion against the city, their father summons them to the executioner's block in freedom's noble name, unfortunate man. However the future years will exalt his actions, a patriot's love wins out, and boundless lust for praise. Now, the Decii and the Drusi, look over there, Torquatus too, with his savage axe, Camillus bringing home the standards. But you see that pair of spirits. Gleaming in equal armor, equals now at peace, while darkness pins them down, but if they should reach the light of life, what war they'll rouse between them. Battles, massacres, Caesar, the bride's father, marching down from his alpine ramparts, fortress Monaco, Pompey her husband set to oppose him with the armies of the east. No, my sons, never renew yourselves to civil war, never turn your sturdy power against your country's heart. You, Caesar, you be first in mercy, you trace your line from Olympus, born of my blood, throw down your weapons now. Mummy as her he will conquer Corinth and, famed for killing Achaeans, drive his victor's chariot up the capital's heights. And there is Paulus, and he will rout all Argos and Agamemnon's own Mycenae and cut Perseus down, the heir of Echus, born of Achilles' warrior blood, and avenge his Trojan kin and Minerva's violated shrine. Who, noble Cato, could pass you by in silence? Or you, Kossus? Or the Gracchi and their kin? 
Or the two Scipios, both thunderbolts of battle, Libya scourge? Or you, Fabricius, reared from poverty into power? Or you, Serenus the sower, seeding your furrow? You far be, where do you rush me, all but spent? And you, famous Maximus, you are the one man whose delaying tactics save our Roman state. Others, I have no doubt, will forge the bronze to breathe with suppler lines, draw from the block of marble features quick with life, plead their cases better, chart with their rods the stars that climb the sky and foretell the times they rise. But you, Roman, remember, rule with all your power the peoples of the earth, these will be your arts, to put your stamp on the works and ways of peace, to spare the defeated, break the proud in war. They were struck with awe as Father Anchises paused, then carried on, look there, Marcellus marching toward us, decked in splendid plunder he tore from a chief he killed, victorious, towering over all. This man on horseback, he will steady the Roman state when rocked by chaos, mow the Carthaginians down in droves, the rebel Gauls. He is only the third to offer up to Father Quirinus the enemy's captured arms. Aeneas broke in now, for he saw a young man walking at Marcellus' side, handsome, striking, his armor burnished bright but his face showed little joy, his eyes cast down. Who is that, father, matching Marcellus stride for stride? A son, or one of his son's descendants born of noble stock? What a claim from his comrades! What fine bearing, the man himself! True, but around his head a mournful shadow flutters black as night. My son, his tears brimming, Father Anchises started in, don't press to know your people's awesome grief. Only a glimpse of him the fates will grant the world, not let him linger longer. Too mighty, the Roman race, it seemed to you above, if this grand gift should last. Now what wails of men will the field of Mars send up to Mars' tremendous city? What a cortege you'll see, old Tiber, flowing past the massive tomb just built. No child of Troy will ever raise so high the hopes of his Latin forebears, nor will the land of Romulus take such pride in a son she's born. Mourn for his virtue. Mourn for his honor forge of old, his sword arm never conquered in battle. No enemy could ever go against him in arms and leave unscathed, whether he fought on foot or rode on horseback, digging spurs in his charger's lathered flanks. Oh, child of heartbreak. If only you could burst the stern decrees of fate. You will be Mosellus. Fill my arms with lilies, let me scatter flowers, lustrous roses, piling high these gifts, at least, on our descendants' shade, and perform a futile rite. So they wander over the endless fields of air, gazing at every region, viewing realm by realm. Once Anchises has led his son through each new scene and fired his soul with a love of glory still to come, he tells him next of the wars Aeneas still must wage, he tells of Laurentine peoples, tells of Latin a city, and how he should shun or shoulder each ordeal that he must meet. There are twin gates of sleep. One, they say, is called the Gate of Horn and it offers easy passage to all true shades. The other glistens with ivory, radiant, flawless, but through it the dead send false dreams up toward the sky. And here Anchises, his vision told in full, escorts his son and Sybil both and shows them out now through the ivory gate. Aeneas cuts his way to the waiting ships to see his crews again, then sets a course straight onto Caeta's harbour. Anchors run from prows, the sterns line the shore. Book 7. Beachhead in Latium, armies gather. In death, Caeta, Aeneas' nurse, you too have granted our shores a fame that never dies. And now your honor preserves your resting place, and if such glory is any glory at all, your name marks out your bones in the great land of the West. But devout Aeneas now, the last rites performed and the grave mound piled high, once the seas lie calm, sets sail on his journey, puts the port astern. Freshening breezes blow as night comes on and a full moon speeds their course, its dancing light strikes sparkles off the waves. And they closely skirt the coasts of Circe's land where the sun's rich daughter makes her deadly groves resound with her endless song, and deep in her proud halls she kindles fragrant cedar flaring through the night as her whirring shuttle sweeps her fine-spun loom. From there you could hear the furious growls of lions bridling at their chains, roaring into the dead of night, the raging of bristly boars and bears caged in their pens and the looming forms of howling wolves, the men who shapes the brutal goddess Circe changed with her potent drugs, trick them out in the hides and look of wild beasts. But to spare the loyal Trojans such a monstrous fate, risking that harbour, touching those lethal shores, Neptune swelled their sails with following winds and gave them a swift escape, speeding them past the churning shoals unharmed. 
Now the sea was going red with the rays of dawn. From the heavens gold aurora shone in her rose-red car when the wind died down, suddenly every breeze fell flat and the oars struggled against a sluggish, leaden swell. But now Aeneas, still at sea, scanning the offing, spots an enormous wooden running through it, the Tiber in all its glory, rapids, whirlpools golden with sand and bursting out to sea. And over it, round it, birds, all kinds, haunting the riverbed and banks, entrance the air with their song and flutter through the trees. Change course, he commands his men. Turn prows to land. And he enters the great shaded river, overjoyed. Now come, Irato, who were the kings, the tides and times, how stood the old Latin state when that army of intruders first beached their fleet on Italian shores? All that I will unfold, I will recall how the battle first began. And you, goddess, inspire your singer, come. I will tell of horrendous wars, tell of battle lines and princes fired with courage, driven to their deaths, Etruscan battalions, all Hesperia called to arms. A greater tide of events springs up before me now, I launch a greater labor. King Latinus, already old, had governed the fields and towns through long years of peace. Fauna's son he was, and the Latian nymphs, Marica, so we hear. Picus was Fauna's father, and Picus boasted you as his sire, great Saturn, you, the founder of the bloodline. Latinus had no son, his one male issue torn from him by the gods' decrees, in the first bloom of youth. One daughter alone was left to preserve the house and royal line, ripe for marriage now, a full-grown woman now. Many suitors sought her all through Latium, all Orsonia too, and the handsomest of the lot was Turnus, strong in his noble birth and breeding. The queen mother burned with a will to wed him to her daughter, true, but down from the gods came sign on sign of alarm to block the way. Far in the palace depths there stood a laurel, its foliage sacred, tended with awe for many years. Father Latinus, they say, had found it once himself, building his first stronghold, hallowed it to Phoebus and named his settlers after the laurel's name, Laurons. Now sweeping toward this tree from a clear blue sky, a marvel, listen, a squadron of bees came buzzing to high heaven, swarmed in an instant, massed on the tree's crown and hooking feet together, bent the laurel's leafy branches down. A prophet cries at once, a stranger, I see him. A whole army of men arriving out of the same quarter, bent on the same goal, to rule our city's heights. What's worse, as the young virgin Lavinia lit the altar with pure torches, flanking her father, look, what horror, her flowing hair caught fire, her lovely regalia crackled in the flames, her regal tresses blazed, her crown blazing, studded with flashing jewels, the next moment the girl was engulfed in a smoky yellow glare, strewing the god of fire's power through the house. That sight was bruited about as a sign of wonder, terror, for Lavinia, prophets sang of a brilliant fame to come, for the people they foretold a long, grueling war. Dismayed by the signs, the king seeks out the oracle of Faunus, his Vatic father. He consults the grove below Albunia's heights, where the grand woods resound with a holy spring and exhale their dark, deadly fumes. Here all the Italian tribes and all Inotria's land seek out the oracle's response in hours of doubt. Here the priest, when he brings the sacred gifts and looks for sleep beneath the silent night, stretched out on the hides of slaughtered sheep, will see whole hosts of phantoms, miracles on the wing, hear the voices swarm, engage with the gods in words and speak with Acheron in Avernus deepest pools. Here too, Latinus himself, seeking out responses, slaughtered a hundred yearling sheep in the old way and there he lay ensconced, at rest on fleecy hides when a sudden voice broke from the grove's depths, never seek to marry your daughter to a Latin, put no trust, my son, in a marriage ready-made. Strangers will come, and come to be your sons and their lifeblood will lift our name to the stars. Their sons' sons will see, wherever the wheeling sun looks down on the ocean, rising or setting, east or west, the whole earth turn beneath their feet, their rule. This response from Father Faunus, a warning sent in the silent night, Latinus did not seal his lips, rumor had spread it already, flying far and wide through Orsonia's towns before the sons of Troy tied up their fleet at the river's green embankments. Now Aeneas, his ranking chiefs and handsome Eulus stretch out on the grass below the boughs of a tall tree, then set about their meal, spreading a feast on wheat and cakes, Jove himself impelled them, heaping the plates with Ceres' gifts, her country fruits. And once they devoured all in sight, still not sated, their hunger drove them on to attack the fateful plates themselves, their hands and teeth defiling, ripping into the thin dry crusts, never sparing a crumb of the flatbread scored in quarters. Suddenly Eulus shouted, what, we're even eating our platters now? 
Only a joke, and nothing more, but his words, once heard, first spelled an end of troubles. As they first fell from the boy's lips, his father seized upon them, struck by the will of God, and made him hold his peace, and Aeneas cries at once, Hail to the country owed to me by fate. Hail to you, you faithful household gods of Troy. Here is our home, here is our native land. For my own father, now I remember, Anchises left to me these secret signs of fate, when, my son, born to an unknown shore, reduced to iron rations, hunger drives you to eat your own platters, thence the moment, exhausted as you are, to hope for home. There, never forget, your hands must labor to build your first houses, ring them round with mounds. This is the hunger he meant, this the last trial, the last limit set to our pains of exile. Come, with the first light of day, our spirits high, let's explore the land. What people hold it? Where are their towns? Scatter out from port on different routes. But now pour cups to Jove and call on Father Anchises with our prayers, set out the wine on tables once again. With that, he reads his brows with a leafy green spray and prays to the spirit of the place, an earth, first of the gods, a nymphs and rivers still unknown, and then to the night and the rising stars of night. He calls on Jove of Ida, calls the Phrygian mother, both gods in turn, and then his two parents, his mother high above and his father down below. The Almighty Father answered, three times over, rending the cloudless sky with claps of thunder, flourishing high in his own hand from heaven's peak a cloud on fire with rays of gold, with radiance. The rumor spread at once through Trojan ranks that the day had come to build their destined city. Impelled by the great omen, hearts filled with joy, they rushed to refresh the banquet, set out bowls and crown the wine with wreaths. The next day, when the sun's first torch had flared across the earth, taking different routes they explore the town, the borderlands and coasts these people hold. Here are the pools where Numica springs rise and here is the Tiber River, here the hardy Latins make their homes. And then Aeneas orders a hundred envoys, picked from all ranks, to approach the king's imperial city, bearing an olive branch of Pallas wound in wool, bearing gifts for the great man, and sue for peace for all the Trojan people. They waste no time, moving out on command, setting a brisk pace. And Aeneas himself lines up his walls with a shallow trench, he starts to work the site and rings his first settlement on the coast with mounds, redoubts and ramparts built like an armed camp. Soon his envoys, having covered the distance, sight the Latins' rising roofs and towers and go up under the walls. There before the city, boys and young men in their vibrant pride of strength are training as riders, breaking teams in the whirling dust, bending their tough, live bows, and hurling home javelins, full shoulder throws, challenging friends to race or box, when a herald comes riding up ahead of the Trojans, bringing news to the old king's ears, powerful men in strangers' dress, they are on their way here now. King Latinus has them summoned into the palace and takes his father's throne amidst them all. August, immense, its hundred column soaring, the house commanded the city heights, Laurentine Picus home with its shuddering grove and ancestral, awesome aura. Here ritual said that kings should receive the scepter, first raise the rods of power. This shrine is their senate, this the site of their sacred banquets. Here the elders slaughtered rams, then sat to dine at an endless line of trestles. Yes, and here, carved in seasoned cedar, rows of statues, rows of the founding forebears, Italus, Father Sabinus, the vintner's figure still wielding his hooked knife, old Saturn and Yana's figure facing right and left. All stand in the forecourt, and all the other kings from the start of time, and those who had taken wounds in war, fighting to save their country. Many weapons, too, hang on the hallowed doors, captured chariots, curved axes, crested helmets, enormous bolts from gates, and lances, shields and ramming beaks ripped from the prows of ships. There with the august staff sat Picus to the life, girt up in the short robe of state, his left hand holding the sacred buckler. Picus, breaker of horses, whom his bride, Circe, seized with a blinding passion, struck with her golden wand and then with magic potions turned him into a bird and splashed his wings with color. So grand, the temple of the gods where King Latinus assumed his father's throne and summoned the Trojans to him in the halls. As they came marching in, he hailed them first with peaceful words of welcome, Tell us, sons of Dardanus, for we know your city, your stock, and we heard that you were sailing here, what do you search for now? What cause, what craving has sailed your ships to Italy, crossing many seas? Whether your lost or storms have swept you far off course, dangers that sailors often suffer, facing open ocean, shielded now by our riverbanks, you ride at anchor. Don't resist our welcome. 
Never forget the Latins are Saturn's people, fair and just, and not because we are bound by curbs or laws, but kept in check of our own accord, the way of our ancient god. I can recall, though the years have blurred the tale, that Oruncan elders like to tell how Dardana sprang up in these fields, then wandered east to the towns of Phrygian Ida, Thracian Samos, called Samothrace these days. From here, his old Tuscan home of Corythus, he set sail, and now a golden palace high in the starry heavens welcomes him to a throne, and his altars add a name to the growing roster of the gods. As Latinus ended, Ilioneus followed, King, great son of Faunus, no black gales, no stormy seas have swept us here to your country, nor did the stars or landmarks throw us far off course. With a firm resolve and willing hearts we've reached your city, driven out of our own kingdom, once the grandest realm the wheeling sun could see from Olympus heights. Our race takes root from Jove, the sons of Dardanus triumph in Father Jove, of the Father's highest stock, our king himself, Aeneas of Troy, who sent us to your gates. How savage the storm that broke from brute Mycenae, scourging Ida's plains. How fate compelled the worlds of Europe and Asia to clash in war. All people know the story, all at the earth's edge, cut off where the rolling ocean pounds them back, and all whom the ruthless sun in the torrid zone, arching amidst the four cool zones of earth, sunders far from us. Escaping that flood and sailing here over many barren seas, now all we ask is a modest resting place for our father's gods, safe haven on your shores, water, and fresh air that's free for all to breathe. We will never shame your kingdom, nor will your fame be treated lightly, no, our thanks for your kind work will never die. Nor will Italy once regret embracing Troy in her heart. I swear by Aeneas' fate, by his right hand proved staunch in loyalty, strong in feats of arms, that many nations, many, and don't slight us now because we come with an olive branch held out and desperate pleas, that many people have urged us, strongly, to join them as allies. But the gods will spur us on to seek your land, their power forced us here. Here Dardanus was born. Here the clear commands of Apollo call him back as the god impels us toward the Tuscan Tiber, the Numica sacred springs. Aeneas, moreover, offers you these gifts, remains of his former riches, meager relics plucked from the fires of burning Troy. From this gold goblet father Anchises tipped the wine at the high altars. This was Priam's regalia when, in the way he liked to rule, he handed down the laws to his gathered people, the scepter, the holy coronet and the robes that Trojan women used to weave. As Ilioneus ends his appeal, Latinus keeps on looking down at the ground, stock still, only his eyes moving, wrapped in concentration. The brocaded purple stirs him, king that he is, and Priam's scepter too, but he is stirred far more, dwelling long on his daughter's marriage, her wedding bed, and mulling deeply over the vision of old Faunus. So this, he thinks, is the man foretold by fate. That son-in-law from a foreign home, and his call to share my throne with equal power. His heirs will blaze in courage, their might will sway the world. And at last he speaks out, filled with joy, may the gods speed the plans that we launch here, their own omens too. Your wish will be my command, Trojan, I embrace your gifts. While Latinus rules, you'll never lack rich plowland, bounty great as Troy's. Just let Aeneas, if he needs us so, and presses so to join in alliance and take the name of comrade, come in person and never shy from the eyes of friends. Let this be part of our peace, to grasp your leader's hand. Take back to your king this answer I give you now. I have a daughter. Signs from my father's shrine and a host of omens from the skies forbid me to wed her to a bridegroom chosen from our race. Our sons-in-law will arrive from foreign shores, that is the fate in store for Latium, so the prophets say, a stranger's blood will raise our name to the stars. This is the one the fates demand. So I believe and if I can read the future with any truth, I welcome him as ours. On that warm note Latinus picks out horses from his entire stable, three hundred strong, standing sleek in their lofty stalls. At once he orders them led out to the Trojans, one for each, swift with their winging hoofs, decked in embroidered purple saddle blankets, golden medallions dangling from their chests, their trappings gold, pure gold the bridle bits they champ between their teeth. For absent Aeneas, a chariot, twin chargers too, sprung from immortal stock, their nostrils flaring fire, born of the mixed breed that crafty Circe bred, making off with one of her father's stallions to mate him with a mare. Riding high with Latinus gifts and words, Aeneas envoys bring back news of peace. 
But look, the merciless wife of Jove was winging back from Argos, in Acca city, holding course through the heavens when, from far in the air, as far as Sicily's Cape Pachinus, she spied Aeneas exulting, Trojan ships at anchor. Men building their homes already, trusting the land already, their fleet abandoned now. Juno stopped, transfixed with anguish, then, shaking her head, this exclamation came pouring from her heart, that cursed race I loathe, their Phrygian fate that clashes with my own. So, couldn't they die on the plains of Troy? So, couldn't they stay defeated in defeat? Couldn't the fires of Troy cremate the Trojans? No, through the shocks of war, through walls of fire, they found a way. What, am I to believe my powers broken down at last, glutted with hatred, now I rest in peace? Oh no, when they were flung loose from their native land I dared to hunt those exiles through the breakers, battle them down the ocean far and wide. I've spent all power of sea and sky against those Trojans. What good have the Certes been to me, or Scylla or gaping Charybdis? The Trojans have settled down secure in the Tiber channel they so craved, safe from the waves, and me. Why, Mars had the force to destroy the giant Lapith race. And Father Jove in person gave old Caledon up to Diana's rage, and for what foul crimes did Caledon and the Lapiths merit so much pain? Oh but I, powerful Juno, wife of Jove, wretched Juno, I endured it all, left nothing undared, I stoop to any tactic, still he defeats me, Aeneas. But if my forces are not enough, I am hardly the one to relent, I'll plead for the help I need, wherever it may be, if I cannot sway the heavens, I'll wake the powers of hell. It's not for me to deny him his Latin throne? So be it. Let Lavinia be his bride. An iron fact of fate. But I can drag things out, delay the whole affair, that I can do, and destroy them root and branch, the people of either king. What a price they'll pay for the father and son-in-law's alliance here. Yes, Latin and Trojan blood will be your dowry, princess, bellona, goddess of war, your maid of honor. So, Hecuba's not the only one who spawned a firebrand, who brought to birth a wedding torch of a son. Venus' son will be the same, a Paris reborn, a funeral torch to consume a second Troy. That said, the terrible goddess swooped down to the earth and stirred Electo, mother of sorrows, up from her den where nightmare furies lurk in hellish darkness. Electo, a joy to her heart, the griefs of war, rage, and murderous plots, and grisly crimes. Even her father, Pluto, loathes the monster, even her own infernal sisters loathe her since she shifts into so many forms, their shapes so fierce, the black snakes of her hair that coil so thickly. Juno whips her on with a challenge like a lash, do me this service, virgin daughter of night, a labor just for me. Don't let my honor, my fame be torn from its high place, or the sons of Aeneas bring Latinus round with their lures of marriage, besieging Italian soil. You can make brothers bound by love gear up for mutual slaughter, demolish a house with hatred, fill it to the roofs with scourges, funeral torches. You have a thousand names, a thousand deadly arts. Shake them out of your teeming heart, sunder their pact of peace, sow crops of murderous war. Now at a stroke make young men thirst for weapons, demand them, grasp them, now. In the next breath, bloated with gorgon venom, Electo launches out, first for Latium, King Latinus' lofty halls, and squats down at the quiet threshold of a martyr seething with all a woman's anguish, fire and fury over the Trojans just arrived and Turnus' marriage lost. Electo flings a snake from her black hair at the queen and thrusts it down her breast, the very depths of her heart, and the horror drives her mad to bring the whole house down. It glides between her robes and her smooth breasts but she feels nothing, no shudder of coils, senses nothing at all as the viper breathes its fire through the frenzied queen. The enormous snake becomes the gold choker around her throat, the raveling end of a headband braiding through her hair, writhing over her body. At the fever's first attack with its clammy poison still stealing over the queen, trickling through her wits and twining her bones with fire, before her mind was seized by the flames within her spirit she could still speak softly, a mother's tender way, sobbing over her daughter's marriage to a Phrygian, so, Lavinia goes in wedlock to these Trojans, exiles? You, her father, have you no pity for your daughter, none for yourself? No pity for me, her mother? Wait, with the first north wind that lying pirate will desert us, setting sail on the high seas, our virgin as his loot. Isn't that how the Phrygian shepherd breached Sparta and carried leaders Helen off to the towns of Troy? What of your sacred word? Your old affection for your people? Your right hand pledged, time and again, to Turnus, your blood kin? 
Now, if the Latin people must seek a son of strangers' stock, if that is fixed in stone and your father Faunus orders press you hard, well then I'd say all countries free of our rule are total strangers. That's what the gods must mean. And Turnus too, track down the roots of his house and who are his forebears? Inachus and Acrisius, Mycenae to the core. Desperate appeals, no use. When she sees Latina stealing himself against her, when the serpent's crazing venom has sunk into her flesh, the fever raging through her entire body, then indeed the unlucky queen, whipped insane by ghastly horrors, raves in her frenzy all throughout the city. Wild as a top, spinning under a twisted whip when boys, obsessed with their play, drive it round an empty court, the whip spinning it round in bigger rings and the boys hovering over it, spellbound, wonderstruck, the boxwood whirling, whip strokes lashing it into life, swift as a top amata whirls through the midst of cities, people fierce in arms. She even darts into forests, feigning she's in the grip of Bacchus' power, daring a greater outrage, rising to greater fury, hiding her daughter deep in the mountain's leafy woods to rob the Trojans of marriage, delay the marriage torch. Bacchus, hail, she shouts. You alone, she cries, you deserve the virgin. For you, I say, she lifts the thyrsus twined with ivy, dancing in your honor, letting her hair grow long, your sacred locks. Rumor flies, and the hearts of Latian mothers flare up with the same fury, the same frenzy spurs them to seek new homes. Old homes deserted, bearing their necks, they loose their hair to the winds, some fill the air with their high-pitched, trilling wails, decked in fawn skins, brandishing lances wound with vines. An amata mid them all, shaking a flaming brand of pine, breaks into a marriage hymn for Turnus and her daughter, rolling her bloodshot eyes she suddenly bursts out, wildly, mothers of Latium, listen, wherever you are, if any love for unlucky amata still stirs your hearts, your loyal hearts, if any care for a mother's right still cuts you to the quick, loose your headbands, seize on the orgies with me. Mad, while through the woods and deserted lairs of wild beasts Electo whips amata on with the lash that whips her menads. Once Electo saw her first arrows of madness piercing home and Latinus plans and his whole house overwhelmed, the grim goddess takes flight on her black wings and heads straight for the walls of bold Rutulian Turnus. Danae once, they say, swept ashore by a southern gale, built that town for her father's settlers, King Acrisius. Ardea, our forebears called the place in the old days, and the mighty name of Ardea still stands firm but its glory is gone forever. Here, under steep roofs in the dark night, Turnus, dead to the world, lay fast asleep and Electo strips away her ghastly features, her furies writhing limbs, transforms herself, her face like an old crone's, she furrows her brow with hideous wrinkles now and takes on snowy hair, binds it with ribbons, braids it with sprays of olive. Now she's Calibi, aged priestess of Juno's temple, so she appears in the young king's eyes and urges, Turnus, how can you lie back and let your labors come to nothing? Your own scepter's handed over to settlers fresh from Troy. The king denies you your bride, denies you your dowry earned in blood, he seeks a stranger as heir to his royal throne. Now go and offer yourself to thankless dangers, you, you laughingstock. Go mow the Tuscans down, armor your Latins well with pacts of peace. This message mighty Juno in person ordered me to give you here, asleep in the dead of night. Action. In high spirits alert your men and arm them, move them out through the gates to the field of battle. Burn them to ash, those Phrygian chiefs encamped at ease along our lovely river, and all their painted ships. The great gods on high decree it so. King Latinus, if he won't yield your bride and keep his word, then he must learn his lesson, taste, at last, the force of turn a sword. Laughing, ready with his reply, the prince mocks the prophet, so, a fleet sailed into the Tiber. The tale's not failed, as you imagine, to reach my ears. Stop concocting this panic for me, please. Queen Juno has hardly wiped me from her mind. It's your dotage, mother, you, you doddering wreck too spent to see the truth, that shakes you with anguish all for nothing now. You and your warring kings, your false alarms, you mockery of a prophet. See to your own chores, go tend the shrines and statues of the gods. Men will make war and peace. War's their work. Enough, Electo ignited in rage. The challenge still on his lips, a sudden shuddering seized him, eyes fixed in terror, the fury was looming up with so many serpents hissing, so monstrous her features now revealed. Rolling her eyes, fiery as he faltered, struggling to say more, she hurled the man back and reared twin snakes from her coiling hair and cracked her whips and raved in her rabid words, so, I'm in my dotage, am I? A doddering wreck too spent to see the truth. 
I and my warring kings, a mockery of a prophet, am I? False alarms. Well, look at these alarms. I come to you from the nightmare fury's den, I brandish war and death in my right hand. With that she flung a torch at the prince and drove it home in his chest to smoke with a hellish black glare. A nightmare broke his sleep and the sweat poured from all over his body, drenched him to the bone. He shouts for armor, frenzied, cries for his armor, rifling through his bed and the whole house to find it. He burns with lust for the sword, the cursed madness of war and rage to top it off. He roars like blazing brush piled under the ribs of a billowing bronze cauldron, the water seeds in the heat and a river boils inside it, bubbling up in spume, the bowl can't hold it, it overflows and a thick cloud of steam goes shooting into the air. So, violating the peace, he tells his captains, march on King Latinus, gear up for war. Defend Italy. Hurl the enemy from the borders. Turnus comes, a match for Trojans and Latins both. Commands given, he called the gods to witness. His keen Rutulians spur each other to arms, some moved by his matchless build and youth, some by his royal bloodline, some by his sword arms shining work in war. While Turnus fills his Rutulian troops with headlong daring, Alecto flies to the Trojan camp on Stygian wings, a fresh plot in the air, to scout out the place where handsome Ulysses was hunting along the shore, coursing, netting game. Here the infernal fury throws an instant frenzy into the hounds, she daubs their nostrils wet with a well-known scent, and they burn to chase a stag. This was the first cause of all the pain and struggle, this first kindled the country people's lust for war. There was a stag, a rare beauty, antlers branching, torn from his mother's dugs. And the sons of Tyrus nursed it with father Tyrus, who kept the royal herds, charged with tending the broad, spreading pastures. Their sister, Sylvia, trained the stag to take the command she gave with love, wreathed its horns with tender, fresh-cut garlands, curried the wild creature, bathed it in running springs. Tamed to the touch, it liked to frequent its master's table. Roving the forests, home to the well-known door it came, all on its own, even at dead of night. This fine beast, straying from home, chanced to be floating down a stream, cooling off on a grassy bank when the frenzied hounds of the hunter Eulis started it, Eulis himself, fired with a love of glory, aimed a shaft from his tense bow and Alecto steadied his trembling hand and the arrow shot with a whirring rush and pierced through womb and loins. Back to its well-known home the wounded creature fled, struggled into its stall and groaning, bleeding, filling the long halls with cries of pain, it seemed to plead for help. The sister, Sylvia, she is the first to call for rescue, hands beating her arms, summoning hardy rustics. Unexpectedly in they come, for savage Electo stalks the silent forests, some with torches charred to a point, some with heavy knotted clubs, whatever they find to hand their anger homes to weapons. Tyrus rallies his troops, he's just been splitting an oak in four with wedges, now, breathing fury, he seizes a woodsman's axe. Savage Electo, high on a lookout, spots her chance to wreak some havoc. Winging up to the stable steep roof, she lights on the highest peak and sounds the herdsman's call to arms, a hellish blast from her twisted horn, and straightway all the copses shiver, all the woods resound to their darkest depths. Far in the distance Trivia's lake could hear it, the glistening sulphur stream of the Nar could hear it, so could the springs of Lake Velinus and anxious mothers clutch their babies to their breasts. Then, quick to the call that cursed trumpet gave, the wild herdsmen gather from every quarter, snatching arms in haste. Young Trojans too, their camp gates spread wide, come pouring out to help Ascanius now. The battle lines form up. No rustic free-for-all with clubs and charred stakes, they'll fight to the finish now with two-edged swords. A black harvest of naked steel bristles far and wide, and the bronze struck by the sun gleams bright and hurls its light to the clouds like a billow whitening under the wind's first gust as crest on crest the ocean rises, its breakers rearing higher until it surges up from its depths to hit the skies. Here a youngster breaks from the front, and an arrow whizzes in and down he goes, Almo, the eldest son of Tyrus, the point lodges deep in his throat and chokes off the moist path for his voice and his faint life breath with blood. Around him, heaps of dead, and among them old Galesus killed as he set himself in their midst to beg for peace, the most righteous man in all the Italian fields, long ago, the richest too. Five flocks of cattle he had in tow and five came home from pasture, a hundred plowshares made his topsoil churn. As the battle draws dead even across the plain the Fury's power has lived up to her promise. 
She's fleshed the war in blood, inaugurated the slaughter with a kill and now she leaves Hesperia, wheeling round in the heavens to report success to Juno, the Fury's voice triumphant, look, I've done your bidding, perfected a work of strife with ghastly war. Go tell them to join in friendship, seal their pacts, now I've spattered the Trojans red with Italian blood. I'll add this too, if I can depend on your goodwill, with rumours I will draw the border towns into war, ignite their hearts with a maddening lust for battle. They'll rush to the rescue now from every side, I'll sow their fields with swords. Enough terror, Juno counters, treachery too. The causes of war stand firm. Man to man they fight and the weapons luck first brought are dyed with fresh blood now. Let them sing of such an alliance, such a wedding hymn, the matchless son of Venus and that grand king Latinus. You're roving far too freely, high on the heaven's winds, and the father, king of steep Olympus, won't allow it. You must give way. Whatever struggle is still to come, I'll manage it myself. Quick to Juno's command, she lifts her wings, hissing with snakes, and quitting the airy heights of heaven, seeks her home in hell. Deep in Italy's heart beneath high mountains lies a famous place renowned in many lands, the Valley of Amsanctus. A dark wooded hillside thick with foliage closes around it right and left, with a crashing torrent amidst it roaring over boulders, rapids roiling white. And here they display a cavern, an awesome breathing vent for the savage god of death, and a vast swirling gorge spreads wide its lethal jaws where the Acheron bursts through, and here the fury hid her hateful power, releasing earth and sky. But no let up yet. Saturn's queenly daughter is just now putting the final touches to the war. Out of the field of battle, streaming into town whole troops of herdsmen are bringing home the dead, Almo the young boy, Galesus with his butchered face, and they beg the gods for rescue, pleading with Latinus. But there stands Turnus now, and amid their hot fury and rising cries of murder, he fires up their fears, Trojans are called to share our realm. Phrygian blood will corrupt our own, and I, I'm driven from the doors. And all whose mothers, maddened by Bacchus, dance in frenzy through the trackless woods, a martyr's name has no lightweight, swarm in from all sides, wearying Mars with war cries. Suddenly all are demanding this accursed war, against all omens, against the divine power of fate, they are spurred by a wicked impulse. They rush to ring the palace of King Latinus round, but he stands fast like a rock at sea, a sea-bound rock that won't give way, when a big surge hits and the howling breakers pound it hard, its bulk stands fast though its foaming reefs and spurs roar on, all for nothing, a seaweed dashing against its flank swirls away in the backwash. But finding he lacks the power to quash their blind fanatic will, and the world rolls on at a nod from brutal Juno, time and again he calls the gods and empty winds to witness, crushed by fate, the father cries, we're wrenched away by the tempest. My poor people, you will pay for your outrage with your blood. You, Turnus, the guilt is yours, and a dreadful end awaits you, you will implore the gods with prayers that come too late. Myself, now that I've reached my peaceful haven, here at the harbor's mouth I'm robbed of a happy death. He said no more. He sealed himself in his house and dropped the reins of power. There was a custom in Latium, land of the West, and ever after revered in Alban towns and now great Rome that rules the world reveres it too, when men first rouse the war god into action, whether bent on bringing the griefs of war to the Gatai, the Hyrcanians, or the Arabs or marching on India, out to stalk the dawn and reclaim the standards taken by the Parthians. There are twin gates of war, so they are called, consecrated by awe and the dread of savage Mars, closed fast by a hundred brazen bolts and iron strong forever, nor does Yanus the watchman ever leave the threshold. And here it is, when the father's will is set on all-out war, the consul himself, decked out in Romulus garb, his toga girt up in the ceremonial Gabine way, will unbar the screeching gates and cry for war. The entire army answers his call to arms and brazen trumpets blast their harsh assent. Then too Latinus was pressed to declare war on Aeneas' sons with the same custom, to unbar the deadly gates. But the father of his people refused to touch them, cringed at the horrid duty, locked himself from sight in his shadowed palace. So the queen of the gods, Saturn's daughter swooping down from the heavens, struck the unyielding doors with her own hand, swinging them on their hinges, bursting open the iron gates of war. All Italy blazed, until that instant all unstirred, inert. Now some gear up to cross the plains on foot, some, riding high on their horses, wildly churn the dust and all shout out, to arms. Polishing shields smooth, burnishing lances bright with thick rich grease, honing their axes keen on grindstones. Ah what joy to advance the banners, hear the trumpets blare. 
Five great cities, in fact, plant their anvils, forge new weapons, staunch Atina, Lofty Tibur, Ardea, Crustumerium, and Timni proud with towers. They beat the helmets hollow to guard the head, they weave the wicker tight to rib their shields, others are pounding breastplates out of bronze, hammering lightweight greaves from pliant silver. So it has given way to this, this, all their pride in the scythe and harrow, all their love of the plow. They reforge in the furnace all their father's swords. Now the trumpets blare. The watchwords out for war. One warrior wildly tears a helmet from his house, one yokes his panting, stamping team to a chariot, donning his shield and mail, triple meshed in gold and he straps a trusty sword around his waist. Now throw Helican open, muses, launch your song. What kings were fired for war, what armies at their orders thronged the plains? What heroes sprang into bloom, what weapons blazed, even in those days long ago, in Italy's life-giving land? You are goddesses, you remember it all, and you can tell it all, all we catch is the distant ring of fame. First to march to war is brutal Mazentius, scorner of gods, fresh from the Tuscan coast to deploy his troops for battle. Beside him, his son, Lausus, second in build and beauty to Latian Turnus alone, Lausus, breaker of horses, hunter of wild game. From Agila town he led a thousand men, who could not save his life, a son who deserved more joy in a father's rule, anyone but Mazentius for a father. Following them comes Aventinus, handsome Hercules' handsome son, parading his victor's team across the field, his chariot crowned with the victor's palm, his shield emblazed with his father's sign, the hydra's hundred snakes, the serpents twisting round. Deep in the woods on Aventine Hill the priestess rear bore him all in secret, into the world of light. A woman matched with a god, with Hercules, hero of Tyrans come to the Latin land in glory, fresh from cutting the monster Gerion down, to wash the herds of Spain in the Tiber River. The men bear spears and grim pikes into battle, fight with sword blades ground to a razor edge and Sabellian hurling spears. The man himself came out on foot, swirling a giant lion's hide, its shaggy head hooding his head with its white teeth, a terrible sight as he marched up to the palace, the wild battle dress of his father Hercules wrapped around his shoulders. Next in the march come twin brothers, leaving Tibur's walls and people named for their brother's name, Tibertus, Catillus and Fearless Coras, boys from Argos. Out of the front lines, into the thick and fast of spears they charge as two centaurs born in the clouds come bolting headlong down from a steep summit, speeding down from Homole or from Arthur's snowy slopes, and the tall timber cleaves wide at their onrush, thicket split with a huge resounding crash. Nor was Prenist's founder lacking from the ranks, King Seculus born to Vulcan among the flocks, all ages still believe, and found on a burning hearth. His rustic bands escort him now from near and far, the men who live on Prenist's heights, on the fields of Gabine Juno, men from the Anio's icy stream, the Hernich's dripping rocks, men you nourish, rich Anagnia, bath in your river, Father Amasinus. Not all of them march to war with armor, shields and chariots rumbling on. Mostly slingers spraying pellets of livid lead, some brandish a pair of lances, all heads cowled with tawny wolfskin caps, their left feet planted, making a naked print, their right feet shod with a rugged rawhide boot. Next Mesippus, breaker of horses, Neptune's son, a king whom neither fire nor iron could bring down, he suddenly grasps his fighting sword again, calls back to arms his people long at peace, his rusty contingents long at rest from battle. Men who hold Fersenia's ridge, Equifelissi too, the steep slopes of Seract and all Flavina's fields, the lake of Simonus rimmed with hills, and Capena's groves. They marched in cadence and sang their rulers' praise like snowy swans you'll see in the misting clouds, winging back from their feeding grounds, their song bursting out of their long throats with beat on beat, resounding far from the river banks and Asian marsh that their pulsing chorus pounds. You'd never think such a throng of men in bronze were massing for battle now, but high in the sky a cloud of birds with their raucous song were surging home from open sea to shore. But look, Clausus, born of the age-old Sabine blood, heading a mighty force, a mighty force himself. From Clausus spreads through Latium both the Claudian tribe and clan, once Rome had long been shared with Sabine people. Under his command came huge divisions from Amiternum, the first Kirites, all the ranks from Aretum, Mutusca green with olives, all who live in the Mentum city, the Rosian fields by Lake Valinus, all on Tetrica's shaggy spurs and grimset Mount Severus, all in Casperia, Foyuli, on the Himela river's banks, men who drink the Tiber and Fabaris, men dispatched from Icy Nursia, musters from Orta, the Latin tribes, men that the Alia, ominous name, divides as it flows on. 
Men as many as breakers rolling in from the Libyan Sea when savage Orion sets low in the winter waves or dense as the ears of corn baked by an early sun on Hermus Plain or Lisha's burnished fields. Shields clang and under the trampling feet the earthquakes in fear. Next Agamemnon's man who hated the very name of Troy, Halesus, yoking his team to a chariot, speeds along a thousand die-hard clans in Turnus' cause. Men whose mattocks till the marsic earth for wine, or uncans their father sent from the rising hills and sidis in flats close by, and men just come from Callis, men who make their homes along the Volturnus shoals and beside them rough seticulans, squads of Askans. Their weapons are long, pointed stakes they like to fit with a supple thong for swifter hurling. They have bucklers to shield their left side, sickle swords for combat, cut and thrust. Nor will you, Ebolus, go unsung in our songs. You, they say, the river nymph Sabethis once bore Telen, an old man now, when Telen ruled over Caprii, the Telebian Isle. But the son unlike the father, not content with his forebears' holdings, even now held sway over broader realms, the Serastian clans, their meadows washed by the Sarnus, men from Ruffray, Betulum and Solemnus farms, and soldiers overseen by the high walls of Abella rife with apples, fighters who whirl the barbed lance, Teutonic style, their heads wrapped with the bark they strip from cork trees, bronze shields gleaming, gleaming bronze, their swords. You too, Euphans, Nurses' foothills sent you to war with your glowing fame, your brilliant luck in arms and your Equian clans, most rugged men alive, seasoned to rough hunting in thicket groves on their hard scrabble land. Armed to the hilt they work the earth, their constant joy to haul fresh booty home and live off all they seize. Next, from the Marzian stock a priest came marching in, his helmet crowned with a leafy olive spray, sent by King Archippus, Umbro, no man braver, an old hand, with his touch and spells, at shedding sleep on the viper spawn and lake snakes hissing death, at soothing their anger, healing bites with his magic arts. But he had no cure for the stab of a Trojan lance, none of his drowsy incantations, no drugs culled on the Marzian hills could heal him of his wounds. For you the grove of Angisha wept, for you the crystal swells of Fusinus Lake, for you the clear quiet pools. He rode to war as well, Verbius, striking son of Hippolytus, sent to fight by his mother Arisha, Verbius in his triumph, bred in Egeria's grove that rings the marshy banks where Diana's altar stands, rich with victims fit to win her favor. For they say Hippolytus, once his stepmother's craft had laid him low and he'd paid the price his father set in blood and his horses went berserk and tore the man apart, back he came, under the world of stars and windy sky, reborn by the healer's potent herbs and Diana's love. Then Father Almighty, enraged that any mortal rise from the shades below, returned to the light of life, Jove with his lightning bolt struck down Apollo's son who honed such healing skills, down to the Styx's flood. But kind Diana hides the man away in a secret haunt, sends him off to Egeria, deep in the nymph's grove where, alone in Italian woods and all unsung, Verbius, his new name, he might live out his time. And so it is that horn-hoofed steeds are barred from Diana Trivia's shrine and holy grove since horses, panicked by monsters of the deep, scattered the man and chariot out along the shore. Nevertheless his son was lashing fiery charges down the level fields, his chariot hurtling Verbius into battle. And there the man himself, Turnus, his build magnificent, sword brandished, marches among his captains, topping all by a head. Triple plumed, his high helmet raises up a chimera with all the fires of Etna blasting from its throat and roaring all the more, its searing flames more deadly the more blood flows and the battle grows more fierce. There on the burnished shield, Io, blazoned in gold, her horns raised, her skin already bristly with hair, already changed to a cow, an awesome emblem, as Argus guards the girl and father Inachus pours his stream from a chaste urn. And following Turnus comes a cloud of troops on foot, shield-bearing battalion swarming the whole plain. Men in their prime from Argos, ranks of Oruncans, Rutulians, Sycanian veterans on in years, Sacranians in columns, Libitians bearing their painted shields, men who plow your glades, Old Tiber, the Numicus holy banks, whose plowshare turns the Rutulian slopes and Circe's high-ridged cape. Then men from fields where Jove of Anxa reigns and goddess Veronia takes joy in her fine green grove, and troops from Satyra's black marsh where the frigid Euphant weaves his way through a valley's bottom land and plunges down to sea. Topping off the armies rides Camilla, sprung from the Volscian people, heading her horsemen, squadrons gleaming bronze. This warrior girl, with her young hands untrained for Minerva spools and baskets filled with wool, a virgin seasoned to bear the rough work of battle, swift to outrace the winds with her lightning pace. 
Camilla could skim the tips of the unreaped crops, never bruising the tender ears in her swift rush or wing her way, hovering over the mid-sea swell and never dip her racing feet in the waves. Young men all come pouring from homes and fields and crowding mothers marvel, stare at her as she strides, awestruck, breathless, how the beauty of royal purple cloaks her glossy shoulders. How her golden brooch binds up her hair, how she cradles a Lycian quiver, a shepherd's staff of myrtle spiked with steel. Book 8. The Shield of Aeneas. Soon as Turnus hoisted the banner of war from Laurentum's heights and the piercing trumpets blared, soon as he whipped his horses rearing for action, clashed his spear against his shield, passions rose at once, all Latium stirred in frenzy to swear the oath, and young troops blazed for war. The chiefs in the lead, Messippus, Euphens, Mezentius, scorner of gods, call up forces from all quarters and strip the fields of men who work the soil. They send Venulus out to Great Diam's city to seek reserves and announce that Trojan ranks encamp in Latium. Aeneas arrives with his armada, bringing the conquered household gods of Troy, claiming himself a king demanded now by fate. And the many tribes report to join the Dardan chief and his name rings far and wide through Latian country. But where does the build-up end? What does he long to gain, if luck is on his side, from open warfare? Clearly, Diams would know, better than King Turnus, better than King Latinus. So things went in Latium. Watching it all, the Trojan hero heaved in a churning sea of anguish, his thoughts racing, here, there, probing his options, shifting to this plan, that, as quick as flickering light thrown off by water in bronze bowls reflects the sun or radiant moon, now flittering near and far, now rising to strike a ceiling's gilded fretwork. The dead of night. Over the earth all weary living things, all birds and flocks were fast asleep when Captain Aeneas, his heart racked by the threat of war, lay down on a bank beneath the chilly arc of the sky and at long last indulged his limbs in sleep. Before his eyes the god of the lovely river, old Tiber himself, seemed to rise from among the poplar leaves, gowned in his blue-gray linen fine as mist with a shady crown of reeds to wreathe his hair, and greeted Aeneas to ease him of his anguish, born of the stock of gods, you who bring back Troy to us from enemy hands and save her heights forever. How long we waited for you, here on Laurentine soil and Latian fields. Here your home is assured, yes, assured for your household gods. Don't retreat. Don't fear the threats of war. The swelling rage of the gods has died away. I tell you now, so you won't think me an empty dream, that under an oak along the banks you'll find a great sow stretched on her side with thirty pigs just farrowed, a snow-white mother with snow-white young at her dugs. By this sign, after thirty years have made their rounds Ascanius will establish Alba, bright as the city's name. All that I foresee has been decreed. But how to begin this current struggle here and see it through, victorious all the way? I'll explain in a word or so. Listen closely. On these shores Arcadians sprung from Pallas, King Evander's comrades marching under his banner, picked their site and placed a city on these hills, Palantium, named for their famous forebear, Pallas. They wage a relentless war against the Latin people. Welcome them to your camp as allies, seal your pacts. I myself will lead you between my banks, upstream, making your way against the current under oars, I'll speed you on your journey. Up with you, son of Venus. Now, as the first stars set, offer the proper prayers to Juno, overcome her anger and threats with vows and plead for help. You will pay me with honors once you have won your way. I am the flowing river that you see, sweeping the banks and cutting across the tilled fields rich and green. I am the river Tiber. Clear blue as the heavens, stream most loved by the gods who rule the sky. My great home is here, my fountainhead gives rise to noble cities. With that, the river sank low in his deep pool, heading down to the depths as Aeneas, night and slumber over, gazing toward the sunlight climbing up the sky, rises, duly draws up water in cupped hands and pours forth this prayer to heaven's heights, you nymphs, Laurentine nymphs, you springs of rivers, and you, Father Tiber, you and your holy stream, embrace Aeneas, shield him from dangers, now at last. You who pity our hardships, wherever the ground lies where you come surging forth in all your glory, always with offerings, always with gifts I'll do you honor, you great horned king of the rivers of the west. Just be with me. Prove your will with works. So he prays and choosing a pair of galleys from the fleet, he mans them both with rowers while fitting out his troops with battle gear. 
but look, suddenly, right before his awestruck eyes, a marvel, shining white through the woods with a brood as white, lying stretched out on a grassy bank for all to see, a great sow, devout Aeneas offers her up to you, Queen Juno on high, a blood sacrifice to you, standing her at your altar with her young. And all night long the Tiber lulled his swell, checking his current so his waves would lie serene, silent, still as a clear lagoon or peaceful marsh, soothing its surface smooth, no labor there for oars. So they embark with cheers to speed them on their way and the dark tarred hulls go gliding through the river, amazing the tides, amazing the groves unused to the sight of warriors' shields, flashing far, and blazoned galleys moving on upstream. And on and on they row, wearying night and day as they round the long, winding bends, floating under the mottled shade of many trees and cleave the quiet stream reflecting leafy woods. The fiery sun had climbed to mid-career when, off in the distance, they catch sight of walls, a citadel, scattered roofs of houses, all that now the imperial power of Rome has lifted to the skies, but then what Evander held, his humble kingdom. Quickly they swerve their prows and row for town. As luck would have it, that day Arcadia's king was holding solemn annual rites in honor of Hercules, Amphitryon's powerful son, and paying vows to the gods in a grove before the city. Flanked by his son, Pallas, the ranking men and the lowly senate, all were offering incense now, and warm blood was steaming on the altars. As soon as they saw the tall ships gliding through the shadowed woods and the rowers bending to pull the oars in silence, alarmed by the unexpected sight, all rise as one to desert the sacred feast. But Pallas forbids them to cut short the rites, and fearless, seizes a spear and runs to confront the new arrivals by himself. Soldiers, he shouts from a barrow some way off, what drives you to try these unfamiliar paths? Where are you going? Who are your people? Where's your home? Do you bring peace or war? Then Captain Aeneas calls from his high stern, his hands extending the olive branch of peace, we're Trojans born. The weapons you see are honed for our foes, the Latins. They drive us here, as exiles, with all the arrogance of war. We look for Evander. Tell him this, leading chiefs of Dardania come, pressing to be his friends in arms. Dardania. Pallas, awestruck by the famous name, cries out, come down onto dry land, whoever you are, speak with my father face to face. Come under our roofs, our welcome guest. Clasping Aeneas' right hand, he held it long and heading up to the grove they leave the river. There Aeneas hails Evander with winning words, best of the sons of Greece, fortune has decreed that I pray to you for help, extend this branch of olive wound in wool. I had no fear of you as a captain of the Greeks, Arcadia born and bound by blood to Atreus' twin sons. For I am bound to you by my own strength, by oracles of the gods and by our fathers, bloodkin, and your own fame that echoes through the world. All this binds me to you, and fate drives me here, and glad I am to follow. Dardanus, first and founding father of Ilium, came to the land of Troy. A son, as Greeks will tell, of Electra, that Electra, daughter of Atlas, mighty Atlas who bears the grand orb of the heavens on his shoulders. Your father is Mercury, conceived by radiant Maya and born on a snow-capped peak of Mount Selene. But Maya's father, to trust what we have heard, is Atlas, the same Atlas who lifts the starry skies. So our two lines are branches sprung from the same blood. Counting on this, I planned my approach to you. Not with envoys or artful diplomatic probes, I come in person, put my life on the line, a suppliant at your doors to plead for help. The same people attack us both in savage war, Rutulians under Turnus, and if they drive us out, nothing, they do believe, can stop their forcing all of Italy, all lands of the west beneath their yoke, the masters of every seaboard north and south. Take and return our trust. Brave hearts in war, our tempers steeled, our armies proved in action. Aeneas closed. While he spoke, Evander had marked his eyes, his features, his whole frame, and now he replies, pointedly, bravest of the Trojans, how I welcome you, recognize you, with all my heart. How will I recall the face, the words, the voice of your father, King Anchises? Once, I remember. Priam, son of Laomedon, bound for Salamis, out to visit his sister Hesion's kingdom, continued on to see Arcadia's cold frontiers. Then my cheeks still sported the bloom of youth and I was full of wonder to see the chiefs of Troy, wonder to see Laomedon's son, Priam himself, no doubt, but one walked taller than all the rest, Anchises. I yearned, in a boy's way, to approach the king and take him by the hand. So up I went to him, eagerly showed him round the walls of Phineas. 
At his departure he gave me a splendid quiver bristling Lycian arrows, a battle cape shot through with golden mesh, and a pair of gilded reins my son, Pallas, now makes his. So the right hand you want is clasping yours. We are allies bound as one. Soon as tomorrow's sun returns to light the earth I'll see you off, cheered with an escort and support I'll send your way. But now for the rights, since you have come as friends, our annual rights it would be wrong to interrupt. So, with a warm heart celebrate them with us now. High time you felt at ease with comrades fair. That said, he orders back the food and cups already cleared away, and the king himself conducts his guests to places on the grass. Aeneas, the guest of honor, he invites to a throne of maple, cushioned soft with a shaggy lion's hide. Then picked young men and the altar priest, outdoing themselves, bring on the roasted flesh of bulls and heap the baskets high with the gifts of Ceres, wheat and loaves just baked, and in Bacchus' name they keep the wine cups flowing. And now Aeneas and all his Trojan soldiers feast on the oxen's long back cut and sacred vitals. Once their hunger was put aside, their appetites content, King Evander began, these annual rites, this feast, a custom ages old, this shrine to a great spirit, no hollow superstition, and no blind ignorance of the early gods has forced them on us. No, my Trojan guest, we have been saved from dangers, brutal perils, and so we observe these rites, we renew them year by year, and justly so. Now then, first look up at this crag with its overhanging rocks, the boulders strewn afar. An abandoned mountain lair still stands, where the massive rocks came rumbling down in an avalanche, a ruin. There once was a cavern here, a vast unplumbed recess untouched by the sun's rays, where a hideous, part-human monster made his home, Cacus. The ground was always steaming with fresh blood and nailed to his high and mighty doors, men's faces dangled, sickening, rotting, and bled white. The monster's father was Vulcan, whose smoky flames he vomited from his maw as he hauled his lumbering hulk. But even to us, at last, time brought the answer to our prayers, the help, the arrival of a god. That greatest avenger, Hercules. On he came, triumphant in his slaughter and all the spoils of triple-bodied Gerion. The great victor, driving those huge bulls down to pasture, herds crowding these riverbanks and glens. But Cacus, desperate bandit, wild to leave no crime, no treachery undared, untested, stole from their steadings four champion bulls and as many head of first-rate, well-built heifers. Ah, but to leave no hoof marks pointing forward, into his cave he dragged them by the tail, turning their tracks backward, the pirate hid his plunder deep in his dark rocks. No hunter could spot a trace that led toward that cave. Meanwhile, Hercules was about to move his herds out, full-fed from their grazing, ready to go himself when the cows began to low at parting, filling the woods with protest, bellowing to the hills they had to leave. But one heifer, deep in the vast cavern, lowed back and Cacus prisoner foiled its jailer's hopes. Suddenly Hercules ignited in rage, in black fury and seizing his weapons and weighted knotted club, he made for the hill steep heights at top speed. And that was the first we'd seen of Cacus afraid, his eyes a swirl with terror, off to his cave he flees, swifter than any east wind, yes, his feet were winged with fear. He shut himself in its depths, shattered the chains and down the great rock dropped, suspended by steel and his father's skill, to wedge between the doorposts, block the entrance fast. Watch Hercules on the attack. Scanning every opening, tossing his head, this way, that way, grinding his teeth, blazing in rage, three times he circles the whole Aventine hill, three times he tries to storm the rocky gates, no use, three times he sinks down in the lowlands, power spent. Looming over the cavern's ridge a spur reared up, all jagged flint, its steep sides shearing away, a beetling, towering sight, a favorite haunt of nestling vultures. This crag jutting over the ridge, leaning left of the river down below, he charged from the right and rocked it, prized it up from its bedrock, tore it free of its roots, then abruptly hurled it down and the hurl's force made mighty heaven roar as the bank split far apart and the river's tide went flooding back in terror. But the cave and giant palace of Cacus lay exposed and his shadowy cavern cleaved wide to its depths, as if earth's depths had yawned under some upheaval, bursting open the locks of the underworld's abodes, revealing the livid kingdom loathed by the gods, and from high above you could see the plunging abyss and the ghosts terror-struck as the light comes streaming in. So Cacus, caught in that stunning flood of light, shut off in his hollow rock, howling as never before, Hercules overwhelms him from high above, raining down all weapons he finds at hand, torn off branches, rocks like millstones. A death trap, no way out for the monster now. Cacus retches up from his throat dense fumes, unearthly, I tell you, endless waves billowing through his lair, wiping all from sight, 
and deep into his cave he spews out tides of rolling, smoking darkness, night and fire fused. Undaunted Hercules had enough, furious, headlong down he leapt through the flames where the thickest smoke was massing, black clouds of it seething up and down the enormous cavern. Here, as Kaka spouts his flames in the darkness, all for nothing, Hercules grapples him, knots him fast in a deathlock, throttling him, gouging out the eyes in his head, choking the blood in his gullet dry. He tears out the doors in a flash, opens the pitch-black den and the stolen herds, a crime that Cacus had denied, are laid bare to the skies, and out by the heels he drags the ghastly carcass into the light. No one can get his fill of gazing at those eyes, terrible eyes, that face, the matted, bristling chest of the brute beast, its fiery more burnt out. From then on, we have solemnized this service and all our heirs have kept the day with joy. Petitius I, the founder of the rites, the Pinarian house too, that guards the worship of Hercules. Petitius set this altar in the grove. The greatest altar we shall always call it, always the greatest it will be. So come, my boys, in honor of his heroic exploits crown your hair with leaves, hold high your cups, invoke the god we share with our new allies, offer him wine with all your eager hearts. With that welcome, a wreath of poplar, hung with a poplar garland's green and silver sheen that shaded Hercules once, shaded Evander's hair and crowned his head and the sacred wooden wine cup filled his hand. In no time, all were tipping wine on the board with happy hearts and praying to the gods. Meanwhile evening is coming closer, wheeling down the sky and now the priests advance, petitious in the lead, robed in animal skins the old accustomed way and bearing torches. They refresh the banquet, bringing on the second course, a welcome savour, weighing the altars down with groaning platters. Then the Salii, dancing priests of Mars, come clustering, leaping round the flaming altars, raising the chorus, brows wreathed with poplar, here a troop of boys and a troop of old men there, singing Hercules' praises, all his heroic feats. How he strangled the first monsters, twin serpents sent by his stepmother, Juno, crushed them in his hands. And the same in warfare, how he raised to the roots those brilliant cities, Troy and Achalia both. How under Eurystheus he endured the countless grawling labors, Juno's brutal doom. Hercules, you the unvanquished one. You have slaughtered centaurs born of the clouds, half man, half horse, Hylius and Pholus, the bull, the monster of Crete, the tremendous Nemean lion hold in his rocky den. The Stygian tide pools trembled at your arrival, death's watchdog cringed, sprawling over the heaps of half-devoured bones in his gory cave. But nothing, no spectre on earth has touched your heart with fear, not even Typhaeus himself, towering up with weapons. Nor did Lerner's Hydra, heads swarming around you, strip you of your wits. Hail, true son of Jove, you glory added to all the gods. Come to us, come to your sacred rites and speed us on with your own righteous stride. So they sing his praise, and to crown it sing of Cacus Cave, the monster breathing fire, and all the woods resound with the ringing hymns, and the hillsides echo back. And then, with the holy rites performed in full, they turned back to the city. The king, bent with years, kept his comrades, Aeneas and his son, beside him, moving on as he eased the way with many stories. Aeneas marveled, his keen eyes gazing round, entranced by the sight, gladly asking, learning, one by one, the legendary tales of the men of old. King Evander, founder of Rome's great citadel, begins, these woods the native fauns and the nymphs once held and a breed of mortals sprung from the rugged trunks of oaks. They had no notion of custom, no cultured way of life, knew nothing of yoking oxen, laying away provisions, garnering up their stores. They lived off branches, berries and acorns, hunters rough-cut fare. First came Saturn, down from the heights of heaven, fleeing Jove in arms, Saturn robbed of his kingdom, exiled. He united these wild people scattered over the hilltops, gave them laws and pitched on the name of Latium for the land, since he'd lain hidden within its limits, safe and sound. Saturn's reign was the age of gold, men liked to say, so peacefully, calm and kind, he ruled his subjects. Ah, but little by little a lesser, tarnished age came stealing in, filled with the madness of war, the passion for possessions. Then on they came, the Orsonian ranks in arms, Sicanian tribes and time and again the land of Saturn changed its name. Then kings reared up and the savage giant Thybris, and since his time we Italians call our river Tiber. The true name of the old river Albulus lost and gone. And I, cast from my country, bound for the ocean's ends, irresistible fortune and inescapable fate have planted me in this place, spurred on by my mother's dire warnings, the nymph Carmentes, and god Apollo's power. 
No sooner said than, moving on, he points out the altar of Carmentes, than the Carmental Gate as the Romans call it, an ancient tribute paid to the nymph Carmentes, seer who told the truth, the first to foresee the greatness of Aeneas' sons and Palantium's fame to come. Next he displays the grand grove that heroic Romulus restored as a refuge, the asylum, then shows him, under its chilly rock, the grotto called the Lupercal, in the old Arcadian way, pan of Mount Lycius. And he shows him the grove of hallowed Argelitum too, he swears by the spot, retells the death of Argus, once his guest. From there he leads Aeneas on to Tarpeia's house and the capital, all gold now but once in the old days, thorny, dense with thickets. Even then the awesome dread of the place struck fear in the hearts of rustics, even then they trembled before the woodland and the rock. This grove, he says, this hill with its crown of leaves is a god's home, whatever god he is. My Arcadians think they've seen almighty Jove in person, often brandishing high his black storm shield in his strong right hand as he drives the tempest on. Here, what's more, in these two towns, their walls raised to the roots, you can see the relics, monuments of the men of old. This fortress built by Father Janus, that by Saturn, this was called the Janiculum, that, Saturnia. So, conversing and drawing near Evander's humble home, they saw herds of cattle, everywhere, lowing loud in the Roman Forum and Carini's elegant district. These gates, Evander says, as he reaches his lodge, Hercules in his triumph stooped to enter here. This mansion of mine was grand enough for him. Courage, my friend. Dare to scoff at riches. Make yourself, you too, worthy to be a god. Come into my meager house, and don't be harsh. So he said, and under his narrow sloped roof he led the great Aeneas, laid him down on a bed of fallen leaves and the hide of a Libyan bear. Night comes rushing down, embracing the earth in its deep dark wings. But his mother, Venus, stirred by fear, no wonder, by all the threats and the Latin's violent uproar, goes to Vulcan now and there in their golden bridal chamber whispers, breathing immortal love through every word, when Greek kings were ravishing Troy in war, her fated towers, her ramparts doomed to enemy fires, I asked no help for the victims then, I never begged for the weapons right within your skill and power. No, my dearest husband, I'd never put you to work in a lost cause, much as I owed to Priam's sons, however often I wept for Aeneas' grawling labours. Now, by Jove's command he lands on Rutulian soil, so now I do come, kneeling before the godhead I adore, begging weapons for my Aeneas, a mother for her son. Remember Aurora, Tithonus' wife, and Nereus' daughter? Both wept and you gave way. Look at the armies massing, cities bolting their gates, honing swords against me to cut my loved ones down. No more words. The goddess threw her snow-white arms around him as he held back, caressing him here and there, and suddenly he caught fire, the same old story, the flame he knew by heart went running through him, melting him to the marrow of his bones. As thunder at times will split the sky and a trail of fire goes rippling through the clouds, flashing, blinding light, and his wife sensed it all, delighting in her bewitching ways, she knew her beauty's power. And Father Vulcan, enthralled by Venus, his everlasting love, replied, Why plumb the past for appeals? Where has it gone, goddess, the trust you lodged in me? If only you'd been so passionate for him, then as now, we would have been in our rights to arm the Trojans, even then. Neither Father Almighty nor the fates were dead against Troy's standing any longer or Priam's living on for ten more years. But now, if you are gearing up for war, your mind set, whatever my pains and all my skills can promise, whatever molten electrum and iron can bring to life, whatever the bellows' fiery blasts can do, enough. Don't pray to me now. Never doubt your powers. With those words on his lips, he gave his wife the embraces both desired, then sinking limp on her breast he courted peaceful sleep that stole throughout his body. And then, when the first deep rest had driven sleep away and the chariot of night had wheeled past mid-career, that hour a housewife rises, faced with scratching out a living with loom and Minerva's homespun crafts, and rakes the ashes first to awake the sleeping fires, adding night to her working hours, and sets her women toiling on at the long day's chores by torchlight, and all to keep the bed of her husband chaste and rear her little boys, so early, briskly, in such good time the fire god rises up from his downy bed to labor at his forge. Not far from Aeolian Lip are flanked by Sicily's coast, an island of smoking boulders surges from the sea. Deep below it a vast cavern thunders, hollowed out like vaults under Etna, forming the Cyclops' forges. You can hear the groaning anvils boom with mighty strokes, the hot steel ingots screeching steam in the cavern's troughs and fires panting hard in the furnace, Vulcan's home, it bears the name Vulcania. 
Here the fire god dove from heaven's heights. The cyclops were forging iron now in the huge cave, thunder and lightning and fire anvil stripped bare. They had in hand a bolt they had just hammered out, one of the countless bolts the father rains on earth from the arching sky, part buffed already, part still rough. Three shafts of jagged hail they'd riveted on that weapon, three of bursting storm clouds, three of blood red flame and the south wind winging fast. They welded into the work the blood curdling flashes, crackling thunder, terror and rage in hot pursuit. Others were pressing on, forging a chariot's whirling wheels for master harrow men and panic towns in war. Others were finishing off the dreaded Aegis donned by Pallas Athena blazing up in arms, outdoing themselves with burnished gilded scales, with serpents coiling, writhing around each other, the gorgon herself, the severed head, the rolling eyes, the breastplate forged to guard the goddess' chest. Pack it away, he shouts. Whatever you've started, set it aside, my cyclops of Etna, bend to this. Armor must be forged for a man of courage. Now for strength, you need it. Now for flying hands. Now for mastery, all your skill. Cast a lay to the winds. Enough said. At a stroke they all pitched into the work, dividing the labors, share and share alike, and bronze is running in rivers and flesh tearing steel and gold or melting down in the giant furnace. They are forging one tremendous shield, one against all the Latin spears, welding seven plates, circular rim to rim. And some are working the bellow sucking the air in, blasting it out, while others are plunging hissing bronze in the brimming troughs, the ground of the cavern groaning under the anvil's weight, and the cyclops raising their arms with all their power, arms up, arms down to the drumming, pounding beat as they twist the molten mass in gripping tongs. While Vulcan, the lord of Lemnos, spurs the work below that Aeolian coast, the life-giving light and birdsong under the eaves at crack of dawn awake Evander from sleep in his humble lodge. The old man rises, pulls a tunic over his chest and binds his Etruscan sandals round his feet. Over his right shoulder, down his flank he straps an Arcadian sword, swirling back the skin of a panther to drape his left side. For company, two watchdogs go loping on before him over the high doorsill, friends to their master's steps. He makes his way to the private quarters of his guest, Aeneas, the old veteran bearing in mind their recent talk and the help that he had promised. Just as early, Aeneas is stirring too. One comes with his son, Pallas, the other brings a Achates. They meet and grasp right hands and sitting there in the open court, are free at last to indulge in frank discussion. The old king starts in, greatest chief of the Trojans, for while you are alive I'll never consider Troy and its kingdom conquered, our power to reinforce you in war is slight, though I know our name is great. Here the Tiber cuts us off and there the Rutulians close the vice, the clang of their armor echoes round our walls. But I mean to ally you now with mighty armies, vast encampments filled with royal forces, your way to safety revealed by unexpected luck. It's fate that called you on to reach our shores. Now, not far from here Agila city stands, founded on age-old rock by Lydian people once, brilliant in war, who built on Etruscan hilltops. The city flowered for many years till King Mezentius came to power, his brutal rule, barbaric force of arms. Why recount his unspeakable murders, savage crimes? The tyrant. God store up such pains for his own head and all his sons. Why, he'd even bind together dead bodies and living men, couple them tightly, hand to hand and mouth to mouth, what torture, so in that poison, oozing putrid slime they die by inches, locked in their brute embrace. Then, at last, at the end of their rope, his people revolt against that raving madman, they besiege Mezentius and his palace, hack his henchmen down and fling fire on his roof. In all this slaughter he slips away, taking flight to Rutulian soil, shielded by Turnus' armies, his old friend. So all Etruria rises up in righteous fury, demanding the king, threatening swift attack. Thousands, Aeneas, and I will put you in command. Their fleet is massed on the shore and a low roar grows, men crying for battle standards now, but an aged prophet holds them back, singing out his song of destiny, you elite Lydian troops, fine flower of courage born of an ancient race, oh, what just resentment whips you into battle. Mezentius makes you burn with well-earned rage. But still the gods forbid an Italian commander to lead a race so great, choose leaders from overseas. At that, the Etruscan fighting ranks subsided, checked on the field of battle, struck with or by the warnings of the gods. Tarshan himself has sent me envoys, bearing the crown and scepter, offering me the ensigns, urging, join our camp, take the Etruscan throne. 
ah, but old age, sluggish, cold, played out with the years, has me in its grip, denies me the command. My strength is too far gone for feats of arms. I'd urge my son to accept, but his blood is mixed, half Sabine, thanks to his mother, and so, Italian. You are the one whose age and breed the fates approve, the one the powers call. March out on your mission, bravest chief of the Trojans, now the Italians too. What's more, I will pay you with pallors, my hope, my comfort. Under your lead, let him grow hard to a soldier's life and the rough work of war. Let him get used to watching you in action, admire you as his model from his youth. To him I will give two hundred horsemen now, fighting hearts of oak, our best, and Pallas will give you two hundred more, in Pallas' name. He had barely closed an Anchise's son, Aeneas, and trusty Achates, their eyes fixed on the ground, would long have worried deep in their anxious hearts if Venus had not given a sign from the cloudless sky. A bolt of lightning suddenly splits the heavens, drumming thunder, the world seems to fall in a flash, the blare of Etruscan trumpets blasting through the sky. They look up, the terrific peals come crashing over and over, and see blood red in a brilliant sky, rifting a cloud bank, armor clashing out. All the troops were dumbstruck, all but the Trojan hero, well he knew that sound, his goddess mother's promise, and he calls out, don't ask, my friend, don't ask me, I beg you, what these portents bring. The heavens call for me. My goddess mother promised to send this sign if war were breaking out, and bring me armor down through the air, forged by Vulcan himself to speed me on in battle. But, oh dear gods, what slaughter threatens the poor Laurentine people? What a price in bloodshed, Turnus, you will pay me soon. How many shields and helmets and corpses of the brave you'll churn beneath your tides, old father Tiber. All right then, you Rutulians, beg for war. Break your pacts of peace. Fighting words. Aeneas rises from his high seat and first he rakes the fires asleep on Hercules' altar, then gladly goes to the lowly gods of hearth and home he worshipped just the day before. Evander himself and his new Trojan allies, share and share alike, slaughter yearling sheep as the old rite demands. And next Aeneas returns to his ships and shipmates, picks the best and bravest to take his lead in war while the rest glide on at ease, no oars required as the river's current bears them on downstream to bring Ascanius news of his father and his affairs. Horses go to the Trojans bound for Tuscan fields, and marked for Aeneas, a special mount decked out in a tawny lion's skin that gleams with gilded claws. A sudden rumor flies through the little town, horsemen are rushing toward the Tuscan monarch's gates. Mothers struck with terror pray and re-echo prayers, the fear builds as the deadly peril comes closer, the spectre of war looms larger, ever larger. Evander, seizing the hand of his departing son, clinging, weeping inconsolably, cries out, if only Jove would give me back the years, all gone, and make me the man I was, killing the front ranks just below Prenist's ramparts, heaping up their shields, torching them in my triumph, my right hand sent great King Erylus down to hell. Three lives his mother Feronia gave him at his birth, I shudder to say it now, three suits of armor for action. Three times I had to lay him low but my right hand, my right hand then, stripped him of all his lives and all his armor too. Oh, if only. Then no force could ever tear me now from your dear embrace, my boy, nor could Mazentius ever have trod his neighbor Evander down, but should so many, bereaved our city, so many widows left. But you, you powers above, and you, Jupiter, highest lord of the gods, pity, I implore you, a king of Arcadia, hear a father's prayers. If your commands will keep my palace safe and if the fates intend to preserve my son, and if I live to see him, join him again, why then I pray for life, I can suffer any pain on earth. But if you are threatening some disaster, fortune, let me break this brutal life off now, now while anxieties waver and hopes for the future fade, while you, my beloved boy, my lone delight come lately, I still hold you in my embrace. Oh, let no graver news arrive and pierce my ears. So at their last parting the words came pouring deep from Evander's heart. He collapsed, and his servants bore him quickly into the house. And even now the cavalry had come riding forth through the open gates, Aeneas out in the lead, flanked by trusty Achates, then other Trojan captains, with Pallas in command of the column center, Pallas brilliant in battle cape and glittering in laid armor. Bright as the morning star whom Venus loves above all the burning stars on high, when up from his ocean bath he lifts his holy face to the lofty skies and dissolves away the darkness. Mothers stand on the ramparts, trembling, eyes trailing the cloud of dust and the troops in gleaming bronze. Over the brush, the quickest route, cross-country, armored fighters ride. 
Cries go up, squadrons form, galloping hoofbeats drum the rutted plain with thunder. Next to Kaya's icy river a huge grove stands, held in ancestral or by people far and wide, on all sides cupped around by sheltering hills and ringed by pitch-dark pines. The story goes that ancient Pelasgians, first in time long past to settle the Latian borders, solemnized the grove and a festal day to Sylvanus, god of fields and flocks. Not far from here, Tarshan and his Etruscans mustered, all secure, and now from the hills his entire army could be seen encamped on the spreading plain. Down come Captain Aeneas and all his fighters picked for battle, water their horses well and weary troops take rest. But the goddess Venus, lustrous among the cloud banks, bearing her gifts, approached and when she spotted her son alone, off in a glade's recess by the frigid stream, she hailed him, suddenly there before him, look, just forged to perfection by all my husband's skill, the gifts I promised. There's no need now, my son, to flinch from fighting swaggering Latin ranks or challenging savage Turnus to a duel. With that, Venus reached to embrace her son and set the brilliant armor down before him under a nearby oak. Aeneas takes delight in the goddess gifts and the honor of it all as he runs his eyes across them piece by piece. He cannot get enough of them, filled with wonder, turning them over, now with his hands, now his arms, the terrible crested helmet plumed and shooting fire, the sword blade honed to kill, the breastplate, solid bronze, blood red and immense, like a dark blue cloud inflamed by the sun's rays and gleaming through the heavens. Then the burnished greaves of Electrum, smelted gold, the spear and the shield, the workmanship of the shield, no words can tell its power. There is the story of Italy, Rome in all her triumphs. There the fire god forged them, well aware of the seers and schooled in times to come, all in order the generations born of Ascania stock and all the wars they waged. And Vulcan forged them too, the mother wolf stretched out in the green grotto of Mars, twin boys at her ducks, who hung there, frisky, suckling without a fear as she with her lithe neck bent back, stroking each in turn, licked her wolf pups into shape with a mother's tongue. Not far from there he had forged Rome as well and the Sabine women brutally dragged from the crowded bowl when the circus games were played and abruptly war broke out afresh, the sons of Romulus battling old King Tatius hardened troops from cures. Then when the same chiefs had set aside their strife, they stood in full armor before Jove's holy altar, lifting cups, and slaughtered a sow to bind their pacts. Nearby, two four-horse chariots, driven to left and right, had torn Metis apart, man of Alba, you should have kept your word, and Tulu's hauled the liar's viscera through the brush as blood drops dripped like dew from breaks of thorns. Poor Senna, there, commanding Romans to welcome banished Tarquin back, mounted a massive siege to choke the city, Aeneas heirs rushing headlong against the steel in freedom's name. See poor Senna to the life, his likeness menacing, raging, and why? Cocles dared to rip the bridge down, Cloelia burst her chains and swam the flood. Crowning the shield, guarding the fort atop the Tarpeian rock, Manlia stood before the temple, held the capital's heights. The new thatch bristled thick on Romulus' palace roof and here the silver goose went ruffling through the gold arcades, squawking its warning, Gauls attacked the gates. Gauls swarming the thickets, about to seize the fortress, shielded by shadows, gift of the pitch-dark night. Gold their flowing hair, their war dress gold, striped capes glinting, their milky necks ringed with golden chokers, pairs of alpine pikes in their hands, flashing like fire, and long shields wrap their bodies. Here Vulcan pounded out the Salii, dancing priests of Mars, the Lupersi, stripped, their peaked caps wound with wool, bearing their body shields that dropped from heaven, and chased matrons, riding in pillowed coaches, led the sacred marches through the city. Far apart on the shield, what's more, he forged the homes of hell, the high gates of death and the torments of the doomed, with you, Catiline, dangling from a beetling crag, cringing before the fury's open mouths. And set apart, the virtuous souls, with Cato giving laws. And amidst it all the heaving sea ran far and wide, its likeness forged in gold but the blue deep foamed in a sheen of white and rounding it out in a huge ring swam the dolphins, brilliant in silver, tail sweeping the crests to cut the waves in two. And here in the heart of the shield, the bronze ships, the battle of Axum, you could see it all, the world drawn up for war, Lucata headland seething, the breakers molten gold. On one flank, Caesar Augustus leading Italy into battle, the Senate and people too, the gods of hearth and home and the great gods themselves. High astern he stands, the twin flames shoot forth from his lustrous brows and rising from the peak of his head, his father's star. On the other flank, Agrippa stands tall as he steers his ships in line, impelled by favoring winds and gods and from his forehead glitter the beaks of ships on the naval crown, proud ensign earned in war. 
and opposing them comes Antony leading on the riches of the Orient, troops of every stripe, victor over the nations of the dawn and blood-red shores and in his retinue, Egypt, all the might of the eastern Bactra, the end of the earth, and trailing in his wake, that outrage, that Egyptian wife. All launch in as one, whipping the whole sea to foam with tugging, thrashing oars and cleaving triple beaks as they make a run for open sea. You'd think the cyclades ripped up by the roots, afloat on the swells, or mountains ramming against mountains, so immense the turrets astern as sailors attack them, showering flaming tow and hot bolts of flying steel, and the fresh blood running red on Neptune's fields. And there in the thick of it all the queen is mustering her armada, clacking her native rattles, still not glimpsing the twin vipers hovering at her back, as Anubis barks and the queen's chaos of monster gods train their spears on Neptune, Venus, and great Minerva. And there in the heart of battle Mars rampages on, cast in iron, with grim furies plunging down the sky and strife in triumph rushing in with her slashed robes and Bellona cracking her bloody lash in hot pursuit. And scanning the melee, high on Aksham's heights Apollo bent his bow and terror struck them all, Egypt and India, all the Arabians, all the Sabaeans wheeled in their tracks and fled, and the queen herself, you could see her calling, tempting the winds, her sails spreading and now, now about to let her sheets run free. Here in all this carnage the god of fire forged her pale with imminent death, sped on by the tides and northwest wind. And rising up before her, the Nile immersed in mourning opens every fold of his mighty body, all his rippling robes, inviting into his deep blue lap and secret eddies all his conquered people. But Caesar in triple triumph, borne home through the walls of Rome, was paying eternal vows of thanks to the gods of Italy, three hundred imposing shrines throughout the city. The roads resounded with joy, revelry, clapping hands, with bands of matrons in every temple, altars in each and the ground before them strewn with slaughtered steers. Caesar himself, throned at brilliant Apollo's snow-white gates, reviews the gifts brought on by the nations of the earth and he mounts them high on the lofty temple doors as the vanquished people move in a long slow file, their dress, their arms as motley as their tongues. Here Vulcan had forged the nomad race, the Africans with their trailing robes, here the Leliges, Carians, Gelonian archers bearing quivers, Euphrates flowing now with a humbler tide, the Morini brought from the world's end, the two-horned Rhine and the Dahai never conquered, Arax's river bridling at his bridge. Such vistas the god of fire forged across the shield that Venus gives her son. He fills with wonder, he knows nothing of these events but takes delight in their likeness, lifting onto his shoulders now the fame and fates of all his children's children. Book 9 Enemy at the gates. Now, while off in the distance much was underway, Saturnian Juno hurried Iris down from the sky to Turnus brash in arms, seated then by chance in a hallowed glen, his forebear Palumnus grove. The messenger with her rosy lips bestirred the king, Turnus, what no god would dare to promise you, the answer to your prayers, time in its rounds has brought you all unasked. Yes, Aeneas has quit his camp, his comrades and his fleet, his lighted out for the Palatine Hill, Evander's royal home. But still not satisfied, he's made his way to the farthest towns of Corythus, arming a band of Tuscans, country folk his mustard. Why hold back? Now's the time for horse and chariot. Away with delay. Attack their shattered camp. She towered into the sky on balanced wings, cleaving a giant rainbow, flying beneath the clouds. And Turnus knew her and raised both hands to the stars, calling after the goddess, trailing her flight with cries, Iris, pride of the sky. Who has sped you here to me, swooping down from the clouds to reach the earth? Why this sudden radiance lighting the heavens? I can see the clouds parting, the stars riding the arching skies. I follow a sign so clear, whoever you are who calls me into action. In that spirit he went to the river's edge, drew pure water up from the brimming banks and prayed to the gods, over and over, weighing down the heavens with his vows. And next his entire army was moving out across the plain, rich in cavalry, rich in braided cloaks, bright gold. Mesippus heads the column, the rears brought up by the sons of Tyrus, Turnus commands the center, a force like the Ganges rising, fed by seven quiet streams or the life-giving Nile ebbing back from the plains to settle down at last in its own banks and bed. Suddenly, far off, a massive dust cloud rises black as night, darkness sweeping across the plain. The Trojans spot it, and first from the landward wall Cacus calls out, What's that mass, my countrymen, blackness rolling toward us? Quick, take arms, pass out weapons, mount the walls, the enemies all but on us. Battle stations. With a deafening roar the Trojans all come pouring in through the gates for shelter, mount the ramparts now. 
So ran his parting orders, Enears, best of captains, if any crisis comes while I am away, don't risk a pitched battle, no, don't trust to the open field, just guard the camp and ramparts, safe behind the walls. So, though shame and anger spur them to all-out war, still they bar the gates, they follow their orders, armed to the hilt, protected inside the turrets, bracing for the foe. But Turner's flying on ahead of his slower column, flanked by a picked troop of twenty horsemen, gains the town in no time, borne by a Thracian charger blazed with white, and helmed in his golden casque with crimson crest. Who's with me, men, who's first to attack the enemy? Just watch. He cries and hurls his javelin into the sky, the opening shot of war, and high in his saddle races down the plain as his shouting comrades speed him on, riding in his wake with their war cries striking terror, amazed at the Trojans' bloodless hearts, and calling, no trusting themselves to a level field of battle. No braving our infantry, grappling hand to hand, the cowards cling to camp. Wildly, back and forth, Turnus gallops along the walls, a way in, no way in. As a wolf prowling in wait around some crowded sheepfold, bearing the wind and rain in the dead of night, howls at chinks in the fence, and the lambs keep bleating on, snug beneath their dams. The wolf rages, desperate, how can he maul a quarry out of reach? Exhausted, frenzied with building hunger, starved so long, his jaws parched for blood. So wildly Turnus, scanning the camp and rampart, flares in anger, brute resentment sears him to the bone. What tactic to try, to make a breakthrough, how to shake those penned-up Trojans clear of their walls and strew them down the plain? The armada, there. Hard by the camp it lay tied up, riding at anchor, shielded round by the high redoubts and river currents, here he attacks, shouting out to his cheering comrades, bring up fire. A man on fire, he seizes a blazing pintar torch in his fist and now, watch, his men pitch into the work as Turnus urges them on in person and whole battalions equip themselves with smoking brands. They've plundered the hearth fires, sooty torches ignite a murky glare, and the god of fire hurls at the skies a swirl of sparks and ash. What god, you muses, warded off such savage flames from the Trojans? Who drove from the ship such raging fire? Tell me. Trust in the tale is old, yet its fame will never die. In the early days on Phrygian Ida slopes when Aeneas first built his fleet, gearing up for the high seas, they say the Berecynthian mother of gods herself appealed to powerful Jove with pleading words, grant this prayer, my son, that your loving mother makes to you, since now you rule on Olympus heights. I had a grove on the mountain's crest where men would bring me gifts, a pine wood loved for long, dark with pitch pine, shady with maple timber. These woods I gladly gave the Dardan prince when the prince lacked a fleet, now dread and anguish have me in their grip. Dissolve my fears, let a mother's prayers prevail. May these galleys never be wrecked on any passage out or overpowered by whirling storms at sea, let their birth on our mountains be a blessing. Her son who makes the starry world go round replied, Mother, what are you asking fate to grant? What privilege are you begging for your ships? Think, should keels laid by a mortal hand enjoy an immortal's rights? Should Aeneas go through scathing dangers all unscathed, Aeneas? What god commands such power? Nevertheless, one day, when their tour of duty is done at last and they moor in a western haven, all the ships that survived the waves and bore the Trojan prince to Latium's fields, I will strip them of mortal shape and command them all to be goddesses of the deep like Doto, Nereus' daughter, and Galatea too, breasting high, cleaving the frothing waves. Jove had spoken. Sealing his pledge by the STYX, his brother's stream, by the banks that churn with pitch-black rapids, whirlpools swirling dark, he nodded his assent and his nod made all of Mount Olympus quake. And so the promised day had arrived and the fates filled out the assigned time, when Turnus' rampage warned the mother to drive his brands from her consecrated ships. And first a strange radiance flashed in all eyes and a great cloud appearing out of the dawn came sweeping down the sky, trailed by the goddess dancing troops from Ida. Then an awesome voice descended through the air, surrounding the Trojan and Rutulian ranks alike, no frantic rush to defend my ships, you Trojans, no rising up in arms. Turnus can sooner burn the ocean dry than burn these sacred pines of mine. Run free, my ships, run, you nymphs of the sea. Your mother commands you now. And all at once, each vessel snapping her cables free of the bank, they dive like dolphins, plunging headlong beaks to the bottom's depths, then up they surface, turned into lovely virgins, wondrous omen, each a sea nymph sweeping out to sea. The Rutulians shrank in panic. 
Messapus himself was stunned with terror, his stallions reared, and the river, roaring, checked its currents, Tiber summoned his outflow back from open sea. But dauntless Turnus never loses faith in his daring, he flares up more at his men, inflaming their spirits more, all these omens threaten the Trojans. Jove himself has whisked away their trusted line of defense. No waiting for us, for Rutulian sword and torch to strike their ships. So now the open sea is blocked to the Trojans, no escape, no hope. They are robbed of half the world and the other half, dry land, is in our grasp, so many thousand Italians take up arms. All their fateful oracles, words from the gods these Phrygians bandy about, alarm me not at all. Let it be quite enough for fate and Venus both that Trojans reach the rich green land of Italy, Trojans. I have my own fate too, counter to theirs, to stamp out these accursed people with my sword, they've stolen away my bride. Atreus sons, they are not alone in suffering such a wound, not only Mycenae has a right to go to war. To die once is enough? The crime they committed once should be enough. If only they hated most all womankind so deeply. These Trojans who borrow courage, build their trust on the walls they raise, the ditch they dig between us, what a flimsy buffer to shield them all from slaughter. Haven't they seen Troy's ramparts, built by Neptune's hands, collapse in flames? But you, my elite ones, who is ready to hack their ramparts down with the sword, to join me now and storm their panicked camp. I have no use for all the armor Vulcan forged, nor for a thousand ships to go against these Trojans. Let all the Etruscans join them at once as allies. They need not fear our stealing up on them in the dark like skulking cowards to rob them of their palladium, butcher their sentries posted on the heights. No hiding ourselves away in a horse's blind dark flanks. In naked daylight I am determined now to ring their walls with fire. I'll make certain they never think they are fighting Greek and Pelasgian boys, the recruits that Hector warded off ten years. But now, my comrades, seeing the best part of the day is done, for the rest, refresh yourselves, hearts high. You've done good work. And trust to it now, we're heading for a battle. All the while Messapus is ordered to cordon off the gates with a central line and gird the walls with fire. Fourteen Rutulians are picked to guard the ramparts, each commanding a hundred troops, their helmets crested with purple plumes, their war gear glinting gold. They scatter to posts and man the watch by turns or stretching out on the grass, enjoy their wine, tilting the bronze bowls while the fires burn on and the watchman dice away a sleepless night. Scanning all of this from the walls aloft, the Trojans hold the heights with men-at-arms while edgy, anxious, they reinforce the gates, building bulwarks, joining ramps to the outworks, bringing weapons up. Nestheus, fierce Arrestus are spurring on the work, the men whom Captain Aeneas charged, should crisis call, to marshal troops in ranks and take command of the outpost. The whole army's on guard, tents along the walls. With perilous posts assigned they stand watch by turns, each fighter defending what he must defend. Now Nisus guarded a gate, matchless in battle, Herticus' son, Aeneas' comrade. Ida the huntress sent him, quick as the wind with spears and winging arrows, and right beside him came his friend, Euryalus. None more winning among Aeneas' soldiers, none who strapped on Trojan armor, a young boy sporting the first down of manhood, cheeks unshaved. One love bound them, side by side they'd rush to attack, so now, standing the same watch, they held one gate. Euryalus, Nisus asks, do the gods light this fire in our hearts or does each man's mad desire become his god? For a while now a cravings urged me on to swing into action, some great exploit, no peace and quiet for me. See those Rutulians? What trust they put in their own blind luck? Watch fires flickering far apart. Men sprawling, sunk in their wine and sleep. Dead silence all around. Now listen to what I'm mulling over, what new plan is shaping in my mind. The people, the elders all demand that Aeneas be recalled and men dispatched to tell him how the land lies. If they promise you my reward, the fame of the work's enough for me, I think I can just make out a path, under that hill, to Palantium's city walls. Euryalus froze, his heart pounding with love of praise and he checks his fiery friend at once, so, Nisus, grudging your friend a share in your fine exploit? I'm to send you out alone into so much danger? That's not how father, the old soldier, Arfelts, brought me up in the thick of the Greek terror, the death throes at Troy. Nor has it been my way, soldiering on beside you, following out the fate of great-hearted Aeneas, right to the bitter end. Here is a heart that spurns the light, 
that counts the honor you're after cheap at the price of life. No, Nisus insisted, I had no such qualm about you, how wrong I'd be. Just let great Jove or whatever god looks down with friendly eyes on what we do, carry me back to you in triumph. Ah, but if, and you often see such things in risky straits, if anything sends me down to death, some god, some twist of fate, you must live on, I say, you're young, your life's worth more than mine. Let someone commit my body to the earth, snatched from battle or ransomed back for gold. Or if fortune, up to her old tricks, denies me rights, pay them when I am gone and honor me with a hollow tomb. Nor would I cause your mother so much grief, dear boy. She alone, out of so many Trojan mothers, dared to follow you all the way. She had no love for great assessed city. Euryalus countered, you're spinning empty arguments, they won't work. No, my mind won't change, won't budge an inch. Let's be gone. With that, he stirs the sentries and up they march to take their turn on watch. Leaving his post, he and his comrade, Nisus, stride off to find the prince. Across the earth all other creatures were stretched out in sleep, easing their cares, their spirits blank to hardship. But the leading Trojan chiefs, the chosen men of rank were holding a council now on grave affairs of state, what should they do? Who'll take word to Aeneas? There they stand, out on the open campgrounds, leaning on spears, hands at rest on shields when in rush Nisus and Euryla side by side, clamoring for admittance, being heard at once, we've something urgent, well worth your while. So intense, that Eulus was first to welcome both, inviting Herticus' son to speak, and so he did, men of Aeneas, hear us out with open minds, don't judge what we say by our young years. The enemy sunken deep in sleep and wine, dead to the world. There's a place for mischief, we've seen it ourselves, an open fork in the road, at the gate that fronts the coast. It's dark there, gaps in their watchfires, smoke blackens the sky. Give us this chance to make our way to Aeneas, Palantium too, and you'll soon see us back, loaded with spoils, some bloody killing done. The road won't play us false. Hunting the dark glens, day after day, we've scouted the city's outposts, reconnoitered every bend in the river. Elites, bowed with the years, a seasoned adviser, cried out, gods of our fathers, Troy's eternal shield. So, you're not about to destroy us root and branch, not if you plant such courage, such resolve in our young soldiers' hearts. He grasped them both by the hands and hugged their shoulders, tears rivering down his cheeks, for you, good men, what reward can I find to equal the noble work you're set on? First and best the gods will give, and your own sense of worth. The rest are thankful Aeneas will repay at once, and young Ascanius too. As long as he lives he'll never forget such meritorious service. Never. Ascanius steps in, my life depends on father's safe return. By our great household gods, by Asaracus half-god and white-haired Vesta's shrine, I swear to you both, Nisus, all my hope, my fortune lies in your laps alone. Just call father back, bring him back to my eyes. If he returns, all griefs are gone. Two cups I'll give you, struck in silver, ridged with engraving, father took them both when Arisba fell, and a pair of tripods, two large bars of gold, and a wine bowl full of years, Dido of Sidon's gift. But if, in fact, we capture Italy, seize the scepter in triumph, allot the plunder. You've seen the stallion Turnus rides, the armor he sports, all gold, that mount, the shield, the blood-red plumes, I exempt from the L.O.T. Your trophies, Nisus, now. Also, father will give twelve women, beauties all, and a dozen captive soldiers, each in armor, more, whatever lands their king Latinus claims for himself. But you, Euryalus, you who outstrip me by a year, I admire you, I receive you with all my heart, through thick and thin embrace you as my comrade. Never without you, when I am bent on glory, whether in word or action, peace or war, you have my trust forever. Euryalus replied, no day will show me unequal to such brave work, if only the dice of fortune fall out well, not badly. But topping all your gifts, I beg you, just one more. My mother, of Priam's ancient stock, poor woman. Neither the land of Troy could hold her back, setting sail with me, nor king assessed city. Now I leave her, unaware of the risk I run, whatever it is, with no parting words because, I swear by the night in your right hand, I cannot bear the sight of my mother's tears. But you, I beg you, comfort her in her frailty, brace her in desolation. Let me carry this hope of you and all the bolder I go to face the worst. 
the Trojans were moved to tears, handsome Ulysses the most of all. Touched by love for his own father, this image stirred his heart. Trust me, he said, all I do will be worthy of your great exploit, your mother will be mine in all but the name, Cruiser. No small thanks awaits the one who bore such a son. Whatever comes of your exploit, I swear by my life, the oath my father used to take, all I promise you on your return in glory, the same rewards await your mother and your kin. He weeps as he speaks and draws from his shoulder strap a sword of gold, forged by one lycane of Crete, marvelous work, fitted with ivory sheath and set for action. Nestheus hands Nisus a fine shaggy hide stripped from a lion, and trusty old elites exchanges helmets with him. Now, both armed, they move out at once, and as they go an escort of ranking Trojans, warriors young and old, sees them off at the gates with many prayers. Yet first the handsome Ulysses, beyond his years, filled with a man's courage, a man's concerns as well, gives them many messages to carry to his father. But the winds scatter them all, all useless, fling them into the clouds. Now out they go, crossing the trench and threading through the dark, heading toward the enemy camp, destined to die but make a bloodbath first. Bodies everywhere, they can see them stretched in the grasses, sunk in a drunken stupor, chariot poles tipped up on shore, bodies of fighters trapped in the wheels and harness, weapons and wine cups too are strewn about, and Nysa speaks up first, Euryalus, now for the daring sword hand. Now the moment calls. Here's the way. You keep guard at our back, so no patrol can attack us from the rear, you be on the alert, a hawk's eye all around. I'll make a slaughter, cut you a good clean swarth. Nisus breaks off as he plants his sword in lofty ramness, propped up by chance on a pile of rugs, his chest puffed out, and heaving, dead asleep, a king himself, King Turner's favorite prophet, but no prophecy now could save him from his death. Three aides at his side the Trojan killed, off guard, sprawled in a snarl of arms, then Remus armor-bearer, then his charioteer, he caught him under his horse's hoofs. He hacks their lolling necks and lops the head of their master, leaves the trunk of him spouting blood, the earth and bedding warmed with the wet black gore. He cuts down Lamorous too, Lamus and Serenus, well-built soldier, he'd gained away till late at night and now lay numb in a drunken haze. Lucky man, if only he'd stretched his gambling through the night and played it out till dawn. Nisus, wild as a starved lion raging through crowded pens as the hunger drives him mad, and he mangles sheep, dumb with terror, rips to shreds their tender flesh and roars from bloody jaws. No less bloody Euryalus work, the man's on fire, storming down on the common ruck before him, Fardus, Herbesus, Roetus, Abaris, quite unconscious now. But Roetus, waking, witnessed it all and cowered, crouching behind an enormous mixing bowl, but Euryalus pounced as Roetus rose, he rushed him, drove a sword in his heart, up to the hilt then wrenched it back, dripping death. Roetus vomits his red lifeblood, spewing out gore and wine mixed with the man's last gasp. But still Euryalus glowed with a killer's stealth, he was stalking near a Mesopus henchman now, he could spot the outer campfires flickering low and horses tethered securely, grazing grass, the cavalry, when Nisus, sensing his comrade run amok with bloodlust, cuts him short, call it quits, the dawn's at hand, our old foe. Enough revenge. We've hacked a path through enemy lines, enough and they leave behind a hall of soldiers armor struck in solid silver, mixing bowls in the bargain, gorgeous rugs. But Euryalus tears off Ramnus battle emblems and gold-studded belt, gifts that lavish Cedicus once sent Remulus of Tibur, hoping to seal a pact with a friend then far away, and Remulus, dying, passed them on to his grandson and, once he died, the Latins commandeered them in battle, spoils of war. Euryalus seizes them, fits them onto his gallant shoulders all for nothing. He dons Mesippus' helmet crested with tossing plumes. The raiders quit the camp and race for safety. But just then a troop of cavalry sent on ahead from the Latin city, the rest of the army waits, poised on the plain, comes riding in with messages for King Turnus. Three hundred strong, all men bearing shields with Volsons in command. Just nearing the camp, just coming up to the earthworks when they spot at a distance two men swerving off to the left. The helmet, Euryalus forgot, it glints in the dark, it gives him away, it's caught in a shaft of moonlight. A sight not lost on Volsons, shouting out from the vanguard, soldiers, halt. Why on the road, in armor? Who are you? Where are you headed? No answer given. Off they scurry into the woods and trust to night. But the troopers fan out left and right, blocking the well-known paths, the sentries ringing all ways out. 
the dense wood spread far, the thickets and black ilex bristle, briars crowd the entire place, with a rare track showing a faint trace through the thick blind glades. The dark branches, the heft of the plunder, all way down Euryalus, fear leads him astray in the tangled paths. But Nisus gets away, unthinkingly flees the foe to a place called Alban later, named for Alba then, a spot where Latinus kept his sturdy sheepfolds. Here Nisus halts, looking back for his lost friend, no use, my poor Euryalus. Where did I lose you? Where can I find you now? Nisus already picks his way, wheeling, groping back through the whole deceptive wood, retracing, scouring his tracks through the silent brush, he hears hoofbits, hears a commotion, orders, hot pursuit. The next moment a cry hits his ears, and look, Euryalus. Caught by the full band, undone by the dark, the place, the treachery, sudden crashing attack, he's overwhelmed, they are dragging him off, struggling, desperate, doomed. What can Nisus do? How can he save his young friend, what force, weapons, what bold stroke? Pitch himself at the swords and die at once? Race through wounds to a swift and noble death? Quickly cocking his arm, his lance brandished high, he cranes up at the moon and prays his heart out, you, goddess, Latona's daughter. Stand by me now. Help me now in the thick of danger, glory of stars, guard of the groves. If Father Herticus ever gave you gifts in my name to grace your altars, if I have ever adorned them with hunting trophies, hanging them from your dome, fixing them to your roofs, help me rout my enemies. Wing my spears through the air. With that he hurled his spear, his whole body behind it, whirring on through the dark night, it flies at Solmo and striking his turn back it splits, crack, and a splinter stabs his midriff through. He twists over, vomiting hot blood from his chest, chill with death, his flanks racked with his last gasps. The Rutulians reel, looking about, but now Nisus, all the bolder, watch, cocking another spear beside his ear as the enemy panics, hurls and the shaft goes hissing right through Tagus' brow, splitting it, sticking deep in the man's warm brains. Volsons burns with fury, stymied, where can he find the one who threw it? Where can he aim his rage? No matter, he cries. Now you'll pay me in full with your hot blood for both my men. With that he rushes Euryalus, sword drawn as nice as terrified, frenzied, no more hiding in shadows, no enduring such anguish any longer, he breaks out, me, here I am, I did it. Turn your blades on me, Rutulians. The crime's all mine, he never dared, could never do it. I swear by the skies up there, the stars, they know it all. All he did was love his unlucky friend too well. But while he begged the sword goes plunging clean through Euryalus' ribs, cleaving open his white chest. He rides in death as blood flows over his shapely limbs, his neck droops, sinking over a shoulder, limp as a crimson flower cut off by a passing plough, that droops as it dies or frail as poppies, their necks weary, bending their heads when a sudden shower weighs them down. But Nysa storms the thick of them, out for Volsons, one among all, Volsons his lone concern his enemies massing round him, trying to drive him back, left, right but he keeps charging, harder, swirling his lightning sword till facing Volsons, he sinks his blade in his screaming mouth, Nisus dying just as he stripped his enemy of his life. Then, riddled with wound on wound, he threw himself on his lifeless friend and there in the still of death found peace at last. How fortunate, both at once. If my songs have any power, the day will never dawn that wipes you from the memory of the ages, not while the house of Aenea stands by the capital's rock unshaken, not while the Roman father rules the world. Triumphant, the Rutulians gathered their battle plunder, weeping now as they bore the lifeless body of Volsons back to camp. There they wept no less, finding Ramnus bled white and so many captains killed in one great slaughter. Serenus, Numa too, and a growing crowd cluster around the dead and dying men, and the ground lies warm with the recent massacre, rivulets foam with blood. Together they recognize the trophies of war, Mesopus burnished helmet and many emblems retrieved with so much sweat. By now, early dawn had risen up from the saffron bed of Tithonus, scattering fresh light on the world. Sunlight flooded in and the rays laid bare the earth as Turnus, fully armed himself, calls his men to arms and each commander marshals his own troops for battle, squadrons sheathed in bronze, and wets their fury with mixed accounts of the last night's slaughter. They even impale the heads on brandished pikes, the heads, a grisly sight, and strut behind them, baiting them with outcries. Euryalus and Nisus. 
On the rampart's left wing, the river flanks the right, the hardened troops of Aeneas group in battle order, facing enemy lines and manning the broad trench or stationed up on the towers, wrung with sorrow, men stunned by the sight of men they know too well, their heads stuck on pikestaff's dripping gore. That moment, rumor, flown through the shaken camp, wings the news to the ears of Euryalus' mother. Suddenly warmth drains from her grief-stricken body, the shuttles flung from her hand, the yarn unravels and off she flies, poor thing. Shrilling a woman's cries and tearing her hair, insane, she rushes onto the high walls, seeking the front ranks posted there, without a thought for the fighters, none for the perils, the spears, no, she fills the air with wails of mourning, you, is this you I see, Euryalus? You, the only balm of my old age. How could you leave me all alone, so cruel? When you set out on that deadly mission, couldn't your mother have said some last farewell? What heartbreak, now you lie in an unknown land, fresh game for the dogs and birds of Latium. Nor did your own mother lead her son's cortege or seal your eyes in death or bathe your wounds or shroud you round in the festive robe I wove, speeding the work for you, laboring day and night, lightening with the loom the pains of my old age. Where can I go? What patch of ground now holds your body cut to pieces, your mutilated corpse? This head, it's all you bring me back, my son, it's all that I followed, crossing land and sea. Stab me through, if you have any decency left, whip all your lances into me, you Rutulians, kill me first with steel. Or pity me, you, great father of gods, and whirl this hated body down to hell with a bolt, the only way I know to burst the chains of this, this brutal life. Her wails dashed their spirits, a spasm of sorrow went throbbing through them all. They were broken men, their lust for battle numbed. As she inflames their grief, Ideas and actor, ordered by Ilioneus and Eulus weeping freely, cradle her in their arms and bear her back inside. A terrific brazen blast went blaring out from the trumpets far and wide and war cries echo the horns and the high sky resounds. And now the Volskians charge, ranks of them packing under a tortoiseshell of shields, bent on filling the trenches, tearing down stockades. Some press hard for an entry, scaling the walls with ladders, wherever a gap shows in the thin defensive ring and light breaks through. The opposing Trojans fling down missiles, any and all, thrusting off the assault with rugged pikes, expert from their years of war at defending city ramparts. Great boulders they trundle down on the raiders, huge weights, trying to break their shielded troops but under the tortoiseshell they gladly take their blows. Yet they can't hold out. Wherever Rutulians mass for attack, the Trojans roll up immense rocks and heave them hurtling down, cracking their armoured carapace, crush them, send them reeling and now the bold Rutulians lose all zest for battle under a blind defensive shell, they struggle out in the open, flinging spears to clear the enemy ramparts. Here in another sector, Mazentius, grim sight, is shaking a Tuscan pine beam, hurling fire and smoky pitch at the foe as Mesippus, breaker of horses, Neptune's son, is ripping open a rampart, shouting, ladders, scale the walls. I pray you, Calliope, muses, inspire me as I sing what carnage and death the sword of Turner spread that day, what men each fighter speeded down to darkness. Come, help me unroll the massive scroll of war. Now a tower reared high, a commanding, salient point with rampways climbing up to it. All the Italians fought to storm it, full strength, straining to drag it down, full force while Trojans, jammed inside, fought to defend it, barricade it with stones, hurling salvos of spears through gaping loopholes. Turnus, first to attack, whirled a flaming torch that stuck in the tower's flanks and whipped by the wind it quickly seized on planking, clinging fast to the doorway's posts it ate away. Inside, panic, chaos, soldiers fighting to find some way out of the flames, no hope. Men went cramming back to the safe side, back from the killing heat but under the sudden lurch of weight the tower came toppling down, making the whole wide heaven thunder back its crash. Fighters writhe in death, crushed on the ground, the enormous wreckage right on top of them, yes, impaling them on their own weapons, stabbing splintered timbers through their chests. Only Helena and Lyca slipped to safety, just, Helena still in the flush of youth. A slave, Lysimnia, bore him once to Meonia's king in secret, sent him to Troy, light-armed in forbidden gear, a naked sword and a shield still blank, unblazoned. Now he found himself in the thick of Turnus thousands, Latin battalions crowding, pressing at all points, as a wild beast snared in a closing ring of hunters, raging against their weapons flings itself at death, staring doom in the face, leaping straight at the spears, just so wild the young soldier leaps at the enemy center, rushing at death where he sees the spearhead's densest. 
but Lycus, far faster, escapes through enemy lines and spears to reach the wall, clawing up to the coping, trying to grasp his comrade's hand when Turnus, chasing him down with a lance, shouts out in triumph, Fool, you hope to escape my clutches? Seizing him as he dangles, tearing the man down along with a hefty piece of wall. As the eagle that bears Jove's lightning snatches up in his hooking talons a hare or snow white swan and towers into the sky, or the wolf of Mars that rips a lamb from the pens and its mother desperate to find it fills the air with bleating. War cries rising, everywhere, on and on they charge, packing the trench with earth, some men hurling fiery torches onto the rooftops. Ilioneus heaving a rock, a huge crag of a rock, brings down Lucetius just assaulting the gates with a flaming torch in hand as Liger kills Amathian, Asilas lays out Corineus, one adept with javelin, one with arrows blindsiding in from a distance, Senius kills Ortigius, Turnus, triumphant Senius, Turnus cuts down Itis, Clonius, Dioxippus and Promulus, Sagaris, Idas, posted out in front of the steepest towers, and Capis kills Privenus. The miller's spear grazed him first, he dropped his shield, the idiot, raised his hand to the gash as the arrow flew and digging deep in his left side, deeper, burst the ducts of his life breath with a deadly wound. There stood Arson's son, decked out in brilliant gear and a war shirt stitched blood red with Spanish dye, a fine, striking boy. His father reared him once in the grove of Mars where Semethus waters swirl and a shrine to the gods of Sicily stands, the Palachi, quick to forgive, their altar rich with gifts, and he sent his son to war. Mazentius hissing sling, keeping it strapped taut and dropping his spears, three times he whipped it around his head, let fly and the lead shot, sizzling hot in flight, split his enemy's skull and splayed him out head first on a bank of sand. Then, they say, Ascanius shot for the first time in war the flying arrow he'd saved till now for wild game, rooting, terrorizing them, now his bow hand cut down strong Eumanus, Remulus by family name, just lately bound in marriage to Turnus' younger sister. New Manus, out of the front lines he swaggered, chest puffed up with his newfound royal rank and he let loose an indiscriminate string of ugly insults, flaunting his own power to high heaven, what, have you no shame? You Phrygians twice enslaved, penned up twice over inside blockaded ramparts, skulking away from death behind your walls. Look at the heroes who'd seize our brides in battle. What god drove you to Italy? What insanity? No sons of Atreus here, no spinner of tales, Ulysses. We're rugged stock, from the start we take our young ones down to the river, toughen them in the bitter icy streams. Our boys, they are up all night, hunting, scouring the woods, their sport is breaking horses, whipping shafts from boughs. Our young men, calloused by labor, used to iron rations, tame the earth with mattocks or shatter towns with war. All our lives are home to the hard edge of steel, reversing our spears we spur our oxen's flanks. No lame old age can cripple our high spirits, sap our vigor, no, we tamp our helmets down on our grey heads, and our great joy is always to haul fresh booty home and live off all we seize. But you, with your saffron braided dress, your flashy purple, you live for lazing, lost in your dancing, your delight, blousy sleeves on your war shirts, ribbons on bonnets. Phrygian women, that's what you are, not Phrygian men. Go traipsing over the ridge of Dindima, catch the songs on the double pipe you dote on so. The tambourines, they are calling for you now, and the boxwood flutes of your Berecynthian mother perched on Ida. Leave the fighting to men. Lay down your swords. Flinging his slander, ranting taunts, Ascanius had enough. Facing him down and aiming a shaft from his bowstring, horsegut, tense, he stood there, stretching both arms wide, praying first to Jove with a fervent heartfelt vow, Jove Almighty, not assent to the daring work I have in hand. All on my own I'll bring your temple yearly gifts. I'll steady before your altar a bull with gilded brows, bright white with its head held high as its mother's, butting its horns already, young hoofs kicking sand. And the father heard and thundered on the left from a cloudless sky, the instant the lethal bow sings out and the taut shaft flies through Remulus' head with a vicious hiss and rends his empty temples with its steel. Go on, now mock our courage with high and mighty talk. Here's the reply the Phrygians, twice enslaved, return to you Rutulians. That's all he says. The Trojans echo back with a roar of joy, their spirits sky high. By chance Apollo, god of the flowing hair enthroned on a cloud in the broad sweeping sky, was glancing down at Orsonia's troops and camp and calls to Ulysses flushed with triumph now, bravo, my boy, bravo, your newborn courage. That's the path to the stars, son of the gods, you'll father gods to come. 
All fated wars to come will end in peace, justly, under Asaracus' future sons, Troy can never hold you. In the same breath the god Apollo dives from the vaulting skies and cleaving the gusty wind searches for Ascanius. He assumes the form and features of old Butes, armor-bearer, once, to Dardan Anchises, trusty guard of his gates until Aeneas made him Ascanius' aid. So Apollo approached like Butes head to foot, the man's age, his voice, the shade of his skin, white hair, weapons clanging grimly, and counsels Ulysses now in his full glow of triumph, son of Aeneas, stop. Enough that new Manus fell to your flying shafts and you've not paid a price. Apollo has granted this, your first flush of glory, he never envied your arrows, a match for the archer's own. For the battles to come, hold back for now, dear boy. This order still on his lips, Apollo vanished from sight into empty air. But the Trojan captains recognized the god, his immortal arms, and heard his arrows rustling in his quiver as he flew. So they restrain Ascanius blazing for battle, pressing on him Apollo's will and last commands but they themselves go rushing back to fight and expose their lives to peril. Cries rock the ramparts, up and down the walls, they are tensing murderous bows, whipping spear straps, weapons strewing the ground, shields and hollow helmets ringing out under impact, fighting surges, raging strong as a tempest out of the west when the kids are rising great with rain that lashes the earth, and thick and fast as the hail that storm clouds shower, pelting headlong down on the waves when Jupiter fierce with south wind spins a whirlwind, thunderheads exploding down the sky. Pandarus and Bishas, Alcanor of Ida's offspring born by the nymph Iera once in Jupiter's grove, men like pines and peaks of their native land, who trusted so to their swords they fling wide the gate their captain entrusted to them, all on their own inviting enemy ranks to breach the walls. There they loom in the gateway, left and right like towers, armoured in iron, crests on their high heads flaring, tall as a pair of oaks along a stream in spate, by the pose banks or the adage lovely waters, rearing their uncropped heads to the high sky, their twin crowns waving tall. But in they charge, the Rutulian forces seeing the way wide open now. In an instant quersons, Aquicula striking in armour, Tmaris, daredevil heart, and Heman, son of Mars, with all their squadrons routed, turn tail and run or throw their lives down right at the gateway's mouth. And the more they fight, the hotter their battle fury grows and now the Trojans mass, regrouping to storm the site, clashing man to man, daring to foray farther out. Turnus, the great captain, is blazing on in another zone, stampeding the Trojan ranks when the news arrives, the enemy flushed with the latest carnage offers up their gates flung open now. And Turnus wheels, dropping the task at hand and full of fury, speeds to the Trojan gate to face the headstrong brothers. But first Antiphates, he was the first to charge, Sarpedon's bastard son by a mother born in Thebes, but Turnus cuts him down, his Italian cornel spears half wings through the melting air and piercing the man's stomach thrusts up into his chest, and froth from the wound's black pit comes bubbling up as the steel heats in the lung it struck. Then Merops and Eremus die at his hands, then Aphidnus, even Bishas, eyes ablaze, all rage at heart, and not by a spear, he'd never give up his life to a spear, a massive pike with a giant blade comes hurtling, roaring into him, driven home like a lightning bolt and neither the two bull's hides of his shield nor trusty breastplate, double-mailed with its scales of gold, can block its force. His immense limbs collapse, and earth groans as his giant shield thunders down on his body. Huge as a mason pier that falls at times on the shore of Ubi and Bai, first they build it of massive blocks, then send it crashing over, dragging all in its wake and it crushes down on the ocean floor as the waves roil and black sand goes heaving into the air and Prokata Island quakes to its depths and the craggy bed of Inarim waiting Typhius down by Jove's command. Here, Mars, power of war, injects new heart and force in the Latins, twisting his sharp spurs in their chests and loosing flight and dark fear at the Trojan ranks, and the Latins swarm in from all directions, seize the moment for all-out assault as the war god strikes their spirits. Pandarus, seeing his brother's body spread on the ground and sensing how fortune falls, disaster rules the day, with all his might he rams his massive shoulder into the gate and wheels it shut on its hinges, shuts out many comrades now outside the ramparts, facing an uphill battle, and shuts in many others, ushering fighters home as in they rush, along with himself, the crazy fool, not to have spotted Turnus charging in with the crowds and all unwittingly shut him up inside the walls like a claw. Mad tiger among some helpless flock. Suddenly strange light flares from Turnus' eyes and his armor clangs, horrific, the blood-red plumes shake on his head and his shield shoots bolts of lightning. They know him at once, his hated face, his immense frame, and Aeneas' troops are stunned. 
but enormous Pandarus breaks ranks, afire with rage at his brother's death, and shouts, No palace here, your dowry from Amata. Look, no fortress Ardea hugging her native Turnus. What you see is your enemy's camp, you can't escape. And Turnus replied with a cool, collected smile, On with it now, if you have the backbone in you, let's trade blows. You'll tell the ghost of Priam you found an Achilles, even here. No more talk. Putting all his strength behind it, Pandarus hurls his spear, unpolished, knotted, bark still rough but the breezes whisk it away, Saturnian Juno flicks aside the approaching wound and the weapon stabs the gate. But you won't escape my blade, whirling in my right hand, cries Turnus. No, this sword and the man who wields it, the wounds they deal are fatal. Rearing to full height, sword high, the steel hacks the brows, splitting the temples, gruesome wound, and it cleaves the soft unshaven cheeks. A great crash. Under his huge weight the earth quakes, his limbs fall limp, his armor splattered with brains, he sprawls on the ground in death, in perfect halves over both his shoulders, right and left, his head goes lolling free. The Trojans swerve and scatter in panic and if the conquering hero had thought at once of smashing the gate bolts, letting his cohorts in, this day would have been the last day of the war, the last of the Trojans too. But Turnus' hot fury, his mad lust for carnage drives him against his foes. First he seizes Phalaris, cuts the knees from under Gyges, snatching their spears he whips them into the backs of men who break and run as Juno builds his courage, his war lust. Harley's next, he sends him packing along with comrades, Phegeus too, as a spear impales him through his shield, then men on the ramparts keen for combat, blind to Turnus who picks them off, Alcander and Halius, Pritonis and Noman. Lincea swings to attack, shouting his comrades on, but first from the right-hand rampart Turner spins with one stroke of his dazzling sword, close up, that brings down Lincius, slashes his head off, head and helmet tumbling far away. Next he brings down Amicus, gifted killer of wild game, no hand more skilled at dipping an arrow's point or capping a lance with poison, then Clitius, Aela's son, then Cretheus, friend of the Muses, the Muses' comrade, Cretheus, always dear to his heart the song and lyre, tuning a verse to the taut string, always singing of cavalry, weapons, wars and the men who fight them. At last the Trojan captains hear of the massacre of their troops. Nestheus, fierce Serestus, both come rushing in and seeing their ranks in panic, ranks of enemies lodged inside the gates, Nestheus shouts out, where are you heading? Where are you flying now, what other walls, what other ramparts have you got? My countrymen, can one man, penned up in your fortress on all sides, spread such slaughter through the city? Send such a rout of first-rate fighters down to death and never pay the price? You feckless, craven, have you no pity? No shame for your wretched land, your gods of old. For great Aeneas? That ignites them, stiffens their spines and closing ranks they halt as Turnus pulls back from the melee, heading step by step for the banks where the river rings the camp. All the more fiercely Trojans swarm him, war cries breaking, ranks packed tight as a band of huntsmen bristling spears, attacking a savage lion. Terrified, true, but glaring still, ferocious still as he backs away, but his heart, his fury keep him from turning tail, yet for all his wild desire he still can't claw his way through spears and huntsmen. Just so torn, so slowly but surely Turnus backs away, his spirit churning with anger. Twice he charged the thick of his foes, twice he broke their lines, stampeding the Trojans down their walls at speed. But a whole battalion marching out of the camp comes massing hard against him, not even Juno dares reinforce his power to counterattack. No, Jove sped Iris down from the high heavens, winging strict commands for his sister, Juno, if Turnus did not quit the Trojans' looming walls. So now no shield, no sword arm helps the fighter stand up under the onslaught, overpowering salvos battering down on him left and right. Over and over the helmet casing his hollow temples rings out shrill, the solid bronze of it splits wide open under the rocks, the plumes are ripped from his head, the boss of his shield caves into the hammering blows. And the Trojan ranks, with lightning bolt Mnestheus out in the lead, unleash an immense barrage of spears, and sweat goes rippling over Turnus' entire body, rivering down, black with filth, can't catch his breath, gasping, weak knees quaking, bone-tired until at last he dives head first, plunging into the river, armor and all, and Tiber swept him into its yellow tide, catching him as he came, then bore him up in its soothing waves and bathing away the carnage, gave the elated fighter back to. Friends. Book 10. Captains fight and die. Now the gates of mighty Olympus' house are flung wide open. 
the father of gods and king of men convenes a council high in his starry home, as throned aloft he gazes down on the earth, the Trojan camp and Latian ranks. The gods take seats in the mansion, entering there through doors to east and west, and Jove starts in, you great gods of the sky, why have you turned against your own resolve? Why do you battle so? Such warring hearts. I ordered Italy not to fight with Troy. What's this conflict flouting my command? What terror has driven one or the other side to rush to arms and rouse their enemy swords? The right time for war will come, don't rush it now, one day when savage Carthage will loose enormous ruin down on the Roman strongholds, breach and unleash the Alps against her walls. Then is the time to clash in hatred, then to ravage each other. Be at peace for now. Spirits high, consent to the pact I have decreed. Jove is just that brief, but golden Venus is far from brief as she replies, O father, everlasting king over men and all the world, what other force could we implore to save us now? You see the Rutulians on the rampage? Turnus amidst them, proud in his chariot, puffed up with his new success, spurring the warlust on. Their thick armoured walls no longer can shield the Trojans. Now they are even fighting inside their gates, its combat cut and thrust, right on their own ramparts, trenches bathed in blood. And Aeneas knows nothing, the man is miles away. When will you ever let them lift the siege? Once more a new force, a new army threatens the walls of newborn Troy. Once more he springs from Arpi, that Aetolian, Diomedes. So once again, I see, some wounds are in store for me, your daughter, and I must block the mortals hurling spears. If without your assent, against your will the Trojans have reached Italy, let them pay for their latest outrage, never grant them rescue. But if they have followed the oracles laid down by the gods on high and the great shades below, how can anyone overturn your edicts now and plant the fates anew? Why recall it all, the armada burned to ash on the shores of Eryx? The storm king lashing gales from Aeolia into fury? Iris swooping down from the clouds? Now she even stirs the dead, the one realm in the world still left untested, yes, an electo, suddenly loosed on earth, tears like a mina through the heart of Italian cities. Empire stirs me no longer now. That was our hope while fortune still smiled. Now let those win out, the ones you want to win. If there is no patch of earth that your ruthless queen could grant the Trojans now, I beg you, father, by the smoking wreck of Troy, let Ascanius have safe passage out of battle, spare my grandson's life. As for Aeneas, let the man be tossed on strange new seas, follow the course where fortune leads the way. Just give me the strength to shield my grandson, bear him quite unscathed from the raw clash of arms. Why, I have Amethus, Paphos Heights, and Cythera too, an Idalian mansion, there with his weapons laid away, let him live his life out, all unsung. And so, give the command for Carthage to crush Italy, overwhelm her with force. From Italy comes no barrier posed against the towns of Tyre. What good has it been to flee the plague of war, to slip through the thick of fires set by the Greeks? Drain to the lees the perils at sea and the whole wide earth while the Trojans hunt for Latium, hunt for Troy reborn. Better, no, to settle down on their country's dying ashes, the ground where Troy once stood. I beg you, father, give them back their Xanthus and their Simois if these luckless Trojans must, once more, relive the fall of Troy. At that, Queen Juno looses her fury, bursting out, why drive me to break my deep silence, to open up my wounds, long scarred over, and brute them to the world? How could anyone, man or god, force your Aeneas to pitch on war, to harry King Latinus as his foe? So, he sought out Italy under the fate's command? The fates? Cassandra's raving spurred him on. Did I press him to leave his camp or cast his life to the winds? To trust his walls, the whole command of the battle to a boy? To disrupt the Tuscan's faith, inflame a peaceful people? What god, what ruthless power of mine drove him to ruin? Where's Juno in this? Or Iris sped from the clouds? So, it's wrong for Italians to ring your newborn Troy with fire? For Turnus to plant his feet on his own native soil? His forebear is Pelumnus, his mother a goddess, Vanilia. What of the Trojans putting the Latins to the torch? Yoking the fields of others, hauling off the plunder? Taking their pick of daughters, tearing the sworn bride from her husband's arms? Their hands pleading for peace while they arm their sterns with spears. Oh, you can whisk Aeneas clear of the clutches of the Greeks, in place of a man puff up some vapid fume of air. 
You can change an armada into sea nymphs, yes, but if we in our turn offer the Latin side a helping hand, is that such a horrid crime? Aeneas knows nothing, the man is miles away? Unknowing let him stay there. Why, you have Paphos, Idolia, steep Cythera too, why tamper with brute Italians, a city rife with war? Is it I who try to overwhelm from the roots up your sinking Phrygian state? Not I. Wasn't it he who exposed your wretched Trojans to the Greeks? What inspired Europe and Asia to surge up in arms, underhandedly break the bonds of friendship? Was it I who lured the Trojan adulterer onto lay Sparta low? Or I who equipped the man with weapons, fanned the flames of war with lust? You should have feared for your chosen people then. It's too late now for rising up with your groundless accusations, flinging empty slander in my face. While Juno harangued the gods with her appeals, all were murmuring low, assenting, dissenting. Low as the first stir of storm wind caught in the trees when the rustling unseen murmur keeps on rolling, warning sailors that gales are coming on. Then the Almighty Father, power that rules the world, begins, and as he speaks the lofty house of the gods fall silent, earth rocks to its roots, the heights of the sky are hushed and the western breezes drop and the ocean calms its waters into peace, so then, take what I say to heart and stamp it in your minds. Since it is not allowed that Latins and Trojans join in pacts of peace, and there is no end to your eternal clashes, now, whatever the luck of each man today, and whatever hope he follows, Trojan or Italian, I make no choice between them. Whether Italy's happy fate lay siege to the camp or the Trojans' folly, the deadly prophesies they follow. Nor do I exempt the Italians. How each man weaves his web will bring him to glory or to grief. King Jupiter is the king to all alike. The fates will find the way. And now, sealing his pledge by the river Styx, his brother's stream, by the banks that churn with pitch black rapids, whirlpools swirling dark, he nodded his assent and his nod made all of Mount Olympus quake. The great debate had closed. Jupiter rises up from his golden throne as the gods of heaven flock around him there and escort him to the gateway of his mansion. All day the Rutulians encircle every entry, battling on to bring their enemies down in blood and ring their walls with fire. But Aeneas' force is locked fast in its own ramparts now, no hope of a breakout. Shattered, helpless, posted high on the turrets, girding walls with a thin defensive ring are Aetius, son of Embracus, Thymoetes, Hystaean son, the Asarachi twins and Castor with aged Thimbris up in front, behind them, both Sarpedon's brothers, Clarus and Themon, new allies from Lycia's highlands. One man puts his weight into heaving up a boulder, no mean piece of a crag, Achman born in Lernesus, strong as his father Clitius, his brother Menestheus. All of them struggle there to defend their walls, some with javelins, some with rocks or flinging blazing torches, narking arrows to bowstrings. There amidst them, look, the Dardan boy himself, Venus' favorite, rightly, handsome head laid bare, he shines like a brilliant gemstone set in tawny gold, adorning a head or neck, or a glow as ivory deftly inlaid in box or black Arician terebinth wood and over his milk-white neck his long locks fall, clasped tight by a talk of hammered gold. Ismarus, you too, your fine hardy fighters watched you dipping your arrowheads in poison, winging wounds at the enemy. You, the noble son of a proud Meonian house, where the farmhands work the loamy soil and Pactolus floods the fields with gold. And there was Mnestheus too, his glory riding high with yesterday's triumph, driving Turnus off the walls, and Capis too, whose name comes down to us in Capua, the famed Campanian town. And so both sides had clashed in the cruel thick and fast of war while Aeneas plowed the sea in the dead of night. Once he left Evander and entered the Tuscan camp, he seeks King Tarshan, tells him his name and stock and the help he needs and the help he brings himself. He tells him Mazentius musters fighters to his side, tells him the heart of Turnus flares for battle, warns him of what to trust in men's affairs, concluding all with his own strong appeals. Then no delay, Tarshan joins forces at once and seals a pact. And so, free of fate's demand, since they are sworn to a foreign leader now, under the will of God the Etruscans set sail. Aeneas ships in the lead, with Phrygian lions fixed on her beak, Mount Ida looming aloft, a god-sent sign of home to Trojan exiles. There sits great Aeneas, musing over the shifting tides of war as Pallas flanks him closely on his left, asking now of the stars that guide them through the night and now of the hardships he had braved on land and sea. Now throw Helican open, muses, launch your song. What forces sail with Aeneas fresh from the Tuscan shores, manning their ships for battle, sweeping through the waves? Massacus first. 
he plows the sea in the bronze-sided tiger. Under him sail battalions, a thousand men who put astern the walls of Clusium, Kosi too, their weapons, arrows, shouldering lightweight quivers, bows bristling death. Fiercer bars joins him, all his fighters shining in arms with a brilliant gilded Apollo stationed at the stern. Six hundred men his motherland Populonia gave him, soldiers drilled for war, three hundred more from Ilva, the blacksmith's inexhaustible island rife with iron ore. Asilus III, the famous seer who bridges the worlds of gods and men, a reader of animals' entrails, stars that sweep the sky and the cries of birds and the lightning charge with fate. A thousand men he rushes aboard, tight rank spiked with spears. Pisa placed them at his command, a Greek city born by the river Alpheus, bred by Tuscan soil. And following in his wake sails irresistible a stir, a stir who trusts to his horse and armor rainbow hued. And swelling his ranks, three hundred, all as one alert to obey his orders, men whose home is Carre, men from Minio's fields, from ancient Pergi and Feveract Graviski. Nor could I pass you by, Cunaris, stanchest in war of all Ligurius chiefs, or you with your modest band of men, Cupavo. Topping your crest the swan plumes toss, a fabulous mark of your father's altered form, and all for offending you, love, you and Venus. They tell how sickness, wrung by grief for his lover, lifting a song to soothe his broken heart for Feethan, shadowed by leafy poplars, Feethan's sisters once, sickness donned the downy white plumage of old age, left the earth behind and soared up to the stars on wings of song. And now his son, Cupavo, flanked by fighters his own age on deck, drives along under oars the giant centaur, the monster high on the figurehead makes threats to heave from aloft a massive boulder down on the waves while the long keel cuts its furrow through the deep. Ocnus too, heading an army come from native coasts, a son of Manto the seer and the Tuscan river Tiber. He gave you, Mantua, walls and his mother's name, Mantua, rich in the rosters of her forebears. Not all of a single tribe but three in one, four clans under each, and Mantua leads them all and the city draws her force from Tuscan blood. Mantua, source of the five hundred men Mazentius goaded on to fight against himself, men the Mincius, son of father Benicus gowned in grey-green reeds, steers down to the sea in warships built of pine. Orlestes bears down too, surging on with the beat of a hundred oaken oars that thrash the swells, churning the sea's clean surface into spume. He sails the massive Triton, her sea horn making the blue deep quake, and as she runs on her prow displays a shaggy man to the waist, all dragon to the tail and under the monster's breast, part man, part beast, the foaming swells resound. So many chosen captains heading thirty warships, speeding to rescue Troy, cleft the fields of salt with beaks of bronze. By now the day had slipped from the sky and the gentle moon was riding high through the heavens at mid-career, her horses pounding through the night. As pressures gave no rest to his limbs, Aeneas sat astern, guiding the tiller, trimming sail, when suddenly, look, a troop of his comrades comes to meet him, halfway home, the nymphs that kindly Sybeep told to rule the sea in power, changing the ships to sea nymphs swimming abreast, cutting the waves, as many as all the bronze prows berthed at anchor once. They know their king far off, circling, dancing round him and one, most eloquent of them all, Cymodocia swims in on his wake and grips his stern with her right hand, arching her back above the swells as her left hand rows the silent waves, and she calls out to Aeneas, lost to it all, awake, Aeneas, son of the gods. Wake up. Fling your sheets to the winds, sail free. Here we are, the pines from the sacred ridge of Ida, now we're nymphs of the sea, we are your fleet. When traitorous Turnus forced us headlong on with sword and torch, we burst your mooring lines, we had no choice, and now we scour the seas to find our captain. The great mother pitied us, changed our shape, she made us goddesses, yes, and so we pass our lives beneath the waves. But not your son, Ascanius, trapped now by the wall and trench, in the thick of the spears, the Latins spiked for war. Already Arcadian horsemen flanked by strong Etruscans hold assigned positions. But Turnus is dead against their joining up with the Trojan camp. He's setting his own squadrons between their closing forces now. Up with you. Call your men to arms with the dawn. That first, then seize the indisruptible shield the god of fire gave you, ringed with gold. Daybreak, if you find my urgings on the mark, we'll see vast heaps of Rutulians cut down in blood. She closed with a dive and drove the tall ship on with her right hand, how well she knew the ropes and on it flies, faster than spear or wind-swift shaft while the rest race on in her wake. 
The Trojan son of Anchises, stunned with awe, his spirits lift with the sign and scanning the skies above his head Aeneas prays a few strong words, Ida's generous queen and mother of the gods, by Dindima dear to your heart, by towered cities, the double team of lions yoked to your reins, lead me in war, bring on the omen, goddess, speed the Trojans home with your victor's stride. No more words. As the wheeling sun swung round to the full light of day and put the dark to flight, First he commands his troops to follow orders, brace their hearts for battle, gear for war. Now Aeneas, standing high astern, no sooner catches a glimpse of his own Trojan camp than he quickly hoists his burnished, brazen shield in his left hand. The Trojans up on the ramparts shout to the skies, fresh hope ignites their rage, and wing their spears like cranes from the river Strymon calling out commands as they swoop through the air below the black clouds, flying before the south winds, cries raised in joy. The Rutulian king and the Latin captains marvel till, glancing back, they see an armada heading toward the shore and the whole sea rolling down on them now in a tide of ships. From the peak of Aeneas helmet flames are leaping forth and a deadly blaze comes pouring from its crest. The golden boss of his shield spews streams of fire, strong as the lethal, blood-red light of comet streaming on in a clear night, or bright as the dog star, Sirius, bearing plague and thirst to afflicted mortals, rises up to shroud the sky with gloom. But dauntless Turnus never lost his faith in his daring, certain to seize the beaches first and hurl the invader off the land, now then, here is the answer to your prayers, we'll break them all by force. The god of battle is in your hands, my men. Let each fighter think of his own wife, his home, remember the great works, the triumphs of our fathers. Down to the shore we go to take them on. They are dazed, they've just debarked, they've got no land legs yet. Fortune speeds the bold. Urging them on but torn, whom to lead to the shore assault? Whom to trust to besiege the embattled walls? And all the while Aeneas lands his men by planks from the high sterns. Many, who watch for the ebbing waves to slip away, go vaulting into the shallows, others row for shore. Tarshan, on the watch for a welcome stretch of beach where the shoals don't churn, no breakers booming low but a smooth unbroken groundswell glides toward the sand, abruptly swerves his prow around and spurs his shipmates, now, my chosen hands, you bend to your sturdy oars. Lift up your prows, thrust them on, beaks plowing this enemy coast, keels cutting their own furrows. I don't flinch from a wreck in such a mooring once I've seized the land. At Tarshan's command his shipmates rise to their oars and drive their vessels foaming onto the Latian shore until their beaks have gripped dry land, all keels beach safe and sound, all but your own ship, Tarshan. Aground on the shoals, long impaled on a jagged reef it teeters back and forth, tiring the waves, and suddenly breaks up, flinging crews in the surf, ensnared in the shattered oars and bobbing thwarts as the heavy backwash drags their feet from shore. But Turnus wastes no time, he deploys his full force quickly against the Trojan force to fight them at the beaches. Trumpets blare. Aeneas is the first to attack the beleaguered farmers and, sign of the battle's outcome, brings the Latins down, killing mighty Theron who dared to attack Aeneas. His sword pierces the bronze mesh of Theron's tunic, stiff with its golden scales, and drains his gaping flank. Lycas next, cut live from his dead mother's womb and hallowed to you, the healer, but what good now to elude the knife at birth? Next Aeneas, as rugged Sisius, giant Gaius clubbed their way through his ranks, he flung both down to death. No help to them now, the weapons of Hercules, no, nor their own strong arms or their father Melampus, Hercules' mainstay, long as the earth afforded the man his grueling labours. Here's Pharis, watch, hurling his hollow threats as Aeneas hurls his javelin, stakes it square in the man's howling mouth. You too, unlucky Sidon, pursuing Clitius, your new love, his cheeks soft with the first gold down of youth, you would have gone down under the Trojan's hand and died a pitiful death, with all recall of your young boy lovers lost, if a pack of your brothers had not blocked Aeneas, seven of Phorcus' offspring rifling seven spears, some glancing off his shield and his helmet, harmless, others, that loving Venus flicked away, just scratched his body. Aeneas cries to Achates, give me a sheaf of weapons. I won't miss a single Rutulian with my spear, just as my spears impaled the Greeks at Troy. With that he seizes a heavy lance and wings it hard and straight through the bronze of Mayan's shield it pounds, ripping open his breast and breastplate both at once. His brother Alcanor runs to brace his falling brother, quick, but the spear's already flown its bloody way, stabbing his dying arm that hangs from his shoulder, dangling loose by the tendons. 
another, Numita, wrenching out the shaft from his brother's body, went at Aeneas, praying to hit him, pay him back but not a chance of that, he could only graze the stalwart Achates in the thigh. Now up steps Clausus from Cures, flushed with his young strength and flings his burly spear from a distance, hitting Dryops under the chin full force to choke the Trojan's throat as he shouted, cutting off both his voice and life in the same breath, and his brow slams the ground as he vomits clots of blood. Three Thracians too, of the north wind's lofty stock, and three whom their father, Idas, and fatherland Ismarus sent away to the wars, but Clausus kills them all with a novel twist of death for each. Halesus rushes in with Oruncan troops and Mesippus, Neptune's son, as well, the brilliant horseman. Trojans and Latins, struggling to rout each other, seesawing back and forth as they fight it out on Italy's very doorstep. Like clashing winds in the vast heavens, bursting forth into battle, matched in spirit, in power, no gust surrendering, one to another, neither the winds nor clouds nor seas, all hangs in the balance, the world gripped in a deadlock. So they clash, the Trojan armies, armies of Latins, foot dug in against foot, man packed against man. Another zone where a torrent had hurled down boulders, heaving them far and wide and torn out trees from its banks. When Pallas saw his Arcadians, untrained to attack on foot and turning tail before the Latins' pursuit, the lay of the rock-choked land convinced them all to desert their horses, so, seizing on one last way to stem disaster, now with prayers, now stinging taunts, he fires up their war lust, where are you flying, friends? I beg you now by your self-respect, your own brave work, by your chief Evander's name, your victories won, by my own rising hopes to match my father's fame, don't trust to your feet, hack the foe with swords, that's the way. Over there, where the massed infantry pushes forward, that's where your famous land demands you back with Pallas in the lead. No gods force us on, we're mortals, harried by mortal enemies. They have as many hands and lives as we. Look, the ocean shuts us in with immense blockades of waves, no land to fly to. What, shall we head for the sea, or Troy? Fighting words, and he hurls himself at the enemy's massed ranks. First to confront him? Lagos, lured on by a harsh fate. As he tries to lift an enormous rock, Pallas rifles a spear that strikes his spine midway where it parts the ribs, and wrenches back the shaft that's wedged in the bone as his bow pounces down on him, filled with the hope to take his man off guard. But Pallas takes him first, his bow rushing in fury, off his guard, berserk with his comrade's death as Pallas welcomes him in with the naked sword he plunges into his lungs puffed up with rage. Next he goes for Sthenius, then Ancemela sprung from Rotius' age-old line, a man who dared befoul his own stepmother's bed. You two, you twins, went down on Latian fields, Thimber, Larides, Dorcas' sons, identical twins, an endearing puzzlement to your parents till Pallas made a strict distinction between you. Thimber, he lops off your head with one sweep of Evander's sword and, Larides, chops your hand and the fighter's dying hand gropes for its body, quivering fingers claw for the sword once more. Inflamed by his taunts and watching his brilliant work, the Arcadians, armed with grief and shame, stand braced to meet the enemy. Suddenly Pallas runs Rotius through as he races past in his two-horse chariot. That much respite and breathing room had Ilus won, at Ilus Pallas had flung a rugged spear at long range, but Rotius pausing between them takes the point head on as he flees from you, distinguished toothers, you and your brother tires, Rotius spilling out of his car in death throes, drumming the fields of Italy with his heels. So as in summer, just when the winds he prayed for rise and a shepherd kindles fires scattered through the forest, suddenly all in the midst ignite into one long jagged battle line of fire rampaging through the fields and high on his perch he gazes down in triumph, seeing the blaze exulting on, just as your comrade's courage speeds to your rescue, all at a single point, pallors, and joy fills your heart. But Halesus hot for combat charges against them now, compressing all his force behind his weapons. Laid in he butchers, fears, Demardicus, a flash of his sword and he slices off Strymonius' hand just as it clutched his throat. He smashes Thoas full in the face with a rock and crushes out his skull in a spray of brains and blood. Halesus' father, foreseeing his son's doom, hid him deep in the woods, but when the old man's eyes went glazing blind in death, the fates, taking the son in hand, devoted him here to Evander's lance. Pallas attacks him, praying first, now, Father Tiber, grant the spear I'm about to hurl a lucky path through rugged Halesa's chest, I'll strip him of weapons, hang them on your oak. The Tiber heard his prayer. As Halesa's guarded Iman, the hapless fighter left his chest defenseless, bared to the Arcadian lance. But Lausus, who plays a frontline role in war, won't let his soldiers flinch at Pallas' carnage. 
First he finishes a bars, quick to face him there, that burly knot, that bulwark of battle. Arcadia's prime he hacks down, hacks down the Tuscans and you whose bodies went unscarred by the Greeks, you Trojans too. And the lines of fighters clash, matched in chiefs, in power, the rearguard packs tight, no room for maneuver, no spear hurled in the press. Here Pallas drives and lunges, Laosus opposes him, all but equal in age, remarkably handsome, both, but fortune grudged them both safe passage home. Yet Jove would not allow those fighters to clash, he saved each man for his own fate, soon now, under a stronger foe. Now his loving sister, Juturna, spurs her brother Turnus quickly to Lausa's side. Turnus races his chariot straight through the ranks and shouts as he sees his comrades, now's the time to halt your fighting. I will go after Pallas, Pallas is mine now, my prize alone. If only his father were here to watch it all in person. At that, his comrades cleared off from the field and as they withdrew, young Pallas, struck dumb by that arrogant command, runs his eyes over Turnus' enormous frame, scanning every feature from where he stood and glancing grimly, Pallas volleys back these words to counter the words his high and mighty enemy used, now's my time to win some glory, either for stripping off a wealth of spoils or dying a noble death, my father can stand up under either fate. Enough of your threats. Enough said. Pallas marches out to the center of the field and the blood runs cold in each Arcadian heart. Down from his chariot Turnus vaulted, nerved to attack the enemy face to face on foot. Like some lion that spots from his high lookout, far off on the plain and flexing for combat there, an immense bull, and the lion plunges toward his kill, and that is the image of Turnus coming on for battle. When Pallas judged him just in range of his spear he moved up first, if only fortune would speed his daring, pitting himself against unequal odds, and he cries out to the arching heavens, Hercules, by my father's board, the welcome you met as a stranger, I beg you, stand by the great task I'm tackling now. May Turner see me stripping the bloody armor off his body, bear the sight of his conqueror, eyes dulled in death. Hercules heard the young man's prayer, suppressed a groan that rose up from his heart, and wept helpless tears as the father said these tender words to his son, each man has his day, and the time of life is brief for all, and never comes again. But to lengthen out one's fame with action, that's the work of courage. How many sons of gods went down under Troy's high wall? Why, I lost a son of my own with all the rest, Sarpedon. For Turnus too, his own fate calls, and the man has reached the end of all his days on earth. So Jove declares, and turns his glance away from the Latian fields below. Where Pallas rifles his spear full force and sweeps his flashing sword from its casing sheath. The spear goes flying on and it hits the armor high up where the bronze rims the shoulder's ridge, and glancing off, it rams its way through the shield's plies and finally scrapes the skin of Turnus' massive body. But Turnus, balancing long his oakwood spear with its iron tip, flings it at Pallas with winging words, now we'll see if my spear pierces deeper and Pallas' shield, for all its layers of iron and bronze, its countless layers of oxide rounding it out for strength, still Turnus' vibrant spear goes shattering through the shield with stabbing impact, piercing the breastplate's guard and Pallas' broad chest. Pallas wrenches the spearhead warm from his wound, no use, his blood and his life breath follow hard on the same track out. Collapsing onto his wound, his armor clanging over him, Pallas dies, pounding enemy earth with his bloody mouth as Turnus trumpets over him, you Arcadians, listen. Take a message home to Evander, tell him this, the palace I send him back will serve him right. Whatever tribute a tomb can give, whatever barmer burial, I am only too glad to give. But the welcome he gave Aeneas costs him dear. With that, he stamped his left foot on the corpse and stripped away the sword belt's massive weight engraved with its monstrous crime, how one night, their wedding night, that troop of grooms was butchered, fouling their wedding chambers with pools of blood, all carved by Clonus, Eurytus' son, in priceless gold. Now Turnus glories in that spoil, exults to make it his. How blind men's minds to their fate and what the future holds, how blind to limits when fortune lifts men high. Yes, the time will come when Turnus would give his all to have Pallas whole, intact, when all this spoil, this very day he'll loathe. But a huge throng of friends is attending Pallas, moaning, weeping, and bears him back upon his shield. O you return to your father, his great grief and glory. This day first gave you to war and this day takes you off and still you leave behind great heaps of Latian dead. Such a heavy blow. Now a trusted herald, no empty rumor, wings the news to Aeneas, his men stand on the razor edge of death, now is the time to rescue his routed Trojans. 
The closest enemy ranks he mows down with iron, reaping a good wide swath through the Latian front, blazing with rage as his sword blade hacks that path, hunting for you, Turnus, so proud of your latest kill. As Pallas, Evander, all of them rise before Aenea's eyes, the welcoming board that met him that first day, the right hands clasped in trust, and four sons of Solmo, fighters all, and the same number reared by Euphans, Aeneas takes them alive to offer Pallas shade and soak his flaming pyre with captive blood. And next he wings from afar a deadly spear at Magus ducking under it, quick, as the quivering shaft flies past and Magus, hugging Aeneas' knees, implores, I beg you now by your father's ghost, by your hopes for rising Ulysses, spare this life of mine for my father and my son. Ours is a stately mansion, deep inside lie buried bars of ridged silver and heavy weights of gold, some of it tooled, some untooled, mine alone. Now how can a Trojan victory hinge on me? How can a single life make such a difference? Magus begged no more as Aeneas lashed back, all those bars of silver and gold you brag of, save them for your sons. Such bargaining in battle, Turnus already cut it short when he cut Pallas down. So the ghost of my father, so my son declares. And seizing Magus' helmet tight in his left hand and wrenching back his neck as the man preys on, he digs his sword blade deep down to the hilt. Hard by, the son of Heman and priest of Phoebus and Diana, his temples wreathed in the consecrated bands, all white in his robes, brilliant in his array, Aeneas confronts him, coursing him down the field and rearing over him as he stumbles, slaughters him, shrouding his brilliant robes with a mighty shade. Serestus gathers the armor, shoulders it home to you, King Mars, your trophy now. Now Seculus, Vulcan stock, and Umbro fresh from the Marsian highlands rally their troops as Aeneas rages on against them. His slashing sword had already hacked off Anxa's left arm and his round buckler slammed the ground. He'd shouted some great boast, trusting his strength would match his words, probably lifting his spirit sky high and promising grey hairs for himself and a ripe old age, as Aeneas faced down Tarquitus gloating in burnished gear and borne to Faunus, god of the woods, by the wood nymph Dryope. Tarquitus blocked his path as Aeneas blazed on and cocking back his spear he flings it and stakes the breastplate fast to the shield's groaning weight. Then as Tarquitus begs him, struggling to keep on begging, all for nothing, Aeneas dashes his head to the ground and rolling the man's warm trunk along and looming over him vaunts with all the hatred in his heart, now lie there, you great, frightful man. No loving mother will bury you in the ground or weight your body down with your father's tomb. You'll be abandoned now to carrion birds or plunged in the deep sea and swept away by the waves and ravening fish will dart and lick your wounds. Plunging on he goes, overtaking their finest, Turnus frontline troops, Antaeus, Lucas and stalwart Numa and Camus with tawny locks, magnanimous Volson's son, the richest landholder in all Italy once, the lord of Amicli, quiet town. Aeneas like Egan who, they say, had a hundred arms and a hundred hands, and flames blazed from his fifty moors and chests when he fought down Jupiter's bolts of lightning, clashing as many matching shields, unsheathing as many swords, so Aeneas now, rampaging in triumph all across the plain, once his sword had warmed to the slaughter. Look there, he heads for Nepheus' car and his four horses raising their chests against him, but as they see him ramping on in his loping strides and hear him groan in fury, round they wheel in terror, rearing backward, spilling their driver out the chariot, whirling it down to shore. While into the melee hurry Lucagus and his brother Liger, chariot borne by two white steeds, the brother reigns man guiding the team as Lucagus flaunts his naked steel. But Aeneas could not suffer their fiery charge, he charged them, looming, huge, his spear poised as Liger shouted out, what you see here are not Diam's team, Achilles' car, or the plains of Troy, now on our own land you see the end of your wars, of your own life too. Such maddened words he hurls but no words come from Aeneas now, he hurls his spear in reply against his foe and then as Lucagus, bending into the stroke, slaps the team with his flat sword, his left foot thrust out, braced for attack, Aeneas' weapon pierces the bottom plies of his gleaming buckler, ripping into his left groin. Flung from the car he rides on the field in death as righteous Aeneas sends some bitter words his way, Lucagus, no panic pair has let your chariot down, no horses shying away from an enemy's empty shade, it's you, tumbling off your chariot, you desert your team. He sees the yoke as the luckless brother, slipping off the war car, flinging his helpless arms toward Aeneas, prayed, I beg you, beg by the ones who bore a son like you, great man of Troy, now spare my life, pity my prayers. Praying on as Aeneas broke in, a far cry from the words you mouthed before, die. No brother deserts a brother here. Then with his blade he carved wide open Liger's chest, his hidden cache of life. 
So much slaughter the Trojan commander spreads throughout the plain like a stream in spate or black tornado storming on till at last the young Ascanius and his troops break free and put the camp behind. The great blockade is over. At the same moment Jove adept spurs on Juno, my own sister, my sweet wife as well, it's Venus, just as you thought, your judgment never fails. She is the one who supports the Trojan forces, not their own strong hands that clutch for combat, not their unflinching spirits seasoned hard to peril. And Juno replies, her head bent low, my dearest husband, why rake my anxious heart? I dread your grim commands. Your love for me, if it held the force it once held and should hold still, you'd never deny me this, all-powerful one, the power to spirit turn us clear of battle, save him all unscathed for his father, Dornus. But now, as it is, let him die and pay his debt to the Trojans, pay with his own loyal blood. Still, Turnus takes his birth from our own breed, his name too, Pelumnus was his forebear, four generations back, and his lavish hand has heaped your threshold high with treasure troves of gifts. The king of lofty Olympus countered briefly, if what you want is reprieve from instant death, some breathing space for the doomed young man, and you acknowledge the limits I lay down, then whisk your Turnus away, pluck him out of the closing grip of fate. That much room for indulgence I will give you. But if some deeper longing for mercy stirs beneath your prayers, some notion the whole thrust of the war can shift and change, you're feeding empty hopes. Juno replies in tears, what if your heart should grant what you begrudge in words, and the life of Turnus were firmly set for years to come? For now, a crushing end awaits an innocent man, unless I'm lost to the truth and swept away. Oh, if only my fears were false and I deceived. If only you, you have the power, would bend your will to a better goal. With that appeal, headlong down from the heights of heaven she dove, girt up in clouds, unfurling a whirlwind through the air and winging straight at the Trojan ranks and Latian camp. Then, out of thin mist the goddess creates a phantom, Aeneas double, but a strange, unearthly sight, a shadow stripped of power, and decking it out in Trojan armor, matching the shield and crest on Aeneas' godlike head, she fills it with hollow words, gives it a voice, sound without sense, and it apes his marching stride. Like ghosts that after our death, they say, will flutter on or dreams that deceive our senses lost in sleep. But the buoyant shade parades before the front, shaking a spear in his enemy's face and taunting, Turnus attacks it, rifling a vibrant lance, a long cast but the phantom swerves away and Turnus in turmoil, thinking Aeneas had really turned tail and fled, and drinking deep of the vapid cup of hope, cries out, where are you racing, Aeneas? Don't abandon your sworn bride. My right hand will give you the earth you crossed the seas to find. He shouts in hot pursuit, flashing his naked sword, blind to the winds that scatter all his triumph. A ship chants to be moored to a spur of cliff, her ladders and gangway set for action. King Osinius sailed her here, straight from the shores of Clusium. Here Aeneas' frightened shadow throws itself into hiding, Turnus hard on its heels, nothing can keep him back, bounding over the gangways, leaping the high decks. He had barely touched the prow when Juno bursts the cables, rips the ship from her moorings, blows her out to sea on the tide ebbing fast. And now the misty phantom, no longer hunting for cover, flutters up on high, dissolving into a dark cloud. And all the while Aeneas calls on Turnus to fight but the man is gone, so the many men who block his way he sends to death as Juno's winds are spinning Turnus around in mid-sea and glancing backward, knowing nothing, no thanks for escape, he lifts his hands in prayer, his voice to the stars, Almighty Father, so, you find my guilt so great? You're dead set on my paying such a price? Where have I come from? Where am I racing now? What is this flight that takes me home, a coward, will I ever see my Laurentine walls and camp again? What of those gallant men who backed my sword and me? All of them, what disgrace, I deserted them all to die an unspeakable death. Now I see them straggling, lost, I hear them groaning as they go under. What shall I do? If only the earth gape deep enough to take me down. Better, pity me, winds. Turnus begs you with all his heart, dash this ship on a reef or cliff or run her aground on the Surtees savage shoals where no Rutulian, no rumor that knows my shame can dog my heels. Praying, his mind at sea, wavering here, there, crazed by his own disgrace, should he fling himself on his sword and thrust the ruthless blade through his ribs. Or plunge in the heavy swells and swim back to the bay and pitch himself at the Trojan spears once more. Three times he probed each way, three times Juno with all her power held the prince's fury down, pitying him in her heart, 
and kept him hard on course, cutting the deep as favoring tide and current sweep him home to his father Dornus' ancient city. But now Mazentius' turn. That moment at Jove's command he carries on the fight, attacks the victorious Trojans, true, but his own Etruscan troops with all their hate and showering weapons rush to attack him quite alone, their one and only target. He, like a headland jutting into the ocean wastes and bared to the wind's rage, braving the breakers, weathering out all force and fury of sea and sky, stands firm himself. He hacks to ground Dolice on sun, Hebrus, Latigus with him and Palmus who spins and runs, he smashes Latigus square in the face and mouth with a rock, a crag of a rock, and cuts the knees from under the racing Palmus, leaves him slowly writhing in pain and gives his armor to Lausus, bronze for his shoulders, plumes to crown his crest. The next to die? Euanth the Phrygian, Mimas too, a comrade of Paris just his age. On the same night the Aino brought into light the son of Amicus, Hecuba, great with the torch, bore Paris. Paris lies dead in the city of his fathers, Mimas lies unsung on the Latian shores. Mazentius. Picture the wild boar that's harried down from a ridge by snapping packs of hounds, some beast Mount Vesula shielded for long or long the Latian forests fed on the reeds that crowd their marshes, once stampeded into the nets he jolts to a halt, snorts, at bay, the hackles rising up on his neck, no hunter bold enough to approach him, take him on, at a safe remove they attack with spears and shouts. But the boar stands fast, unflinching, where to charge, anywhere, grinding his tusks and shaking spears from his back. So Mazentius now, for all his attackers' rightful fury, none of them has the spine to fight him, swords drawn, they just bait him with missiles, far-flung cries, all at a safe remove. Now Akron, a Greek, had just arrived from Carithus' old frontier, an exile, leaving his marriage in the lurch. As Mazentius spied him rooting the lines far off, crested in purple plumes, the blue of his bride to be, like a famished lion stalking the cattle pens for prey, for the hunger will often drive him mad just let him spot some goat on the run or a stag's antlers branching high, his big jaws gape at the sport, his manner bristles, then a pouncing assault. And he clenches his quarry's flesh as the sopping gore soaks his ruthless maw, just so Mazentius pounces hotly onto the enemy masses. He lays unlucky Akron low, his heels pounding the dark earth as he gasps his life away and dies the weapon splintered off in his body bloodred. Orodes darts away but Mazentius would not stoop to killing him on the run with a spear cast from behind, stabbing him, unseen, no, he duelled him man to man, proving himself the better man by force of arms, not stealth, and next, stamping his foot on the corpse and leaning hard on the spear, Mazentius shouts out, here, men, lies no mean part of their battle strength, Orodes, once so tall. And his comrades shout back, redoubling the victor's cry as Orodes pants his last, you don't have long to crow, whoever you are, my victor. Vengeance waits, the same fate watches over you too, you'll lie here in the same field, very soon. Die now. Mazentius cries, grinning through his rage, as for my own death, the father of gods and king of men will see to that. Mazentius, vaunting, pries the spear from Orode's body. Grim repose and an iron sleep press down his eyes and seal their light in a night that never ends. Cedicus chops Alcathus down, Sacrator, Hydaspes, Rapo kills Parthenius, then the indestructible Orses. Messapus levels Clonius, then Lycaon's son, Erechites, one thrown from a rainless horse and sprawled aground, the other fighting on foot. On foot a Lycian too, one Aegis strode up now but Valerus, no poor heir to his father's battle prowess, hurled him down as Thronius fell to Salius, Salius to Nielses, crack marksmen with spears and arrows both, blindsiding in front afar. Ruthless Mars was drawing the battle out, dead even now, equaling out the grief, the mutual slaughter. Victors and victims killing, killed in turn, both sides locked, not a thought of flight, not here. The gods in the halls of Jove are filled with pity, feeling the futile rage of both great armies, mourning the labors borne by mortal men. Here Venus, over against her, Juno gazing down, as Tisiphone seeds amid the milling thousands, that livid, lethal fury. But here Mazentius comes, brandishing high his massive spear and storming on like a whirlwind down the plain, an enormous as Orion marching in mid-sea, plowing a path through the deep swells, his shoulders rearing over the waves, or hauling down from a ridge the trunk of an age-old mountain ash, as he treads the ground he hides his head in clouds, so vast, Mazentius marching on in gigantic armor. Aeneas, spotting him out in the long front ranks, comes up to cross his path. But he holds firm, unafraid, awaiting his great-hearted foe, stands firm in all his mass. 
his eyes narrow, gauging the length his spear will need, he cries, let this right arm, my only god, and the spear I hurl be with me now. I dedicate you, Lao Tzu's, decked in the spoils I strip from that pirate's corpse, my son, my living trophy over Aeneas. Enough. He hurled his spear and whizzing in from a distance, winging on, it ricocheted off Aeneas' shield to hit that hardy fighter Antors, yards away, between the flank and groin, Antors sent from Argos, Hercules' aide who bound himself to Evander, settling down in the king's Italian city. Laid low by a wound aimed for another, luckless man, he looks up at the heavens, longing for his dear Argos as he dies. Next the grave Aeneas flings a spear at Mezentius, right through the buckler's three round plates of bronze, through the linen plies and bull's hide triply stitched the spear pierced, plunging deep in the man's groin but its force stopped short of home. In a flash Aeneas, overjoyed now at the sight of the Tuscan's blood, sweeps his sword from its sheath and closes fast on his staggered foe. But Lausus, seeing it all, groaned low with the love he bore his father, tears poured down his face and now, Lausus, your fated, brutal death and your brave deeds, if glorious work long ages old can win belief, neither your record nor yourself will I ever fail to sing, young soldier, you deserve our praise. Now his father was backing off, defenseless, weighed down, dragging his enemy's spears half trailing from his shield, so the sun sprang forward, darting into the moil and just as Aeneas rose up, his arm reared for attack, Lausus, ducking under the stroke, parried the sword, holding the Trojan off while shouting comrades harried Aeneas with missiles pelting in from afar till under his son's shield the father could escape. Aeneas keeps down, huddling under his own shield, enraged. Think of a cloud burst bearing down with gusts of hail and every plowman, every farmhand quits the fields and the traveller keeps safe in a welcome refuge under some river's banks or cavern's rocky arch while rain pelts the earth, so when the sun returns they can all get on with the day's work. So Aeneas, overpowered by missiles left and right, braves out the cloud burst of war till its thunder dies away and then he taunts Lausus, threatens Lausus, why hurry your death? Daring beyond your powers. Your love for your father lures you into folly. But Lausus rages on, berserk as the savage fury surges higher now in the Trojan captain's heart. The fates bind up the last threads of Lausus' life as Aeneas drives his tempered sword through the youth, plunging it home hilt deep. The point impaled his shield, a flimsy defense for the youngster's brash threats, and the shirt his mother wove him of soft gold mesh and his lap filled up with blood, and then his life slipped through the air, sorrowing down to the shades and left his corpse behind. Ah but then, when the son of Anchises saw his dying look, his face, that face so ashen, awesome in death, he groaned from his depths in pity, reached out his hand as this picture of love for a father pierced his heart, and said, Forlorn young soldier, what can Aeneas, in all honour, give you to match your glory now? What gifts are worthy of such a noble spirit? Keep your armour that gave you so much joy. I give you back to your father's ash and shades if it offers any solace. And this, at least, may comfort you for a death so cruel, unlucky boy, you went down under the hand of great Aeneas. With that, he rounded hard on Lausus' comrades, slow to move, and lifted their captain's body off the ground where Lausus was defiling his braided hair with blood. But Lausus' father was just stanching his wounds in the Tiber's waters, leaning his body against a tree trunk, resting now. Nearby, his brazen helmet swings from a branch and his heavy armor lies on the grass, in peace. Picked young soldiers stand in a ring around him. His combed, flowing beard spreading across his chest, he tries to limber his neck, panting, heaving in torment. Time and again he asks for news of Lausus, again he dispatches runners to recall him, bearing a stricken father's orders. Yes, but Lausus, weeping comrades are bearing his lifeless body home on his shield, a great soldier taken down by a great wound. But his father hears their wails far off and stirred by a grim foreboding, knows it all. Soiling his grey hair with dust, flinging both hands to the skies, he clings to his son's body, crying, Was I so seized by the lust for life, my son, I let you take my place before the enemy's sword. My own flesh and blood. What, your father saved by your own wounds? Kept alive by your death. Oh, now at last I know the griefs of exile, I, in all my pain, at last a wound strikes home. I've stained your name, my son, with my own crimes, detested, drum from my father's scepter and their throne. I owed a price to my land and people who despise me. If only I'd paid in full with my own guilty life, by any death on earth. But I live on, not yet have I left the land of men and light of day but I will leave it all. 
In the same breath he struggles to stand erect on his damaged thigh and though his strength is sapped by his deep wound, his spirit is unbroken. He calls for his horse, his pride, his mainstay, always the mount he rode triumphant from every battle. Seeing it grieving, he begins, Long have we lived together, Rebus, if anything in this mortal world lives long. Today, either you'll carry back those bloody arms we strip in triumph, parade Aenea's head and avenge together Lorsa's pains. Or if no force can clear our path, you will go down with me. For I can't believe, my brave one, you could bend to a stranger's orders, bear a Trojan master. Mazentius mounted up, his weight settling onto the horse's back in the old familiar way, both hands holding the heft of well-honed spears, his helmet aflash with bronze and bristling horsehair crest, and into the surge of battle so he plunged, churning with mighty shame, with grief and madness all aswirl in that one fighting heart. Three times he shouted out to Aeneas, a great resounding shout, and Aeneas knew that voice and his prayer rose up in joy, so grant it, father of gods and high Apollo, bring the battle on. That challenge made, he closes on his enemy, spear poised for the kill as Mazentius answers back, why, you king of cruelty, now that you've killed my son, why try to make me cringe? That was the only way you could destroy me. I never flinch at death or bow to a single god. No more words. I'm here to die, but I bring you these gifts first. And with that he flung a javelin at his enemy, planting one shaft after another, racing round in a sweeping ring, but the golden boss of Aenea's shield stands fast. Three times Mazentius rides around him, hurling his weapons, keeping the Trojan on his left, three times Aeneas wheels round with him, bearing a grisly thicket of lances bristling on his shield. Then, tired of all delays, of ripping out the shafts, outmatched, on the defensive, Aeneas now at last, at his wit's end, bursts forth and hurls his spear and it splits the temples of Mazentius' war horse. Back it rears, flailing the air with flying hoofs and throwing its rider, pitching headlong down in a tangled mass, its shoulder joint torn out, it crushes Mazentius' body to the ground. Trojan and Latin war cries set the sky on fire as Aeneas dashes up and wrenching his sword from its sheath, he triumphs over him, where's the fierce Mazentius now? Where's his murderous fury? And the Tuscan fighter, gazing up at the sky and drinking in the air as he returned to his senses, said, My mortal enemy, why do you ridicule me, threaten me with death? Killing is no crime. I never engaged in combat on such terms. No such pact did Laosu seal between you and me that you would spare my life. One thing is all I ask, if the vanquished may ask a favor of the victor, let my body be covered by the earth. Too well I know how my people's savage hatred swirls around me. Shield me, I implore you, from their fury. Let me rest in the grave beside my son, in the comradeship of death. With those words, fully aware, he offers up his throat to the sword and across his armor pours his life in waves of blood. Book 11. Camilla's Finest Hour. Now as dawn rose up and left her ocean bed, Aeneas, moved as he is by grief to pause and bury comrades, desolate with their deaths, still the victor pays his vows to the gods as first light breaks. An enormous oak, its branches lopped and trunk laid bare, he stakes on a mound and decks with the burnished arms he stripped from Mazentius, that strong captain, a trophy to you, Mars, the great god of war. Aeneas fixes the crest still dripping blood, the enemy splintered spears and breastplate battered hard and pierced in a dozen places. Fast to the left hand he straps the brazen shield and down from the neck he hangs the ivory hilt sword. Then he turns to his comrades, bands of officers pressing round him there, and Aeneas starts in to stir their spirits flushed with recent triumph, what magnificent things we've done, my friends. Dismiss all fears for what's still left to do. These are the spoils stripped from a proud king, our first fruits of battle, this is Mazentius, the work of my right hand. Now on we go to the Latian king, his city walls. Sharpen your swords with heart and pin your hopes on war. No taking us off guard, no hanging back, no dread must cripple our steps with anxious second thoughts when the gods allow us to pull our standards up, strike camp, and move the army out. But now commit our friends' unburied bodies to the earth, their only tribute down in the depths of hell. Go, he cries, deck with funeral gifts those heroes' souls. They won this land for us with their own blood. But first send Pallas home to Evander's grieving city, a soldier who never lost heart when the black day swept him off and drowned him in bitter death. So Aeneas says, in tears, turning back to his gates where Pallas' lifeless body lay outspread, guarded by old Achoetes. 
He bore Evander's arms in Arcadia once, but the omens were less bright when he marched out with Pallas, beloved foster son. Around them flocked a retinue, crowds of Trojans and Trojan women, their hair unbound in the mourner's way. But then, as soon as Aeneas entered the high-built gates, they beat their breasts and raised their cries to the sky and the royal lodging groaned with wails of grief. Aeneas, gazing at Pallas resting there, his head, his face bled white, and his smooth chests blade apart by a Latin spear, the tears came welling up with words of sorrow, child of heartbreak, was it you whom fortune denied me, coming to me all smiles? Now you will never live to see our kingdom born, never ride in triumph home to your father's house. A far cry from the pledge I made Evander for his son. Embracing me as I left that day, he sent me out to win ourselves an empire, fearful, warning that we would face brave men, a battle-hardened people. So even now, gripped by his own empty hopes, he may be paying his vows, perhaps, and loading the altars down with gifts while we, with shows of grief and hollow tributes, bring him a lifeless son who owes no more, now, to any god on high. Unlucky man, you must behold the agonizing burial of your son. Is this how we return? Our longed-for triumph? Is this my binding pledge? Ah, but Evander, you will never see him retreat, hit by a shameful wound, never pray for a father's wretched death, disgraced by a son who still lives safely on. Oh, Italy, oh, what a rugged bastion you have lost, how great your loss, my Eulus. Morning done, he commands his troops to lift the stricken body high and sends a thousand men, picked from the whole corps to escort the rites and join in the father's tears. A small comfort offered a grief so great but owed to a father's heartache. Others lost no time, braiding with wickerwork a soft, pliant beer, weaving shoots of arbutus, sprigs of oak, shrouding the piled couch with shady leaves. Here on his raised rustic bed they place the boy and there he lies like a flower cut by a young girl's hand, some tender violet bloom or drooping hyacinth spray, its glow and its lovely glory still not gone, though Mother Earth no longer nurses it now or gives it life. Then Aeneas carried out twin robes, stiff with purple and gold braid, that Dido of Sidon made with her own hands once, just for Aeneas, loving every stitch of the work and weaving into the weft a glinting mesh of gold. Heartsick, he cloaks the boy with one as a final tribute, covering locks that soon will face the fire. Then, heaping a mass of plunder seized in the Latin rout, Aeneas orders it borne home in a long cortege, adding the steeds and arms he stripped from foes. Behind their backs he strapped their hands, the captives he planned to send below as gifts to appease the shades, sprinkling Latin blood on the pyre that burned their corpses. He orders his own captains to carry tree trunks clad in enemy arms, with the hated names engraved. Unlucky old Achoetes, weighed down with the years, they help along as he beats his chest with fists, claws his cheeks with his nails and stumbling on, flings his full length to the ground. Chariots too are rolled along, splashed to the rails with Latin blood. And here comes Pallas' war horse, Blaze, regalia set aside, weeping, ambling on, big tears rivering down his face. And others bear the spear and helmet of Pallas. Turnus, the victor, commandeered the rest. There follows an army of mourners, Trojans all, and all the Tuscans, all the Arcadians march with arms reversed. After the long cortege of Pallas' friends had moved on well ahead, Aeneas drew to a halt, groaned from his depths and spoke these last words, the same dark fate of battle commands me back to other tears. Hail forever, our great Pallas. Hail forever and farewell. Aeneas said no more. Back he strode to his ramparts, back to camp. Now in came envoys sent from the Latin city, bearing olive branches and pleading for a truce. Those bodies felled by the sword and strewn about the field, return them, let them lie with mounds of earth for cover. There is no fighting defeated men, robbed of the light. Spare them now. You called them your hosts, once, and the fathers of your brides. Good Aeneas grants the appeal he'd never shun. He treats them kindly and adds these gracious words, What unmerited stroke of fortune, men of Latium, traps you so in war that you flee from us, your friends. Peace for the dead, cut down by the lots of battle, that's your plea. I'd grant that to the living too. I'd never have come if fate had not ordained me here a house and home. Nor do I make war with your people. It's your king, who renounced our pact of friendship, choosing to trust to turn us force of arms. Why, it would have been fairer for Turnus to meet this death. If the soldier means to finish off our war by force, to rout the Trojans now, he should have clashed with me and my weapon then, in combat man to man. 
one of us would have lived, the one whom Mars, or his own right arm, had granted life. Go now. Ignite the pyre beneath your luckless dead. Aeneas closed. They all stood silent, trading startled glances fixed on each other, hushed. Then aged Drances, always quick to attack the young captain, Turnus, full of hatred and accusations, breaks forth to have his say, man of Troy, great in fame, greater in battle, how can I sing your praises to the skies? What to commend first? Your sense of justice, your awesome works of war? Surely we'll carry back to our walls these words of yours with grateful hearts, and if fortune points the way, ally you with our king, Latinus. Turnus can find his allies for himself. We'll even be glad to raise your mighty walls ordained by fate, glad to shoulder up the foundation stones of Troy. All as one, his comrades murmured yes to Drance's offer. Now for a dozen days they made their truce and, peace intervening, Trojans and Latins mingled safely, ranging the woods and mountain ridges side by side. And soaring ash trees ring to the two-edged iron axe and they bring down pines that towered toward the skies. There is no pause in the work as the wedges split the oak and fragrant cedar, the groaning wagons haul down from the slope's huge rowan trunks. Rumor, already in flight with the first alarms of sorrow, fills Evander's ears, Evander's walls and palace, rumor that just had trumpeted Pallas' Latian triumph. Arcadians throng to gateways, grasping funeral brands in the old archaic way. And the torches light the road, searing a long line through flatlands far and wide. Joining forces with them, the Trojan escorts mass to form a growing column of mourners on the march. Once Arcadia's mother saw them nearing their homes, their wailing set the walls on fire with grief. And no force in the world can stop Evander now. Into the crowds he goes and as the beer is lowered, throws himself on pallors, clinging for dear life, sobbing, groaning, his sorrow all but choking his voice that thrusts a passage through at last, a far cry from the pledge you made your father, pallors, that you would do nothing rash the day you trusted yourself to the savage god of war. How well I knew the thrill of a boy's first glory in arms, the heady sweetness of one's first fame in battle. But how bitter the first fruits of a man's youth, the hard lessons learned in a war so near at hand, and none of the gods would hear my vows, my prayers. And you, my wife, most blessed woman in all the world, how lucky you were to die, spared this wrenching grief. But I defeated fate, a father doomed to outlive his son. If only I'd joined ranks with our Trojan comrades here and Latin spears had hurled me down. And I had given my own life, and the long last march brought me, not Pallas, home. Not that I blame you, Trojans, nor our pacts, our friendship sealed by a handclasp. No, this fate was assigned to me in my old age. But if my son was doomed to an early death, to know he died after killing Volskian hordes and died as he led the Trojans into Latium, that will be my joy. Nor do I think you merit any other burial rites than good Aeneas grants, and the Trojan heroes, Tuscan chiefs as well and Tuscan armies, bearing your great trophies stripped from the men your right arm killed in war. And you too, Turnus, would now be standing here, a tremendous trunk of oak decked out in armor if Pallas had had your years and strength to match. But why in my torment hold the Trojans back from battle? Go. Take this word to your king. Remember it well. The reason I linger out this life I loathe, Aeneas, now Pallas is dead and gone, is your right arm that owes, as you well know, the life of Turnus to son and father both. That is the only field left free to you now, to prove your worth and fortune. I look for no joy in life, the gods have ruled that out, just to bear the news to my son among the dead. Soon the dawn had raised her light that gives men life, wretched men, calling them back to labor and mortal struggle. Now Captain Aeneas, now Tarshan erected pyres along the sweeping shore. And here they carried the bodies of their dead in the old ancestral way, as the dark funeral fires blazed up from below to shroud the high skies in pitch-dark smoke. Three times they ran their ritual rounds about the burning pyres, armed in gleaming bronze, three times they rode on horseback, circling the fires lit in mourning, lifting their wails of sorrow. Tears wet the earth, tears wetting their armor. The shouting of fighters' saws, the clashing blare of trumpets. Some heave on the flames the plunder stripped from the Latin ranks they killed, their helmets, burnished swords, bridles, chariot wheels still glowing hot, while others burn the offerings well known to the dead, their shields, their spears that had no luck. And round about they slaughter droves of cattle, carcasses offered up to death, and bristling swine and beasts led in from the fields are butchered over the flames. 
Then down the entire shore they watch their comrades burn as men stand guard at the pyres now dying out. Nor can they tear themselves away till the dank night comes wheeling round the heavens studded with fiery stars. No less in another zone the grieving Latins raise up countless pyres too. For they had many dead, and some they bury in earth, some they lift and bear off to the nearby fields and the other dead they carry back to town. All the rest they burn, unnumbered and unsung, an enormous tangled mass of bloody carnage waits and the wasteland far and wide lights up with fires, with pyre on pyre striving to outblaze the last. The third day rose, driving the night's chill from the sky as the mourners raked the embers, leveling off the ashes mixed with bones, and piled the gravesite high with mounds of earth still warm. Now in the homes, in King Latin a city that overflowed with wealth, the breaking wails and the long dirges reach their climax. Here the mothers and grief-stricken brides of the dead and their loving sisters, hearts torn with sorrow, and young boys robbed of their fathers, curse this horrendous war and turn us marriage. He himself, they cry, he should decide it all with his own sword and shield, since he lays claim to the realm of Italy, claims the lion's share of honour for himself. And caustic drances lends weight to their side. He swears that Turnus alone is summoned, he alone called forth to battle. But opposing them at once, a mix of views and voices rises up for Turnus. The famous name of the queen holds out its shield, and the hero wins support for his many feats, his trophies won in war. Now amid the din, as the fiery controversy flared, look, to top it off, the grimset envoys enter, bearing the news from Diam's noble city, nothing has been won, for all our attempts. Nothing achieved by all our gifts, our gold, our fervent appeals. We Latins must look elsewhere, hunt for other allies or press for peace at once at the hands of the Trojan king. Crushing news. Even King Latinus is overwhelmed. It's clear, Aeneas comes by the will of fate, the word on high. So the wrath of the gods declares, the fresh dug graves before Latinus' eyes. And so he convenes a council, all the leading captains mustered at his command, inside the lofty gates. They all collected now, crowding into the royal halls through milling streets. Throned in their midst, greatest in years and first in power, sits Latinus, the king's brow hardly marked by joy. He orders the envoys, home from Aetolia city, to tell all, all the reports they carry back, demanding the truth from each man in turn. A hush fell as Venulus, following orders, tells his story, My countrymen, we have seen Diams, seen the Argive camp. We've made the long march and survived its many dangers, we have grasped the hand that toppled Troy. The victor king was still building his city, Argyripa, named for his father's Argive stock, in Iapix, realm, the fields round Mount Garganus. Once we entered, allowed to appeal before the king, we offered our gifts, told him our names, our native land, and who had attacked us, what had drawn us to Arpi. He heard our pleas and replied with calming words, You happy, happy people, men of old Orsonia, land where Saturn ruled, what drives you now to shatter your blessed peace? What spurs you to rouse the hells of war you've never known? We who defiled the fields of Troy with swords, why mention all the pain we drank to the dregs, fighting beneath those walls, or the men we lost, drowned in Simwa River? Strewn across the world, we all have borne unspeakable punishments, yes, we've paid the price in full for all our crimes. Even Priam might pity our embattled troops. The grim star of Minerva, she bears witness, so do you be as crags and Caffery as vengeful cliffs. Caught in that war's wake, we have been driven to many shores. Atreus' son, Menelaus, right up to the pillars of Proterus, long an exile now. Ulysses has seen the Cyclops on Mount Etna. Shall I tell you of Neoptolemus' brief reign? The house of Idomeneus tumbled to the ground? The Locrians stranded out on Libya's coast? Even he, the Mycenaean commander of all Greece, the moment he crossed his threshold, down he went at the hands of his wicked queen. The conqueror of Asia, an adulterer crouched in wait to lay him low. Just think. The envious gods denied me my return to my father's altars, or one glimpse of the wife I yearned for so, or the lovely hills of Caledon. I'm still stalked by the sight of terrifying omens. My comrades gone. Flown off to the sky on wings or they roam the streams, as birds, how brutal, the punishments all my people have endured, and they make the cliffs re-echo with their cries. Such disasters were in the stars, from that day on that I like a maniac attacked an immortal's body, my sword defiled the hand of Venus with a wound. No, don't press me to face such battles now. 
I've had no strife with Trojan since Troy fell, nor do I think of those old griefs with any joy. And as for the gifts you bring me from your homeland, give them to Aeneas. I've stood up against his weapons, we've gone man to man. Trust me, I know just how fiercely the fighter rises up behind his shield, what a whirlwind rides on that man's spear. If Troy had borne two others to match Aeneas, Trojan troops would have marched on greasy cities, Greece would now be grieving, fate turned upside down. Whatever the standoff round the sturdy walls of Troy, with Greek victory hanging fire until the tenth year came, was all thanks to Aeneas and Hector's strong right arms. Both men shone in courage, both men blazed in combat, Aeneas the more devout. Join hands in pacts of peace while you still have the chance. Don't join battle, sword to sword. Be on your guard. Now then, you have heard, great king, the king's response, the view he takes of this mighty war of ours. The envoys had barely closed when a troubled groan came murmuring from the Italians' anxious lips and mounted as when the rocks resist a stream in spate and the damned up tide goes churning, sounding out as it beats from bank to bank with water roaring white. Once their spirits calmed and the anxious din died down, first the king salutes the gods from his high throne and then begins, if only before now, men of Latium, we had resolved this dire crisis. How I wish we had called a council then. Far better then, not now, with the enemy camped before our walls. What an ominous war we wage, my countrymen. Fighting people descended from the gods, unbeaten heroes, never wearied in battle, even in defeat they can't put down the sword. If you had any hope of winning Aetolian allies, give it up now. Each man to his own best hope, but now you can see how slim your hopes have been. The rest of your prospects. All lie in shambles, look with your own eyes, feel with your own hands. I blame no one. The most that Vela could do, Vela has done. We have fought the good fight with all our kingdom's power. Now, at this point, torn as I am with doubts, here is what I propose. I will tell it in brief. Come, listen closely. I have an age-old tract along the Tiber River, stretching west, beyond the Sicanian border. Here the Oruncans and Rutulians sow their crops, plow the rugged hills and graze the wildest banks. Let this entire spread, plus highlands ringed with pines, be given the Trojans now to win their friendship. And let us draft a treaty, just in every term, and invite the Trojans in to share our kingdom. Let them settle here, if so their hearts desire, and build their city walls. But if they are bent on seizing other countries, other people now, and it's in their power to put our land astern, then we'll build them twenty ships of Italian oak. More, if they have the crews. The timbers stacked ashore. Let them set out the number, the class of ship they need. We can supply the bronze, the shipwrights, docks and tackle. I also propose, to bear the news, confirm the pact, that a hundred envoys be dispatched, elite Latin stock, their arms laden with boughs of peace and bearing gifts, hundred weights of gold and ivory, throne and robe, our royal emblems. Confer among yourselves. Shore up our shattered fortunes. Drances rises, aggressive as always, stung by Turnus glory, spurred by smarting, barely hidden envy, a lavish spender, his rhetoric even looser, but a frozen hand in battle. No small voice in the public councils, always a shrewd adviser, a power in party strife. On his mother's side, well born, but his father's side remains a blank. Drances rises now. His urgings fuel their fire, our situation is clear for all to see, and it needs no voice of ours in council now, my noble king. The people know, they admit they know what destiny has in store, but they flinch from speaking out. Let him allow us to speak and quit his puffed up pride, that man whose unholy leadership and twisted ways, oh, I'll let loose, he can threaten me with death, so many leading lights among us is snuffed out that we see our entire city plunged in grief while he, trusting that he can break and run, attacks the Trojans, terrorizing the heavens with his spears. Just add one gift to the hordes you tell us now to give and pledge the Dardans. Just one more, my generous king. Let no one's violence overwhelm your power here as a father to give his daughter to a man, an outstanding man, a marriage earned in full and sealed by pacts of peace that last forever. But if such terror grips our hearts and minds, let us beg a favor of our fine prince. Turnus, surrender to king and country their due rights. Why keep flinging your wretched people into naked peril? You are the root and spring of all the Latins' griefs. There's no salvation in war. Peace, we all beg you, turn us, 
bound with the one inviolate pledge of peace. I've come first, the man you think your enemy, and what if I am? I'm here to implore you now, pity your own people. Surrender your pride. You're beaten, now retreat. Routed so, we have seen our fill of death. Vast tracts we have left a wasteland. Or if glory spurs you on, if your strength is still like oak, if the dowry of a palace seems so very dear to your heart, courage. Chest out, meet your enemy head on. But of course, so Turnus can fetch his royal bride, our lives are cheap, scattered in piles across the field, unburied and unwept. Come, prince, if you have the spine, if you have any spark of your father's warring spirit, look, your challenger calls you out to fight. Turnus groans under that barrage, his fury breaks into fire and the outrage bursts from the soldier's deep heart, always a mighty flood of words from you, drances, when battle demands our fighting hands. Whenever the senate's called, you're first to show your face. But there is no earthly need to fill these halls with the talk that flies so bravely from your mouth, safe as you are while the ramparts keep the enemy out and the trenches still don't overflow with blood. So, bluster away with your bombast, that's your style. Brand me for cowardice, drances, once your arm has left as many piles of slaughtered Trojans, decked as many fields with brilliant trophies. Now we're free to see what courage and quickness can achieve. No long hunt for the foe. As you may have noticed, they camp around our walls on every side. Come, shall we march against them? You hang back, why? Will your war lust always lie in your windy words and your craven, racing feet? Beaten, am I? Who could rightly call me beaten, you, you swine, who bothers to see the Tiber crest with Trojan blood and Evander's house uprooted, raised to the earth and all his Arcadian fighters stripped of arms? That's hardly the man that Pandarus and Bishas met when those two giants confronted me, and the thousand men whom I, in a single day, sent down to hell in all my triumph, trapped as I was inside the enemy's rugged walls. So, there's no salvation in war, you say? Go sing that song, you fool, for the Trojan chief, your own prospects too. Keep on striking your huge panic in all our hearts, praising to high heaven the strength of a people beaten twice. Disdaining the forces of Latinus. Now, I suppose, the Myrmidon captains cringe before the Phrygian armies, now Diams, now Larisian Achilles, and Orphidus rapids rush back from the Adriatic's waves. But here's Drances, feigning terror at my rebukes, a scoundrel's shabby dodge, just to hone his charges hurled against me. You, you'll never lose your life, such as it is, not by my right hand, fear not, just let it rest, beating inside that coward's chest of yours. But now, father, I come back to you and your resolves. If you no longer harbor any hope for our armies, if we are so alone, and at one repulse our forces are totally overwhelmed, good fortunes lost forever, let us reach out our helpless arms and plead for peace. Oh, if only we had a shred of our old courage left. I rate that man the luckiest one among us, first in the work of war, first in strength of heart, who spurning the sight of our surrender, falls, dying, and bites the dust for one last time. But if we have troops and provisions still intact and the towns and men of Italy still support our side, if the Trojans have also paid a bloody price for glory, they have their burials too, the same storms struck us both, then why this shameful collapse before it all begins? Why tremble so before the trumpet blares? Many things the run of the days and shifting works of fickle time have turned from bad to good. Many men has two-faced fortune cheated, only to come back and set them up on solid ground once more. Diams, true, and his city, Arpi, will offer us no relief. But Mesippus will, I trust, Tolumnius will, that soldier of fortune, and all the captains sent by so many lands, and no small glory waits for the men picked out from Latian and Laurentine fields. And Camilla too, our ally sprung from Volscian stock, heading her horsemen, squadrons gleaming bronze. But if the Trojans call me to single combat, if that's your will as well, and I am such a bar to the public good, then victory has not spurned or so hated these hands of mine that I would shrink from any risk when hopes are riding high. I will take him on with a will. Let him outfight the great Achilles, strap on armor the match for his, forged by Vulcan's hands. Bring him on, I say. To all, to Latinus, the father of my bride, I, Turnus, second in fighting strength to none of the men who came before me, I devote my life. Aeneas challenges me alone? Challenge away, I beg you. And if the gods are raging now, don't let Drances appease them with his death instead of mine. 
If courage and glory are at stake, don't let Drances carry off the prize. But now, while they debated their heated, divisive issues, sparring back and forth, Aeneas struck camp and deployed his lines for battle. Then in the thick of the din, suddenly, look, a messenger rushes in through the royal palace, spreading panic across the city, armies marching. Trojan and Tuscan allies pouring down from the Tiber, sweeping the whole plain. Confusion reigns at once, the people's spirits distraught, raked by the spur of rage. Shaking fists, they shout to arms. Arms, the ranks shout out while their fathers weep and groan. And now from all sides an enormous uproar, cries in conflict lift on the winds, like cries of bird flocks landing in some tall grove by chance or swans with their hoarse calls clamming out across the sounding pools of Pedusa River stocked with fish. All right then, citizens, seizing his moment Turnus calls, summon your councils, sit there praising peace. Our enemies swoop down on our country, full force. No more for them. Up he leapt and raced from the halls, shouting, You, Volusus, call your Volscian units to arms, move your Rutulians out. Messapus, array the cavalry, you and your brother Coras, range them down the plains. Another contingent guard the gates and man the towers. The rest attack with me where I command. At once they rush to the walls from all parts of the city. King Latinus himself, shocked by the sudden crisis, leaves the council, delays his own noble plans till a better hour, over and over faults himself for not embracing Trojan Aeneas with open arms, adopting him as his son to shield the city. Others are digging trenches before the gates, hauling up on their shoulders stones and pikes. And the raucous trumpet sounds the signal, bloody war. Then a mixed cordon of boys and mothers rings the walls as the long last struggle calls them all to gather. Here is the queen, with a grand cortege of ladies bearing gifts and riding up to Minerva's temple, set on the heights, and beside her rides the girl, the princess Lavinia, cause of all their grief, her lovely eyes bent low. Taking their lead, the ladies fill the shrine with the smoke of incense, pouring out their wails from the steep threshold, you, power of armies, queen of the battle, Pallas, virgin goddess, shatter that Phrygian pirate's spear. Himself? Hurl him headlong down, sprawled at our high gates. And Turnus in matchless fury gears himself for war. Now his buckled his breastplate, gleaming, ruddy bronze with its bristling metal scales, encased his legs in gold, his temples still bare, but his sword was strapped to his side as down from the city heights he speeds in a flash of gold in all his glory, in all his hopes already locked fast with the enemy, wild as a stallion bolting the paddock, burst free of the reins at last he commands the open plain, making for pasture, out for the herds of mares or keen for a plunge in the river runs he. Know so well, he charges off, his proud head flung back, neighing, racing on, reveling in himself, his maness sporting over his neck and shoulders. Rushing to meet him came Camilla, riding up with her arm Volskian ranks and under the gates the princess sprang from her horse, and following suit her entire troop dismounted in one gliding flow as their captain speaks out, Turnus, if the brave deserve to trust themselves, I'm steeled, I swear, to engage the cavalry of Aeneas, foray out alone to confront the Tuscan squadrons. Permit me to risk the first shock of battle. You stay here on foot and guard the walls. Turnus, his eyes trained on the awesome young girl, responded, Pride of Italy, princess, what can I do or say to show my thanks? But since that courage of yours would leap all bounds, come share the struggle with me. Aeneas, as rumor has it and posted scouts report, has recklessly sent his light horse on ahead to harass the plains, while he himself, crossing the mountain heights by a lonely, desolate ridge, is moving on the city. I am setting an ambush deep in a hollowed woody path and posting troops to block the passage through at both ends of the gorge. You take on the Etruscan cavalry, frontal assault, flanked by brave Messapus, the Latin horsemen and squadrons of Tibertus. You two assume a captain's joint command. With equal zeal he rallies Messapus, rallies allied chiefs and spurring them into battle, marches on the foe. There is a valley full of twists and turns, a perfect spot for the lures and subterfuge of battle, both of its sides closed off and dark with thick brush. A cramped path leads the way, a tightening pass, a difficult entry takes you in, a ready trap. And over it all, amid the hilltop lookout points there's high ground, hidden, good safe shelter. Whether you'd like to attack from left or right or stand on the ridge and roll huge boulders down. Now here Turner's heads, by a track he knows by heart and staking his ground, he lurks in the woods, in ambush. 
While high on Olympus, Diana called swift Opis, one of her virgin comrades, one of her sacred troop, and the goddess spoke in tears, Camilla's moving out to a brutal war, dear girl, strapping on our armor all for nothing. I love her like no one else. And it's no new love, you know, that stirs Diana, no sweet lightning bolt of passion. Once, when that tyrant, Metabus, loathed by people for his abuse of power, was drummed from his kingdom, leaving Provernum's ancient town, he took his daughter, a baby, with him, fleeing the thick and fast of battle, a friend to share his exile. Camilla, he called her, changing her mother's name, Casmilla, just a bit. Holding her in his arms, he made for the ridges, wild, dense with woods, with enemy weapons raining down around them, Volskian forces closing for the kill. And suddenly as they flew, the Amasinus overflowed, look, foaming over its banks, such violent cloudbursts broke. About to swim for it, Metaba stopped short, stayed by love for his child, fear for that dear burden. As he racked his brains, desperate, deeply torn, he lit on a quick decision. His own huge spear, the fighter luckily bore it in his grip, rugged with knots, the oakwood charred hard. Rolling her up in cork bark stripped from trees, he lashed her fast to the weapon, just mid haft and balancing both in his right hand, he prays to the skies, bountiful one, to you, lover of groves, Latona's daughter, a father devotes his baby girl. Yours is the first spear she grasps as she flees the enemy through the air, pleading for your mercy. Receive her, goddess, your very own, I pray you, now I commit my child to the fickle winds. With that, cocking back his arm he sends the javelin whirring on and the river roars out as over the churning rapids poor Camilla flies along on the whizzing shaft. But now as enemy fighters harry Mesopus even more, he flings himself in the stream and, flushed with triumph, pries from the turf his spear and baby girl as one, his gift to you, Diana, goddess of the crossroads. No homes, no city walls would give them shelter, nor would he have consented, fierce man that he was, no, a shepherd's life on the lonely mountains, that's the life he led. There in the brush and the rough lairs of beasts he nursed his child on raw milk from the dugs of a wild broodmare, milking its udders into her tender lips. And then, when the toddler had taken her first hesitant steps, Metabus armed her hand with a well-honed lance and slung from her tiny shoulder bow and arrows. No gold band for her hair, no long flaring cape, a tiger skin that covered her head hung down her back. With a hand uncallous still she flung her baby spears, swirled a slingshot round her head with its supple strap and bagged a crane or snowy swan by the Strymans banks. Many a mother in Tuscan cities yearned for her as a daughter. Futile. Diana's her only passion. She nurses a lifelong love of chastity and the hunt while she remains untouched. If only she'd never been carried away to serve in such a war, bent on challenging Trojans. She'd still be one of my loyal comrades, still my own dear girl. Action. Watch, a terrible destiny drives her on. Down you die from the high skies, Opus my nymph, light out for the Latin lands where battle flares and the omens all are bad. These weapons, take them, pluck from the quiver an arrow fletched for vengeance. Use it. Whoever defiles her sacred body with a wound, Trojan, Italian, make him pay me an equal price in blood. Then I will fold her in cloud, poor girl, with all her gear and bear Camilla's unsullied body home to a tomb and lay her to rest in her own native land. At that, Opis doved down from the sky through a light breeze, her body wrapped in a whirlwind dark as night and whirring on her way. But all the while the Trojan forces are closing on the walls, Etruscan chiefs and a massed army of cavalry squaring off in squadrons rank by rank. Across the entire field the snorting chargers stamping, fighting their tight reins and veering left and right and the plains are bristling a jagged crop of iron spears, everywhere, fields ablaze with weapons brandished high. At the same time, grouping against the Trojan lines, Mesopus, the swift Latins, Coras, his brother too and young Camilla's wing, all march into sight, right arms cocked back, thrusting javelins forward, shaking vibrant lances, infantry tramping into position, battle stallions panting, planes mounting to fever pitch. And once both armies had closed to a spear cast away they reined back to a halt, then abruptly surge forward, shouting, whipping their teams into combat frenzy, weapons pelting thick as a snowstorm shrouds the skies in darkness. At once Tyrannus and fierce Acontius charge each other full tilt with their spears, and both are first to crash, shattering down with tremendous impact, splintering ribs of their battle stallions ramming chest to chest. Acontius, hurled off, drops like a lightning bolt or a dead weight shot forth from a siege engine, heaving headlong far away from his charger, gasping out his life breath on the winds. 
that moment the lines of fighters buckle, Latins, routed, sling their shields on their backs and wheel their horses round to the walls as the Trojans drive them on with Asilas in the lead, his squadrons charging. Now they are nearing the gates when again the Latins raise a war cry, wrenching the horses' supple necks around while the Trojans, all reins slack, beat a deep retreat. Picture an ocean rolling, waves ebbing and flowing, now flooding onto the shore, smashing over the cliffs in a burst of foam and drenching the bay's sandy edge, now rushing in fast retreat, swallowing down the scree lost in the backwash, leaving the shallows high and dry, so twice the Etruscans hurled the Latins toward their walls, twice routed, glancing round they cover their backs with shields. But when at the third assault the whole front locked fast, fighting hand to hand, and each man picked out his man, then, truly, the groans of the dying men break loose, weapons, bodies, a sea of blood, massacred riders, half-dead horses writhing together now in death and the pitched battle peaks. Orsoloches fearing to face the horseman Remulus, whirls a lance at his horse instead, planting the point below its ear and furious, wild with the wound, it cannot bear the agony, rearing back, chest high, its hoofs thrashing the air as Remulus, thrown free, rolls around in the dust. And Catillus brings down Iolas, then Herminius, massive in courage, immense in brawn and armor, his blond locks flowing bare and his shoulders bare, no fear of wounds, so huge his body exposed to spears. But Catilla's shaft goes hammering through him, quivering out his broad back and it doubles up the man impaled with pain. Everywhere, black tides of blood, iron clashing, slaughter, fighters striving for death with glory through their wounds. Watch, exulting here in the thick of carnage, an Amazon, one breast bared for combat, quiver at hand, Camilla, now she rifles hardened spears from her hand in salvos, now she seizes a rugged double axe in her tireless grasp, Diana's golden archery clashing on her shoulder. Even forced to withdraw she swerves her bow and showers arrows, wheeling in full flight. And round Camilla ride her elite companions, Tulla, young Laina, Torpiae brandishing high her brazen axe, daughters of Italy, all, she chose to be her glory, godlike Camilla's aids in peace and war and wild as Thracian Amazons galloping, pounding along the Thermodon's banks, fighting in burnished gear around Hippolyte, or when Penthesilia born of Mars comes sweeping home in her car, an army of women lifts their rolling, shrilling cries in welcome exulting with half-moon shields. Fierce young girl, who is the first and who the last your spear cuts down? How many dying bodies do you spread out on the earth? Eunius, son of Clitius, first. His chest, unshielded, charging Camilla now, who runs her enemy through with her long pine lance and he vomits spurts of blood, gnawing the gory earth, twisting himself around his wound as the Trojan breathes his last. Then Lyris, Pegasus over him, Lyris struggling to clutch his reins, thrown from his horse as it goes sprawling under him, Pegasus rushes to help his falling comrade, reaches out with an unarmed hand and both of them side by side pitch headlong down. And adding kills, she takes Amastris, Hippota's son, then attacking at long range, with spear casts pierces Terius and Harpalicus, then Demophoon, Chromis too and for every shaft the girl let fly from her hand another Phrygian fighter bit the dust. Here's Ornitus riding his Calabrian charger in from a distance, all decked out in exotic armor, the huntsman setting up for a soldier. A bull's hide covers his broad shoulders, the big yawning maw of a wolf with glistening fangs in its jaws protects his head and a hunter's hook-tipped javelin arms his hand as into the press he goes, topping all by a head but Camilla runs him down, easy work with the ranks in full retreat, and spears him through, exulting over his body with all the hatred in her heart, still in the woods, you thought, and flushing game, my fine Etruscan hunter? Well, the day has come when a woman's weapons prove your daydreams wrong. Still, you carry no mean fame to your father's shades, just tell them this, you died by Camilla's spear. Lunging she kills a pair of massive Trojans, Butes and Orsolochus. Butes, his back turned, she stabs between the helmet and breastplate, just where the horseman's neck shines bare and the shield on his left arm dangles down, off guard. And fleeing Orsolochus now as the Trojan drives her round in a huge ring, Camilla tricks him, wheeling inside him, quick, the pursuer now the pursued as she rears above him, praying, begging for mercy, her battle axe smashes down, blow after blow through armor, bone, splitting his skull, warm brains from the wound go splashing down his face. Suddenly right before Camilla, stunned with terror to see her here, stands Ornus fighting son, an Apennine man and not the least of Liguria's liars while the fates allow. Once he sees there is no running away from battle, no turning aside Camilla's attack, he tries to devise a ruse with all his craft and cunning, letting loose, now where's the glory, tell me, a woman putting her trust in a powerful horse? No more running away. 
meet me on level ground, in combat, hand to hand, gear up to fight on foot. You'll soon see whose windy boasts of glory cheat him blind. Raked by the scathing taunt Camilla blazes up in rage, hands off her horse to an aide and takes her stand against the Ligurian, fearless on foot and armed like him with a naked sword and still unbattered shield. But quick as a flash the soldier, certain his guile had won the day, runs away himself, yanking his reins around and digging iron spurs in his racing stallion's flanks. Ligurian fool. So bloated with all your empty pride, pulling your slippery inbred tricks for nothing. Fraud will never carry you home, safe and sound, to your lying father Ornus. So young Camilla cries and lightning fast on her feet outruns the charger, snatches the reins and facing her enemy dead on, makes him pay with his own detested blood, quick as Apollo's falcon wheeling down from a crag outraces a dove in flight to a high cloud, seizes it, clutches it, hooked talons ripping its insides out, its blood and plucked feathers drifting down the sky. But the father of men and gods, far from blind, throned on his steep Olympian peak observes it all and stirs Etruscan Tarshan into the savage fighting, lashing the trooper on with the rough spur of rage. So into the bloody, buckling lines rides Tarshan, goading his horsemen on with a burst of mixed cries, rallying each by name, spurring the routed back to battle, what's your fear, you Tuscans forever deaf to shame? Always slacking off. What cowardice saps your courage? What, is a woman rooting squadron strong as ours? Why have swords or useless lances gripped in our fists? But you're not slow when it comes to nightly bouts of love, when the curved flute strikes up some frantic bacchic dance. Linger on for the feasts and cups at the groaning board, that's your love, your lust, till the seer will bless and proclaim the sacrifice and the rich victim lures you into the deep groves. With that, he whips his warhorse into the press, braced to die himself, he rushes Venulus headlong, sweeps him off his mount and hugging his enemy tight to his chest with his clenched right arm, gallops away with him, racing off full tilt. A cry hits the skies, all the Latins turning to watch as Tarshan flies like wildfire down the field, bearing the man and weapons both, then wrenches off the iron point of Venula's spear and delves around for a spot laid bare where a lethal blow might land, the other fighting off the enemy's hand from his throat, pitting force against fury. Swift as a golden eagle seizes a snake and towers into the sky, talons knotted round it, claws clutching fast but the wounded serpent rides in its rippling coils, stiffens, scales bristling, hissing through its fangs as it rears its head, but all the more the eagle keeps on digging into its struggling victim, its hooked beak ripping away, its wings thrashing the air, so Tarshan sweeps his kill right from the Tiber's columns, Tarshan flushed with triumph. Following hard on their captain's feet and clear success the Etruscans swing to attack, as a run starts to circle swift Camilla, a match for her spear yet more adept at cunning. His life is doomed by the fates but now he tests his luck for the quickest way in. Wherever Camilla rages, plunging into the front, their run stalks her, quietly tracks her steps, whenever she downs a foe and turns around for home, round he tugs at his fast reins and ducks from sight. Now this approach, now that, exploring the circuit round from every side, he shakes his fatal spear in his ruthless fist. By chance, one glorious, sacred to goddess Saibib, once her priest, Camilla spied him at long range, gleaming in Phrygian gear, spurring a lathered warhorse decked with coat of mail, its brazen scales meshing with gold-like feathers stitched. He himself, aflame in outlandish reds and purples, shot Gortinian shafts from a Lycian bow, a bow of gold slung from the priest's shoulders, gold his helmet too, and he'd knotted his saffron cape and flaring linen pleats with a tawny golden brooch, his shirt and barbarous legging stiff with needle braid. Camilla, keen to fix some Trojan arms on a temple wall or sport some golden plunder out on the hunt, she tracked him now, one man in the moil of war, she stalked him wildly, reckless through the ranks, afire with a woman's lust for loot and plunder when, grasping his chance at last, rising up from ambush a runs flings his spear with a winged prayer aloft, Apollo, highest of gods, lord of holy Seract. We worship you first and foremost, honor your fire stoked by cords of pine. And we your celebrants firm in our faith, we plant our feet in your embers glowing hot. Grant, Father, our shame be blotted out by our spears, Almighty God Apollo. I am not bent on plunder stripped from a girl, no trophy over her corpse. My other feats of arms will win me glory. If only this murderous scourge drops dead beneath my strokes, back I'll go to my father's towns, unsung. Apollo heard and willed that part of the prayer would win the day but part he scattered abroad on the ruffling winds. 
That a run should cut Camilla down in sudden death, that he granted, true, but not that his noble land should see him home again and the gusting south wind swept that prayer away. So when he sent his javelin hissing through the air and all the Volskians, wheeling, trained their eyes and alert minds on the princess, she was numb to it all, the draught, the hiss, the weapon sent from the blue, until the spear went ripping through her, under her naked breast and it struck deep, it hammered home and drank her virgin blood. Her frightened comrades hurry to brace their falling queen but Arun's race is off, more frantic than all the rest, his triumph mixed with terror, no longer trusting his spear or daring to meet the young girl's weapons point blank. Like the wolf that's killed some shepherd or hulking ox and before attacking spears can catch him, races off at once, darting into the pathless hills for cover, he knows he's done some outrage, frantic now, he tucks his trembling tail between his legs and heads for the woods. So runs, shaken, slinking from sight, content with a bare escape, loses himself in the milling lines of fighters. Camilla, dying, tugs at the spear but the iron point stands fixed in the deep wound, wedged between her ribs. She's faint from loss of blood, her eyes failing, chill with death, and the glowing color she had, once, fades away. Then as she breathes her last, she calls to Akka, alone of her young comrades, more than all the others true to Camilla, the only one with whom she shares her cares, and here is what she says, this far, Akka, my sister, and I can go no further. Now the raw wound saps my strength, darkness, everywhere, closing in around me. Go, quickly, carry my last commands to Turnus, take over the fighting, free the town from Trojans. Now farewell. With Camilla's last words she lost her grip on the reins and, all against her will, slipped down to the ground. Little by little she grew cold, and wholly freed of her body, laid down her head as her neck drooped limp in the clutch of death, and she let her weapons fall. Camilla's life breath fled with a groan of outrage down to the shades below. And then, at that, an immense cry rose up and hit the golden stars. With Camilla down, the melee peaks to a new pitch, the masses surging forward, the whole Trojan army, Etruscan captains, Evander's Arcadian wings. But all the while Diana sentry, Opis, posted high on a ridge, has scanned the fighting unperturbed. And when at a distance she could see, clear in the thick of battle, war cries, warrior's fury, Camilla beaten down by the brutal stroke of death, she moaned, crying out from the bottom of her heart, too cruel, dear girl, too cruel the price you pay for trying, begging to challenge the men of Troy in combat. What gain for you, your lonely life in the forest, serving Diana, our quiver round your shoulder? But your queen has not deserted you, shorn of honor, not in your hour of death, nor will your death lack glory among the race of man, nor will you bear the shame of dying unavenged. Whoever defiled your body with that wound will pay with the death that he deserves. Under the mountain ridges stood an immense mound of earth, hedged with shady ilex, the tomb of Dersenus, an old Laurentine king. Here with a swoop the lovely goddess first took up her post, from the high ground looking round for a runs, and seeing him gleam in armor, puffed with pride, why running away, she shouted. Step right up, just come this way, to die. Collect the reward you've earned for Camilla's death. Just think, you are to die by the arrows of Diana. That said, the Thracian goddess, plucking a wind-swift shaft from her golden quiver, drew her bow with a vengeance, back to a full draw till the curved horns all but touched, her balanced hands tense, left hand at the iron point, right hand at the bowstring stretched to her breast, then, the instant that Aruns heard the whizzing shaft and whirring ere the iron struck home in his flesh. As he gasps out his last, his oblivious comrades leave him sprawled in the nameless dust and Opis flies away to Mount Olympus. Their captain gone, Camilla's light horse squadrons are first to flee, the harried Rutulians flee and brave Atenas too, leaders routed, and frontline men, their leaders lost, make for safety, swerving their horses, racing for the walls. But nothing can halt the Trojans' fierce offensive now, no weapons can stop them, nothing stand against them. Home the Latins go, slack bows on sagging shoulders, galloping hoofbits pound the rutted plain with thunder. As a dust storm dark as night goes whirling toward the walls, the mothers stand at the lookouts, beating their breasts, raising the women's shrilling wails to the starry sky. And the first Latins to rush through the open gates. Enemies mixing in with their own ranks crowd them hard, nor can they find escape from a wretched death, no, right at the entrance, just in their native walls, in the safe retreat of home they are pierced by spears and pant their lives away. Some shut the gates, not daring to clear a safe way in for comrades, beg as they will, and a ghastly bloodbath follows, defenders killed at the entries, enemies flung on swords. 
shut out in front of their parents' faces, eyes streaming tears, some pitch headlong into the trenches, pressed by the rout, some charge wildly, reins flying, ramming the gateways blocked by the rugged posts. And even mothers up on the ramparts strive, their genuine love of country marks the way, they'd seen Camilla fight, they hurl their weapons with trembling hands, daring to do the work of iron with pikes of rugged oak and poles charred hard. Defending their city walls, they all burn to be the first to die. At the same time the wrenching news hits Turner still in the woods. It arrives in force as Acker brings her commander word of stark disaster, Volskian units routed, Camilla fallen, enemy armies surging on, attacking on all fronts, and Mars in his triumph, panic already shakes the city walls. Turnus in all his fury, that's what the ruthless will of Jove demands, abandons his hilltop ambush, quits the shaggy grove. He was barely out of sight and about to range the plain when Captain Aeneas, moving through the exposed pass, climbs the ridge and comes forth from the shady woods. So now both men are speeding toward the walls, not many strides between their armies marching in total strength. Then, the moment Aeneas spied the dust storm swirling down the plain and the long lines of Latian fighters, Turner spied Aeneas, savage in full armor, and caught the tramp of marching infantry, battle stallions panting. They would have clashed at once and tried their luck in war but the ruddy sun has plunged his weary team in the western sea and as daylight slips away he brings the nightfall on. Now both armies come to a halt before the city, building dikes to fortify their camps. Book 12. The sword decides all. Once Turner sees his ranks of Latins broken in battle, their spirits dashed and the war god turned against them, now is the time, he knows, for him to keep his pledge. All eyes are fixed on him, his blood is up and nothing can quench the fighter's order now. Think of the lion ranging the fields near Carthage, the beast won't move into battle till he takes a deep wound in his chest from the hunters, then he revels in combat, tossing the rippling manet on his neck he snaps the spear some stalker drove in his flesh and roars from bloody jaws, without a fear in the world. So Turnus blazes up into full explosive fury, bursting out at the king with reckless words, Turnus spurns all delay. Now there's no excuse for those craven sons of Aeneas to break their word, to forsake the pact we swore. I'll take him on, I will. Bring on the sacred rites, father, draft our binding terms. Either my right arm will send that Dardan down to hell, that rank deserter of Asia, my armies can sit back and watch, and turn a sword alone will rebut the charge of cowardice trained against them all. Or let him reign over those he's beaten down. Let Lavinia go to him, his bride. Latinus replied in a calming, peaceful way, brave of the brave, my boy, the more you excel in feats of daring, the more it falls to me to weigh the perils, with all my fears, the lethal risks we run. The realms of your father, Dornus, are yours to manage, so are the many towns your right arm took by force. Latinus, too, has wealth and the will to share it. We've other unwed girls in Latian and Laurentine fields, and no mean stock at that. So let me offer this, hard as it is, yet free and clear of deception. Take it to heart, I urge you. For me to unite my daughter with any one of her former suitors would have been wrong, forbidden, all the gods and prophets made that plain. But I bowed to my love of you, bowed to our kindred blood and my wife's heartrending tears. I broke all bonds, I tore the promised bride from her waiting groom, I brandished a wicked sword. Since then, Turnus, you see what assaults, what crises dog my steps, what labors you have shouldered, you, first of all. Beaten twice in major battles, our city walls can scarcely harbor Italy's future hopes. The rushing Tiber still steams with our blood, the endless fields still glisten with our bones. Why do I shrink from my decision? What insanity shifts my fixed resolve? If, with Turnus dead, I am ready to take the Trojans on as allies, why not stop the war while he is still alive? What will your Rutulians, all the rest of Italy say if I betray you to death, may fortune forbid, while you appeal for my daughter's hand in marriage? Oh, think back on the twists and turns of war. Pity your father, bent with years and grief, cut off from you in your native city a day afar away. Latinus' urgings deflect the fury of Turnus not one bit, it only surges higher. The attempts to heal inflame the fever more. Soon as he finds his breath the prince breaks out, the anguish you bear for my sake, generous king, for my sake, I beg you, wipe it from your mind. Let me barter death as the price of fame. I have weapons too, old father, and no weak, and tempered spears go flying from my right hand, from the wounds we deal the blood comes flowing too. 
His mother, the goddess, she'll be far from his side with her woman's wiles, lurking in stealthy shadows, hiding him in clouds when her hero cuts and runs. But the queen, afraid of the new rules of engagement, wept, and bent on her own death embraced her ardent son-in-law to be, Turnus, by these tears of mine, by any concern for a martyr that moves your heart, you are my only hope, now, you the one relief to my wretched old age. In your hands alone the glory and power of King Latinus rest, you alone can shore our sinking house. One favor now, I pray you. Refrain from going hand to hand with the Trojans. Whatever dangers await you in that one skirmish, Turnus, await me too. With you I will forsake the light of this life I hate, never in shackles live to see Aeneas as my son. As Lavinia heard her mother's pleas, her warm cheeks bathed in tears, a blush flamed up and infused her glowing features. As crimson as Indian ivory stained with ruddy dye or white lilies aglow in a host of scarlet roses, so mixed the hues that lit the young girl's face. Turnus, struck with love, fixing his eyes upon her, fired the more for combat, tells Amata, briefly, don't, I beg you, mother, send me off with tears, with evil omens as I go into the jolting shocks of war, since Turnus is far from free to defer his death. Be my messenger, Idmon. Take my words to Aeneas, hardly words to please that craven Phrygian king. Soon as the sky goes red with tomorrow's dawn, riding Aurora's blood-red chariot wheels, he's not to hurl his Trojans against our Latins, he must let Trojan and Latian armies stand at ease. Our blood will put an end to this war at last, that's the field where Lavinia must be won. No more words. Rushing back to the palace Turnus calls for his team and thrills to see them neighing right before him, gifts from Orithia herself to glorify Pelumnus, horses whiter than snow, swifter than racing winds. Restless charioteers flank them, patting their chests, slapping with cupped hands, and groom their rippling manes. Next Turnus buckles round his shoulders the breastplate, dense with its golden mesh and livid mountain bronze, and straps on sword, shield, and helmet with horns for its bloody crest, that sword the fire god forged for Father Dornus, plunged red hot in the river Styx. And next with his powerful grip he snatches up a burly spear aslant an enormous central column, plunder seized from an enemy, actor, shakes it hard till the haft quivers and now, my spear, he cries, you've never failed my call, and now our time has come. Great actor wielded you once. Now you're in Turnus' hands. Let me spill his corpse on the ground and strip his breastplate, rip it to bits with my bare hands, that Phrygian eunuch, defile his hair in the dust, his tresses crimped with a white-hot curling iron dripping myrrh. Frenzy drives him, Turnus' whole face is ablaze, showering sparks, his dazzling glances glinting fire, terrible, bellowing like some bull before the fight begins, trying to pour his fury into his horns, he rams a tree trunk, charges the wind's full force, stamping sprays of sand as he warms up for battle. At the same time, Aeneas, just as fierce in the arms his mother gave him, hones his fighting spirit too and incites his anger, glad the war will end with the pact that Turnus offers. Then he eases his friends and anxious Euless fears, explaining the ways of fate, commanding envoys now to return his firm reply to King Latinus, state the terms of peace. A new day was just about to dawn, scattering light on the mountaintops, the horses of the sun just rearing up from the ocean's depths, breathing forth the light from their flaring nostrils when the Latins and Trojans were pacing off the dueling ground below the great city's walls, spacing the braziers out between both armies, mounding the grassy altars high to the gods they shared in common. Others, cloaked in their sacred aprons, brows wreathed in verbena, brought out spring water and sacramental fire. The Italian troops march forth, pouring out of the packed gates in tight, massed ranks and fronting them, the entire Trojan and Tuscan force comes rushing up, decked out in a range of arms, no less equipped with iron than if the brutal war god called them forth to battle. And there in the midst of milling thousands, chiefs paraded left and right, resplendent in all their purple and gold regalia, Nestheus, bloodkin of Asaracus, hardy Asilas, then Mesippus, breaker of horses, Neptune's son. The signal sounds. All withdraw to their stations, plant spears in the ground and cant their shields against them. Then in an avid stream the mothers and unarmed crowds and frail old men find seats on towers and rooftops, others take their stand on the high gates. But Juno, looking out from a ridge now called the Alban Mount, then it had neither name, renown nor glory, gazed down on the plain, on Italian and Trojan armies face to face, and Latinus city walls. 
At once she called to turn a sister, goddess to goddess, the lady of lakes and rilling brooks, an honor the high and mighty king of heaven bestowed on due Turner once he had ravished the virgin girl, nymph, beauty of streams, our heart's desire, well you know how I have favored you, you above all the Italian women who have mounted that ungrateful bed of our warm-hearted Jove, I gladly assigned you a special place in heaven. So learn, due Turner, the grief that comes your way and don't blame me. While fortune seemed to allow and fate to suffer the Latian state to thrive, I guarded Turnus, guarded your city walls. But now I see the soldier facing unequal odds, his day of doom, his enemy's blows approaching. That duel, that deadly pact, I cannot bear to watch. But if you dare help your brother at closer range, go and do so, it becomes you. Who knows? Better times may come to those in pain. Juno had barely closed when tears brimmed in Juturna's eyes and three, four times over she beat her lovely breast. No time for tears, not now, warned Saturn's daughter. Hurry. Pluck your brother from death, if there's a way, or drum up war and abort that treaty they conceived. The design is mine. The daring, yours. Spurring her on, Juno left Juturna torn, distraught with the wound that broke her heart. As the kings come riding in, a massive four-horse chariot draws Latinus forth, his glistening temples ringed by a dozen gilded rays, proof he owes his birth to the sun god's line, and a snow-white pair brings Turnus' chariot on, two steel-tipped javelins balanced in his grip. And coming to meet them, marching from the camp, the great founder, Aeneas, source of the Roman race, with his blazoned starry shield and armor made in heaven. And at his side, his son, Ascanius, second hope of Rome's imposing power, while a priest in pure white robes leads on the young of a bristly boar and an unshorn yearling sheep toward the flaming altars. Turning their eyes to face the rising sun, the captains reach out their hands, pouring the salted meal, and mark off the brows of the victims, cutting tufts with iron blades, and tip their cups on the sacred altar fires. Then devoted Aeneas, sword drawn, prays, Now let the sun bear witness here and this, this land of Italy that I call. For your sake I am able to bear such hardships. And Jove Almighty, and you, his queen, Saturnia, goddess, be kinder now, I pray you, now at last. And you, father, glorious Mars, you who command the revolving world of war beneath your sway. I call on the springs and streams, the gods enthroned in the arching sky and gods of the deep blue sea. If by chance the victory goes to the Latin, Turnus, we agree the defeated will depart to Evander city, Eulus will leave this land. Nor will Aeneas Trojans ever revert in times to come, take up arms again and threaten to put this kingdom to the sword. But if victory grants our force in arms the day, as I think she may, may the gods decree it so, I shall not command Italians to bow to Trojans, nor do I seek the scepter for myself. May both nations, undefeated, under equal laws, march together toward an eternal pact of peace. I shall bestow the gods and their sacred rites. My father-in-law Latinus will retain his armies, my father-in-law, his power, his rightful rule. The men of Troy will erect a city for me, Lavinia will give its walls her name. So Aeneas begins, and so Latinus follows, eyes lifted aloft, his right hand raised to the sky, I swear by the same, Aeneas, earth and sea and stars, by Latona's brood of twins, by Yana's facing left and right, by the gods who rule below and the shrine of ruthless death, may the father hear my oath, his lightning seals all pacts. My hand on his altar now, I swear by the gods and fires that rise between us here, the day will never dawn when Italian men will break this pact, this peace, however fortune falls. No power can bend awry my will, not if that power sends the country avalanching into the waves, roiling all in floods and plunging the heavens into the dark pit of hell. Just as surely as this scepter, raising the scepter he chanced to be grasping in his hand, will never sprout new green or scatter shade from its tender leaves, now that it's been cut from its trunk's base in the woods, cleft from its mother, its limbs and crowning foliage lost to the iron axe. A tree, once, that a craftsman's hands have sheathed in hammered bronze and given the chiefs of Latium state to wield. So, on such terms they sealed a pact of peace between both sides, witnessed by all the officers of the armies. Then they slash the throats of the hallowed victims over the flames, and tear their pulsing entrails out and heat the altars high with groaning platters. But in fact the duel had long seemed uneven to all the Rutulians, long their hearts were torn, wavering back and forth, and they only wavered more as they viewed the two contenders at closer range, poorly matched in power. Turnus adds to their anguish, quietly moving toward the altar, eyes downcast, to pray. 
a suppliant now, his fresh cheeks and his strong young body pallid. Soon as his sister Juturna saw such murmurs rise and the hearts of people slipping into doubt, into the line she goes like came as to the life, a soldier sprung from a grand ancestral clan, his father a name for valor, brilliant deeds, and he himself renowned for feats of arms. Into the center lines Juturna strides, alert to the work at hand, and she sows a variety of rumors, urging, aren't you ashamed, Rutulians, putting at risk the life of one to save us all? Don't we match them in numbers, power? Look, these are all they've got, Trojans, Arcadians, and all the Etruscan forces, slaves to fate, to battle turn us in arms. Why, if only half of us went to war, each soldier could hardly find a foe. But Turnus, think, he'll rise on the wings of fame to meet the gods, gods on whose altars he has offered up his life, he will live forever, sung on the lips of men. But we, if we lose our land, will bow to the yoke, enslaved by our new high lords and masters, we who idle on amid our fields. Stinging taunts inflame the will of the fighters all the more till a low growing murmur steals along the lines. Even Laurentines, even Latins change their tune, men who had just now longed for peace and safety long for weapons, pray the pact be dashed and pity the unjust fate that Turner's faces. Then, crowning all, Juturna adds a greater power. She displays in the sky the strongest sign that ever dazed Italian minds and deceived them with its wonders. The golden eagle of Jove, in flight through the blood-red sky, was harrying shorebirds, rooting their squadrons shrieking ranks when suddenly down he swoops to the stream and grasps a swan, out in the lead, in his ruthless talons. This the Italians watch, enthralled as the birds all scream and swerving round in flight, a marvel, look, they overshadow the sky with wings, and forming a dense cloud bank, force their enemy high up through the air until, beaten down by their strikes and his victim's weight, his talons drop the kill in the river's run and into the clouds the eagle winged away. Struck, the Italians shout out, saluting that great omen, all hands eager to take up arms, and the augur Tolumnius urges first, this, this, he cries, is the answer to all my prayers. I embrace it, I recognize the gods. I, I will lead you, reach for your swords now, my poor people. Like helpless birds, terrorized by the war that ruthless invader brings you, devastating your shores by force of arms. He too will race in flight and wing away, setting his sails to cross the farthest seas. Close ranks. Every man of you mass with one resolve. Fight to save your king the marauder seized. Enough. Lunging out he whips a spear at the foes he faced and the whizzing javelin hisses, rips the air dead on, and at that instant a huge outcry, ranks in a wedge in disarray, lines buckling, hearts at a fever pitch as the shaft wings on where a band of nine brothers with fine bodies chance to block its course. One mother bore them all, a Tuscan, loyal to Rena wed to Gelippus, her Arcadian husband. And one of these, in the waist where the braided belt chafes the flesh and the buckle clasps the strap from end to end, a striking, well-built soldier in burnished bronze, the spear splits his ribs and splays him out on the sand. But his brothers, a phalanx up in arms, inflamed by grief, some tear swords from sheaths and some snatch up their spears and all press blindly on. As the Latian columns charge them, charging them come Agilines and Trojans streaming up with Arcadian ranks decked out in blazoned gear and one lust drives them all, to let the sword decide. Altars plundered for torches, down from menacing clouds a torrent of spears, and the iron rain pelts thick and fast as they carry off the holy bowls and sacred braziers. Even Latinus flees, cradling his defeated gods and shattered pact of peace. Others harness teams to chariots, others vault up onto their horses, swords brandished, tents for attack. Messippus, keen to disrupt the truce, whips his charger straight at Tuscan Orlestes, king adorned with his kingly emblems, forcing him back in terror. And back he trips, poor man, stumbling, crashing head over shoulders into the altar rearing behind him there, and Messippus, fired up now. Flies at him, looming over him, high in the saddle to strike him dead with his rugged beamy lance, the king begging for mercy, Messippus shouting, this one's finished. Here, a choice of victim offered up to the great gods. And the Latins rush to strip the corpse still warm. Rushing to block them, Corineus grabs a flaming torch from the altar, just so Ebesus can't strike first, and hurls fire in the Latin's face and his huge beard flares up, reeking with burnt singe. And following on that blow he seizes his dazed foe's locks in his left hand and pins him fast to the ground with a knee full force and digs his rigid blade in Ebesus' flank. 
Podlirius, tracking the shepherd Alsus, hurtles through the front where the spears shower down, his rearing over him now with his naked sword but Alsus, swirling his axe head back, strikes him square in the skull, cleaving brow to chin and convulsive sprays of blood imbrue his armor. Grim repose and an iron sleep press down his eyes and shut their light in a night that never ends. But Aeneas, bound to his oath, his head exposed and the hand unarmed he was stretching toward his comrades, shouted out, Where are you running? Why this sudden outbreak, why these clashes? Rein your anger in. The pact's already struck, its terms are set. Now I alone have the right to enter combat. Don't hold me back. Cast your fears to the wind. This strong right arm will put our truce to the proof. Our rights have already made the life of Turnus mine. Just in the midst of these, these outcries, look, a winging arrow whizzes in and it hits Aeneas. Nobody knows who shot it, whirled it on to bring the Rutulians such renown, what luck, what god, the shining fame of the feat is shrouded over now. Nobody boasted he had struck Aeneas. No one. Turnus, soon as he saw Aeneas falling back from the lines, his chiefs in disarray, ignites with a blaze of hope. He demands his team and arms at once, in a flash of pride he leaps up onto his chariot, tugging hard on the reins and races on and droves of the brave he hands to death and tumbles droves of the half-dead down to earth or crushes whole detachments under his wheels or seizing their lances, cuts down all who cut and run. A mock as Mars by the banks of the Hebrus frozen over, splattered with blood, fired to fury, drumming his shield as he whips up war and gives his frenzied team free rein and over the open fields they outstrip the winds from south and west till the far frontiers of Thrace groan to their pounding hoofs and round him the shapes of black fear, rage and ambush, aids of the war god gallop on and on. Just so madly Turnus whips his horses into the heart of battle, charges steaming sweat, trampling enemy fighters killed in agony, kicking gusts of bloody spray, their hoofs stamping into the sand the clotted gore. Now his dealing death to Sthenelus, Tamaris, Pholus, Sthenelus speared at long range, the next two hand to hand, at a distance two both sons of Embracus, Glaucus and Lades. Embracus had reared them himself in Lycia once and equipped them both with matching weapons either to fight close up or outrace the winds on horseback. Another sector. Eumedes charges into the Malay, grandson of old Eumedes, bearing that veteran's name but famed for his father Dolan's heart and hand in war. Dolan, who once dared to ask for Achilles' chariot, his reward for spying out the Achaean camp but Diams paid his daring a different reward, now he no longer dreams of the horses of Achilles. Eumedes spotting him far out on the open meadow, Turnus hits him first with a light spear winged across that empty space then races up to him, halts his team, and rearing over the dying Trojan, plants a foot on his neck and tears the sword from his grip, a flash of the blade, he stains it red in the man's throat, and to top it off cries out, look here, Trojan, here are the fields, the great land of the west you fought to win in war. Lie there, take their measure. That's the reward they all will carry off who risk my blade, that's how they build their walls. A whirl of his spear and Turner sends as bites to join him, Glorious too and Sibiris, dares, Thersilochus, then Thymo eats, pitched down over the neck of his bucking horse. Like a blast of the Thracian north wind howling over the deep Aegean, whipping the waves toward shore, wherever the winds burst down the clouds take flight through the sky, so Turnus, wherever he hacks his path, the lines buckle in and the ranks turn tail and run as his own drive sweeps him on, his rushing chariot charging the gusts that toss his crest. Phegeus could not face his assault, his deafening cries, he flung himself before the chariot, right hand wrestling the horse's jaws around as they came charging into him, frothing at their bits, then dragged him dangling down from the yoke as Turner spearhead hit his exposed flank and ripping the double links of his breastplate, there it stuck, just grazing the fighter's skin. But raising his shield, swerving to brave his foe, he strained to save himself with his naked sword, when the wheel and whirling axle knocked him headlong, ground him into the dust. Turnus, finishing up with a stroke between the helmet's base and the breastplate's upper rim, hacked off his head and left his trunk in the sand. And now, while Turnus is spreading death across the plains in all his triumph, Mnestheus and trusty Achates, Ascanius at their side, are setting Aeneas down in camp, bleeding, propping himself on his lengthy spear at every other step. Furious, struggling to tear the broken arrowhead out, he insists they take the quickest way to heal him, cut the wound with a broadsword, open it wide, dig out the point where it's bedded deep and put me back into action. 
Now up comes Iapix, Iasia's son, and dear to Apollo, more than all other men, and once, in the anguished grip of love, the god himself gladly offered him all his own arts, his gifts, his prophetic skills, his lyre, his flying shafts. But he, desperate to slow the death of his dying father, preferred to master the power of herbs, the skills that cure, and pursue a healer's practice, silent and unsung. But Aeneas, pressed by a crowd of friends and Eulus grieving sorely, the fighter stood there bridling, fuming, hunched on his rugged spear, unmoved by all their tears. The old surgeon, his robe tucked back and cinched in the healer's way, with his expert, healing hands and Apollo's potent herbs he works for all his worth. No use, no use as his right hand tugs at the shaft and his clamping forceps grip the iron point. No good luck guides his probes, Apollo the master lends no help, and all the while the ruthless horror of war grows greater, grimmer throughout the field, a disaster ever closer. Now they see a pillar of dust upholding the sky and the horsemen riding on and dense salvos of weapons raining down in the camp's heart, and the cries of torment reach the heavens as young men fight and die beneath the iron fist of Mars. At this point, Venus, shocked by the unfair pain her son endures, culls with a mother's care some dittany fresh from Cretan Ida, spear erect with its tender leaves and crown of purple flowers. No stranger to wild goats who graze it when flying arrows are planted in their backs. This she bears away, her features veiled in a heavy mist, this she distills in secret into the river water poured in burnished bowls, and fills them with healing power and sprinkles ambrosial juices bringing health, and redolent cure-all too. With this potion, aged Iapix laid the wound, quite unaware, and suddenly all the pain dissolved from Aenea's body, all the blood that pulled in his wound stanched, and the shaft, with no force required, slipped out in the healer's hand and the old strength came back, fresh as it was at first. Quick, fetch him his weapons. Don't just stand there. Iapix cries, the first to inflame their hearts against the foe. This strong cure, it's none of the work of human skills, no expert's arts in action. My right hand, Aeneas, never saved your life. Something greater, a god, is speeding you back to greater exploits. Starved for war, Aeneas had cased his calves in gold, left and right, and spurning delay, he shakes his glinting spear. Once he has fitted shield to hip and harness to his back, he clasps Ascanius fast in an ironclad embrace and kissing him lightly through his visor, says, learn courage from me, my son, true hardship too. Learn good luck from others. My hand will shield you in war today and guide you toward the great rewards. But mark my words. Soon as you ripen into manhood, reaching back for the models of your kin, remember, Father Aeneas and Uncle Hector fire your heart. Urgings over, out of the gates he strode, immense in strength, waving his massive spear. Antheus and Nestheus flank him closely, dashing on and from the deserted camp roll all their swarming ranks. The field is a swirl of blinding dust, the earth quaking under their thundering tread. From the opposing rampart Turner saw them coming on, his Italians saw them too and an icy chill of dread ran through their bones. First in the Latin ranks, Juturna caught the sound, she knew what it meant and, seized with trembling, fled. But Aeneas flies ahead, spurring his dark ranks on and storming over the open fields like a cloudburst wiping out the sun, sweeping over the seas toward land, and well in advance the poor unlucky farmers, hearts shuddering, know what it will bring, trees uprooted, crops destroyed, their labor in ruins far and wide, and the winds come first, churning in uproar toward the shore. So the Trojans storm in, their commander heading them toward the foe, their tight ranks packed in a wedge, comrade linked with comrade massing hard. A slash of a sword, Thimbrius finished giant Osiris, Nestheus kills Arcetius, Achates hacks Epilo down and Gaius, Euphens. Even the seer Tolumnius falls, the first to wing a lance against the foe. Cries hit the heavens, now it's the Latins' time to turn tail and flee across the fields in a cloud of dust. Aeneas never stoops to leveling men who show their backs or makes for the ones who fight him fairly, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, or the ones who fling their spears at longer range. No, it's Turnus alone his tracking, eyes alert through the murky haze of battle, Turnus alone Aeneas demands to fight. Due Turner, terror struck at the thought, the woman warrior knocks Matiscus, Turnus charioteer, from between the reins he grasps and leaves him sprawling far from the chariot pole as she herself takes over, shaking the rippling reins like Matiscus to the life, his voice, his build, his gear. Quick as a black swift darts along through the great halls of a wealthy lord, and scavenging morsels, banquet scraps for her chirping nestlings, all her twitterings echo now in the empty colonnades, now round the brimming ponds. 
So swiftly Ju Turner drives her team at the Trojan center, darts along in her chariot whirling through the field, now here, there, displaying her brother in his glory, true, but she never lets him come to grips, she swerves far away. But Aeneas, no less bent on meeting up with the enemy, stalks his victim, circling round him, turn by turn and his shrill cries call him through the broken ranks. As often as he caught sight of his prey and strained to outstrip the speed of that team that raced the wind, so often Ju Turner wheeled the chariot round and swooped away. What should he do? No hope. He seeds on a heaving sea as warring anxieties call him back and forth. Then Messippus, just sprinting along with a pair of steel-tipped spears in his left hand, training one on the Trojan, lets it fly, right on target. Aeneas stopped in his tracks and huddled under his shield, crouching down on a knee but the spear in its onrush swiped the peak of his helmet off and swept away the plumes that crowned his crest. Aeneas erupts in anger, stung by treachery now and seeing Turnus horses swing his chariot round and speed away, over and over he calls out to Jove, to the altars built for the treaty now a shambles. Then, at last, he hurtles into the thick of battle as Mars drives him on, and terrible, savage, inciting slaughter, sparing none, he gives his rage free reign. Now what god can unfold for me so many terrors? Who can make a song of slaughter in all its forms, the deaths of captains down the entire field, dealt now by Turnus, now by Aeneas, kill for kill? Did it please you so, great Jove, to see the world at war, the people's clash that would later live in everlasting peace? Aeneas takes on Rutuli and Sucro, here was the first duel that ground the Trojan charge to a halt, and meets the man with no long visit, just a quick stab in his flank and the ruthless sword blade splits the ribcage, thrusting into the heart where death comes lightning fast. Turnus, hurling the brothers Amicus and Dior's off their mounts, attacks them on foot and one he strikes with a long spear, rushing at Turnus, one he runs through with a sword and severing both their heads, he dangles them from his car as he carts them off in triumph dripping blood. Aeneas packs them off to death, Talos, Tanais, staunch Cethegus, all three at a single charge, then grim Onites too, named for his the ban line, his mother called Pyridea. Turnus kills the brothers fresh from Apollo's Lycian fields and next Menoetes who, in his youth, detested war but war would be his fate. An Arcadian angler skilled at working the rivers of Lerna stopped with fish, his lodgings poor, a stranger to all the gifts of the great, and his father farmed his crops on rented land. Like fires loosed from adverse sides into woodlands dry as tinder, thickets of rustling laurel, or foaming rivers hurling down from a mountain ridge and roaring out to sea, each leaves a path of destruction in its wake. Just as furious now those two, Aeneas, Turnus rampaging through the battle, now their fury boils over inside them, now their warring hearts at the breaking point, they don't concede defeat, and now they hack their wounding ways with all their force. Here's Morena sounding off the names of his forebears, all his father's father's line from the start of time, his entire race come down from the Latin kings. Headlong down Aeneas smashes the braggart with a rock, a whirling boulder's power that splays him on the ground, snarled in the reins and yoke as the wheels roll him on and under their thundering hoofbits both his galloping horses, all thought of their master vanished, trample him to death. Here's Hillus rushing in with his blood-curdling rage but Turnus rushing to block him whips a spear at his brow that splits his gilded helmet, sticks erect in his brain. And your sword arm, Cretheus, bravest Greek afield, it could not snatch you from Turnus, nor did the gods he worshipped save Cupenca's life when Aeneas came his way, he thrust his chest at the blade but his brazen shield, poor priest, could not put off his death. And Aeolus, you too, the Laurentine field saw you go down and your body spread across the earth. Down you went, whom neither the Greek battalions could demolish, nor could Achilles, who raised the realms of Priam. Here was your finish line, the end of life. Your halls lie under Ida, high halls at Lernesus, but here in Laurentine soil lies your tomb. All on attack, the armies wheeling around for combat, all the Latins, all the Trojans, Nestheus, fierce Arrestus, Mesippus breaker of horses, brawny Asselas, the Etruscan squadron, Evander's Arcadian wings, each fighter at peak strength, all force put to the test as they soldier on, no rest, no let up, total war. And now his lovely mother impelled Aeneas to storm the ramparts, hurl his troops at the city, fast, frontal assault, and panic the Latins faced with swift collapse. And he, stalking Turnus through the moil of battle, Aeneas glances roving left and right, sights the town untouched by this ruthless war, immune, at peace and an instant vision of fiercer combat fires his soul. 
he summons Mnestheus, Segestus, staunch Serestus, chosen captains, takes his stand on a high rise where the rest of the Trojan fighters cluster round, tight ranks that don't throw down their shields and spears as Aeneas, rising amidst them, urges from the earthwork, no delay in obeying my orders, Jove backs us now. No slowing down, I tell you, we must strike at once. That city, the cause of the war, the heart of Latinus' realm, unless they bow to the yoke, brought low this very day, I'll topple their smoking rooftops to the ground. What, wait till Turnus deigns to take me on? Consents to fight me again, defeated as he is? That city, my people, there's the core and crux of this accursed war. Quick, bring torches. Restore our truce with fire. A call to arms and they pack in wedge formation bent on battle, advancing toward the walls in a dense fighting mass, in a moment you see ladders slanted, brands aflame. Some charge at the gates and cut the sentries down and others will their steel, blot out the sky with spears. Aeneas himself, up in the lead beneath the ramparts, raises his arm and thunders out, upbraiding Latinus, calling the gods, bear witness, I've been dragged into battle once again. The Latins are our enemies twice over, this is the second pack they've shattered and discord surges up in the panic-stricken citizens, some insisting the gates be flung wide to the Dardans, yes, and they hail the king himself toward the walls. Others seize on weapons, rush to defend the ramparts. Picture a shepherd tracking bees to their rocky den, closed up in the clefts he fills with scorching smoke and all inside, alarmed by the danger, swarming round through their stronghold walled with wax, hone sharp their rage to a piercing buzz and the black reek goes churning through their house and the rocks hum with a blind din and the smoke spews out into thin air. Now a new misfortune assailed the battle-weary Latins, rocking their city to its roots with grief. The queen, when from her house she sees the enemy coming strong, walls assaulted, flames surging up to the roofs and no Rutulian force in sight to block their way, no troops of Turnus, then, poor woman, she thinks him killed in the press of war and suddenly lost in the frenzied grip of sorrow, claims that she's the cause, the criminal, source of disaster, shrilling wild words in her crazed, grieving fit and bent on death, ripping her purple gown for a noose, she knots it high to a rafter, dies. A gruesome death. As soon as the wretched Latin women hear the worst, the queen's daughter Lavinia is the first to tear her golden hair and score her lustrous cheeks, the rest of the women round her mad with grief and the long halls resound with trilling wails of sorrow. From here the terrible news goes racing through the city, spirits plunge, Latinus, rending his robes to tatters, stunned by his wife's death and his city's fall, fouls his white hair with showers of dust. Turnus at this point, fighting off on the outskirts of the field, is hunting a few stragglers. Yet he's less avid now, exulting less and less when his horses win the day. But the winds bring him a hint of hidden terrors, mingled cries drifting out of the town in chaos. A muffled din. He cocks his ears, listening, hardly the sound of joy. What am I hearing, why this enormous grief that rocks the walls, this clamor echoing from the city far away? So he wonders, madly tugging the reins back and makes the chariot stop. But his sister, changed to look like his charioteer, Matiscus, handling the car and team and reins, she faced him with this challenge, this way, Turnus. We'll hunt these Trojans down where victory opens up the first way in. Other hands can defend our city walls. Aeneas hurtles down on the Latins, all out assault, but we can deal out savage death to his Trojans. You'll return from the front no less than Aeneas in numbers killed and battle honors won. My sister, Turnus replies, I recognized you long ago, yes, when you first broke up our treaty with your wiles and threw yourself into combat. No hiding your guardhood, you can't fool me now. But what Olympian wished it so, who sent you down to bear such heavy labor? Why, to witness your luckless brother's painful death? What do I do now? What new twist of fortune can save me now? I've seen with my own eyes, calling out to me, Turnus, as he fell. Moranus, no one dearer to me survived, a great soldier taken down by a great wound. Unlucky Euphans died before he could see my shame and the Trojans commandeered his corpse and weapons. Must I bear the sight of Latinus' houses raised, the last thing I needed, and not rebut the ugly slander of drances with my sword? Shall I cut and run? Shall the country look on Turnus in full retreat? To die, tell me, is that the worst we face? Be good to me now, you shades of the dead below, for the gods above have turned away their favors. Down to you I go, a spirit cleansed, utterly innocent as charged, forever worthy of my great father's fame. 
the words were still on his lips when, look, Sax, riding his lathered horse through enemy lines and slashed where an arrow raked his face, comes racing up, calling for help, crying the name of Turnus, Turnus, you are our last best hope. Pity your own people. Aeneas strikes like lightning. Up in arms he threatens to topple Italy's towers, bring them down in ruins, already the flaming brands go winging toward the roofs. The Latins, their eyes, their looks are trained on you. Latinus, the king himself, moans and groans with doubt, whom to call his sons. Which pact can he embrace? And now the queen, whose trust lay all in you, she's dead by her own hand, terrified, she's fled the light of life. Alone before the gates Mesippus and brave Atenas hold our front line steady, ringed by enemy squadrons packed tight, bristling a jagged crop of naked blades. While look at you, wheeling your chariot round the abandoned grassy fields. Stunned by pictures of these disasters blurring through his mind, Turner stood there, staring, speechless, churning with mighty shame, with grief and madness all aswirl in that one fighting heart, with love spurred by rage and a sense of his own worth too. As soon as the shadows were dispersed and the light restored to his mind, he turned his fiery glance toward the ramparts, glaring back from his chariot to the town. But now, look, a whirlwind of fire goes rolling story to story, billowing up the sky, and clings fast to a mobile tower, a defense he built himself of wedged, rough-hewn beams, fitting the wheels below it, gangways reared above. Now, now, my sister, the fates are in command. Don't hold me back. Where God and relentless fortune call us on, that's the way we go. I'm set on fighting Aeneas hand to hand, set, however bitter it is, to meet my death. You'll never see me disgraced again, no more. Insane as it is, I beg you, let me rage before I die. He leapt from his chariot, hit the ground at a run through enemies, Trojan spears, and left his sister grieving as he went bursting through the lines. Wild as a boulder plowing headlong down from a summit, torn out by the tempests, whether the storm winds washed it free or the creeping year stole under it, worked it loose, down the cliff it crashes, ruthless crag of rock bounding over the ground with enormous impact, churning up in its onrush woods and herds and men. So Turnus bursts through the fractured ranks, charging toward the walls where the earth runs red with blood and the winds hiss with spears and, hand flung up, he cries with a ringing voice, hold back now, you Rutulians. Latins, keep your arms in check. Whatever fortune sends, it's mine. Better for me alone to redeem the pact for you and let my sword decide. All ranks scattered, leaving a no man's land between them both. But Aeneas, the great commander, hearing the name of Turnus, deserts the walls, deserts the citadel's heights and breaks off all operations, jettisons all delay, he springs in joy, drums his shield and it thunders terror. As massive as Athos, massive as Eryx or even Father Apennine himself, roaring out with his glistening oaks, elated to raise his snow-capped brow to the winds. And then, for a fact, the Rutulians, Trojans, all the Italians, those defending the high ramparts, those on attack who batter the wall's foundations with their rams, all armies strained to turn their glances round and lifted their battle armor off their shoulders. Latinus himself is struck that these two giant men, sprung from opposing ends of the earth, have met, face to face, to let their swords decide. But they, as soon as the battlefield lay clear and level, charge at speed, rifling their spears at long range, then rush to battle with shields and clanging bronze. The earth groans as stroke after stroke they land with naked swords, fortune and fortitude mix in one assault. Charging like two hostile bulls fighting up on Silas woods or Tabernus ridges, ramping in mortal combat, both brows bent for attack and the herdsmen back away in fear and the whole herd stands by, hushed, afraid, and the heifers wait and wonder, who will lord it over the forest? Who will lead the herd, while the bulls battle it out, horns butting, locking, goring each other, necks and shoulders roped in blood and the woods resound as they grunt and bellow out? So they charge, Trojan Aeneas and Turnus, son of Dornus, shields clang and the huge din makes the heavens ring. Jove himself lifts up his scales, balanced, trued, and in them he sets the opposing fates of both. Whom would the labor of battle doom? Whose life would weigh him down to death? Suddenly Turnus flashes forward, certain he's in the clear and raising his sword high, rearing to full stretch strikes, as Trojans and anxious Latins shout out, with the gaze of both armies riveted on the fighters. But his treacherous blade breaks off, it fails Turnus in mid-stroke, enraged, his one recourse, retreat, and swifter than east winds, Turnus flies as soon as he sees that unfamiliar hilt in his hand, no defense at all. 
they say the captain, rushing headlong on to harness his team and board his car to begin the duel, left his father's sword behind and hastily grabbed his charioteer Matiscus blade. Long as the Trojan stragglers took to their heels and ran, the weapon did its work, but once it came up against the immortal armor forged by the god of fire, Vulcan, the mortal sword burst at a stroke, brittle as ice, and glinting splinters gleamed on the tawny sand. So raging Turnus runs for it, scours the field, now here, now there, weaving in tangled circles as Trojans crowd him hard, a dense ring of them shutting him in, with a wild swamp to the left and steep walls to the right. Nor does Aeneas flag, though slowed down by his wound, his knees unsteady, cutting his pace at times but his still in full fury, hot on his frantic quarry's tracks, stride for stride. Alert as a hunting hound that lights on a trapped stag, hemmed in by a river's bend or frightened back by the ropes with blood-red feathers, the hound barking, closing, fast as the quarry, panicked by traps and the steep riverbanks, runs off and back in a thousand ways but the Umbrian hound, keen for the kill, hangs on the trail, his jaws agape, and now, now he's got him, thinks he's got him, yes and his jaws clap shut, stymied, champing the empty air. Then the shouts break loose, and the banks and rapids round resound with the din, and the high sky thunders back. Turnus, even in flight he rebukes his men as he races, calling each by name, demanding his old familiar sword. Aeneas, opposite, threatens death and doom at once to anyone in his way, he threatens his harried foes that he'll root their city out and, wounded as he is, keeps closing for the kill. And five full circles they run and reel as many back, around and back, for it's no mean trophy they are sporting after now, they race for the life and the lifeblood of Turnus. By chance a wild olive, green with its bitter leaves, stood right here, sacred to Faunus, revered by men in the old days, sailors saved from shipwreck. On it they always fixed their gifts to the local god and they hung their votive clothes in thanks for rescue. But the Trojans, no exceptions, hallowed tree that it was, chopped down its trunk to clear the spot for combat. Now here the spear of Aeneas had stuck, borne home by its hurling force, and the tough roots held it fast. He bent down over it, trying to wrench the iron loose and track with a spear the kill he could not catch on foot. Turnus, truly beside himself with terror, Faunus, he cried, I beg you, pity me. You, dear earth, hold fast to that spear. If I have always kept your rights, a far cry from Aeneas' men who stain your rights with war. So he appealed, calling out for the gods' help, and not for nothing. Aeneas struggled long, wasting time on the tough stump, no power of his could loose the timber's stubborn bite. As he bravely heaves and hauls, the goddess Juturna, changing back again to the charioteer Matiscus, rushes in and returns her brother's sword to Turnus. But Venus, incensed that the nymph has had her brazen way, steps up and plucks Aeneas' spear from the clinging root. So standing tall, with their arms and fighting hearts refreshed, one who trusted all to his sword, the other looming fiercely with his spear, confronting each other, both men breathless, brace for the war god's fray. Now at the same moment Jove, the king of mighty Olympus, turns to Juno, gazing down on the war from her golden cloud, and says, where will it end, my queen? What is left at the last? Aeneas the hero, god of the land, you know yourself, you confess you know that he is heaven-bound, his fate will raise Aeneas to the stars. What are you plotting? What hope can make you cling to the chilly clouds? So, was it right for a mortal hand to wound, to mortify a god? Right to restore that mislaid sword to Turnus, for without your power what could you Turner do, and lend the defeated strength? Have done at last. Bow to my appeals. Don't let your corrosive grief devour you in silence, or let your dire concerns come pouring from your sweet lips and plaguing me forever. We have reached the limit. To harass the Trojans over land and sea, to ignite an unspeakable war, degrade a royal house and blend the wedding hymn with the dirge of grief, all that lay in your power. But go no further. I forbid you now. Jove said no more. And so, with head bent low, Saturn's daughter replied, because I have known your will so well, great Jove, against my own I deserted Turnus and the earth. Or else you would never see me now, alone on a windswept throne enduring right and wrong. No, wrapped in flames I would be up on the front lines, dragging the Trojan into mortal combat. Juturna? I was the one, I admit, who spurred her on to help her embattled brother, true, and blessed whatever greater daring it took to save his life, but never to shower arrows, never tense the bow. I swear by the unappeasable fountain head of the Styx, the one dread oath decreed for the gods on high. So, now I yield, Juno yields, and I leave this war I loathe. 
but this, and there is no law of fate to stop it now, this I beg for Latium, for the glory of your people. When, soon, they join in their happy wedding bonds, and wedded let them be, in pacts of peace at last, never command the Latins, here on native soil, to exchange their age-old name, to become Trojans, called the kin of Tusa, alter their language, change their style of dress. Let Latium endure. Let Alban kings hold sway for all time. Let Roman stock grow strong with Italian strength. Troy has fallen, and fallen let her stay, with the very name of Troy. Smiling down, the creator of man and the wide world returned, now there's my sister. Saturn's second child, such tides of rage go churning through your heart. Come, relax your anger. It started all for nothing. I grant your wish. I surrender. Freely, gladly too. Latium's sons will retain their father's words and ways. Their name till now is the name that shall endure. Mingling in stock alone, the Trojans will subside. And I will add the rites and the forms of worship, and make them Latins all, who speak one Latin tongue. Mixed with Orsonian blood, one race will spring from them, and you will see them outstrip all men, outstrip all gods in reverence. No nation on earth will match the honors they shower down on you. Juno nodded assent to this, her spirit reversed to joy. She departs the sky and leaves her cloud behind. His task accomplished, the father turned his mind to another matter, set to dismiss Juturna from her brother's battles. They say there are twin curses called the Furies. Night had borne them once in the dead of darkness, one and the same spawn, and birthed infernal Megaera, wreathing all their heads with coiled serpents, fitting them out with wings that race the wind. They hover at Jove's throne, crouch at his gates to serve that savage king and wet the fears of afflicted men whenever the king of gods lets loose horrific deaths and plagues or panics towns that deserve the scourge of war. Jove sped one of them down the sky, commanding, cross Juturna's path as a wicked omen. Down she swoops, hurled to earth by a whirlwind, swift as a darting arrow whipped from a bowstring through the clouds, a shaft armed by a Parthian, tipped with deadly poison, shot by a Parthian or a Cretan archer, well past any cure, hissing on unseen through the rushing dark. So raced this daughter of night and sped to earth. Soon as she spots the Trojan ranks and Turnus lines she quickly shrinks into that small bird that often, hunched at dusk on deserted tombs and rooftops, sings its ominous song in shadows late at night. Shrunken so, the demon flutters over and over again in Turnus' face, screeching, drumming his shield with its whirring wings. An eerie numbness unnerved him head to toe with dread, his hackles bristled in horror, voice choked in his throat. Recognizing the fury's ruffling wings at a distance, wretched Juturna tears her hair, nails clawing her face, fists beating her breast, and cries to her brother, How, Turnus, how can your sister help you now? What's left for me now, after all I have endured? What skill do I have to lengthen out your life? How can I fight against this dreadful omen? At last, at last I leave the field of battle. Afraid as I am, now frighten me no more, you obscene birds of night. Too well I know the beat of your wings, the drumbeat of doom. Nor do the proud commands of Jove escape me now, our great, warm-hearted Jove. Are these his wages for taking my virginity? Why did he grant me life eternal, rob me of our one privilege, death? Then, for a fact, I now could end this agony, keep my brother company down among the shades. Doomed to live forever? Without you, my brother, what do I have still mine that's sweet to taste? If only the earth gaped deep enough to take me down, to plunge this goddess into the depths of hell. With that, shrouding her head with a grey-green veil and moaning low, down to her own stream's bed the goddess sank away. All hot pursuit, Aeneas brandishes high his spear, that tree of a spear, and shouts from a savage heart, more delay. Why now? Still in retreat, Turnus, why? This is no foot race. It's savagery, sword play cut and thrust. Change yourself into any shape you please, call up whatever courage or skill you still have left. Pray to wing your way to the starry sky or bury yourself in the earth's deep pits. Turnus shakes his head, I don't fear you, you and your blazing threats, my fierce friend. It's the gods that frighten me, Jove, my mortal foe. No more words. Glancing around he spots a huge rock, huge, ages old, and lying out in the field by chance, placed as a boundary stone to settle border wars. 
A dozen picked men could barely shoulder it up, men of such physique as the earth brings forth these days, but he wrenched it up, hands trembling, tried to heave it right at Aeneas, Turner stretching to full height, the hero at speed, at peak strength. Yet his losing touch with himself, racing, hoisting that massive rock in his hands and hurling, true, but his knees buckle, bloods like ice in his veins and the rock he flings through the air, plummeting under its own weight, cannot cover the space between them, cannot strike full force. Just as in dreams when the nightly spell of sleep falls heavy on our eyes and we seem entranced by longing to keep on racing on, no use, in the midst of one last burst of speed we sink down, consumed, our tongue won't work, and tried and true, the power that filled our body fails, we strain, but the voice and words won't follow. So with Turnus. Wherever he fought to force his way, no luck, the merciless fury blocks his efforts. A swirl of thoughts goes racing through his mind, he glances toward his own Rutulians and their town, he hangs back in dread, he quakes at death, it's here. Where can he run? How can he strike out at the enemy? Where's his chariot? His charioteer, his sister? Vanished. As he hangs back, the fatal spear of Aeneas streaks on, spotting a lucky opening he had flung from a distance, all his might and main. Rocks heaved by a catapult-pounding city ramparts never storm so loudly, never such a shattering bolt of thunder crashing forth. Like a black whirlwind churning on, that spear flies on with its weight of iron death to pierce the breastplate's lower edge and the outmost rim of the round shield with its seven plies and right at the thick of Turnus' thigh it whizzes through, it strikes home and the blow drops great Turnus down to the ground, battered down on his bent knees. The Rutulians spring up with a groan and the hillsides round groan back and the tall groves far and wide resound with the long-drawn moan. Turnus lowered his eyes and reached with his right hand and begged, a suppliant, I deserve it all. No mercy, please, Turnus pleaded. Seize your moment now. Or if some care for a parent's grief can touch you still, I pray you, you had such a father, in old anchises, pity Dornus in his old age and send me back to my own people, or if you would prefer, send them my dead body stripped of life. Here, the victor and vanquished, I stretch my hands to you, so the men of Latium have seen me in defeat. Lavinia is your bride. Go no further down the road of hatred. Aeneas, ferocious in armor, stood there, still, shifting his gaze, and held his sword arm back, holding himself back too as Turnus' words began to sway him more and more, when all at once he caught sight of the fateful saw belt of pallors, swept over Turnus' shoulder, gleaming with shining studs Aeneas knew by heart. Young pallors, whom Turnus had overpowered, taken down with a wound, and now his shoulder flaunted his enemy's battle emblem like a trophy. Aeneas, soon as his eyes drank in that plunder, keepsake of his own savage grief, flaring up in fury, terrible in his rage, he cries, decked in the spoils you stripped from one I loved, escape my clutches? Never Pallas strikes this blow, Pallas sacrifices you now, makes you pay the price with your own guilty blood. In the same breath, blazing with wrath he plants his iron sword hilt deep in his enemy's heart. Turnus' limbs went limp in the chill of death. His life breath fled with a groan of outrage down to the shades below.